Preface This book contains little that is original. Since most aspects of the subject have been thoroughly worked over by previous historians, primary research was rarely required. The book's originality, such as it is, lies only in the selection, rearrangement and presentation of the contents. The main aim was to map out a grid of time and space for European history, and, by introducing a sufficiently comprehensive range of topics into the framework, to convey an impression of the unattainable whole. The academic apparatus has been kept to a minimum. There are no notes relating to facts and statements that can be found in any of the established works of reference. Among the latter, special mention must be made of my 29 volumes of the Encyclopaedia Britannica, which far surpasses all its successors. End notes are only provided to substantiate less familiar quotations and sources of information beyond the range of the standard textbooks. One should not assume that the text necessarily agrees with interpretations found in the works cited. On ne s'étonnera pas que la doctrine exposée dans le texte ne soit toujours d'accord avec les travaux auxquels il est renvoyé en note. The academic considerations which underlay the writing of the present volume have been set out in the introduction, but its design may need some explanation. The text has been constructed on several different levels. Twelve narrative chapters pan across the whole of Europe's past, from prehistory to the present. They gradually zoom in from the distant focus of Chapter 1, which covers the first five million years, to the relatively close focus of Chapters 11 and 12, which cover the 20th century at roughly one page per year. Each chapter carries a selection of more specific capsules, picked out, as it were, by telephoto, and illustrating narrower themes that cut across the chronological flow. Each chapter ends with a wide-angle snapshot of the whole continent, as seen from one particular vantage point. The overall effect may be likened to a historical picture album, in which panoramic tableaux are interspersed by a collection of detailed insets and close-ups. One hopes it is understood that the degree of precision attainable at these different levels will vary considerably. Indeed, a work of synthesis cannot expect to match the standards of scientific monographs that have rather different purposes in mind. The twelve main chapters follow the conventional framework of European history. They provide the basic chronological and geographical grid into which all the other topics and subjects have been fitted. They concentrate on event-based history, on the principal political divisions, cultural movements and socio-economic trends which enable historians to break the mass of information into manageable, though necessarily artificial, units. The chronological emphasis lies on the medieval and modern periods where a recognisably European community can be seen to be operating. The geographical spread aims to give equitable coverage to all parts of the European peninsula, from the Atlantic to the Urals, north, east, west, south and centre. At every stage, an attempt has been made to counteract the bias of Eurocentrism and Western civilization. But in a work of this scope, it has not been possible to extend the narrative beyond Europe's own frontiers. Suitable signals have been made to indicate the great importance of contingent subjects such as Islam, colonialism or Europe overseas. East European affairs are given their proper prominence. Wherever appropriate, they are integrated into the major themes which affect the whole of the continent. An eastern element is included in the exposition of topics such as the barbarian invasions, the Renaissance or the French Revolution, which all too often have been presented as relevant only to the West. The space given to the Slavs can be attributed to the fact that they form the largest of Europe's ethnic families. National histories are regularly summarized, but attention has been paid to the stateless nations, not just to the nation-states. Minority communities, from heretics and lepers to Jews, Romanis and Muslims, have not been forgotten. In the last chapters, the priorities of the Allied scheme of history have not been followed nor have they been polemically contested. The two world wars have been treated as two successive acts of a single drama, preference being given to the central continental contest between Germany and Russia. The final chapter on post-war Europe takes the narrative to the events of 1989-91 and the disintegration of the Soviet Union.
The argument contends that 1991 saw the end of a geopolitical arena, dubbed the Great Triangle, whose origins can be dated to the turn of the 20th century, and whose demise offers a suitable hiatus in a continuing story. The approach of the 21st century sees the opening of a new opportunity to design a new Europe. The capsules, of which there are some 300, perform several purposes. They draw attention to a wide variety of specifics, which would otherwise find no place among the generalizations and simplifications of synthetic history writing. They sometimes introduce topics which cross the boundaries of the main chapters, and they illustrate all the curiosities, whimsies, and inconsequential side-streams which over-serious historians can often overlook. Above all, they have been selected to give as many glimpses as possible of the new methods, the new disciplines, and the new fields of recent research. They provide samples from some 60 categories of knowledge which have been distributed over the chapters in the widest possible scatter of period, location, and subject matter. For arbitrary reasons of the book's length, the publisher's patience, and the author's stamina, the original capsule list had to be reduced. Nonetheless, it is hoped that the overall pointillist technique will still create an effective impression, even with a smaller number of points. Each capsule is anchored into the text at a specific point in time and space, and is marked by a headword that summarizes its contents. Each can be tasted as a separate, self-contained morsel, or it can be read in conjunction with the narrative into which it is inserted. The snapshots, of which there are twelve, are designed to present a series of panoramic overviews across the changing map of Europe. They freeze the frame of the chronological narrative, usually at moments of symbolic importance, and call a temporary halt to the headlong charge across enormous expanses of time and territory. They should help the listener to catch breath and to take stock of the numerous transformations which were progressing at any one time on many different fronts. They are deliberately focused from a single vantage point and make no attempt to weigh the multiplicity of opinions and alternative perspectives which undoubtedly existed. To this extent, they are shamelessly subjective and impressionistic. In some instances, they border on the controversial realm of faction, combining known events with undocumented suppositions and deductions. Like several other elements in the book, they may be judged to exceed the conventional bounds of academic argument and analysis. If so, they will draw attention not only to the rich variety of Europe's past, but also to the rich variety of prisms through which it can be viewed. There is strong reason to believe that European history is a valid academic subject, which is solidly based on past events that really happened. Europe's past, however, can only be recalled through fleeting glimpses, partial probes, and selective soundings. It can never be recovered in its entirety. This volume, therefore, is only one from an almost infinite number of histories of Europe that could be written. It is the view of one pair of eyes, filtered by one brain, and translated by one pen. Norman Davis, Oxford, Bloomsday, 1993 In preparing the corrected edition of Europe, a history, the amendments have been addressed solely to errors of fact, nomenclature, and orthography. No attempt was made to re-enter the realm of historical interpretation. Norman Davis, 17th of March, 1997 The Legend of Europa In the beginning there was no Europe. All there was, for five million years, was a long, sinuous peninsula with no name, set like the figurehead of a ship on the prow of the world's largest landmass. To the west lay the ocean, which no one had crossed. To the south lay two enclosed and interlinked seas, sprinkled with islands, inlets, and peninsulas of their own. To the north lay the great polar ice cap, expanding and contracting across the ages like some monstrous, freezing jellyfish. To the east lay the land bridge to the rest of the world, whence all peoples and all civilizations were to come. In the intervals between the ice ages, the peninsula received its first human settlers, the humanoids of Neanderthal and the cave people of Cro-Magnon must have had names and faces and ideas, but it cannot be known who they really were. They can only be recognized dimly from their pictures, their artifacts, and their bones. 
With the last retreat of the ice, only 12,000 years ago, the peninsula received new waves of migrants. Unsung pioneers and prospectors moved slowly out to the west, rounding the coasts, crossing the land and the seas until the furthest islands were reached. Their greatest surviving masterwork, as the age of stone gave way to that of bronze, was built on the edge of human habitation on a remote offshore island. But no amount of modern speculation can reveal for certain what inspired those master masons, nor what their great stone circle was called. At the other end of the peninsula, another of those distant peoples at the dawn of the Bronze Age was founding a community whose influence has lasted to the present day. By tradition, the Hellenes descended from the continental interior in three main waves, taking control of the shores of the Aegean towards the end of the second millennium BC. They conquered and mingled with the existing inhabitants. They spread out through the thousand islands which lie scattered among the waters between the coasts of the Peloponnese and of Asia Minor. They absorbed the prevailing culture of the mainland and the still older culture of Crete. Their language distinguished them from the barbarians, the speakers of unintelligible babble. They were the creators of ancient Greece. Later, when children of classical times asked where humankind had come from, they were told about the creation of the world by an unidentified Arpifex rerum, or divine maker. They were told about the flood and about Europa. Europa was the subject of one of the most venerable legends of the classical world. Europa was the mother of Minos, lord of Crete, and hence the progenitrix of the most ancient branch of Mediterranean civilization. She was mentioned in passing by Homer. But in Europa and the Bull, attributed to Mascus of Syracuse, and above all in the Metamorphoses of the Roman poet Ovid, she is immortalized as an innocent princess seduced by the father of the gods. Wandering with her maidens along the shore of her native Phoenicia, she was beguiled by Zeus in the guise of a snow-white bull. And gradually she lost her fear, and he offered his breast for her virgin caresses, his horns for her to wind with chains of flowers, until the princess dared to mount his back, her pet bull's back, unwitting whom she rode. Then, slowly, slowly, down the broad, dry beach, first in the shallow waves, the great god set his spurious hooves, then sauntered further out, till in the open sea he bore his prize. Fear filled her heart as, gazing back, she saw the fast-receding sands. Her right hand grasped a horn, the other leant upon his back, her fluttering tunic floated in the breeze. Here was the familiar legend of Europa as painted on Grecian vases in the houses of Pompey, and in modern times by Titian, Rembrandt, Rubens, Veronese, and Claude Lorrain. The historian Herodotus, writing in the 5th century BC, was not impressed by the legend. In his view, the abduction of Europa was just an incident in the age-old wars over women-stealing. A band of Phoenicians from Tyre had carried off Io, daughter of the king of Argos, so a band of Greeks from Crete sailed over to Phoenicia and carried off the daughter of the king of Tyre. It was a case of tit for tit. The legend of Europa has many connotations, but in carrying the princess to Crete from the shore of Phoenicia, now South Lebanon, Zeus was surely transferring the fruits of the older Asian civilizations of the east to the new island colonies of the Aegean. Phoenicia belonged to the orbit of the pharaohs. Europa's ride provides the mythical link between ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. Europa's brother, Cadmus, who roamed the world in search of her, Orbe Pererato, was credited with bringing the art of writing to Greece. Europa's ride also captures the essential restlessness of those who followed in her footsteps. Unlike the great river valley civilizations of the Nile, of the Indus, of Mesopotamia, and of China, which were long in duration but lethargic in their geographical and intellectual development, the civilization of the Mediterranean Sea was stimulated by constant movement. Movement caused uncertainty and insecurity. Uncertainty fed a constant ferment of ideas. Insecurity prompted energetic activity. Minos was famed for his ships. Crete was the first naval power. The ships carried people and goods and culture, fostering exchanges of all kinds with the lands to which they sailed. Like the vestments of Europa, the minds of those ancient mariners were constantly left 
fluttering in the breeze, tremulae sinuantur flamine vestis. Europa rode in the path of the sun from east to west. According to another legend, the sun was a chariot of fire, pulled by unseen horses from their secret stables behind the sunrise to their resting place beyond the sunset. Indeed, one of several possible etymologies contrasts Asia, the land of the sunrise, with Europa, the land of the sunset. The Hellenes came to use Europe as a name for their territory to the west of the Aegean, as distinct from the older lands in Asia Minor. At the dawn of European history, the known world lay to the east. The unknown waited in the west, in destinations still to be discovered. Europa's curiosity may have been her undoing, but it led to the founding of a new civilization that would eventually bear her name and would spread to the whole peninsula. Introduction History Today History can be written at any magnification. One can write the history of the universe on a single page, or the life cycle of a mayfly in forty volumes. A very senior and distinguished historian, who specializes in the diplomacy of the 1930s, once wrote a book on the Munich crisis and its consequences, a second book on the last week of peace, and a third entitled 31st of August, 1939. His colleagues waited in vain for a crowning volume to be called One Minute to Midnight. It is an example of the modern compulsion to know more and more about less and less. The history of Europe, too, can be written at any degree of magnitude. The French series L'Evolution de l'Humanité, whose content was over 90% European, was planned after the First World War with 110 main volumes and several supplementary ones. The present work, in contrast, has been commissioned to compress the same material and more between two covers. Yet no historian can compete with the poets for economy of thought. If Europe is a nymph, then Naples is her bright blue eye, and Warsaw is her heart. Sebastopol and Azov, Petersburg, Mitau, Odessa, these are the thorns in her feet. Paris is the head, London the starched collar, and Rome the scapulary. For some reason, whilst historical monographs have become ever narrower in scope, general surveys have settled down to a conventional magnification of several hundred pages per century. The Cambridge Medieval History, for example, covers the period from Constantine to Thomas More in eight volumes. The German Handbuch der Europäischen Geschichte covers the twelve centuries from Charlemagne to the Greek colonels in seven similarly weighty tomes. It is common practice to give greater coverage to the contemporary than to the ancient or the medieval periods. For English listeners, a pioneering collection such as Rivington's eight-volume Periods of European History moved from the distant to the recent with ever-increasing magnification. 442 years at the rate of 1.16 years per page for Charles Oman's Dark Ages, 476 to 918, 104 years at 4.57 pages per year for A. H. Johnson's Europe in the 16th Century, 84 years at 6.59 pages per year for W. Allison Phillips's Modern Europe, 1815 to 99. More recent collections follow the same pattern. Most listeners are most interested in the history of their own times, but not all historians are willing to indulge them. Current affairs cannot become history until half a century has elapsed, runs one opinion, until documents have become available and hindsight has cleared men's minds. It is a valid point of view, but it means that any general survey must break off at the point where it starts to be most interesting. Contemporary history is vulnerable to all sorts of political pressure, yet no educated adult can hope to function efficiently without some grounding in the origins of contemporary problems. Four hundred years ago, Sir Walter Raleigh, writing under sentence of death, understood the dangers perfectly. Whosoever in writing a modern history shall follow the truth too near the heels, he wrote, it may haply strike out his teeth. Given the complications, one should not be surprised to find that the subject matter of studies of Europe or of European civilization varies enormously. 
Successful attempts to survey the whole of European history without recourse to multiple volumes and multiple authors have been few and far between. H. A. L. Fisher's A History of Europe or Eugene Weber's A Modern History of Europe are among the rare exceptions. Both of these are extended essays on the dubious concept of Western civilization. Probably the most effective of grand surveys are those which have concentrated on one theme, such as Kenneth Clark's Civilization, which looked at Europe's past through the prism of art and painting, or Jacob Bronowski's The Ascent of Man, which made its approach through the history of science and technology. Both were the offshoots of opulent television productions. A more recent essay approached the subject from a materialistic standpoint, based on geology and economic resources. The value of multi-volume historical surveys is not in question, but they are condemned to remain works of reference, to be consulted, not read. Neither full-time history students nor general listeners are going to plough through 10, 20 or 110 volumes of general European synthesis before turning to the topics which attract them most. This is unfortunate. The framework of the whole sets parameters and assumptions which reappear without discussion in detailed works on the parts. In recent years, the urgency of reviewing the general framework of European history has grown in proportion to the fashion for highly specialised, high-magnification studies. A few distinguished exceptions, such as the work of Fernand Braudel, may serve to prove the rule. But many historians and students have been drawn into more and more about less and less, to the point where the wider perspectives are sometimes forgotten. Yet the humanities require all degrees of magnification. History needs to see the equivalent of the planets spinning in space, to zoom in and observe people at ground level, and to dig deep beneath their skins and their feet. The historian needs to use counterparts of the telescope, the microscope, the brain scanner, and the geological probe. It is beyond dispute that the study of history has been greatly enriched in recent years by new methods, new disciplines, and new fields. The advent of computers has opened up a whole range of quantitative investigations hitherto beyond the historian's reach. Historical research has greatly benefited from the use of techniques and concepts derived from the social and human sciences. A trend pioneered by the French Annales School from 1929 onwards has now won almost universal acclaim. New academic fields such as oral history, historical psychiatry or psychohistory, or family history or the history of manners are now well established. At the same time, a number of subjects reflecting contemporary concerns have been given a fresh historical dimension. Anti-racism, environment, gender, sex, semitism, class and peace are topics which occupy a sizable part of current writing and debate. Notwithstanding the overtones of political correctness, all serve to enrich the whole. Nonetheless, the multiplication of fields and the corresponding increase in learned publications have inevitably created severe strains. Professional historians despair of keeping up with the literature. They are tempted to plunge ever deeper into the alleyways of ultra-specialization and to lose the capacity of communicating with the general public. Much specialization has proceeded to the detriment of narrative history. Some specialists have worked on the assumption that the broad outlines need no revision, that the only route to new discovery lies in digging deep on a narrow front. Others, intent on the exploration of deep structures, have turned their backs on the surface of history altogether. They concentrate instead on the analysis of long-term underlying trends. Like some of their confreres in literary criticism, who hold the literal meaning of a text to be worthless, some historians have seen fit to abandon the study of conventional facts. They produce students who have no intention of learning what happened, how, where, and when. The decline of factual history has been accompanied, especially in the classroom, with the rise of empathy, that is, of exercises designed to stimulate the historical imagination. Imagination is undoubtedly a vital ingredient of historical study, but empathetic exercises can only be justified if accompanied by a modicum of knowledge. In a world where fictional literature is also under threat as a respectable source of historical information, 
Students are sometimes in danger of having nothing but their teacher's prejudices on which to build an awareness of the past. The divorce between history and literature has been particularly regrettable. When the structuralists in the humanities were overtaken in some parts of the profession by the deconstructionists, both historians and literary critics looked set not only to exclude all conventional knowledge, but also to exclude each other. Fortunately, as the wilder aspects of deconstructionism are deconstructed, there are hopes that these esoteric rifts can be healed. There is absolutely no reason why the judicious historian should not use literary texts critically assessed, or why literary critics should not use historical knowledge. It would now seem, therefore, that the specialists may have overplayed their hand. There has always been a fair division of labour between the industrious worker-bees of the historical profession and the queen-bees, the grands simplificateurs, who bring order to the labours of the hive. There will be no honey if the workers take over completely, nor can one accept that the broad outlines of general history have been fixed for all time. They too shift according to fashion, and those fixed fifty or one hundred years ago are ripe for revision. Equally, the study of the geological strata of history must never be divorced from doings on the ground. In the search for trends, societies, economies, or cultures, one should not lose sight of men, women, and children. Specialization has opened the door to unscrupulous political interests. Since no one is judged competent to offer an opinion beyond their own particular mineshaft, beasts of prey have been left to prowl across the prairie unchecked. The combination of solid documentary research harnessed to blatantly selective topics, which a priori exclude a full review of all relevant factors, is specially vicious. As A.J.P. Taylor is reputed to have said of one such work, it is 90% true and 100% useless. The prudent response to these developments is to argue for pluralism of interpretation and for safety in numbers that is, to encourage a wide variety of special views in order to counter the limitations of each and every one. One single viewpoint is risky, but fifty or sixty viewpoints, or three hundred, can together be counted on to construct a passable composite. There is no one truth, but as many truths as there are sensitivities. In Chapter 2, mention is made of Archimedes' famous solution of the problem of pi, that is, of calculating the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. Archimedes knew that the length of the circumference must lie somewhere between the sum of the sides of a square drawn outside the circle and the sum of the sides of a square drawn inside the circle. Unable to work it out directly, he hit on the idea of finding an approximation by adding up the length of a ninety-nine-sided polygon contained within the circle. The more sides he gave to his polygon, the nearer it would come to the shape of the circle. Similarly, one is tempted to think, the larger the number of sources of illumination, the smaller the gap will be between past reality and historians' attempts to reconstruct it. Elsewhere, the impossible task of the historian has been likened to that of a photographer whose static two-dimensional picture can never deliver an accurate representation of the mobile three-dimensional world. The historian, like the camera, always lies. If this simile were to be developed, one could say that photographers can greatly increase the verisimilitude of their work, where verisimilitude is the aim, by multiplying the number of pictures of the same subject. A large number of shots taken from different angles and with different lenses, filters, and films can collectively reduce the gross selectivity of the single shot. As movie makers discovered, a large number of frames taken in sequence creates a possible imitation of time and motion. By the same token, history in the round can only be reconstructed if the historian collates the results of the widest possible range of sources. The effect will never be perfect, but every different angle and every different technique contributes to the illumination of the parts which together make up the whole. Distortion is a necessary characteristic of all sources of information. Absolute objectivity is absolutely unattainable. Every technique has its strengths and its weaknesses. The important thing is to understand where the value and the distortions of each technique lie, and to arrive at a reasonable approximation. 
Critics who object to the historian's use of poetry or sociology or astrology or whatever on the grounds that such sources are subjective or partial or unscientific are stating the obvious. It is as though one could object to X-ray pictures of the skeleton or ultrasound scans of the womb on the grounds that they give a pretty poor image of the human face. Medical doctors use every known device for prying open the secrets of the human mind and body. Historians need a similar range of equipment for penetrating the mysteries of the past. Documentary history, which has enjoyed a long innings, is simultaneously one of the most valuable and the most risky lines of approach. Treated with incaution, it is open to gross forms of misrepresentation, and there are huge areas of past experience which it is incapable of recording. Yet no one can deny that historical documents remain one of the most fruitful veins of knowledge. Lord Acton, founder of the Cambridge School of History, once predicted a specially deleterious effect of documentary history. It tends to give priority to the amassing of evidence over the historian's interpretation of evidence. We live in a documentary age, Acton wrote some ninety years ago, which will tend to make history independent of historians to develop learning at the expense of writing. Generally speaking, historians have given more thought to their own debates than to the problems encountered by their long-suffering readers. The pursuit of scientific objectivity has done much to reduce earlier flights of fancy and to separate fact from fiction. At the same time, it has reduced the number of instruments which historians can use to transmit their discoveries. For it is not sufficient for the good historian merely to establish the facts and to muster the evidence. The other half of the task is to penetrate the reader's minds, to do battle with all the distorting perceptors with which every consumer of history is equipped. These perceptors include not only all five physical senses, but also a complex of preset intellectual circuits, varying from linguistic terminology, geographical names and symbolic codes, to political opinions, social conventions, emotional disposition, religious beliefs, visual memory, and traditional historical knowledge. Every consumer of history has a store of previous experience through which all incoming information about the past must be filtered. For this reason, effective historians must devote as much care to transmitting their information as to collecting and shaping it. In this part of their work, they share many of the same preoccupations as poets, writers, and artists. They must keep an eye on the work of all the others who help to mould and to transmit our impressions of the past, the art historians, the musicologists, the museologues, the archivists, the illustrators, the cartographers, the diarists and biographers, the sound recordists, the filmmakers, the historical novelists, even the purveyors of bottled medieval air. At every stage, the key quality, as first defined by Vico, is that of creative historical imagination. Without it, the work of the historian remains a dead letter, an unbroadcast message. In this supposedly scientific age, the imaginative side of the historical profession has undoubtedly been downgraded. The value of unreadable academic papers and of undigested research data is exaggerated. Imaginative historians, such as Thomas Carlyle, have not simply been censured for an excess of poetic license. They have been forgotten. Yet Carlyle's convictions on the relationship of history and poetry are at least worthy of consideration. It is important to check and to verify, as Carlyle sometimes failed to do. But telling it right is also important. All historians must tell their tale convincingly or be ignored. Postmodernism has been a pastime in recent years for all those who give precedence to the study of historians over the study of the past. It refers to a fashion which has followed in the steps of the two French gurus, Foucault and Derrida, and which has attacked both the accepted canon of historical knowledge and the principles of conventional methodology. In one line of approach, it has sought to demolish the value of documentary source materials in the way that literary deconstructionists have sought to dismantle the meaning of literary texts. Elsewhere, it has denounced the tyranny of facts and the authoritarian ideologies which are thought to lurk behind every body of information. At the extreme, 
it holds that all statements about past reality are coercive, and the purveyors of that coercion include all historians who argue for a commitment to human values. In the eyes of its critics, it has reduced history to the pleasure of the historian, and it has become an instrument for politicized radicals with an agenda of their own. In its contempt for prescribed data, it hints that knowing something is more dangerous than knowing nothing. Yet the phenomenon has raised more problems than it solves. Its enthusiasts can only be likened to those lugubrious academics who, instead of telling jokes, write learned tomes on the analysis of humour. One also wonders whether conventional liberal historiography can properly be defined as modernist, and whether postmodernist ought not to be reserved for those who are trying to strike a balance between the old and the new. It is all very well to deride the authority of all and sundry, but it only leads in the end to the deriding of Derrida. It is only a matter of time before the deconstructionists are deconstructed by their own techniques. We have survived the death of God and the death of man. We will surely survive the death of history and the death of postmodernism. But to return to the question of magnification, any narrative which chronicles the march of history over long periods is bound to be differently designed from the panorama which coordinates all the features relevant to a particular stage or moment. The former, chronological approach, has to emphasize innovative events and movements which, though untypical at the time of their first appearance, will gain prominence at a later date. The latter synchronic approach has to combine both the innovative and the traditional and their interactions. The first risks anachronism, the second immobility. Early modern Europe has served as one of the laboratories for these problems. Once dominated by historians exploring the roots of humanism, Protestantism, capitalism, science, and the nation-state, it then attracted the attention of specialists who showed, quite correctly, how elements of the medieval and pagan worlds had survived and thrived. The comprehensive historian must somehow strike a balance between the two. In describing the 16th century, for example, it is as misguided to write exclusively about witches, alchemists and fairies as it once was to write almost exclusively about Luther, Copernicus or the rise of the English Parliament. Comprehensive history must take note of the specialists' debate but it must equally find a way to rise above their passing concerns. Concepts of Europe Europe is a relatively modern idea. It gradually replaced the earlier concept of Christendom in a complex intellectual process lasting from the 14th to the 18th centuries. The decisive period, however, was reached in the decades on either side of 1700 after generations of religious conflict. In that early phase of the Enlightenment, it became an embarrassment for the divided community of nations to be reminded of their common Christian identity, and Europe filled the need for a designation with more neutral connotations. In the West, the wars against Louis XIV inspired a number of publicists who appealed for common action to settle the divisions of the day. The much-imprisoned Quaker William Penn, son of an Anglo-Dutch marriage and founder of Pennsylvania, had the distinction of advocating both universal toleration and a European Parliament. The dissident French abbé Charles Castel de Saint-Pierre, author of Projet d'une paix perpétuelle, called for a confederation of European powers to guarantee a lasting peace. In the East, the emergence of the Russian Empire under Peter the Great required radical rethinking of the international framework. The Treaty of Utrecht of 1713 provided the last major occasion when public reference to the Respublica Christiana, the Christian Commonwealth, was made. After that, the awareness of a European as opposed to a Christian community gained the upper hand. Writing in 1751, Voltaire described Europe as a kind of great republic divided into several states, some monarchical, the others mixed, but all corresponding with one another. They all have the same religious foundation, even if divided into several confessions. They all have the same principle of public law and politics, unknown in other parts of the world. Twenty years later, Rousseau announced, There are no longer Frenchmen, Germans and Spaniards, or even English, but only Europeans. 
according to one judgment, the final realization of the idea of Europe, took place in 1796, when Edmund Burke wrote, No European can be a complete exile in any part of Europe. Even so, the geographical, cultural, and political parameters of the European community have always remained open to debate. In 1794, when William Blake published one of his most unintelligible poems entitled Europe, a Prophecy, he illustrated it with a picture of the Almighty leaning out of the heavens and holding a pair of compasses. Most of Europe's outline is determined by its extensive sea coasts, but the delineation of its land frontier was long in the making. The dividing line between Europe and Asia had been fixed by the ancients from the Hellespont to the River Don, and it was still there in medieval times. A 14th century encyclopedist could produce a fairly precise definition. Europe is said to be a third of the whole world, and has its name from Europa, daughter of Agino, king of Libya. Jupiter ravished this Europa and brought her to Crete, and called most of the land after her Europa. Europe begins on the river Tane, Don, and stretches along the northern ocean to the end of Spain. The east and south part rises from the sea called Pontus, Black Sea, and is all joined to the Great Sea, the Mediterranean, and ends at the islands of Cadiz, Gibraltar. Pope Pius II, Enea Piccolomini, began his early Treatise on the State of Europe with a description of Hungary, Transylvania, and Thrace, which at that juncture were under threat from the Turks. Neither the ancients nor the medievals had any close knowledge of the easterly reaches of the European plain, several sections of which were not permanently settled until the 18th century. So it was not until 1730 that a Swedish officer in the Russian service called Stralenberg suggested that Europe's boundary should be pushed back from the Don to the Ural Mountains and the Ural River. Sometime in the late 18th century, the Russian government erected a boundary post on the trail between Yekaterinburg and Tumen to mark the frontier of Europe and Asia. From then on, the gangs of Tsarist exiles, who were marched to Siberia in irons, created the custom of kneeling by the post and of scooping up a last handful of European earth. There is no other boundary post in the whole world, wrote one observer, which has seen so many broken hearts. By 1833, when Volga's Handbuch der Geographie was published, the idea of Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals had gained general acceptance. Nonetheless, there is nothing sacred about the reigning convention. The extension of Europe to the Urals was accepted as a result of the rise of the Russian Empire. But it has been widely criticized, especially by analytical geographers. The frontier on the Urals had little validity in the eyes of Halford Mackinder, of Arnold Toynbee, for whom environmental factors had primary, or of the Swiss geographer J. Reynold, who wrote that Russia is the geographical antithesis of Europe. The decline of Russian power could well invoke a revision, in which case the views of a Russian-born Oxford professor about a tidal Europe, whose frontiers ebb and flow, would be borne out. Geographical Europe has always had to compete with notions of Europe as a cultural community, and in the absence of common political structures, European civilization could only be defined by cultural criteria. Special emphasis is usually placed on the seminal role of Christianity, a role which did not cease when the label of Christendom was dropped. Broadcasting to a defeated Germany in 1945, the poet T.S. Eliot expounded the view that European civilization stands in mortal peril after repeated dilutions of the Christian core. He described the closing of Europe's mental frontiers that had occurred during the years which had seen the nation-states assert themselves to the full. A kind of cultural autarky followed inevitably on political and economic autarky, he said. He stressed the organic nature of culture. Culture is something that must grow. You cannot build a tree. You can only plant it and care for it and wait for it to mature. He stresses the interdependence of the numerous subcultures within the European family. What he called cultural trade was the organism's lifeblood and he stressed the special duty of men of letters. Above all, he stressed the centrality of the Christian tradition, which subsumes within itself the legacy of Greece, of Rome, and of Israel. 
the dominant feature in creating a common culture between peoples, each of which has its own distinct culture, is religion. I am talking about the common tradition of Christianity which has made Europe what it is, and about the common cultural elements which this common Christianity has brought with it. It is in Christianity that our arts have developed. It is in Christianity that the laws of Europe, until recently, have been rooted. It is against a background of Christianity that all our thought has significance. An individual European may not believe that the Christian faith is true, and yet what he says and makes and does will all depend on the Christian heritage for its meaning. Only a Christian culture could have produced a Voltaire or a Nietzsche. I do not believe that the culture of Europe could survive the complete disappearance of the Christian faith. This concept is, in all senses, the traditional one. It is the yardstick of all other variants, breakaways, and bright ideas on the subject. It is the starting point of what Madame de Stahl once called Pensée à l'Européenne. For cultural historians of Europe, the most fundamental of tasks is to identify the many competing strands within the Christian tradition and to gauge their weight in relation to various non-Christian and anti-Christian elements. Pluralism is de rigueur. Despite the apparent supremacy of Christian belief right up to the mid-twentieth century, it is impossible to deny that many of the most fruitful stimuli of modern times, from the Renaissance passion for antiquity to the Romantic's obsession with nature, were essentially pagan in character. Similarly, it is hard to argue that the contemporary cults of modernism, eroticism, economics, sport or pop culture have much to do with the Christian heritage. The main problem nowadays is to decide whether the centrifugal forces of the 20th century have reduced that heritage to a meaningless jumble or not. Few analysts would now maintain that anything resembling a European cultural monolith has ever existed. One interesting solution is to see Europe's cultural legacy as composed of four or five overlapping and interlocking circles. According to the novelist Alberto Moravia, Europe's unique cultural identity is a reversible fabric, one side variegated, the other a single colour, rich and deep. It would be wrong to suppose, however, that Europe was devoid of political content. On the contrary, it has often been taken as a synonym for the harmony and unity which was lacking. Europe has been the unattainable ideal, the goal for which all good Europeans are supposed to strive. This messianic or utopian view of Europe can be observed as far back as the discussion which preceded the Treaty of Westphalia. It was loudly invoked in the propaganda of William of Orange and his allies, who organized the coalitions against Louis XIV, as in those who opposed Napoleon. Europe, said Tsar Alexander I, is us. It was present in the rhetoric of the balance of power in the 18th century, and of the concert in the 19th. It was an essential feature of the peaceful age of imperialism which, until shattered by the Great War of 1914, saw Europe as the home base of worldwide dominion. In the 20th century, the European ideal has been revived by politicians determined to heal the wounds of two world wars. In the 1920s, after the First World War, when it could be propagated in all parts of the continent outside the Soviet Union, it found expression in the League of Nations, and particularly in the work of Aristide Briand. It was specially attractive to the new states of Eastern Europe, who were not encumbered by extra-European empires and who sought communal protection against the great powers. In the late 1940s, after the creation of the Iron Curtain, it was appropriated by people who were intent on building a little Europe in the West, who imagined their construction as a series of concentric circles focused on France and Germany but it equally served as a beacon of hope for others cut off by oppressive communist rule in the East. The collapse of the Soviet Empire in 1989-91 to offered the first glimpses of a pan-European community that could aspire to spread to all parts of the continent. Yet the frailty of the European ideal has been recognised both by its opponents and by its advocates. In 1876, Bismarck dismissed Europe, as Metternich had once dismissed Italy as a geographical notion. Seventy years later, Jean Monnet, the father of Europe, saw the force of Bismarck's disdain. Europe has never existed, he admitted. One has genuinely to create Europe. 
For more than 500 years, the cardinal problem in defining Europe has centered on the inclusion or exclusion of Russia. Throughout modern history, an orthodox, autocratic, economically backward but expanding Russia has been a bad fit. Russia's Western neighbors have often sought reasons for excluding her. Russians themselves have never been sure whether they wanted to be in or out. In 1517, for example, the rector of the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Marci Mihovita, published a geographical treatise which upheld the traditional Ptolemaean distinction between Sarmatia Europea, European Sarmatia, and Sarmatia Asiatica, Asian Sarmatia, with the boundary on the Don. So Poland-Lithuania was in, and Russian Muscovy was out. Three centuries later, things were not so clear. Poland-Lithuania had just been dismembered, and Russia's frontier had shifted dramatically westwards. When the Frenchman Louis-Philippe de Ségur passed by on the eve of the French Revolution, he was in no doubt that Poland no longer lay in Europe. En quoi sortir entièrement de l'Europe, he wrote after entering Poland. Tout ferait penser qu'on a reculé de dix siècles. One believes oneself to be leaving Europe completely. Everything might give the impression of retreating ten centuries in time. By using economic advancement as the main criterion for European membership, he was absolutely up to date. Yet this was exactly the era when the Russian government was insisting on its European credentials. Notwithstanding the fact that her territory stretched in unbroken line through Asia to North America, the Empress Catherine categorically announced in 1767 that Russia is a European state. Everyone who wished to do business with St. Petersburg took note. After all, Muscovy had been an integral part of Christendom since the 10th century, and the Russian Empire was a valued member of the diplomatic round. Fears of the bear did not prevent the growth of a general consensus regarding Russia's membership of Europe. This was greatly strengthened in the 19th century by Russia's role in the defeat of Napoleon and by the magnificent flowering of Russian culture in the age of Tolstoy, Tchaikovsky and Chekhov. Russian intellectuals, divided between westernizers and Slavophiles, were uncertain about the degree of Russia's Europeanness. In Russia and Europe, the Slavophile Nikolai Danilevsky argued that Russia possessed a distinctive Slavic civilization of its own, midway between Europe and Asia. Dostoevsky, in contrast, speaking at the unveiling of a statue to the poet Pushkin, chose to launch into a eulogy of Europe. Peoples of Europe, he declared, they don't know how dear to us they are. Only the small group of Vastochniki, or Orientals, held that Russia was entirely un-European, having most in common with China. After 1917, the conduct of the Bolsheviks revived many of the old doubts and ambiguities. The Bolsheviks were widely regarded abroad as barbarians, in Churchill's words, a baboonery a gang of wild Asiatics sowing death and destruction like Attila or Genghis Khan. In Soviet Russia itself, the Marxist revolutionaries were often denounced as a Western implant, dominated by Jews, backed by Western money, and manipulated by German intelligence. At the same time, a strong line of official opinion held that the revolution had severed all links with decadent Europe. Many Russians felt humiliated by their isolation, and boasted that a revitalized Russia would soon overwhelm the faithless West. Early in 1918, the leading Russian poet of the revolutionary years wrote a defiant poem entitled The Scythians. Your millions, we are hosts and hosts and hosts. Engage with us and prove our seed. We're Scythians and Asians too, from coasts that breed squint eyes, bespeaking greed. Russia's a sphinx, Triumphant though in pain, she bathes her limbs in blood's dark stream. Her eyes gaze on you, gaze and gaze again, with hate and love in a single beam. Old world, once more awake, your brother's plight to toil and peace a feast of fire. Once more, come join your brother's festal light, obey the call of Barbary's lyre. Not for the first time, the Russians were torn in two directions at once. As for the Bolshevik leadership, Lenin and his circle identified closely with Europe. They saw themselves as heirs to a tradition launched by the French Revolution, 
They saw their immediate roots in the socialist movement in Germany, and they assumed that their strategy would be to join up with revolutions in the advanced capitalist countries of the West. In the early 1920s, Com in turn mooted the possibility of a communist-led United States of Europe. Only under Stalin, who killed all the old Bolsheviks, did the Soviet Union choose to distance itself spiritually from European affairs. In those same decades, an influential group of émigré Russian intellectuals, including Prince N. S. Trubetskoy, P. N. Savitsky, and G. Vernadsky, chose to re-emphasize the Asiatic factors within Russia's cultural mix. Known as Yevrazitsi, or Eurasians, they were fundamentally opposed to Bolshevism, whilst maintaining a sceptical stance to the virtues of Western Europe. Of course, 70 years of totalitarian Soviet rule built huge mental as well as physical curtains across Europe. The public face of the Soviet regime grew blatantly xenophobic, a posture greatly assisted by experiences during the Second World War and assiduously cultivated by the Stalinists. In their hearts, however, many individual Russians followed the great majority of non-Russians in the Soviet bloc in fostering a heightened sense of their European identity. It was a lifeline for their spiritual survival against communism. When the chains of communism melted away, it enabled them to greet, in Václav Havel's phrase, the return to Europe. Nonetheless, scepticism about Russia's European qualifications continued to circulate both inside and outside Russia. Russian nationalist opinion, which heartily dislikes and envies the West, supplied a rallying point for the Stalinist apparatus, which felt humiliated by the collapse of Soviet power and which wanted nothing more than to get its empire back. As the core of opposition to hopes for a post-communist democracy, the unholy alliance of Russian nationalists and unreformed communists could only look askance at Moscow's growing rapprochement with Washington and with Western Europe. For their part, Western leaders were most impressed by the need for stability. Having failed to find a lasting partnership with Gorbachev's humanized version of the USSR, they rushed headlong to shore up the Russian Federation. They responded sympathetically to Moscow's requests for economic aid and for association both with NATO and with the European community. But then some of them began to see the drawbacks. After all, the Russian Federation was not a cohesive nation-state, ripe for liberal democracy. It was still a multinational complex spanning Eurasia, still highly militarized, and still manifesting imperial reflexes about its security. It was not clearly committed to letting its neighbors follow their own road. Unless it could find ways of shedding the imperialist legacy, like all other ex-imperial states in Europe, it could not expect to be considered a suitable candidate for any European community. Such, at least, was the strong opinion of the doyen of the European Parliament, speaking in September 1993. Some commentators have insisted that Britain's European credentials are no less ambiguous than Russia's. From the Norman Conquest to the Hundred Years' War, the Kingdom of England was deeply embroiled in continental affairs. But for most of modern history, the English sought their fortunes elsewhere. Having subdued and absorbed their neighbours in the British Isles, they sailed away to create an empire overseas. Like the Russians, they were definitely Europeans, but with prime extra-European interests. They were, in fact, semi-detached. Their habit of looking on the continent, as if from a great distance, did not start to wane until their empire disappeared. What is more, the imperial experience had taught them to look on Europe in terms of great powers, mainly in the West, and small nations, mainly in the East, which did not really count. Among the sculptures surrounding the Albert Memorial in London is a group of figures symbolizing Europe. It consists of only four figures, Britain, Germany, France, and Italy. For all these reasons, Historians have often regarded Britain as a special case. The initiators of the first pan-European movement in the 1920s assumed that neither Britain nor Russia would join. In the meantime, a variety of attempts have been made to define Europe's cultural subdivisions. In the late 19th century, the concept of a German-dominated Mitteleuropa was launched to coincide with the political sphere of the central powers. In the interwar years, a domain called East-Central Europe was invented 
to coincide with the newly independent successor states, from Finland and Poland to Yugoslavia. This was revived again after 1945 as a convenient label for the similar set of nominally independent countries which were caught inside the Soviet bloc. By that time, the main division between a Western Europe, dominated by NATO and the EEC, and an Eastern Europe, dominated by Soviet communism, seemed to be set in stone. In the 1980s, a group of writers led by the Czech novelist Milan Kundera launched a new version of Central Europe to break down the reigning barriers. Here was yet another configuration, another true kingdom of the spirit. The heart of Europe is an attractive idea which possesses both geographical and emotional connotations. But it is peculiarly elusive. One author has placed it in Belgium, another in Poland, a third in Bohemia, a fourth in Hungary, and a fifth in the realm of German literature. Wherever it is, the British Prime Minister declared in 1991 that he intended to be there. For those who think that the heart lies in the dead centre, it is located either in the commune of Saint-Clément, the dead centre of the European community, or else at a point variously calculated to lie in the suburbs of Warsaw or in the depths of Lithuania, the dead centre of geographical Europe. During the 75 years when Europe was divided by the longest of its civil wars, the concept of European unity could only be kept alive by people of the widest cultural and historical horizons. Especially during the 40 years of the Cold War, it took the greatest intellectual courage and stamina to resist not only persistent nationalism, but also the parochial view of a Europe based exclusively on the prosperous West. Fortunately, a few individuals of the necessary stature did exist and have left their legacy in writings which will soon be sounding prophetic. One such person was Hugh Seaton Watson, elder son of the pioneer of East European studies in Britain, R. W. Seaton Watson. As a boy, he played at the knee of Thomas Masaryk. He spoke Serbo-Croat, Hungarian and Romanian as effortlessly as French, German and Italian. Born in London, where he became Professor of Russian History at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies. He usually described himself as a Scot. He never succumbed to the conventional wisdom of his day. He set out his testament on the concept of Europe in a paper published posthumously. His argument stressed three fundamental points. The need for a European ideal, the complementary role of the East and the West European nations, and the pluralism of Europe's cultural tradition. Each deserves a quotation of some length. Seton Watson's first thunderbolt was directed at the low horizons of those who expected European unity to be built on nothing more than the security interests of NATO or the economic interest of the EEC. Let us not underrate the need for a positive common cause, for something more exciting than the price of butter, more constructive than the allocation of defence contracts, a need for an European mystique. The second shaft was directed at those who sought to exclude the East Europeans in the name of Western civilization. The European cultural community includes the peoples living beyond Germany and Italy, something in no way annulled by the fact that they cannot today belong to an all-European economic or political community. Nowhere in the world is there so widespread a belief in the reality and the importance of a European cultural community as in the countries lying between the EEC and the Soviet Union. To these peoples, the idea of Europe is that a community of cultures to which the specific culture or subculture of each belongs. None of them can survive without Europe, or Europe without them. This is, of course, a myth, a sort of chemical compound of truth and fantasy. The absurdities of the fantasy need not obscure the truth. The third shaft was aimed at those who harbour a simplistic or monolithic view of European culture. The interweaving of the notions of Europe and of Christendom is a fact of history which even the most brilliant sophistry cannot undo. But it is no less true that there are strands in European culture that are not Christian. The Roman, the Hellenic, arguably the Persian, and in modern centuries the Jewish. Whether there is also a Muslim strand is more difficult to say. The conclusion defines the purpose and value of European culture. European culture is not an instrument of capitalism or socialism. 
it is not a monopoly possession of EEC bureaucrats or of anyone else. To owe allegiance to it is not to claim superiority over other cultures. The unity of European culture is simply the end product of 3,000 years of labor by our diverse ancestors. It is a heritage which we spurn at our peril, and of which it would be a crime to deprive younger and future generations. Rather, it is our task to preserve and renew it. Seton Watson was one of a select band of lonely runners who carried the torch of European unity through the long night of Europe's eclipse. He was one of the minority of Western scholars who bestrode the barriers between East and West and who saw Soviet communism for what it was. He died on the eve of the events which were to vindicate so many of his judgments. His intellectual legacy is the one which the present work is honoured to follow most closely. The writing of European history could not proceed until the concept of Europe had stabilised and the historian's art had assumed an analytical turn. But it was certainly well underway in the early decades of the 19th century. The earliest effective attempt at synthesis was by the French writer and statesman François Guizot. His Histoire de la Civilisation en Europe was based on lectures presented at the Sorbonne. Thanks to the problems of definition, most historians would agree that the subject matter of European history must concentrate on the shared experiences which are to be found in each of the great epochs of Europe's past. Most would also agree that it was in late antiquity that European history ceased to be an assortment of unrelated events within the given peninsula and began to take on the characteristics of a more coherent civilizational process. Central to this process was the merging of the classical and the barbarian worlds and the resultant assertion of a consciously Christian community. In other words, the founding of Christendom. Later on, all manner of schisms, rebellions, expansions, evolutions and fissiparities took place giving rise to the exceedingly diverse and pluralistic phenomenon which is Europe today. No two lists of the main constituents of European civilization would ever coincide. But many items have always featured prominently, from the roots of the Christian world in Greece, Rome and Judaism, to modern phenomena such as the Enlightenment, modernization, romanticism, nationalism, liberalism, imperialism, totalitarianism. Nor should one forget the sorry catalogue of wars, conflicts and persecutions that have dogged every stage of the tale. Perhaps the most apposite analogy is the musical one. European historians are not tracing the story of a simple libretto. They are out to recapture a complicated score, with all its cacophony of sounds and its own inimitable codes of communication. Europe has been likened to an orchestra. There are certain moments when certain of the instruments play a minor role, or even fall silent altogether. But the ensemble exists. There is much to be said also for the contention that Europe's musical language has provided one of the most universal strands of the European tradition. Nonetheless, since Europe has never been politically united, diversity has evidently provided one of its most enduring characteristics. Diversity can be observed in the great range of reactions to each of the shared experiences, there is lasting diversity in the national states and cultures which persist within European civilization as a whole. There is diversity in the varying rhythms of power and of decline. Guizot, the pioneer, was not alone in thinking of diversity as Europe's prime characteristic. Eurocentrism European history writing cannot be accused of Eurocentrism simply for focusing its attention on European affairs, that is, for keeping to the subject. Eurocentrism is a matter of attitude, not content. It refers to the traditional tendency of European authors to regard their civilization as superior and self-contained, and to neglect the need for taking non-European viewpoints into consideration. Nor is it surprising or regrettable to find that European history has mainly been written by Europeans and for Europeans. Everybody feels the urge to discover their roots. Unfortunately, European historians have frequently approached their subject as Narcissus approached the pool, looking only for a reflection of his own beauty. Guizot has had many imitators since he identified European civilization with the wishes of the Almighty. European civilization has entered into the eternal truth, into the plan of providence, he reflected. 
it progresses according to the intentions of God. For him, and for many like him, Europe was the promised land, and Europeans the chosen people. Many historians have continued in the same self-congratulatory vein, and have argued, often quite explicitly, that the European record provides a model for all other peoples to follow. Until recently, they paid scant regard to the interaction of European culture with that of its neighbours in Africa, India, or Islam. A prominent American scholar, writing in 1898, who traced European civilization primarily to the work of Teutonic tribes, took it as axiomatic that Europe was the universal model. The heirs of the ancient world were the Teutonic tribes, who gradually formed a new uniform civilization on the foundation of the classic, and in recent times this has begun to be worldwide, and to bring into close relationship and under common influences all the inhabitants of the earth. When Oxford University Press last dared to publish a one-volume history of Europe, the authors opened their preface with a similar choice sentiment. Although a number of grand civilizations have existed in various ages, it is the civilization of Europe which has made the deepest and widest impression, and which now, as developed on both sides of the Atlantic, sets the standard for all the peoples of the earth. This line of thought and mode of presentation has steadily been losing its attractions, especially for non-Europeans. Rudyard Kipling is sometimes regarded as a central figure of the Eurocentric tradition, even as an apologist for the civilizing mission of British colonial expansion. His famous Ballad of East and West was composed with India in mind. Oh, East is East, and West is West, and never the twain shall meet, till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat. But there is neither East nor West, border, breed, nor birth. When two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. Kipling shared little of the arrogance which was usually associated with the European attitudes of his day. He did not shrink from the phraseology of his day concerning our dominion over palm and pine, or the lesser breeds without the law. Yet he was strongly attracted to Indian culture, hence his wonderful jungle books, and he was a deeply religious and humble man. The tumult and the shouting dies, the captains and the kings depart, Still stands thine ancient sacrifice, an humble and a contrite heart. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. These words are a standing rebuke to anyone who would lump all Western imperialists into the same gang of arrogance. Opposition to Eurocentrism comes at present from four main sources. In North America, it has emerged from that part of the black community and their political sympathizers, who are rebelling against an educational system allegedly dominated by white supremacist values, in other words, by the glorification of European culture. It has found expression in the black Muslim movement and, in scholarship, in a variety of black studies, Afrology, directed against conventional American academia. In its most militant form, it aims to replace Eurocentrism with Afrocentricity, the belief in the centrality of Africans in postmodern history. This is based on the contention that European civilization has stolen the birthright of mankind and of Africans in particular. In the world of Islam, especially in Iran, similar opposition is mounted by religious fundamentalists who see the West as the domain of Satan. Elsewhere in the Third World, it is espoused by intellectuals, often of a Marxian complexion, who regard Eurocentric views as part and parcel of capitalist ideology. In Europe it is widespread, though not always well articulated, in a generation which, when they paused to think, have been thoroughly ashamed of many of their elders' attitudes. One way forward for historians will be to pay more attention to the interaction of European and non-European peoples, Another is to use non-European sources for the elucidation of European problems. A third is to insist on honest comparisons with Europe's neighbours, comparisons which in many aspects and instances will not be in Europe's favour. Above all, it is essential to modulate the tone. For the last hundred years the conduct of those Teutonic tribes and of other Europeans has not been much to boast of. In the end, like all human activities, 
the European record must be judged on its own merits. It cannot be fairly represented in a list of great books, which selects whatever is most genial and ignores the dross. It can be viewed with admiration or with disgust, or with a mixture of both. The opinion of one Frenchman strikes an optimistic note. After all, crime and Western history are not the same thing. Whatever the West has given to the world by far exceeds that which it has done against various societies and individuals. Not everyone would agree. Western Civilization For the best part of two hundred years, European history has frequently been confused with the heritage of Western civilization. Indeed, the impression has been created that everything Western is civilized, and that everything civilized is Western. By extension, or simply by default, anything vaguely Eastern or Oriental stands to be considered backward or inferior, and hence worthy of neglect. The workings of this syndrome have been ably exposed with regard to European attitudes towards Islam and the Arab world, that is, in the tradition of so-called Orientalism. But it is not difficult to demonstrate that it operates with equal force in relation to some of Europe's own regions, especially in the East. Generally speaking, Western civilization is not taken to extend to the whole of Europe, although it may be applied to distant parts of the globe far beyond Europe. Historians most given to thinking of themselves as from the West, notably from England, France, Germany, and North America, rarely see any necessity to describe Europe's past in its entirety. They see no more reason to consider the countries of Eastern Europe than to dwell on the more westerly parts of Western Europe. Any number of titles could be cited which masquerade as histories of Europe or of Christendom, but which are nothing of the sort. Any number of surveys of Western civilization confine themselves to topics which relate only to their chosen fragments of the peninsula. In many such works there is no Portugal, no Ireland, Scotland or Wales, and no Scandinavia, just as there is no Poland, no Hungary, no Bohemia, no Byzantium, no Balkans, no Baltic states, no Bielorussia or Ukraine, no Crimea or Caucasus. There is sometimes a Russia, and sometimes not. Whatever Western civilization is, therefore, it does not involve an honest attempt to summarize European history. Whatever the West is, it is not just a synonym for Western Europe. This is a very strange phenomenon. It seems to assume that historians of Europe can conduct themselves like the cheesemakers of Gruyere, whose product contains as many holes as cheese. Examples are legion, but three or four must suffice. A history of medieval Europe, written by a distinguished Oxford tutor, has long served as a standard introduction to the subject. Listeners of the preface may be surprised to learn, therefore, that the contents do not coincide with the title. In the hope of maintaining a continuity of theme, I have probably been guilty of oversimplifying things. The history of medieval Byzantium is so different from that of Western Europe in its whole tone and tenor that it seemed wiser not to attempt any systematic survey of it. In any case, I am not qualified to undertake such a survey. I have said nothing about the history of medieval Russia, which is remote from the themes which I have chosen to pursue, and I have probably said less than I should have done about Spain. The subject, in fact, is defined as Western Europe, Latin Christendom, the terms being more or less analogous. One might then think that all would be well if the book were to receive a title to match its contents, A History of Medieval Western Europe, or a history of Latin Christendom in the Middle Ages might seem appropriate. But then one finds that the text makes little attempt to address all the parts even of Latin Christendom. Neither Ireland nor Wales, for example, find mention. The realm of the Jagiellons in Poland and Lithuania, which in the latter part of the chosen period was absolutely the largest state in Latin Christendom, merits two passing references. One relates to the policies of the German Emperor Otto III, the other to the plight of the Teutonic Knights. The huge multinational kingdom of Hungary, which stretched from the Adriatic to Transylvania, gains much less attention than Byzantium and the Greeks, which the author has put a priori out of bounds. The book has many virtues, but like very many others, what it amounts to is a survey of selected themes from favoured sectors of one part of Europe. A highly influential 
Handbook to the History of Western Civilization, is organized within a similar strange framework. The largest of its three parts, European Civilization, approximately AD 900 to present, starts with the geographical setting of European Civilization and explains how the transitions from Oriental to Classical and from Classical to European Civilizations each time involved a shift to the periphery of the older society. The original homeland of European civilization is described in terms of a plain extending from the Pyrenees into Russia and separated from the Mediterranean lands by an irregular mountain barrier. But there is no attempt in subsequent chapters to map out the history of this homeland. The former lands of the Roman Empire came to be divided between three civilizations, Islam, Orthodox Christianity, and Latin Christianity. But no systematic treatment of this threefold division in Europe is forthcoming. One sentence is awarded to pagan Scandinavia, and none to any of the other pagan lands which were later Christianized. There is a small subsection on the peoples of Western Europe in early times, including unspecified Indo European tribesmen, but none on the peoples of Eastern Europe in any period. There are scattered references to Slavic or Slavic speaking peoples but no indication that they represented the largest of Europe's Indo-European groups. There are major chapters on Western Christendom 900 to 1500, but no chapter appears on Eastern Christendom. The paragraphs on the expansion of Europe refer either to German colonization or to ocean voyages outside Europe. Two sentences suddenly inform the reader that Western Christendom in the 14th century actually included Scandinavia, the Baltic States, Poland, Lithuania, and Hungary. But no further details are given. The largest of all the chapters, The Modern World, 1500 to Present, deals exclusively with themes shorn of their Eastern element until Russia, and Russia alone, appears ready-made under Peter the Great. From then on, Russia has apparently been a fully qualified member of the West. The author apologizes in advance for his arbitrary principles of ordering and selection. Unfortunately, he does not reveal what they are. The Great Books Scheme is another product of the same Chicago school. It purports to list the key authors and works that are essential for an understanding of Western civilization. It was invented at Columbia University in 1921, used from 1930 at Chicago, and became the model for university courses throughout America. No one would expect such a list to give exact parity to all the regions and cultures of Europe, but the prejudices and preferences are manifest. Of the 151 authors on the amended list, 49 are English or American, 27 French, 20 German, 15 Classical Greek, 9 Classical Latin, 6 Russian, 4 Scandinavian, 3 Spanish, 3 Early Italian, 3 Irish, 3 Scots, and 3 East Europeans. Political theorists often betray the same bias. It is very common, for example, to classify European nationalism in terms of two contrasting types, Eastern and Western. A prominent Oxford scholar who stressed the cultural roots of nationalism explained his version of the scheme. What I call Eastern nationalism has flourished among the Slavs as well as in Africa and Asia, and also in Latin America. I could not call it non-European, and have thought it best to call it Eastern because it first appeared to the east of Western Europe. He then elucidated his view of Western nationalism by reference to the Germans and the Italians, whom he took, by the time of the onset of nationalism in the late 18th century, to have been well-equipped culturally. They had languages adapted to the consciously progressive civilization to which they belonged. They had universities and schools imparting the skills prized in that civilization. They had philosophers, scientists, artists, and poets of world reputation. They had legal, medical, and other professions with high professional standards. To put themselves on a level with the English and the French, they had little need to equip themselves culturally by appropriating what was alien to them. Their most urgent need, so it seemed to them, was to acquire national states of their own. The case with the Slavs, and later with the Africans and the Asians, has been quite different.
it would be difficult to invent a more cockeyed comment on the geography and chronology of Europe's cultural history. The analysis of the Slavs, it turns out, is evidenced exclusively by points relating to Czechs, Slovaks, Slovenes, Serbs, and Croats. Nothing is said about the three largest Slav nations, the Russians, Ukrainians, and Poles, whose experiences flatly contradict the analysis. Who, what, and where, one wonders, did Professor Plamenitz imagine the Slavs to be? Is Eastern Europe inhabited only by Slavs? Did the Poles or the Czechs or the Serbs not feel an urgent need to acquire a state? Did not Polish develop as a language of government and of high culture before German did? Did the universities of Prague and Krakow belong to the East? Was Copernicus educated in Oxford? As it happens, there is much to be said for a typology of nationalism which is based on varying rates of cultural development and on the differing correlations of nationality and statehood. But there is nothing to be said for giving it the labels of Eastern and Western. If one does, one finds that the best candidate for a nationalism of the Eastern type is to be found in the far west of Western Europe, in Ireland. As everyone knows, the Irish are typical products of Eastern Europe. By questioning the framework within which European history and culture is so frequently discussed, therefore, one does not necessarily query the excellence of the material presented. The purpose is simply to inquire why the framework should be so strangely designed. If textbooks of human anatomy were designed with the same attention to structure, one would be contemplating a creature with one lobe to its brain, one eye, one arm, one lung, and one leg. The chronology of the subject is also instructive. The idea of the West is as old as the Greeks, who saw free Hellas as the antithesis of the Persian-ruled despotisms to the East. In modern times, it has been adopted by a long succession of political interests who wish to reinforce their identity and to dissociate themselves from their neighbours. As a result, Western civilization has been given layer upon layer of meanings and connotations that have accrued over the centuries. There are a dozen or so main variants. The Roman Empire, which stretched far beyond the European peninsula, nonetheless left a lasting impression on Europe's development. To this day, there is a clear distinction between those countries, such as France or Spain, which once formed an integral part of the empire, and those, such as Poland or Sweden, which the Romans never reached. In this context, the West came to be associated with those parts of Europe which can claim a share in the Roman legacy, as distinct from those which cannot. Christian civilization, whose main base settled down in Europe, was defined from the 7th century onwards by the religious frontier with Islam. Christendom was the West, Islam the East. The Catholic world was built on the divergent traditions of the Roman and the Greek churches, especially after the schism of 1054, and on the use of Latin as a universal language. In this version, the West was equivalent to Catholicism, where the frequent divorce of ecclesiastical and secular authority facilitated the rise of successive non-conformist movements, notably the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, and the Enlightenment. None of these key movements made an early impact on the Orthodox world. Protestantism gave Western civilization a new focus in the cluster of countries in Northern Europe, which broke away from Catholic control in the 16th century. The dramatic decline of major Catholic powers, such as Spain or Poland, was accompanied by the rise of the United Provinces, England, Sweden, and later Prussia, where naval or military preeminence was underpinned by economic and technological prowess. The French variant of Western civilization gained prominence in the 17th and 18th centuries. It found expression in the secular philosophy of the Enlightenment and in the ideals of the Revolution of 1789, both of which have had a lasting influence. The French language was adopted by the educated elites of Germany and Eastern Europe, making French still more universal than the earlier reign of Latin. The imperial variant of Western civilization was based on the unbounded self-confidence of the leading imperial powers during the long European peace prior to 1914. It was fired by a belief in the God-given right of the imperial races to rule over others and in their supposedly superior cultural, economic, and constitutional development. 
Germany, England and France were the clear leaders, whose prejudices could be impressed on the rest. Other major empire builders, such as Portugal or the Netherlands, were minor players within Europe. Russia and Austria were impressive imperial powers, but fell short on other qualifications. For the rich imperial club in the West was marked by its advanced industrial economies and sophisticated systems of administration, the East by peasant societies, stateless nations, and raw autocracy. The Marxist variant was a mirror image of the imperial one. Marx and Engels accepted the premise that the imperialist countries of Western Europe had reached a superior level of development, but they believed that the precocity of the West would result in early decadence and revolution. Their opinions carried little weight in their own day, but for a time gained greatly in importance, thanks to the unexpected adoption of Marxism-Leninism as the official ideology of the Soviet Empire. The first German variant of Western civilization was encouraged by the onset of the First World War. It was predicated on German control of Mitteleuropa, Central Europe, especially Austria, on hopes for the military defeat of France and Russia, and on future greatness to be shared with the Anglo-Saxon powers. Its advocates harboured no doubts about Germany's civilising mission in Eastern Europe, whilst their rivalry with France and their rejection of liberalism and the ideas of 1789 led to a distinction between Abendlich, Occidental, and Westlich, Western, civilization. The political formulation of the scheme was most closely associated with Friedrich Naumann. Its demise was assured by Germany's defeat in 1918 and was mourned in Spengler's Der Untergang des Abendlandes. In the sphere of secular culture, the ethos of Mitteleuropa owed much to the influence of a strong Jewish element, which had turned its back on the East and whose assimilation into German life and language coincided with the peak of Germany's imperial ambitions. The WASP variant of Western civilization, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, the dominant social and cultural group during the formative years of US history, came to fruition through the common interests of the USA and the British Empire, as revealed during the First World War. It was predicated on the Anglophile tendencies of America's then elite, on the shared traditions of Protestantism, parliamentary government and the common law, on opposition to German hegemony in Europe, on the prospect of a special strategic partnership, and on the primacy of the English language, which was now set to become the principal means of international communication. Despite American contempt for the traditional forms of imperialism, it assumed that the USA was the equal of Europe's imperial powers. Its most obvious cultural monuments are to be found in the Great Books Scheme and in the takeover of the Encyclopaedia Britannica. Its strategic implications were formulated, among others, by the father of geopolitics, Sir Halford Mackinder, and found early expression in the Washington Conference of 1922. It was revived at full strength after the USA's return to Europe in 1941 and the sealing of the Grand Alliance. It was global in scope and mid-Atlantic in focus. It inevitably faded after the collapse of the British Empire and the rise of American interest in the Pacific. But it left Britain with a special relationship that helped NATO and hindered European unification, and it inspired a characteristic allied scheme of history which has held sway for the rest of the 20th century. The second German variant, as conceived by the Nazis, revived many features of the first, but added some of its own. To the original military and strategic considerations, it added Aryan racism, greater German nationalism, pagan mythology, and anti-Bolshevism. It underlay Germany's second bid for supremacy in Europe, which began in 1933 and ended in the ruins of 1945. It specifically excluded the Jews. The American variant of Western civilization coalesced after the Second World War around a constellation of countries which accepted the leadership of the USA and which paid court to American ideas of democracy and capitalism. It grew from the older Anglo-Saxon variant but has outgrown its European origins. It is no longer dependent either on WASP supremacy in American society or on Britain's pivotal role as America's agent in Europe. Indeed, its centre of gravity soon moved from the Mid-Atlantic to the Pacific Rim. 
In addition to NATO members in Western Europe, it is supported by countries as Western, as Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, South Africa, and Israel, even Egypt, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. Through 40 years of the Cold War, it was fired by perceptions of the worldwide threat of communism. One wonders how long it can continue to call itself the West. The Euro variant of Western civilization emerged in the late 1940s amidst efforts to forge a new West European community. It was predicated on the existence of the Iron Curtain, on Franco-German reconciliation, on the rejection of overseas empires, on the material prosperity of the EEC, and on the desire to limit the influence of the Anglo-Saxons. It looked back to Charlemagne and forward to a federal Europe united under the leadership of its founding members. So long as the community confined its principal activities to the economic sphere, it was not incompatible with the Americans' alternative vision of the West or with American-led NATO, which provided its defence. But the accession of the United Kingdom, the collapse of the Iron Curtain, plans for closer political and monetary union, and the prospect of membership spreading eastwards, all combined to cause a profound crisis both of identity and of intent. From all these examples, it appears that Western civilization is essentially an amalgam of intellectual constructs which were designed to further the interests of their authors. It is the product of complex exercises in ideology, of countless identity trips, of sophisticated essays in cultural propaganda. It can be defined by its advocates in almost any way that they think fit. Its elastic geography has been inspired by the distribution of religions, by the demands of liberalism and of imperialism, by the unequal progress of modernization, by the divisive effects of world wars and of the Russian Revolution, and by the self-centered visions of French philosophes, of Prussian historians, and of British and American statesmen and educators, all of whom have had their reasons to neglect or to despise the East. In its latest phase, it has been immensely strengthened by the physical division of Europe, which lasted from 1947 to 8 to 1991. On the brink of the 21st century, one is entitled to ask in whose interests it may be used in the future. A set of assumptions recurs time and again. The first maintains that West and East, however defined, have little or nothing in common. The second implies that the division of Europe is justified by natural, unbridgeable differences. The third, that the West is superior. The fourth, that the West alone deserves the name of Europe. The geographical assumptions are abetted by selective constructs of a more overtly political nature. Every variant of Western civilization is taken to have an important core and a less important periphery. Great powers can always command attention. Failing powers, lesser states, stateless nations, minor cultures, weak economies do not have to be considered even if they occupy a large part of the overall scene. Four mechanisms have been employed to achieve the necessary effect. By a process of reduction, one can compress European history into a tale which illustrates the origins of themes most relevant to present concerns. By elimination, one can remove all contradictory material. By anachronism, one can present the facts in categories which suggest that present groupings are permanent fixtures of the historical scene. By the emphases and enthusiasms of language, one can indicate what is to be praised and what deplored. These are the normal mechanisms of propaganda. They devalue the diversity and the shifting patterns of European history. They rule out interpretations suggested by the full historical record, and they turn their unwitting readers into a mutual admiration society. Anachronism is particularly insidious. By taking transient contemporary divisions, such as the Iron Curtain, as a standing definition of West or East, one is bound to distort any description of Europe in earlier periods. Poland is neatly excised from the Renaissance, Hungary from the Reformation, Bohemia from industrialization, Greece from the Ottoman experience. More seriously, one deprives a large part of Europe of its true historical personality with immeasurable consequences in the miscalculations of diplomats, business people, and academics. As for the products of European history, which the propagandists of Western civilization are most eager to emphasize, everyone's list would vary. 
In the late 20th century, many would like to point to religious toleration, human rights, democratic government, the rule of law, the scientific tradition, social modernization, cultural pluralism, a free market economy, and the supreme Christian virtues such as compassion, charity, and respect for the individual. How far these things are truly representative of Europe's past is a matter for debate. It would not be difficult to draw up a matching list which starts with religious persecution and ends with totalitarian contempt for human life. If mainstream claims to European supremacy have undoubtedly come out of the West, it should not be forgotten that there has been no shortage of counterclaims from the East. Just as Germany once reacted against the French Enlightenment, so the Orthodox Church, the Russian Empire, the Pan-Slav movement, and the Soviet Union have all reacted against the more powerful West, producing theories which claim the truth and future for themselves. They have repeatedly maintained that, although the West may well be rich and powerful, the East is free from moral and ideological corruption. In the final years of communist rule in Eastern Europe, dissident intellectuals produced their own variation on this theme. They drew a fundamental distinction between the political regimes of the Soviet bloc and the convictions of the people. They felt themselves less infected by the mindless materialism of the West and argued that communist oppression had strengthened their attachment to Europe's traditional culture. They looked forward to a time when, in a reunited Europe, they could trade their Europeanness for Western food and technology. Here was yet another exercise in wishful thinking. In determining the difference between Western civilization and European history, it is no easy task to sift reality from illusion. Having discovered where the distortions of Western civilization come from, the historian has to put something in their place. The answer would seem to lie in the goal of comprehensiveness, that is, to write of Europe north, east, west, and south, to keep all aspects of human life in mind, to describe the admirable, the deplorable, and the banal. Nonetheless, no historian could deny that there are many real and important lines on the map which have helped to divide Europe into West and East. Probably the most durable is the line between Catholic, Latin, Christianity, and Orthodox, Greek, Christianity. It has been in place since the earliest centuries of our era. As shown by events during the collapse of Yugoslavia, it could still be a powerful factor in the affairs of the 1990s. But there are many others. There is the line of the Roman limes, dividing Europe into one area with a Roman past and another area without it. There is the line between the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. In more modern times, there is the Ottoman line, which marked off the Balkan lands which lived for centuries under Muslim rule. Most recently, until 1989, there was the Iron Curtain. Less certainly, social scientists invent divisions based on the criteria of their own disciplines. Economic historians, for example, see a line separating the industrialized countries of the West from the peasant societies of the East. Historical anthropologists have identified a Leningrad-Trieste line, which supposedly separates the zone of nuclear families from that of the extended family. Legal historians trace a line separating the lands which adopted forms of Roman law and those which did not. Constitutional historians emphasize the line dividing countries with a liberal democratic tradition from those without. As mentioned before, political scientists have found a line dividing Western and non-Western forms of nationalism. All these lines, real and imagined, have profoundly affected the framework within which European history has been conceived and written. Their influence is so strong that some commentators can talk disparagingly of a white Europe in the West and a black Europe in the East. The division of Europe into two opposing halves, therefore, is not entirely fanciful. Yet one has to insist that the West-East division has never been fixed or permanent. Moreover, it rides roughshod over many other lines of division of equal importance. It ignores serious differences both within the West and within the East, and it ignores the strong and historic division between North and South. Any competent historian or geographer taking the full range of factors into consideration 
can only conclude that Europe should be divided not into two regions, but into five or six. Similarly, no competent historian is going to deny that Europe, in its various guises, has always possessed a central core and a series of expanding peripheries. European peoples have migrated far and wide, and one could argue in a very real sense that Europe's periphery lies along a line joining San Francisco with Buenos Aires, Cape Town, Sydney and Vladivostok. Yet, once again, there can be no simple definition of what the core consists of. Different disciplines give different analyses. They have based their findings on the geographical peninsula of Europe, on the ethnic heritage of the European branch of the Indo-European peoples, on the cultural legacy of Christendom, on the political community which grew from the concert of Europe, or, in the hands of the economists, on the growth of a world economy. For the purposes of comprehensive treatment, however, the important thing about all these definitions is that each and every one contains a variety of regional aspects. Wherever or whatever the core is taken to be, it is linked to the Ebro, the Danube and the Volga, as well as the Rhone and the Rhine, to the Baltic and the Black Seas, as well as the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, to the Balts and the Slavs, as well as the Germanics and the Celts, to the Greeks, as well as the Latins, to the peasantry, as well as the proletariat. Despite their differences, all the regions of Europe hold a very great deal in common. They are inhabited by peoples of predominantly Indo-European culture and related kin. They are co-heirs of Christendom. They are connected by every sort of political, economic and cultural overlap and interaction. Despite their own antagonisms, they share fears and anxieties about influences from outside, whether from America, from Africa or from Asia. Their fundamental unities are no less obvious than their manifest diversity. Western supremacy is one of those dogmas which holds good at some points in European history and not at others. It does not apply in the earlier centuries when, for example, Byzantium was far more advanced than the Empire of Charlemagne, which explains why Byzantium is often passed over. It has applied in many domains in recent times when the West has clearly been richer and more powerful than the East. Yet, as many would argue, the criminal conduct of Westerners in the 20th century has destroyed the moral basis to all former claims. The title of Europe, like the earlier label of Christendom, therefore, can hardly be arrogated by one of its several regions. Eastern Europe is no less European for being poor or undeveloped or ruled by tyrants. In many ways, thanks to its deprivations, it has become more European, more attached to the values which affluent Westerners can take for granted. Nor can Eastern Europe be rejected because it is different. All European countries are different. All West European countries are different. And there are important similarities which span the divide. A country like Poland might be very different from Germany or from Britain, but the Polish experience is much closer to that of Ireland or of Spain than many West European countries are to each other. A country like Greece, which some people thought to be Western by virtue of Homer and Aristotle, was admitted to the European community. But its formative experiences in modern times were in the Orthodox world under Ottoman rule. They were considerably more distant from those of Western Europe than several countries who found themselves on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. The really vicious quality shared by almost all accounts of Western civilization lies in the fact that they present idealized and hence essentially false pictures of past reality. They extract everything that might be judged genial or impressive, and they filter out anything that might appear mundane or repulsive. It is bad enough that they attribute all the positive things to the West and denigrate the East, but they do not even give an honest account of the West. Judging from some of the textbooks, one gets the distinct impression that everyone in the West was a genius, a philosopher, a pioneer, a democrat or a saint, that it was a world inhabited exclusively by Plato's and Marie Curie's. Such hagiography is no longer credible. The established canon of European culture is desperately in need of revision. Overblown talk about Western civilization threatens to render the European legacy, which has much to be said in its favor, disreputable. In the United States, the debate about Western civilization has centered on the changing requirements of American education. 
In recent years, it seems to have been driven by the needs of a multi-ethnic and multicultural society, and by concern for Americans whose origins lie neither in Europe nor in Europe's Christian-based culture. Generally speaking, it has not re-examined the picture of the European heritage as marketed by the likes of the Great Books Scheme, and it has not been disturbed by demands from Americans of European descent for a fairer introduction to Europe. Where courses on Western civilization have been abandoned, they have been rejected for their alleged Eurocentrism, not for their limited vision of Europe. In very many cases, they have been replaced by courses on world history, which is judged better suited to America's contemporary understanding of the West. One well-publicized reaction against the shortcomings of Western civilization was to abolish it. Stanford University in California took the lead in 1989, instituting a Culture, Ideas and Values course in place of the former foundation course in Western culture that had hitherto been compulsory for all fresh persons. According to reports, the university authorities surrendered to chants of Hey ho, hey ho, Western culture has to go. Readings in Virgil, Cicero, Tacitus, Dante, Luther, Aquinas, Moore, Galileo, Locke, and Mill were replaced by excerpts from Rigoberto Manchu, Franz Fanon, Juan Rulfo, Sandra Cisneros, and Zora Neale Hurston, none of whom suffered the stigma of being dead white European males. This event was excessively satirized. Stanford can take some pride from seeing a problem and trying to tackle it. The trouble is that the cure may prove worse than the malady. In theory, there is much to be said for introducing multiculturalism and ethnic diversity into American academe. It is unfortunate that there is no known Tibetan Tacitus, no African Aquinas, no Mexican Mill for students to study. Indeed, there is nothing much in any of the recorded non-European cultures that might illustrate the roots of America's supposedly liberal traditions. At the time of the furore over Stanford's program on Western culture, its parallel courses on European history escaped the spotlight. But they were cast in the same mould. The choice of 39 set readings for the program in Europe 1, 2 and 3, for example, revealed a brand of selectivity with far-reaching implications. Apart from Joseph Conrad, Korzhanovsky, there was no single author from Eastern Europe. Conrad was included for his novels about Africa, such as Heart of Darkness, not for his writings on Eastern Europe. Apart from Matthew Arnold, there was no single author with any sort of connection with the Celtic world. Arnold was included as English critic and poet, not as professor of Celtic literature. There was no single Italian author more modern than Baldassare Castiglione, who died in 1528. There was one novelist from South Africa, but no one from Ireland, no one from Scandinavia, no one but Germans from Central Europe, no one from the Balkan countries, no one from Russia. Most curiously, from a history department, there was no historical text more modern than one from Herodotus. To be fair, selection is always necessary, always difficult, and always unsatisfactory. Stanford's quandary is not unique, but the particular form of selection practiced by one of the world's most expensive seats of learning is indicative of wider concerns. It purports to introduce Europe, but introduces only a small corner of the European continent. It purports to introduce the Western heritage, the title of its textbook, but it leaves much of the West untouched. It purports to give emphasis to Europe's literary and philosophical aspects, but emphasizes only a partial slice of European culture. It mentions neither Joyce nor Yeats, neither Anderson, Ibsen nor Kierkegaard, neither Kafka, Kessler nor Kundera, neither Solzhenitsyn nor even Dostoevsky. No Trades Description Act could ever sanction a product whose list of ingredients lacked so many of the basic items. No zoo can contain all the animals, but, equally, no self-respecting collection can confine itself to monkeys, vultures, or snakes. No impartial zoologist could possibly approve of a reptile house which masquerades as a safari park, and which contains only twelve crocodiles, of both sexes, eleven lizards, one dodo, and fifteen sloths. In any case, Stanford was hardly alone. 
By 1991, the National Endowment for the Humanities was quoted with an assessment that students could graduate from 78% of U.S. colleges and universities without ever taking a course in Western civilization. One suspects, in fact, that the problem lies less in the subject matter of European studies than in the outlook of those who present them. Many American courses, like the Great Book Scheme, were directed at a particular generation of young Americans who were desperately eager to learn a simplified version of the lost heritage of their immigrant forebears. Nowadays, they obviously need to be modified to match a new generation with different perceptions. Readings about Europe might arouse less resentment if they were laced with some of its less savoury aspects. Intelligent students can always sense when something is concealed, when they are not expected to understand but to admire. Some of America's minorities may indeed have a case for contesting Eurocentrism. If so, America's majority, who are overwhelmingly European in their origins, may choose to challenge Western civilization on other grounds. Many of America's most numerous communities, Irish, Spanish, Polish, Ukrainian, Italian, Greek, Jewish, came from regions of Europe which find little place in existing surveys of Western civilization and they have every reason to expect an improvement. The great paradox of contemporary American intellectual life, however, lies in the fact that the virtues most prized by the American version of Western civilization, tolerance, freedom of thought, cultural pluralism, now seem to be under attack from the very people who have benefited from them most. Critics have observed the closing of the American mind. Self-styled liberals, have been shown to be pursuing an illiberal education. Sixty years on, the author of the Great Books Scheme, still proud of the opening of the American mind, prefers to lambast his colleagues at the University of Chicago rather than to modify his prescription. The wrangles may be overreported, but America's historic drive towards a unified language and culture looks to be losing out to those lobbies and pressure groups who shout loudest. It is an understatement to say that history did not quite work out as the devotees of Western civilization would have wished. All of them were believers in one or another form of European domination. Spengler was as right to record the West's decline as he was wrong to believe in the future supremacy of Russia. But the ideas linger on, and their final defeat has not yet occurred. For most Europeans, they have lost their former vitality. They have been shattered by two world wars and by the loss of overseas empires. They will obviously make their last stand in the USA. For only in the USA do the true wellsprings of Western civilization still flow. Since the collapse of the Soviet Empire in 1991, the USA is the sole heir of European imperialism and has inherited many of its attitudes. It may not be an empire of the old sort, but it has been left with the white man's burden. Like Imperial Europe before it, the USA struggles to police the world whilst battling the ethnic and racial conflicts within its own borders. Like Europe today, it is in urgent need of a unifying mystique to outreach the dwindling attractions of mere democracy and consumerism. Unlike Europe, it has not known the lash of war on its own face within living memory. An absolute majority of Americans have European roots. They have adopted and adapted the English language and the European culture of the Founding Fathers, often in creative ways. Yet those Euro-Americans will never draw their main inspiration from Asia or Africa, or from studying the world in general. In order to cope with themselves, they have a profound need to come to terms with Europe's heritage. In order to do so successfully, they must liberate their view of Europe's past from its former limitations. If the European example shows anything at all, it shows that belief in the divisive propositions of Western civilization is a sure road to disaster. The greatest minds in Europe's past have had no truck with the artificial divorce of East and West. Gottes ist der Orient, Gottes ist der Occident, Nord und Südliches Gelände, ruht im Frieden seiner Hände. God's is the East, God's is the West. Northern and southern lands rest in the peace of his hands. National Histories In modern times, almost every European country has devoted greater energy and resources to the study of its own national history 
than to the study of Europe as a whole. For reasons that are very understandable, the parts have been made to seem more significant than the whole. Linguistic barriers, political interests, and the line of least resistance have helped to perpetuate the reigning citadels of national historiography and the attitudes which accompany them. The problem is particularly acute in Great Britain, where the old routines have never been overturned by political collapse or national defeat. Until recently, British history has generally been taken to be a separate subject from European history, requiring a separate sort of expertise, separate courses, separate teachers, and separate textbooks. Traditional insularity is a fitting partner to the other widespread convention that equates British history with English history. Only the most mischievous of historians would bother to point out that his English history referred only to England. Politicians have accepted the misplaced equation without a thought. In 1962, when opposing British entry to the European Economic Community, the leader of HM Opposition felt able to declare quite wrongly that such a step would spell the end of a thousand years of British history. The English are not only insular, most of them have never been taught the basic history of their own islands. Similar attitudes prevail in universities. Honourable exceptions no doubt exist, but Britain's largest history faculty did not start teaching British history until 1974, and even then the content remained almost entirely English. The students rarely learn anything about Ireland, Scotland or Wales. When they take examinations in European history, they are faced with a few optional questions about Eastern Europe and none about Britain. The net result can only be a view of the world where everything beyond England is alien. The basic and fallacious assumption, writes one dissenter, is that everything important in British history can be explained in terms of British causes, or again, the deeply ingrained and undiminished segregation of British, in reality English, history from European history, creates a narrowness of vision that has become a powerfully constricting cultural factor. According to another harsh critic, a combination of traditional structures, arcane research and excessive professionalisation has reduced British history to incoherence. At the universities as in the schools, he wrote before sensibly emigrating, the belief that history provides an education has all but vanished. Cultural history, as taught at Britain's universities, often clings to a narrow national focus. There is a marked preference for the old-style study of national roots over broad international comparisons. At the University of Oxford, for example, the one and only compulsory subject for all students of the English faculty remains the Anglo-Saxon text of Beowulf, until very recently, in Oxford's Faculty of Modern History, the one and only compulsory reading was the Latin text of the 7th century, History of the English Church and People, by the Venerable Bede. Curiosities of the same order no doubt exist in all countries. In Germany, for instance, universities suffer from the ramifications of the Humboldtian principle of academic freedom. German history professors are reputedly free to teach whatever they like. German history students are free to learn whatever they choose from the menu served up by their professors. In most universities, the only rule is that each student must choose at least one course from ancient history, one from medieval, and one from modern. At times of great pressure from the German state, therefore, professors sympathetic to official ideology were free to load the menu with a heavy dose of German national history. Back to the Teutonic tribes once again. In more recent times, when the state has been loath to interfere, they have been free to devise a menu where German national history can be completely avoided by any student so inclined. The problem of national bias is probably best observed in the realm of school textbooks and popular histories. The more that historians have to condense and to simplify their material, the harder it is to mask their prejudices. A few comments are called for. In the first place, it may be taken for granted that historical education in most European countries has traditionally possessed a strong nationalistic flavour. In its origins in the 19th century, history teaching was recruited to the service of patriotism. In its most primitive form, it consisted of little more than a rota of the names, dates and titles of the ruling dynasty. From that, it progressed to a recital of the nation's heroes, victories and achievements. 
In its most extreme form, it deliberately set out to condition school children for their future role as killers and casualties in the nation's wars. On the other hand, it is not right to assume that nationalistic history teaching has passed unchallenged. There has been a long countercurrent of trying to inculcate an awareness of wider horizons, and practices changed radically after 1945, at least in Western Europe. A remarkable textbook on modern history, published in Austrian Galicia in 1889, directly confronted the assumptions of the age of nationalism. The book was designed for Polish-language secondary schools. Its author, a historian from Warsaw, who could not publish freely in his home city, then under Russian rule, explained the priorities. In the struggles and achievements of the modern era, nations do not act on their own, but collectively. They are joined together in a variety of interrelated groupings and alliances. For this reason, we are obliged to use the synchronic method, that is, to speak of all the nations who participated in the events of any given time. Such general history cannot present a complete picture of all the nations involved, and their individual histories must be consigned to the category of special national histories. The result was a book where, in Volume 1, covering the period from the Renaissance to 1648, Habsburg and Polish events occupy exactly 71 and 519 pages respectively. The author makes a careful distinction between Poland and the Polish-Lithuanian-Ruthenian-Prussian state. The student could learn in some detail about the Catholic and the Lutheran Reformations, as about Islam and the Ottomans. The geographical range stretched from the Portuguese voyages of discovery to Ivan the Terrible's conquest of the Carnate of Kazan, from Mary Stuart's overthrow in Edinburgh to Charles V's expedition to Tunis. This volume would rate more highly on the non-nationalist scale than many still emanating from member states of the European community. It is also fair to say that concerted attempts have been made in recent years to purge educational materials of the grosser forms of misinformation. Bilateral textbook commissions have worked long and hard on such matters as militarism, place names and historical atlases, and one-sided interpretations. Scholars and teachers are possibly more aware of the problems than previously. In the last analysis, two extremes can be observed. At one extreme is the cosmic approach, where historians are expected to write and students to learn about all parts of the world in all ages. At the other extreme lies the parochial approach, where attention is reserved for one country in one short period of time. The cosmic approach has breadth but lacks depth. The parochial approach has the chance of depth but lacks breadth. The ideal must be somehow to strike a balance between breadth and depth. On this score, one has to admit that the centrally planned syllabuses and textbooks of Soviet bloc countries were sometimes more successful than those of their Western counterparts. Though the actual content tended to be horrendously chauvinist and ideological, the chronological and geographical framework was often admirably comprehensive. All Soviet schoolchildren had to work their way through the five stages of historical development, gaining some knowledge of primitive society, classical antiquity, feudalism, capitalism, and, from 1917, so-called socialism. Courses on the history of the USSR insisted on giving priority to the leading historical role of Russia and the Russians. At the same time, even in the worst years of Stalinism, any standard Soviet textbook would devote space to the ancient Greeks, Scythians and Romans, to the history of the Caucasus, to the empires of Genghis Khan and Tamerlane, and to the Muslim states of Kazan or Crimea. One would look in vain for such things in most general histories of Europe, in England, in contrast, where the syllabus of history teaching has largely been left to individual schools and teachers, the chronological and geographical framework tends to be extremely narrow. Even senior pupils studying history at advanced level are often confined to standard courses such as the Tudors and Stuarts, or Britain in the 19th century. Local history provides an interesting solution to some of these dilemmas. It draws on the familiar and the down-to-earth, encourages individual exploration and research, and is relatively resistant to nationalistic or to ideological pressures. It is well suited to subjects such as the family, which is readily understood by schoolchildren, 
while being used by specialists as the basis for far-flung international theorizing. At the other end of the scale, world history has been developed, both at schools and universities. It has strong arguments in favor for the education of a generation which must take their place in the global village. Its critics would argue, as some argue about European history, that the sheer size of its content condemns all but its most able practitioners to deal in worthless generalities. Naturally, narrowness of one kind provides an opportunity for breadth of a different kind. The narrowing of chronological and geographical parameters enables teachers to widen the variety of techniques and perspectives that can be explored within the chosen sector. Generally speaking, English pupils are relatively well-grounded in the study of sources, in causational problems, in the connections between political, socio-economic and cultural factors, and in the art of thinking for themselves. Here, their historical education has strength. On the other hand, there really must be something wrong if their studies are limited to five or ten percent of the span of only one-third of just one of the thirty-eight sovereign states of the world's smallest continent. The problem of national bias will only disappear when historians and educators cease to regard history as a vehicle for state politics. More than 1800 years ago, the Greek writer Lucian advised that the historian among his books should forget his nationality. It was sound advice. In the longer term, the definitive history of Europe will probably be written by a Chinese, a Persian, or an African. There are some good precedents, a Frenchman once wrote the best introduction to Victorian England. An Englishman is now established as the leading historian of Italy, and the only survey of British history to give proportionate weight to all four nations was written by an exile in the USA. So far, none of the experiments aimed at writing history from the European point of view has met with general acclaim. Some historians, such as Christopher Dawson, have made the attempt by appealing to Europe's Christian foundations. But Dawson's Catholic thesis did not illuminate the pluralism of recent centuries and did not convince his predominantly WASP readership. Others have taken the task of tracing the drive for European unity. The trouble here is that the list of contents is exceedingly short. Nation-states and national consciousnesses have been dominant phenomena throughout the era when history has been written as a systematic science. To a large extent, national histories have been allowed to predominate through the lack of alternatives. This may be regrettable, but it reflects the true condition of a Europe that has been deeply divided over recent centuries. Ever since the fragmentation of Christendom during the Renaissance and the Reformation, Europe has had no unifying ideal. Historians cannot pretend otherwise. As some analysts have realized about the United States, the mosaic of Europe is every bit as important as the melting pot. In all probability, therefore, it is still too early for a satisfactory European synthesis to be conceived and accepted. National sensitivities still abound. National histories cannot simply be abandoned, and it would be a gross distortion if the differences between Europe's nations were to be willfully submerged in some bland Euro-history. European history may be more than the sum of its parts, but it cannot be built except by studying those parts in their full idiosyncrasies. It seems that we cannot be content with national history, but pan-European history cannot be easily achieved. This is wise counsel. The implication is that the reformulating of European history must inch forward alongside the gradual construction of a wider European community. Neither will be built in a day. Unfortunately, national bias dies slowly. In April 1605, soon after England and Scotland were joined in personal union, Sir Francis Bacon wrote to the Lord Chancellor, recommending that one just and complete history be compiled of both nations. His wish has not yet been granted. In the words of one of the few British historians who are trying to address the problem of British identity, the ingrained reluctance to ask fundamental questions about the nature of Britain remains constant. Two Failed Visions The prevalence of nationalism in the 20th century has not encouraged internationalist history. But two forceful attempts were made to overcome prevailing divisions and to provide the ideological framework for a new 
universal vision of Europe's past. Both attempts failed and deserved to fail. Of the two, the Marxist-Leninist or communist version of European history started first and lasted longest. It grew out of Marxism, whose spirit and intentions it ignored, and in the hands of the Bolsheviks became one of the coercive instruments of state policy. In the initial phase, 1917-34, under enthusiasts such as M. N. Pakrovsky, it was strongly internationalist in flavour. Pakrovsky fully accepted that history was politics turned towards the past, and he threw himself with gusto into the fight against chauvinism. Great Russia was built on the bones of the non-Russian nations, he wrote. In the past, we Russians were the greatest robbers on earth. Yet for Stalin, the rejection of Russia's imperial traditions was anathema, and from 1934, when Stalin's decrees on history teaching took effect, the direction changed abruptly. Pokrovsky died, and most of his unrecanting colleagues were shot. The textbooks were suppressed. In their place, there appeared a virulent brew of vulgar Marxism and extreme Russian imperialism that was served up by all the ideological agencies of the USSR for the next fifty years. The twin elements of communist history were at bottom contradictory. They were held together by the messianic dogma of an ideology that no one could openly question. The pseudo-Marxist element was contained in the famous five-stage scheme that led from prehistory to the revolution of 1917. The Russian element was predicated on the special mission awarded to the Russian nation as the elder brother of the Soviet peoples and the vanguard of the world's proletariat. By Lenin's own admission, Soviet Russia was not yet as advanced as Germany and the other industrialized countries, but the world's first socialist state had been created to sow the seeds of the world revolution, to hold the fort of socialism during capitalism's terminal decline, and to inherit the earth at the end. In the meantime, superior Soviet methods of social organization and economic planning would soon ensure that the capitalist world was rapidly overtaken. Indeed, as the final chapter of the textbooks always stressed, the Soviet Union was surging ahead in everything from military might to living standards, technology and environmental protection. The final victory of socialism, as communism was always called, was taken to be scientifically proved and inevitable. Despite its lip service to socialist internationalism, the historical thinking of the Soviets paid homage both to Eurocentrism and, in a backhanded way, to Western civilization. Its Eurocentrism found expression in the fund of European examples on which Marxist-Leninist argument was based, and in the mania for European-style industrialization. It was specially blatant in the emphasis placed on the historic destiny of the Russians. Soviet assumptions on this last score caused offence to the European members of their empire, had an unsettling effect on the comrades of the communist movement in the Third World, and was the principal cause of the Sino-Soviet split. In Chinese eyes, the droves of Soviet advisers and technicians who appeared in China in the 1950s gave a worse display of European arrogance and bad machinery than any previous wave of foreign devils they had known. For the Chinese, as for Bolts, Poles or Georgians, the Russians' belief in their own superiority was bizarre. If Russians were accustomed to think of themselves as Westerners in relation to China, they were obviously Easterners in relation to the main body of Europeans. There is no doubt that Soviet communism proclaimed the West to be the ideological enemy. At the same time, it did not deny that its own roots lay in Europe, and that Lenin's dearest wish had been to link the revolution in Russia with the expected revolution in Germany. So Western civilization was not all bad. Indeed, so long as they were dead, leading Western figures could be readily admired. The point was, the West had grown decadent. The East, in the hands of the heroic proletariat, had stayed vigorous and healthy. Sooner or later the capitalist regimes would fade, the socialist fatherland would give them a final push, the frontiers would fall, and East would be rejoined with the West under Soviet-Russian leadership in a new revolutionary brotherhood. This is what Lenin had dreamed of, and what Leonid Brezhnev would have in mind when he talked of a common European home. 
This view of the communists' messianic mission was exported, with local variations, to all the countries which the Soviet Union controlled. In its strictly historical aspect, it sought to instill two cardinal dogmas, the primacy of socio-economic forces and the benign nature of Russia's expansion. It was greatly boosted by the Soviet defeat of Germany in 1941-5 and was still being taught as gospel to tens of millions of European students and schoolchildren in the late 1980s. Right at the end of communism's career, the general secretary of the CPSU, Mikhail Gorbachev, revived the slogan of a common European home. It was seized on by many foreign commentators and widely welcomed, but Gorbachev never had time to explain what he meant. He was dictator of an empire from Kaliningrad to Kamchatka, a peninsula as remote and as European as neighbouring Alaska. Could it be possible that Gorbachev's dream was of a greater Europe, stretching right round the globe? The rival fascist version of history started later and flourished more briefly. To some extent it grew up in response to communism and in the hands of the Nazis became one of the instruments of their new order. In the initial phase, 1922-34, it contained a certain socialist flavour both in Germany and Italy, but was dominated by the Italian variant and by Mussolini's dream of a restored Roman Empire. From 1934, when Hitler began to remodel Germany, the direction changed abruptly. The socialist element of National Socialism was purged. The German variant of fascism took the driving seat, and overtly racial theories came to the fore. As a result, there appeared a virulent brew of racism and German imperialism that was served up by all the ideological agencies of the Nazi Reich as long as it lasted. Despite Nazi-Soviet hostility, Nazi ideology was not so completely different from that of Stalinism. The racial element was predicated on the special mission supposedly awarded to the German nation as the most vigorous and healthy branch of the white Aryan race. The German imperial element was predicated on the criminal diktat of Versailles and on Germany's supposed right to recover its leading position. Together, they formed the basis of a program which assumed that Nazi power would spread across Europe and eventually beyond it. There were serious incompatibilities with fascist ideologies elsewhere in Europe, especially in Italy, whose nationalism had always possessed strong anti-Germanic overtones, but these did not have the time to ferment. The historical thinking of the Nazis contained the most extreme versions of Eurocentrism and Western civilization that have ever existed. The master race was identified with Aryan Europeans, wherever they lived in the world. They were the only true human beings, and were credited with all the most important achievements of the past. All non-Aryans, non-whites and non-Europeans, were classed as genetically inferior, and were placed in descending categories of untermenschen, or subhumans. A parallel hierarchy of biological merit was established within Europe, with the tall, slim, blonde, Nordic type, as tall as Goebbels, as slim as Goering, as blonde as Hitler, considered superior to all others. The Slavs of the East, Poles, Russians, Serbs, etc., who were wrongly classified as a racial subgroup, were declared inferior to the dominant Germanic peoples of the West and were treated on a level with various non-Aryan subhumans. The lowest categories of European inhabitants were those of non-European origin, principally gypsies and Jews, who were blamed for all the evils of European history and were deprived of the right to life. Nazi strategy was largely constructed from these absurdities, where the distinction between West and East was paramount. Beyond the removal of recalcitrant governments, Hitler harboured few designs against Western Europe, of which he felt himself to be the champion. He despised the French, whose Frankishness had been much diluted, and whose historic hatred for Germany had somehow to be cured. He disliked the Italians and their Roman connections and felt them to be unreliable partners. He respected the Spaniards, who had once saved Europe from the blacks and was puzzled by Franco's reluctance to cooperate. With the exception of certain degenerate individuals, he admired the Anglo-Saxons and found their persistent hostility towards him distressing. In his own terms, their behaviour could only be explained as that of fellow Germanics who were preparing to compete for mastery of the master race. 
All he wanted from them was that they should leave him alone. All of the Nazis' most radical ambitions were directed against the East. Mein Kampf clearly identified Eastern Europe as the site of Germany's Lebensraum, her future living space. Eastern Europe was inhabited by an assortment of inferior Slavs and Jews. Its genetic stock had to be improved by massive German colonization. The diseased elements had to be surgically removed, that is, murdered. Eastern Europe was also the sphere of Soviet power, and the nest of Jewish Bolshevism had to be smashed. When the Nazis launched the German invasions of Eastern Europe, first against Poland and then against the Soviet Union, they felt they were launching a crusade. And they said so explicitly. They were told by their history books that they were marching in the glorious steps of Henry the Fowler, the Teutonic Knights, and Frederick the Great. They claimed to be speeding to the ultimate showdown of a thousand years of history. Unlike communism, Nazism was not granted 75 years in which to elaborate its theory and practice. It was destroyed by the combined efforts of its neighbors before the Greater Reich could be consolidated. It never reached the point where a Nazi-run Europe would have been obliged to articulate its posture towards the other continents. Yet, if the Soviets had succumbed, as they very nearly did in 1941-2, Nazism would have become the driving force of a Eurasian power of immense size, and it would have had to prepare for a global confrontation against rival centers in the USA and Japan. Conflict would surely have ensued. As it was, Nazism was kept within Europe's bounds. Hitler was not given the chance to operate beyond the world of his fellow Aryans. Both as theorist and as political leader, he remained to the end a European. Though Nazidom once stretched from the Atlantic to the Volga, the Nazi version of history was only free to operate for a very brief interval. In Germany itself, its career was limited to a mere twelve years, less than the school days of one single class. Elsewhere, it could only sow its poison for a matter of weeks or months. Its impact was intense, but fleeting in the extreme. When it collapsed in disgrace in 1944-5, it left a gaping vacuum that could only be filled by the historical thoughts of the victorious powers. In Eastern Europe, occupied from 1944-5 by the Soviet army, the Soviet version was imposed without ceremony. Western Europe, liberated by the Anglo-Americans, was left open for the Allied Scheme of History. The Allied Scheme of History Contemporary views of Europe have been strongly influenced by the emotions and experiences of two world wars, and especially by the victory of the Grand Alliance. Thanks to their triumphs in 1918, in 1945, and at the end of the Cold War in 1989, the Western powers have been able to export their interpretation of events worldwide. They have been particularly successful in this regard in Germany, whose receptiveness was heightened by a combination of native guilt and allied re-education policies. The priorities and assumptions which derive from allied attitudes of the wartime vintage are very common in accounts of the 20th century, and are sometimes projected back into more remote periods. They may be tentatively summarized as follows. The belief in a unique, secular brand of Western civilization in which the Atlantic community is presented as the pinnacle of human progress. Anglo-Saxon democracy, the rule of law in the tradition of Magna Carta, and a capitalist free market economy are taken to be the highest forms of good. Keystones in the scheme include the Wilsonian principle of national self-determination and the Atlantic Charter. The ideology of anti-fascism, in which the Second World War of 1939-45 is perceived as the war against fascism and as the defining event in the triumph of good over evil. Opposition to fascism, or suffering at its hands, is the overriding measure of merit. The opponents, or the victims of fascists, deserve the greatest admiration and sympathy. A demonological fascination with Germany, the twice-defeated enemy. Germany stands condemned as the prime source both of the malignant imperialism which produced the First World War and of the virulent brand of fascism which provoked the Second. Individuals and nations who fought on the German side, especially in 1939-45, bear the stigma of collaboration. N.B. 
German culture is not to be confused with German politics. An indulgent, romanticized view of the Tsarist Empire and the Soviet Union, the strategic ally in the East, commonly called Russia. Russia's manifest faults should never be classed with those of the enemy, for Russia is steadily converging with the West. Russia's great merits as a partner in the anti-fascist alliance, whose huge sacrifices brought fascism to its knees, outweigh all the negative aspects of her record. The unspoken acceptance of the division of Europe into Western and Eastern spheres, whereas Atlantic values are expected to predominate in the more advanced West, Russia's understandable desirity for security justifies its domination over the backward East. It is natural for the Western powers to protect themselves against the threat of further Russian expansion, but they should not interfere in Russia's legitimate sphere of influence. The studied neglect of all facts which do not add credence to the above. The Allied scheme of history grew naturally out of the politics and sympathies of two world wars and has never been consciously or precisely formulated. In the hurly-burly of free societies it could never establish a monopoly, nor has it ever been systematically contested. Yet, half a century after the Second World War, it was everywhere evident in academic discussions, and perhaps unknowingly, in the conceptual framework which informs the policy decisions of governments. It was the natural residue of a state of affairs where Allied soldiers could be formally arrested for saying that Hitler and Stalin are equally evil. In the academic sphere, the Allied scheme can be seen at work in institutional priorities and structures, as well as in debates on particular issues. It has contributed to the crushing preponderance of research in history and political science that is devoted to Nazi or Nazi-related themes, and to the prominence of German studies, especially in the USA. It helps explain why the analysis of East European affairs continues to be organized in separate institutes of Soviet or Slavonic studies, and why the Sovietological profession was notoriously reluctant to expose the realities of Soviet life. It was responsible in part for the excessive emphasis on Russian within the Soviet and Slavic field, often to the exclusion of non-Russian cultures. It was present, above all, in the assumptions and illusions surrounding views on the Second World War. Half a century after that war was fought, the majority of episodes which contradict the Allied myth continued to be minimized or discounted. Many wartime stereotypes have been perpetuated, especially regarding Eastern Europe. One can observe a clear-cut hierarchy of perceptions at work which are related to the degree of subservience of various nations to the Allied cause. The Czechs and Serbs, for example, who had a long tradition of cooperation with Russia and of hostility towards Germany, fitted well into the Allied scheme. So they could be hailed as brave, friendly and democratic, at least until the wars in Bosnia. The Slovaks, Croats and Baltic nations, in contrast, who were thought to have rejected the friends of the West or to have collaborated with the enemy, deserved no such compliment. The Poles, as always, fitted no one's scheme. By resisting German aggression, they were obviously fighting staunchly for democracy. By resisting Soviet aggression, they were obviously treacherous, fascistic, irresponsible and anti-democratic. The Ukrainians, too, defied classification. Although they probably suffered absolutely the largest number of civilian casualties of any European nation, their main political aim was to escape from Soviet and Russian domination. The best thing to do with such an embarrassing nation was to pretend that it didn't exist and to accept the old Tsarist fiction about there being little Russians. In reality, they were neither little nor Russians. In the political sphere, the Allied scheme has been the foundation stone of the USA's supposed special relationship with the United Kingdom and one source for the exclusion of democratic Germany and democratic Japan from bodies such as the UN Security Council. It was explicit when a British Prime Minister scolded the French President over the relative merits of Magna Carta and the rights of man, or when the prospect of a European superstate was blasted in tones reminiscent of Pitt or Churchill. It underlay the vote in the British House of Commons in favour of a war crimes bill which limits those crimes to offences committed in Germany or in German-controlled territory, as if no other war crimes count. Arguably, 
It was present when a National Holocaust Memorial Museum was opened in Washington. The hold of the Allied scheme was perhaps most strongly evident, however, in reactions to the collapse of communism after 1989. The outburst of Gorby mania, the priority given to the integrity of wartime allies, first the USSR and then Yugoslavia, and the willful confusing of patriotism with nationalism in Eastern Europe, can only be explained in terms of pre-set historical reflexes. It was only by a slow process of readjustment that Western opinion learned that Russia and the Soviet Union were not the same thing, that Gorbachev headed a deeply hated regime, that the Yugoslav Federation was a communist front organization, that the most extreme nationalism was emanating from the communist leadership of Serbia, or that Lithuania, Slovenia, Ukraine or Croatia were distinct European nations legitimately seeking statehood. The realization that the West had been misled on so many basic issues was bound to swell demands for the revision of European history. Euro history. The movement for European unity, which began in Western Europe after 1945, was fired by an idealism that contained an important historical dimension. It aimed to remove the welter of ultra nationalistic attitudes which had fueled the conflicts of the past. All communities require both a sense of present identity and the sense of a shared past. So historical revision was a natural requirement. The first stage sought to root out the historical misinformation and misunderstandings which had proliferated in all European countries. The second stage was to build a consensus on the positive content of a new Euro history. The Council of Europe provided the forum within which most early discussions took place. As an organization supported by 24 governments in Western Europe, it was never bounded by the political horizons either of the EEC or of NATO, and in the cultural field it gained the cooperation of four non-member countries from the Soviet bloc, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary and the USSR. Its input ranged from the Vatican to the Kremlin. From the first colloquium, which was organized at Calv in 1953 on the European idea in history teaching, the Council organized at least one major international meeting on historical matters every year for 40 years, a 1965 symposium on teaching history at Elsinore, and a 1986 seminar on the Viking Age, emphasized the desirability both of broad-based themes and of a generous geographical and chronological spread. Apart from historical didactics, and the problems of introducing a skills-based new history into school teaching, the main focus lay on the elimination of national bias and religious prejudice from European education. Special attention was given to the shortcomings of national history textbooks. Numerous bilateral commissions were established for examining the sins of omission and commission, of which all European educators were guilty in the presentation of their own and their neighbours' past. In this, the Georg Eckert Institute for International Textbook Research, established at Braunschweig in West Germany, played a pioneering role. The obstacles to creating a consensus about European history, however, were legion. One line, following the Gaullist concept of a Europe des Patries, might have contented itself with an amalgam of national histories shorn of all offensive material. Others have sought to fuse the national element into a more coherent whole. A major obstacle lay in shifting political realities and the expanding membership of the West European community. It was one thing to imagine a history which might reconcile the historical perceptions of the original six. It was a much greater task to anticipate the sensitivities of the twelve, the nineteen or even the thirty-eight. By the 1990s, the notion of European unity could no longer be confined to Western Europe. Modern history syllabuses will have to abandon the old bifocal view of Europe in favour of an all-embracing concept. In the meantime, brave souls had not been deterred from attempting a new synthesis. One history project that was financially supported, though not originated, by the European Commission in Brussels was conceived prior to the political deluge of 1989-91. to Labelled An Adventure in Understanding, it was planned in three stages, a 500-page survey of European history, a 10-part television series, 
and a school textbook to be published simultaneously in all eight languages of the EC. Its authors were quite open about their political quest. Their aim was to replace history written according to the ethos of the sovereign nation-state. Nationalism and the fragmentation of Europe into nation-states are relatively recent phenomena. They may be temporary and are certainly not irreversible. The end of empires and the destruction wrought by nationalism have been accompanied by the defeat of totalitarianism and the triumph of liberal democracy in Western Europe, completed in 1974-5. This has enabled people to begin to rise above their nationalistic instincts. Nationalistic instincts was an unfortunate phrase. But the principal author, who had published both on early Christianity and on l'idée de l'Europe dans l'histoire, was convinced of Europe's basic unity in diversity. There are solid historical reasons for regarding Europe not only as a mosaic of cultures, but as an organic whole. The timing of the venture was unfortunate, since it reached the market at the very time when its geographical frame of reference had just collapsed. It had defined Europe as the territory of the member states of the EC, with Scandinavia, Austria and Switzerland thrown in. The status of Finland, Poland, Hungary and Bohemia, it had intimated, was not clear. So here was yet another exercise in Western civilization. Several of the critics were not kind. Its moral tone was likened by one reviewer as reminiscent of Soviet bloc historiography. Elsewhere, its approach was summed up in the headline, Half Truths About Half of Europe. The Greeks in particular were incensed. Although Greece had been a member state of the EC since 1981, Durocell had largely omitted the contributions of ancient Greece and Byzantium. Letters of protest were addressed to the European Commission by several Greek MEPs, the Archbishop of Athens and others. The text was likened to the Satanic Verses. Attention was drawn to the opinion of the French historian Ernest Renan. L'Europe est grecque par la pensée et l'art, romaine par le droit et judéo-chrétienne par la religion. Europe is Greek in its thought and its art, Roman in its law, and Judeo-Christian in its religion. A British correspondent invoked the Greek origins of the words Europa and Historia. If the Greek contribution is to be denied, he asked, one wonders what this book ought to be called. In due course, the European Commission was obliged to dissociate itself from the project. The most telling observation was made amongst remarks originating in the Academy of Athens. It concerned Monsieur Durocell's concept of a European history of Europe. If a study addressed almost exclusively to Western Europe was to be categorized as European, it followed that the rest of Europe was somehow not European. Non-Western is made to mean non-European. Europe equals West in everything but simple geography. Eastern Europe whether Byzantine Europe, Orthodox Europe, Slavic Europe, Ottoman Europe, Balkan Europe or Soviet Europe, was to be permanently beyond the pale. Here was the fundamental fallacy which led Monsieur Durocel to discuss the ancient peoples of Europe without mentioning either the Greeks or the Slavs. The author's attempts to defend himself were not always felicitous. Charged that his book did not mention the Battle of Marathon, he was said to have countered with the news that it did not mention the Battle of Verdun either, in which case it must be judged as weak on West European history as on European history as a whole. The project's textbook, composed by twelve historians from twelve different countries, appeared in 1992. The text had been established by collective discussion. A French account of the barbarian invasions was changed to the Germanic invasions, a Spanish description of Sir Francis Drake as a pirate was overruled. A picture of General de Gaulle among the portraits on the cover was replaced by one of Queen Victoria. For whatever reason, the European history book did not find a British publisher and was judged unlikely to pass the strict authorization criteria of the 16 German lender. Euro history, however, was not engaged on frivolous business. Its strong point lay in the search for a dynamic vision of a European community that would be capable of creating its own mystique. In its initial form, that vision was of necessity stunted. After all, it saw its origins in the middle of the Cold War. But it may have grasped an essential truth, that sovereign national states do not offer the sole form of sound political community. 
National states are themselves imagined communities. They are built on powerful myths and on the political rewriting of history. All communities larger than the primordial villages of face-to-face -face contact, and perhaps even these, are imagined. Members of even the smallest nation will never know their fellow members, and yet in the mind of each lives the image of their communion. Europeans need that same imagination. Sooner or later, a convincing new picture of Europe's past will have to be composed to accompany the new aspirations for Europe's future. The European movement of the 1990s may succeed or it may fail. If it succeeds, it will owe much to the historians who will have helped to give it a sense of community. They will have helped to provide a spiritual home for those millions of Europeans whose multiple identities and multiple loyalties already transcend existing frontiers. European History When asked to define European history, many professional historians cannot give a clear answer. They do not usually concern themselves with such matters. If pressed, however, most of them would contrast the certainties of past assumptions with the confusions of the present. An inquiry organized by a historical journal in 1986 brought some revealing replies. One distinguished scholar said, when I was a schoolboy in France in the 1930s, the answer to what is European history seemed simple and obvious. Any place, event, or personality that has a relationship to France belongs to European history, nay, to history tout court. But now there is no single European history, but rather many. A second respondent delivered a homily about Europe's traditional parochialism and the need for worldwide horizons. The concept of European history, indeed the history of Europe, was but history seen with the eyes of Europe and with a European vision of history. This kind of presentation is indefensible today. The implication seemed to be that the Eurocentric attitudes of his misguided predecessors had somehow invalidated the entire subject. A Hungarian contributor pointed to the eccentric British habit of distinguishing European from British history. Through this distinction, European is made to mean continental, and the British part is made to appear as something completely unique. Yet another contributor offered an analysis of three separate definitions of European history. He listed the geographical, the cultural or civilizational, and a category which he described as a convenient shorthand for the central zone of the capitalist world economy as it has developed since the 16th century. In Magdalen College, one was used to more incisive opinions. Mr. A. J. P. Taylor produced an inimitable sample for the benefit of the journal's inquiry. European history is whatever the historian wants it to be. It is a summary of the events and ideas, political, religious, military, pacific, serious, romantic, near at hand, far away, tragic, comic, significant, meaningless, anything else you would like it to be. There is only one limiting factor— it must take place in or derive from the area we call Europe. But as I am not sure what exactly that area is meant to be, I am pretty well in a haze about the rest. As usual, my old tutor was more than half right and completely amusing. But he put himself in the company of those who imply that European history, even if it exists, is not a subject worth worrying about. In the end, therefore, Intellectual definitions raise more questions than they answer. It is the same with European history as with a camel. The practical approach is not to try and define it, but to describe it. 1. Peninsula Environment and Prehistory There is a marked determinism about many descriptions of Europe's environmental history. Many Europeans have assumed that their continent was so magnificently endowed that it was destined by nature for world supremacy. And many have imagined that Europe's good fortune would somehow last forever. The empire of climate, wrote Montesquieu in 1748, is the first of all empires, and he proceeded to show that the European climate had no rival. For Montesquieu, as for his many successors, Europe was synonymous with progress. There has also been a good deal of national parochialism. Even the founder of human geography, the great Paul Vidal de la Blache, one of the intellectual ancestors of the Annal school, 
was not above a touch of Gallic chauvinizing. The geography of France, he stressed, was marked by the keynote of variety. Against the diversities which assail her, he wrote, France sets her force d'assimilation, her power of assimilation. She transforms everything that she receives. On Britain, in contrast, he quotes the doggerel lines about this paltry little isle with acres few and weather vile. One hundred years later, one finds Fernand Brodel doing similar things. Variety is indeed a characteristic of France's superb makeup, but it is not a French monopoly. It is a hallmark of Europe as a whole. In fact, the peninsula of Europe is not really a continent at all. It is not a self-contained land mass. At approximately 10 million square kilometers, 3.6 million square miles, it is less than one quarter the size of Asia, one third of Africa, one half of each of the Americas. Modern geographers classify it, like India, as a subcontinent of Eurasia, a cape of the old continent, a western appendix of Asia. Even so, it is impossible to deny that Europe has been endowed with a formidable repertoire of physical features. Europe's landforms, climate, geology and fauna have combined to produce a benign environment that is essential to an understanding of its development. Europe's landforms do not resemble those of any other continent or subcontinent. The depressions to north and south have been flooded by the ocean to form two parallel sea chains which penetrate deep into the interior. In the north, the North Sea Baltic Sea Lane stretches 1,500 miles, 2,500 kilometers, from the Atlantic to Russia. In the south, the Mediterranean Black Sea system stretches over 2,400 miles, 4,000 kilometers, from Gibraltar to the Caucasus. Within these protected seas lie a vast complex of lesser gulfs and a huge spangle of islands. As a result, the ratio of shoreline to land mass is exceptionally high, at approximately 37,000 kilometers, or more than 23,000 miles, the European shoreline is almost exactly the length of the equator. For early man, this was perhaps the most important measure of accessibility. What is more, since the shores of the peninsula lie in the temperate latitudes of Eurasia's western extremity, they are served by a user-friendly climate. Prevailing ocean winds blow westerly, and it is the western coasts of the great continents that stand to benefit most from the moderating influx of sea air. Yet few other west-facing continental coasts can actually enjoy the advantage. Elsewhere, if the western shore is not blocked by towering peaks or icy currents, it is lined by deserts such as the Sahara, the Kalahari, or the Atacama. The climate of Europe, therefore, is unusually temperate for its latitude. Generally speaking, under the influence of the Gulf Stream, northern Europe is mild and moist. Southern Europe is relatively warm, dry, and sunny. Central and Eastern Europe enjoy elements of a true continental climate, with clear cold winters and baking hot summers. But everywhere the weather is changeable. Extremes are usually avoided. Even in European Russia, where the difference between the mean temperatures of January and July can approach 45 degrees centigrade, the range is only half what it is in Siberia. The wettest district in Europe is in western Norway, with an average annual precipitation of 3,500 millimetres, 138 inches. The driest district surrounds the Caspian Sea, with less than 250 millimetres, 9 inches, per annum. The coldest spot is Forkuta, with a mean January chill of minus 20 degrees centigrade. The hottest is disputed between Seville and Astrakhan, both with mean July roasts of plus 29 degrees centigrade. These extremes do not compare with their counterparts in Asia, Africa, or the Americas. Europe's temperate climate favoured the requirements of primitive agriculture. Most of the peninsula lies within the natural zone of cultivable grasses. There were abundant woodlands to provide fuel and shelter. Upland pasture often occurs in close proximity to fertile valleys. In the west and south, Livestock can winter in the open. Local conditions frequently encouraged special adaptations. The extensive coastline, combined with the broad continental shelf, gave fishermen rich rewards. The open plains, especially of the Danube Basin, preserved the nomadic horse-rearing and cattle-driving of the Eurasian steppes. In the Alps, which take their name from the high pastures above the tree-line, 
transhumance has been practiced from an early date. Europe's climate was probably also responsible for the prevalent skin color of its human fauna. Moderate levels of sunshine, and hence of ultraviolet radiation, meant that moderate levels of pigmentation came to be encoded in the peninsula's gene pool. Certainly, in historic times, pale faces have predominated, together with blonde or golden hair and blue eyes in the northern regions. The great majority of Europeans and their descendants can be easily recognized as such from their looks. Until recently, of course, it was impossible to take anything but the most superficial racial factors into consideration. The analysis of blood groups, body tissues and DNA imprints, for example, was unknown until the late 20th century, and it was not realized just how much genetic material all human beings have in common. As a result, racial theorists were apt to draw conclusions from external criteria such as skin color, stature, or skull form. In reality, the racial makeup of Europe's population has always displayed considerable variety. The tall, blue-eyed, fair-skinned, platinum blondes of the so-called Nordic race, which established itself in Scandinavia, forms the only group remotely qualified for the label of white. They bore little resemblance to the squat, brown-eyed, swarthy-skinned and black-haired people of the so-called Mediterranean or Indo-Mediterranean race, which dominated large parts of the South. Between the two extremes there were numerous gradations. Most of the peninsula's population can be clearly distinguished from the Mongoloid, Indoid and Negroid races, but not from other groups predominating in the Near East and North Africa. Some of the most promising advances in the field of prehistory are now being made through modern genetic research. The refinement of serology, the discovery of DNA, and the subsequent operation of mapping the 3,000 million letters on human genes permit investigations of a very sophisticated nature. The correlation of genetic and linguistic records now suggests that the patterns of biological and cultural evolution may be closer than imagined. Recent studies show that the movement of genetic material into prehistoric Europe corresponded with parallel cultural trends. Genes, peoples and languages have diverged in tandem, writes a leading scholar. Local studies show that isolated cultural communities, such as the non-Indo-European Basques, possess recognizable genetic traces of their own. There are no general conclusions. But the study of Europe's genetic inheritance, once a pseudoscience, is now a respectable pursuit. At last, we are beginning to read the messages left to us by distant ancestors. From the psychological point of view, the peninsula presented early man with a stimulating blend of opportunity and challenge. It created a degree of stress that demanded enterprise but was still manageable. Life was hard but rewarding. Seasonal rhythms fostered activities which required routine and foresight. The changeable weather stimulated flexibility. There were plenty of natural hazards to be overcome. Ocean gales, winter snows, summer droughts and disease. Yet the prospects for health and survival were good. One may surmise that the primitive settlers of prehistoric Europe felt less at risk than their descendants on the eastern seaboard of North America several millennia later. It would be rash to state that the European peninsula was the only location where human civilization could have developed as it did. Yet, most of the alternative locations had their drawbacks. Compared to the subtropical river valleys where mankind first flourished, the seasonal rhythms and benign moderation of the peninsula provided an altogether more receptive setting for sustained development. The geological and biological environment is rich and varied. There are young alpine mountains, ancient primary hills, active volcanoes, deep gorges and wide plains, racing upland torrents, broad rivers, lakes by the thousand, subarctic tundra permafrost glaciers, rocky coasts, sandy beaches and spreading deltas. There are open grasslands, spacious deciduous woods, gloomy pine forests and subtropical palms, leached semi-desert soils, vast marshes, and zones of deep loess and black earth. The range of plant life and fauna is large. Enough of Europe's wildernesses have survived to show what the primeval habitat would have resembled. Importantly, however, the scale of heights and distances is far less forbidding than elsewhere. 
Europe's localities are linked by a network of natural pathways, which primitive man must have found more of an invitation than a barrier. Just as one could paddle round most of the inland coast in a dugout, one could float down any number of rivers in almost any direction. The Seine, the Rhine, the Elbe, Oder, Vistula, Niemen, and Dvina all flow to the north, the Ebro, the Rhone, the Maritza, the Dnieper, and the Volga to the south. Tagus, Loire, and Severn flow to the west, Thames, Danube, Po, and Dniester to the east. Between them there is an endless series of short walks and easy porterages. In the district of Augsua in Upper Burgundy, for instance, one can stroll in the course of a few hours between waters that take one to the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, or the English Channel. In the Central Alps, the sources of the Rhine and the Rhone rise side by side near Andermatt before flowing north and south, respectively. On the Dvina Dnieper porterage, in the vicinity of Vitebsk, one can easily haul a boat which has come from Sweden to a point that will take it to Egypt. One should not underestimate the lengthy process whereby the highways and byways of Europe were opened up to human movement and settlement. On the other hand, there is no comparison between the relative ease of travel in Europe and that in the greater continents. Caravans on the ancient silk route from China needed a year or more to cross the body of Asia. Yet from time immemorial, any fit and reasonably enterprising traveller has been able to move across Europe in a matter of weeks, if not days. The division of Europe into natural or historic regions has long provided an intellectual exercise that is as entertaining as it is inconclusive. Attempts to define Western Europe as distinct from Eastern Europe have been as numerous as the criteria used to fix the dividing lines. The distinction between Northern Europe and Southern Europe is clear and permanent in the peninsula's central alpine sector but it does not hold good to the same extent either in Europe's far west, in Iberia, or in Europe's far east, in the hinterland of the Black Sea. The arguments advanced to prove the pedigree of regions such as Central Europe or East Central Europe are as ingenious as they are contorted. One stands on safer ground dividing Europe into regions based on physical and geographical features. The European peninsula is constructed from five natural components, in historical times, these geographical units have remained largely constant, whilst the political units surmounting them have come and gone with great fickleness. Earth's proud empires are constantly passing away, but the plains and the mountains, the seas, peninsulas and islands apparently go on forever. 1. The great European plain stretches without interruption for over 2,400 miles, 4,000 kilometres, from the Atlantic to the Urals. It is Europe's dominant territorial feature. Indeed, since the Urals form little more than a gentle bridge, the plain may be regarded as an extension of the still greater expanse of lowland stretching to the Verkhoyansk ridge of eastern Siberia. At the longitude of the Urals, it spans the 1,200 miles, 2,000 kilometers, between the Barents Sea and the Caspian. Between the coast and the hills in the low countries, it narrows to less than 200 kilometres. Almost all the major rivers of the plain flow on a north-south axis, thereby creating a series of natural breaks to east-west traffic and dividing the traverse of the plain into six or seven easy stages. East of the Vistula, the impenetrable Pripyat marshes split the plain into two natural pathways, a northerly one, which skirts the Baltic lakeland, and a southerly one, serving as the high road to and from the steppes. The plain is at its most vulnerable in the section between the Rhine and the Oder. Here it is overborne by ranges of impenetrable forested hills. The Ardennes, the Teutoburger Wald, and the Harz remain formidable barriers even today. They inhibit movement both laterally along the plain and vertically from the plain to the Alps. The map of modern Germany shows how almost all the country's development has been channelled either onto the plain or into the four river basins of the Rhine, Main, Neckar and Danube. The peoples who settled on the plain suffered from one permanent disability. They could find no natural limits to the territory which they chose to occupy. They had to fight for it. Lowlanders tend to think of themselves as docile tillers of the soil in contrast to the ferocious predatory men from the hills. 
In reality, it was the plainsmen who had to learn the arts of systematic military organization and occupation. On the plain, one learned to strike first or to be struck down oneself. It is perhaps no accident that the plain long resisted the onset of settlement, also that in due course it nourished the most formidable military powers of European history. France, Prussia, and Russia all grew strong from the interminable wars of the plains, and all developed a martial tradition to match their predicament. The lowlands provided the setting for many of their most titanic encounters, at Kunersdorf and Kursk, at Leipzig and Tannenberg, at Waterloo and Stalingrad. The physical gradients of the European plain are tipped in two different directions, on the one hand from the Alpine ridge to the shore of the northern seas, and on the other hand from east to west, from the peak of the Urals, 1,894 metres, to France's Atlantic coast. On average, the main east-west gradient falls by 6,000 feet over almost 3,000 miles, or 26 inches per mile, a gradient of only 0.04%. The idea of cultural gradients, which run across the European plain in the opposite direction to the physical ones, developed in response to Europe's particular patterns of settlement and of political evolution. It so happened that permanent settlement occurred first in the south and the west, later in the north and centre, and last in the east. Hence, for much of the last 4,000 years, to cross the mountains from the plain and to descend to the Mediterranean was actually to undertake a cultural ascent. Similarly, in modern times, to move along the European plain from west to east was widely considered to involve a cultural descent. This concept of the Kulturgefälle, or cultural gradient, was implicit in the ideology of German nationalism, which reacted against the cultural dominance of the west whilst laying claim to the east. It can be observed in some aspects of French attitudes to Belgium and Germany, of German attitudes to the Slavs, of Polish attitudes to Russia and Ukraine, of Russian attitudes to the peoples of Central Asia. Human nature always tempts people to imagine that they inhabit the cultural upland whilst their neighbours inhabit the sticks. In the British Isles, for example, the English majority are apt to perceive all cultural gradients sloping steadily downhill from the Himalayan peaks of Oxford or Hyde Park Corner to the Celtic fringe, the Scotch mist, the Irish bogs, and the Channel fog. The English saying that wogs begin at Calais is very close in spirit to France's Histoire Belge, to Metternich's most Viennese remark that Asia begins at the Landstrasse, or to the Polish proverb Narushi Shemushi, in Russia one has to. The prejudices inherent in their elastic cultural geography have undoubtedly been strengthened by fears of the instability of life on the plain. Thanks to the configuration of its approaches, one small branch line of the European plain has assumed special importance. The plain of Pannonia, now in modern Hungary, is the only extensive stretch of grassland south of the mountain chain. It is protected in the north by the main Carpathian ridge and is bounded to the south by the middle reaches of the Danube. It has three natural gateways one at Vienna from the west, another through the Iron Gates from the east, and a third through the Moravian Gap from the north. Its well-watered pastures offered a natural terminus for nomads moving from east to west, and a convenient springboard for many a barbarian tribe preparing to invade the Roman Empire. It was the home successively of the Gaipedes, the Huns, from whom it took the name of Hungaria, the Avars, the Cumans, the Slavs, and eventually the Magyars. The Magyars call it the Alfold, lowland, and sometimes the Pusta, a word of Slav origin meaning the wilderness. 2. The Mountains The central feature of the peninsula is to be found in the majestic chain of mountains which curve in two elegant arcs from the Maritime Alps in Provence to the Carpathian Alps in Transylvania. This impressive barrier forms the peninsula's backbone, creating a watershed which divides the northern plain from the Mediterranean lands. The highest peaks in the westerly sections, Mont Blanc, 4,807 metres, the Matterhorn, 4,478 metres, or Gran Paradiso, 4,061 metres, are significantly higher than those in the more easterly ranges, 
Trieglau, 2,863 metres in the Julian Alps, Gerlach, 2,655 metres in the Tatras, or Moldoveanu, 2,543 metres in Romania. Even so, with the eternal snows lying above the 3,200 metre line on the south facing Zonenseite, or Sunshine side, and above the 2,500 metre contour on the north facing slopes, the upper ridges are impassable almost everywhere. Continental Europe's largest glacier, the Aletsch, which runs beneath the Jungfrau in the Beneza Oberland, has no equivalent in the east. But all the highest passes are closed by snow during the winter months. For well over 1,200 miles, there are only three significant gaps in the chain, the Danube Gap in Bavaria, the Elbe Gap in Bohemia, and the Moravian Gap, which links Silesia with Hungary. For obvious reasons, the people who settled in the high valleys kept themselves aloof from the turbulent affairs of the lowlands, regarding their mountain home as a refuge and fortress to be defended against all intruders. Switzerland, which emerged in the 13th century as a confederation of mountain cantons, has retained something of this outlook to the present day. The mountains, however, have had a unifying as well as a divisive function. The critical distances across them are not very great. Bourg Saint-Maurice on the Isère and Martigny on the Rhône are, respectively, only 62 and 88 kilometres, 39 and 55 miles, from Italian Aosta. Austrian Innsbruck is 68 kilometres from Bressanone, Brixen, in South Tyrol. Sambor on the Dniester is 105 kilometres from Ujgorod, on a tributary of the Danube. Once the high alpine passes were tamed, the lands on either side of the ridge acquired common links, common interests, and to a large degree a common culture. Turin, for example, is much closer to Lyon and Geneva than it is to Rome. Milan or Venice have had stronger ties with Zurich, Munich or Vienna than with distant Sicily. Bavaria, which was long cut off from the north by the vast forests and hills of central Germany, has shared much with nearby Lombardy. The old province of Galicia, on the northern slopes of the Carpathians, had much to do with Hungary over the ridge to the south. As any tourist can see, the worlds of the Alpenraum, or of the Carpathians, have survived, notwithstanding the barriers created by modern national states. The presence of the mountains gave special significance to the three major gaps between them. The Bavarian Gap, which follows the corridor of the Middle Danube from Passau to Krems, became a capital link between north and south. The Elbe Gap opened Bohemia to the German influences which the Burma Wald might otherwise have impeded. Of equal importance, especially in earlier times, was the Moravian Gap, which formed a natural south-bound funnel for many of the peoples coming from the steppes. In early medieval times, it provided the site of the first Slav state, the great Moravian Empire. In historic times, it has provided a pathway for innumerable armies, for Sobieski, bound for the Turkish wars, or for Napoleon, bound for Austerlitz. It ultimately leads, like the routes through the Bavarian and the Elbe gaps, to the Danube near Vienna, the heart of the heart of Europe. Of course, Europe possesses many mighty mountain chains in addition to its central spine. Mulasen, 3,487 metres, in the Sierra Nevada. Le Pic de Netu, or Daneto, 3,404 metres, in the Pyrenees. Mount Etna, 3,233 metres, in Sicily. Monte Corno, 2,912 metres, in the Apennines. Musala, 2,925 metres in Bulgaria, Korab, 2,764 metres in Albania, and Olympus itself, 2,917 metres, are all peaks of alpine proportions. Not all Europeans are aware that the supreme summit of the peninsula is to be found not on Mont Blanc, but on the Elbrus Massif, 5,642 metres in the Greater Caucasus. 3. The Mediterranean, that marvellously secluded sea which laps Europe's southern coastline, forms the basis of a self-contained geographical unit. Its sea lanes provide a ready channel for cultural, economic and political contacts. It supplied the cradle for the classical world. Under the Caesars it became, in effect, a Roman lake. 
In the Renaissance and after, it was the focus of an interwoven civilization with important material as well as cultural dimensions. Yet, significantly, since the decline of Roman power, the Mediterranean has never been politically united. Sea power has never been sufficient to overcome the land-based empires which established themselves on its perimeter. Indeed, once the Muslim states took root in the Levant and in Africa, the Mediterranean became an area of permanent political division. Maritime and commercial powers such as Venice were incapable of uniting the whole. The European powers of the 19th century founded colonies from Syria to Morocco, but they were prevented by their rivalries from destroying the principal Muslim bastion in Turkey, and hence from creating a general hegemony. Political disunity may well explain some of the cultural unities which persist across state frontiers in the Mediterranean. One deep-rooted feature has been found in the existence of parallel authorities, such as that of the Mafia in southern Italy, which defy all efforts to suppress them. For most of recorded history, the peoples inhabiting the northern shores of the Mediterranean have outnumbered their southern neighbours by at least two to one, and hence have played a dominant role. A demographic explosion in North Africa promises to upset the traditional balance. In any case, the Mediterranean lands have never been confined to the countries on the immediate shoreline. In Europe, the Mediterranean watershed lies far to the north, taking in Bavaria, Transylvania and Ukraine. No power or culture, not even Rome, has ever united all of these. Similar patterns are observable in the history of Europe's other enclosed seas, the Baltic and the Black Sea. The Baltic came to prominence at a relatively late date. It was the focus in Hansa times for German commercial expansion and in the 17th century for Sweden's bid for glory. Yet no single Baltic power ever achieved the long-dreamt-of Dominium Maris. German, Swedish, Danish, Polish and Russian rivalry has kept the Baltic disunited to the present day. The Black Sea first known to the ancients as the Axinos or Inhospitable, later as the Euxin or Hospitable, and then as the Pontus, is the Mediterranean Siamese twin. It has passed through phases of Greek, Roman, Byzantine and Ottoman dominance. Yet there again, the rise of a major land power in Russia led to lasting divisions. Until the 1990s, the Soviet Union and its satellites faced NATO's southern flank in Turkey across hostile waters. More seriously, perhaps, much of the Black Sea is anoxic. That is, it is so heavily impregnated with hydrogen sulfide that its depths form the largest mass of lifeless water in the world. If turnover of the water strata were to occur, it would provoke the worst natural cataclysm to strike the Earth since the last Ice Age. Since undisputed command of Europe's seas has proved impossible, special attention has inevitably been given to their three strategic gateways. The Straits of Gibraltar, the Dardanelles and the Danish Sound have handed inordinate power and influence to the states that control them. 4. The mainland trunk of the peninsula is amplified by several large sub-peninsulas which protrude into the surrounding seas. One such mountainous promontory, Scandinavia, adjoins the Baltic. Three others, Iberia, Italy and the Balkan Massif, adjoin the Mediterranean. Two more, Crimea and Caucasus, adjoin the Black Sea. Each of them, though physically joined to the continent, has more readily been approached by sea than by land. Scandinavia, once the site of the shrinking European ice cap, could never support a large population. But its wild western fjords are tempered by the Gulf Stream, the mountains are rich in minerals, and the morainic lakes left by the retreating ice are abundant in fish. What the Scandinavians lack in terms of climate, they have gained from a secure home base. The Iberian Peninsula consists largely of a lofty tableland, separated from the rest of the continent by the high peaks of the Pyrenees. Its eastern seaboard forms part of the Mediterranean world, and in early times was drawn successively into the Carthaginian, Roman and Muslim spheres. But much of the arid interior is drawn through the valleys of the Douro, the Tagus and the Guadalquivir towards the Atlantic. Hence, in modern times, whilst Aragon expanded eastward into the Mediterranean, Portugal and Castile moved confidently to the Western Ocean. 
They were Europe's first colonial powers, and they once divided the world between them. Italy is the most perfect of peninsulas. The Alpine barrier to the north is seamless. The plain of the Po forms a rich natural larder. The long craggy leg and toe shelter a large number of fertile, impregnable valleys with ready access to the sea. Some of these Italian localities have been rich and extrovert. One of them, Rome, gave rise to the largest empire of the ancient world. But after Rome's decline, they could so defend their independence that Italy was not reunited again for almost two thousand years. The Balkan Peninsula is far less welcoming than Italy. Its interior is more arid, the mountains, from the Dineric Alps to the Rhodopes, more stony, the valleys more remote, the sea less accessible. Its main function in history has been to preserve the tenacious communities which cling to its soil and which block the direct passage between the Mediterranean and the Danube Basin. The peninsularity of Crimea, formerly known as Taurus, was emphasized by its hinterland on the Ukrainian steppe, which was not permanently settled until recent times. It looks to the sea, the sun, and the south, and formed part of successive East Mediterranean civilizations until conquered by the Russian Empire in 1783. The Caucasus, too, has many peninsular characteristics. Although it is physically joined to land at both ends, to Europe in the north and to Asia in the south, the mountains which ring it on the landward side are so massive that its activities have inevitably been channeled seawards. The ridge of the Greater Caucasus, which tops 18,000 feet, 5,486 meters, is significantly higher than the Alps or the Carpathians. The Lesser Caucasus, to the south, attains a similar elevation on Mount Ararat, 16,786 feet, or 5,165 meters. The inhabitants of the Caucasus are Eurasians in more senses than one. 5. Europe was endowed by nature with 10,000 islands. The largest of them, Iceland, Ireland, Great Britain, Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, and Crete, have been able at various times to develop distinct cultures and political entities of their own. One sceptred isle, in exceptional circumstances and for a very brief period, was able to amass the largest empire in world history. They are all part of Europe, yet physically and psychologically separate. As the twin slots on the post boxes in Messina and Syracuse rightly indicate, there are two different worlds, Sicilia and Continente. Many of the lesser islands, from Spitsbergen to Malta, stand like watchmen in the lonely sea. But others are grouped in comforting archipelagos that support a sense of mutual interest and identity. The Shetlands, Orkneys and Hebrides off Great Britain, the Balearics off Catalonia, and above all the Ionians, the Sporades, the Cyclades, and the Dodecanese off Greece, all have their collective as well as their individual characters. Nowadays, however, insularity is shrinking fast. Great Britain, for example, built its overseas empire in an era when naval power could provide effective insulation from continental affairs. But the same degree of separation is no longer possible. Naval power has been superseded by aeroplanes and aeroplanes by ICBMs that render surface features, such as the English Channel, almost irrelevant. The British Empire has disappeared, and Britain's dependence on her continental neighbours has correspondingly increased. The opening of the Channel Tunnel in 1994 was an event of more than symbolic importance. It marked the end of Britain's island history. Given the principal divisions of the peninsula, three sub-regions have gained functions of particular importance, the Midi, the Danube Basin, and the Volga Corridor. The Midi, or south of modern France, abuts the Mediterranean coast between the Pyrenees and the Alps. For anyone cruising the Mediterranean, it offers the only painless passage to the northern plain. A landing in the Midi offers the immediate prospect of an easy journey to the main part of the continent. From ancient Marseille or from Arles at the mouth of the Rhone, one can move without hindrance either across the lowland of Languedoc to the Atlantic or round the flank of the Massif Central to the headwaters of the Loire and the Seine. The Rhone's main tributary, the Saône, leads straight to the Belfort Gap and a gentle descent to the Rhine. At every other point between Gibraltar and the Dardanelles, 
the early northbound traveller would be faced with alpine passes, dead ends, or lengthy detours. The felicitous location of the Midi, bridgeland between the Mediterranean and the plain, had important consequences. It provided the most effective setting for the fusion of the ancient civilization of the south with the barbarian cultures of the north. For the Romans, it offered, as Cisalpine Gaul, the first major province beyond Italy. For the Franks, the first of the barbarians to establish a major empire of their own, it offered the promise of the sun and of high culture. They established a foothold in AD 537, a century after the fall of Roman power, and never let go. The resultant Kingdom of France, partly northern, partly Mediterranean, developed the most influential and the most universal culture of the continent. The Danube Basin, like the Midi, links the plain with the Mediterranean, but in this case the link lies west-east. The Danube rises in the Black Forest, crosses the mountain line in the Bavarian Gap at Passau, and flows east for 1,500 miles to the Black Sea. For peoples approaching from the east, it offered the simplest route to the interior. For the peoples of the plain, the most tempting itinerary to the southern seas. For most of its length, it constituted the principal frontier line of the Roman Empire, and hence of civilization. In modern times, its catchment area supplied the territorial base for the great multinational empire of the Habsburgs, and the scene for the principal confrontation in Europe between Christianity and Islam. Of all the bridge lands, however, none is more vital than that through which the Volga flows. By modern convention, the continental divide is taken to lie on the line of the Ural Mountains and the Ural River. To the west of the Ural, in the Volga Basin, one is in Europe. To the east of the Ural, in Siberia or Kazakhstan, one is in Asia. On the banks of the Volga, therefore, at Saratov or Tsaritsyn, one stands truly at the gate. For the Volga marks the first European station on the high road of the steppe, and it fills the corridor which joins the Baltic with the Caspian. Until the 17th century, the Volga also happened to coincide with the limit of Christian settlement, and hence with an important cultural boundary. It is Europe's largest river, and a worthy guardian of the peninsula which stretches from the Atlantic to the Urals. Environmental change is taken for granted in all aspects of physical geography. Yet traditional disciplines, such as geology, give the impression that the pace of change is so slow as to be marginal within the human time frame. Only recently has the realization dawned that the modern environment is far less fixed than was once supposed. Climate, for example, is constantly on the move. In Civilization and Climate, the American scholar Ellsworth Huntington published the fruits of his ingenious research into the giant redwoods of California. It was the starting point of historical climatology. Since the redwoods can live for more than 3,000 years, and since the annual rings of their trunks vary in size according to the warmth and humidity of every year that passes, the cross-section of a redwood trunk provides a systematic record of climatic variations over three millennia. Huntington's technique, now called dendrochronology, inspired a pulsatory theory of alternating climatic phases which could be applied to the past of all the continents. This, in turn, produced a special brand of environmental determinism. The growth of classical civilization in the Mediterranean could be attributed to the onset of a moist phase, which permitted the cultivation of wheat in North Africa, for instance, whilst Northern Europe floundered under an excessive deluge of rain, fog and frost. The decline of the ancient world could be attributed to a climatic shift in the opposite direction, which brought Mediterranean sunshine north of the Alps. The migrations of the Mongols, which directly affected the history both of China and of Europe, could be attributed to an extended drought in the oases of Central Asia. In his later work, The Mainsprings of Civilization, Huntington explored other factors of the physical environment, such as diet and disease, and their interplay with human heredity. Crude linkages gave the subject a bad name, and attempts have since been made to refine the earlier findings. Nevertheless, periodicity theories continue to have their advocates. Cyclomania is not yet dead. The rise and fall of civilizations has been linked to everything from sunspots to locust swarms. Whatever their particular preference, 
scholars are bound to be drawn to the phenomenon of environmental variation and to its impact on human affairs. After all, it is a matter of simple fact that climate does vary. Parts of the Roman world, which once supported a flourishing population, now find themselves in desert wasteland. Viking graves were once dug in plots in Iceland and Greenland, which permafrost renders impenetrable to pick or shovel. In the 17th century, annual fairs were held on the winter ice of the Thames in London, and armies marched across the frozen Baltic in places where similar ventures would now be suicidal. The European environment is not a fixed entity, even if its subtler rhythms cannot always be exactly measured. Arnold Toynbee's A Study of History, which offered a comprehensive theory of the growth, breakdown, and disintegration of civilizations, is but the most prominent of environmental histories. After discussing the genesis of civilizations in terms of mankind's response to the challenge of the environment, he propounds his law on the virtues of adversity, the Roman Campania, the semi-desert of Judah, the sandy wastes of Brandenburg, and the hostile shore of New England are all cited as dour environments that have generated a vigorous response. One might add the backwards of Muscovy. After outlining the stimuli of blows, pressures, and penalizations, he comes to the concept of the golden mean. If the Slavs in Eastern Europe suffered from a lack of early stimuli, the Celts and the Scandinavians suffered from excessive adversity. According to Toynbee, the nearest thing to ideal conditions was experienced by the Hellenic civilization of ancient Greece, the finest flower of the species that has ever yet come to bloom. Nowadays, though the impact of the environment on man is by no means discounted, special attention is also paid to the impact of man on the environment. Historical ecology emerged as an academic subject well before the onset of the greenhouse effect, alerted everyone to its importance. It calls on a wide range of technological wizardry. Aerial archaeology has revolutionized our knowledge of the prehistoric landscape. Sedimentology, which studies the patterns of riverine deposits, and glaciology, which studies the patterns of ice formation in glaciers, have been mobilized to give new precision to environmental change over centuries and millennia. Geochemical analysis, which measures telltale phosphates in the soil of ancient habitations, has given archaeologists another potent tool. Palynology, or pollen analysis, which analyzes ancient grains preserved in the earth, permits the reconstruction of former plant life spectra. Specialists debate the evidence for the great elm decline, for the crops of prehistoric agriculture, or for the chronology of forest clearances. Peat analysis, which depends on the composition and rate of accumulation of peat bogs, has identified five major climatic deteriorations in the period between 3000 BC and AD 1000. The science of prehistory has moved far from the time when archaeologists could only dig objects out of the earth and struggle to match their finds with fragmentary references in the writings of the ancients. Today's prehistorians also place great emphasis on the processes of prehistoric social change. Time was when almost all new cultural phenomena were explained in terms of human migration. The emergence of new burial practices, of new rites, of new artefacts, or of a new language group, was automatically linked to the presumed arrival of new peoples. Now, though prehistoric migrations are not discounted, it is well understood that material and cultural changes can be explained in terms of evolution within existing populations. Technological advances, religious conversions, and linguistic evolutions must all be taken into consideration. European prehistory has to be related to two chronologies of entirely different orders of magnitude. Geological time, which spans the estimated 4,550 million years since the formation of the Earth, is divided into eras, periods, and epochs from the Ozoic to the Holocene. Human life, in contrast, is confined to the terminal tip of geological time. Its earliest origins occur in Africa, in the middle of the Pliocene. It reaches Europe in the middle of Pleistocene. It does not move into the stage called civilization until after the end of the Quaternary. 
Europe in its present form is no more than five million years old, and the human presence in Europe has not lasted for more than one million years. On the scale of geological time, the formation of the European peninsula must be counted as a recent event. Eighty million years ago, most of the land that was destined to constitute Europe lay half submerged in a scattered archipelago of mid-ocean islands. After that, as the Atlantic opened up to its fullest extent, the drifting African plate closed the ocean gap from the south. Five million years ago, Africa was still directly joined to Eurasia, with the Alps and the Atlas Mountains piled high on either side of the dry Mediterranean trench. But then the natural dam at Gibraltar broke, a gigantic waterfall of seawater, one hundred times the size of Victoria Falls, rushed in and completed the peninsula's familiar outline. Two final afterthoughts, less than ten thousand years ago, opened up the English Channel and the Danish Sound, thereby creating first the British Isles and then the Baltic Sea. Over the last million years, the young peninsula lived through seventeen ice ages. At its greatest extent, the ice sheet reached to a line joining North Devon, Hanover, Krakow, and Kiev. Humanoid visitors made their appearance during the warmer interglacials. The earliest traces of man in Europe have been found at sites near Vertesulus in Hungary and at Isernia in Italy, both dated 850 to 700,000 BC. At Isernia, Homo erectus ate a varied diet from the fauna of a savanna type countryside. At Terra Armata, on the beach near Nice, a human footprint 400,000 years old was found in hard baked fireside clay. In 1987, a cache of fossilized human remains was discovered deep in a cave chamber at Atapuerca, near Burgos in Spain. In the course of the Ice Ages, human evolution progressed through the stages of Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, and Homo sapiens sapiens, modern humankind. The remains of a transitional creature were found in a quarry in the Neanderthal Valley near Dusseldorf in 1856, thereby provoking the public debate on human origins that has continued ever since. The Neanderthals, with massive bones and short limbs, are thought to have been a specifically European variant adapted to glacial conditions. They used flint tools, understood the secret of fire, buried their dead, and cared for the living. Their particular brand of Mousterian stone technology was named after a site in Dordogne. They hunted in organized collectives, as shown by the sites at La Côte de saint brelade on the island of Jersey, or more recently at Zvoleng in Poland, which was used over many millennia for the entrapment of stampeding horses and mammoths. They passed away some forty to thirty-five thousand years ago, during the last interglacial. Recent finds at Saint-Césaire have suggested that they survived for a time alongside new immigrants who were arriving from Africa and the Middle East. The newcomers were slight in build, but much more dexterous, possessing finger bones only half as thick as those of their predecessors. As shown by remains from Sungir in northern Russia, they could thread very fine bone needles and could sew clothes. They are widely known as cavemen, but caves were only one of their habitats. They roamed the plains, hunting bison and mammoth and gathering wild plants. At Merzirich in Ukraine, one Ice Age encampment has survived intact. Its spacious huts were built from hundreds of mammoth bones covered with hides. The end of the last Ice Age was preceded by the daddy of all volcanic explosions. The pressure of the African plate had opened a fault line running along the bed of the Mediterranean, and it created a string of volcanoes which still exist. Some 36,000 years ago, the largest of these volcanoes blew its cone, leaving a trail of volcanic ash that reached to the Volga. At Pozzuoli, near Naples, it left a caldera, or crater ring, some seven miles wide. It was the forerunner of all the greatest eruptions of historic times. At Thera, in 1628 BC, at Vesuvius in AD 79, at Etna, in 1669. It is a sobering reminder that mankind has always been skating on the fragile crust of its geological heritage. By convention, the human sector of European prehistory is usually related to the three-age system 
of stone, bronze, and iron. The system was first set out in 1836 by a Danish antiquary, Christian Thomson, and it provides a framework of time based on the changing implements of primitive man. Hence, the Paleolithic, Old Stone Age, refers to the vast period before the end of the Ice Ages when man worked with chipped stone tools. The Mesolithic, Middle Stone Age, refers to the much more recent period following the last of the ice, approximately 8,000 to 3,000 BC. The two millennia which preceded the Christian or Common Era, which forms our own arbitrary scheme of chronology, were taken up successively by the Neolithic, New Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. Each of these technological ages can be subdivided into early, middle, and late phases. It is essential to remember, however, that the three-age system is not based on any absolute scale of time. At any given moment, one place might have lingered in the Neolithic, whilst others had reached the Iron Age. In any given region, there could be peoples living at different stages of development or using different forms of technology simultaneously. The Old Stone Age reached back for a million years. It overlapped with the penultimate era of quaternary geological time, the Pleistocene, and with the last great glaciations, known respectively as Mindel, Riss, and Wurm. Apart from Neanderthal and Le Moustier, invaluable finds have been made at Cro-Magnon, Grimaldi, Combe Capelle, Chancelade, and at all points between Abbeville and Oidjof, each associated with particular humanoid types, periods, or cultures. At Aurignac, Solutre, and Abri la Madeleine, Sculptures of the human form first appeared in the shape of figurines, such as the Venus of Willendorf or the Venus of Lossel. With the Magdalenian period, at the end of the Paleolithic age when bone tools were in fashion, under the shadow of the last ice cap, the high point of cave art was reached. Magnificent subterranean galleries have survived at Altamira in Spain and at Lascaux in Dordogne leading some commentators to talk of a Franco-Cantabrian school. In a cave near Monton on the Riviera, a hoard of Cassis Rufa shells from the Indian Ocean was found. The shells were thought to possess life-giving powers, and their presence would seem to confirm both a sophisticated religious system and a far-flung trading network. The Middle Stone Age, or Mesolithic, represents a transitional era when man was adapting to rapidly improving climatic conditions. The terminal moraine of the last Finno-Scandinavian ice sheet has been dated to 7,300 BC. Technological advance was characterized by the appearance of microliths, very small pointed or bladed flints. Greatly increased supplies of fish and shellfish encouraged settlement along the lakes, rivers, and coasts. Earlier cultures identified in the south, as at Mar d'Azil in the Pyrenees, were complemented by more northerly ones, such as Maglamos in Zealand or Ertabulla in Jutland, where deep-sea fishing emerged. For the first time, the Mesolithic stone axe was capable of felling the largest trees. The new Stone Age, or Neolithic, was marked by the transition from food gathering to food production. The domestication of plants and animals otherwise known as agriculture, was accompanied by further improvements in stone technology, where grinding, polishing, and boring produced implements of far superior quality. This Neolithic revolution began in the Middle East in the 8th millennium BC, in northern parts of Europe as late as the 2nd. It saw the beginnings of cattle, sheep, and pig farming, of horse breeding and of hybridization to produce mules, of systematic cereal production, of ploughing, weaving, pottery, mining. It also saw the principal drive for the comprehensive colonization of the peninsula, where previously only scattered settlements had existed. Two main lines of Neolithic advance have been identified, one which is associated with the linear band ceramic, or linear pottery, moved rapidly up the Danube Valley into central Europe. In a brief spurt of perhaps 700 years in the fifth millennium, it crossed the 1,500 miles between present-day Romania and the Netherlands. The pioneer settlements clustered round great communal longhouses built from the largest timbers of the newly cleared forest. Problems of agricultural over-exploitation and of manpower shortages 
led to temporary retreats, followed by the characteristic reoccupation of abandoned sites. A second line of advance, associated with the spread of a stamped pottery culture, moved westwards round the Mediterranean shore. In the fourth millennium, there were further extensions of agricultural settlement into the peninsula's western and northern extremities, into Iberia, France, and Switzerland, the British Isles, Scandinavia, and eastern parts of the Great Plain. By approximately 3200 BC, the whole of the peninsula below latitude 62 degrees north was occupied by various types of a food-producing economy. In this era, lake villages were built such as those at Charavine near Grenoble, at Chalin in the Jura, on the Ferdesee in Württemberg, or on Lake Zurich. They are particularly valuable to archaeologists since the mud of the lake has acted as an almost perfect preservative of everything from kitchen utensils to half-eaten apple cores. Overall, six principal Neolithic zones have been established, an East Mediterranean and Balkan zone, under strong influences from the Levant, the Tripolye kukuteni zone on the Ukrainian steppe, the Baltic Black Sea zone of cord-impressed ceramics and of the Battle Axe people, the central zone of linear ceramics, with its heartland in Bohemia but with outposts west of the Rhine and east of the Vistula, the northern zone of the Great Plain, dominated by funnel-necked beakerware, and the western zone of the Bell Beaker people, stretching from southern Spain to the British Isles and Scandinavia. Late Neolithic cultures were often connected with vast megalith constructions, varying from simple dolmens or menhirs to huge chambered tombs, stone avenues, and stone circles. The principal sites are at New Grange, Ireland, and Maze Howe in the Orkneys, at Carnac in Brittany, and at Avebury and Stonehenge in Wiltshire. The risky suggestion has been made that they owe their development to international enterprise, even to contact with Egyptian or possibly Minoan metal prospectors. The Chalcolithic Age is a term used by some prehistorians to describe the long transitional phase when stone and bronze overlapped. The Bronze Age was marked by the manufacture of a new alloy through the admixture of copper with tin. Its onset began in the Middle East, approximately 3000 BC, in northern Europe perhaps a thousand years later. Especially in the Mediterranean, it saw the growth of urban culture, written records, specialized crafts, widespread trade. Its greatest achievements were found at Mycenae, unearthed by Heinrich Schliemann from 1876, and at Knossos in Crete, excavated by Sir Arthur Evans in 1899 to 1930. These sites are roughly contemporary with the stone circles at Stonehenge, whose three phases of construction began approximately 2600 BC. Charcoal from the Aubrey Holes of Phase 1 at Stonehenge has been carbon dated to 1848 BC plus or minus 275 years, an antler pick from a stone socket of Phase 3 to 1710 BC plus or minus 150 years. Hence, whilst advanced civilizations akin to those of the Middle East were developing in the Aegean, the peoples of the Northwest were passing through the transition from Neolithic to Bronze. However, talk of advanced or backward cultures might well be inhibited by the skills of the engineers of Stonehenge, who contrived to transport 80 blue stones weighing over 50 tons apiece from the distant Preseli Mountains of South Wales, and to erect them with such precision that awestruck observers have imagined them to be the working parts of a sun computer. Indeed, carvings at Stonehenge of axes and daggers resembling objects found in the shaft graves at Mycenae gave rise once again to speculation about direct contacts with the Mediterranean. Interregional trade, especially in minerals, is one of the important features of Bronze Age Europe. The peninsula's mineral resources were rich and varied, but their distribution was uneven, and a widespread network of trade routes grew up in response to the imbalances. Salt had been sought from the earliest times, either by mining rock salt or by evaporating brine from seaside salt pans. Huge rock salt mountains occur naturally in several locations, from Cardona in Catalonia to the Salzkammergut in Austria or Wielitzka in Poland. Primitive salt pans or salinae were located all along the hot southern coast, 
from the Rhone to the Dnieper. Now permanent salt roads began to function. Best known among them was the ancient Via Salaria, which linked Rome with the salt pans of the Adriatic coast. Amber, which can be found both on the western shore of Jutland and on the Baltic shore east of the Vistula, was greatly prized as jewellery. The ancient Amber Road ran down the valley of the Oder, through the Moravian Gap to the Danube, and over the Brenner Pass to the Adriatic. Obsidian and lapis lazuli were also in great demand. Copper and tin were the staples. Copper came first from Cyprus, whence its name, later from the Dolomites, and above all from the Carpathians. Carpathian copper found its way northwards at an early date to Scandinavia, and was later sent south to the Aegean. Tin, which was not always distinguished by the ancients from lead, was brought from distant Cornwall. The search for copper and tin seems to have stimulated transcontinental contacts more effectively than the subsequent search for iron, which was found much more readily. Special prominence accrued to those districts where several of the desired commodities could be found in close proximity. One such district was the Salzkammergut, Noricum, where the salt mountains of Ischel and Hallstatt lay alongside the metal mines of Noriai. Another lay in the vicinity of Krakow, where silver, lead, iron, and salt could all be found within a stone's throw of the upper Vistula. Most productive of all, however, were the islands of the Aegean. Milos yielded obsidian, Paros yielded pure white marble, Kithnos yielded copper, Siphnos and Laurion, on the coast of Attica, yielded silver and lead. The wealth and power of Crete, and later of Mycenae, was clearly connected with the command of these Aegean resources and with their role as the termini of the transcontinental trade routes. They were the focus of what has been called the international spirit of the Bronze Age. Neither Crete nor Mycenae were known to the early classicists who first formed our view of the ancient world. But it is now generally accepted that Minoan culture on Crete and Mycenaean culture on mainland Greece formed the twin peaks of Europe's first civilization. From the day when Schliemann found a golden death mask in one of the royal shaft graves at Mycenae, and telegraphed the mistaken news, Today I have looked on the face of Agamemnon. It was clear that he was opening up something far more significant than just another rich prehistoric grave. Both the palisites on Crete at Knossos, Festus, and Malia, and the mainland sites at Mycenae, Tirins and Pylos have yielded abundant proof of art, religion, technology, and social organization of a far more sophisticated kind than anything known before. The golden age of Minoan life in the so-called palatial period began approximately 1900 BC. That of the more warlike Mycenaeans, whose fortresses commanded the plain of Argos and the Gulf of Corinth, began three or four centuries later. Together with the Trojans, who commanded the Dardanelles, the Minoans and the Mycenaeans brought European history out of the realm of faceless archaeology. In the late Bronze Age of Central Europe, a widespread group of urnfield cultures was characterized by cemeteries where the cremated remains of the dead were buried in urns, together with elaborate grave goods. Important Bronze Age sites have been found at Terra Mare, Italy, El Largar, Spain, Leibingen, Buchal, Adlerberg, Germany, Unakitska, near Prague in Czechoslovakia, and at Otomani in Romania. In the last quarter of the second millennium, approximately 1200 BC, Bronze Age Europe suffered an unexplained breakdown from which it never recovered. Archaeologists write of a general systems collapse. Trade was disrupted, cities were abandoned, political structures were destroyed. Waves of invaders descended on the remnants. Crete, having barely withstood a series of terrible natural catastrophes, had already fallen to the Mycenaean Greeks before Mycenae itself was destroyed. Within the space of a single century, many established centres passed into oblivion. The Aegean was overrun by tribes from the interior. The Hittite Empire in Asia Minor came to an end. Egypt itself was besieged by unidentified sea peoples. The Urnfield people survived in Central Europe, relapsing into a long passive era which ended with the appearance of the Celts. 
Greece was plunged into its archaic Dark Age, which separated the legendary era of the Trojan Wars from the recorded history of the later city-states. The Iron Age brings prehistory within range of regular historical sources. Ironworking is usually thought to have been initiated by the Hittites of Asia Minor. A gold-hilted dagger with an iron blade, unearthed from the royal tombs at Aladja Huyuk, may originate from the end of the third millennium BC. From there, the use of iron spread first to Egypt, approximately 1200 BC, to the Aegean, approximately 1000 BC, and to the Danube Basin, approximately 750 BC. On the mainland of the peninsula, the prehistoric Iron Age is customarily divided into two successive periods, that of Hallstatt, approximately 750 to 400 BC, and of La Ten, approximately 400 to 50. Hallstatt, a site in the Salzkammergut, first explored in 1846, gave its name to a period and culture which blended the traditions of the former Urnfield people with fresh influences coming from the east. La Ten, a site on Lake Neuchâtel in Switzerland discovered in 1858, gave its name to the second period where ironworking reached a very high level of competence. Long swords, beautifully wrought from a hard iron core and a soft iron cutting edge, which could be fearfully sharpened, were the hallmark of a warrior society living in great hill forts. These people were familiar with the potter's wheel, with horse-drawn chariots, with the minting of coins, and with highly stylistic art forms that combine native, Mediterranean, and even nomadic elements. At Rudki in the Holy Cross Mountains near Krakow in southern Poland, they left traces of the most extensive ironworkings in prehistoric Europe. They were active traders, and the tombs of their princes have yielded up Celtic jewellery, Etruscan vases, Greek amphorae, Roman artefacts. Not without dissenting voices, they have been widely identified with the Celts, the first great nation north of the Alps whose name we know. Apart from La Ten itself, important sites are located at Entremont in Provence, at Alésir in Burgundy, and at Villanova in Emilia. With the appearance of Celts, European prehistory reaches the knottiest of all problems, the matching of the material cultures defined by archaeologists with the ethnic and linguistic groupings known from other sources. Most prehistorians do indeed accept that those ironworkers of the Latin period were Celts, that they derived from the formation or influx of Celtic tribes in the first millennium BC, and that they were one and the same group whom Greek and Roman literary records refer to as Keltoi or Keltai. But the most recent survey of the matter maintains that the origin of the Celtic languages may lie much further back, in the Neolithic era. One thing is certain. Modern linguistic research has proved beyond doubt that the languages of the Celts are cognate both to Latin and to Greek, and to most of the languages of modern Europe. The Celts were the vanguard of a linguistic community that can be more clearly defined than the archaeological communities of prehistory. The Celts stand at the centre of the Indo-European phenomenon. As long ago as 1786, Sir William Jones, a British judge serving in Calcutta, made the epoch-making discovery that the main languages of Europe are closely related to the principal languages of India. Jones saw the link between classical Latin and Greek and ancient Sanskrit. It subsequently turned out that many modern Indian languages formed part of the same family as their counterparts in Europe namely the Romance, Celtic, Germanic, Baltic, and Slavonic groups. At the time, no one had any idea how this family of Indo-European languages could have found its way across Eurasia, though it came to be assumed that they must have been carried to the West by migrating peoples. In 1902, however, a German archaeologist, Gustav Kosiner, linked the Indo-Europeans with a specific type of corded ware pottery, that was widely distributed in sites throughout northern Germany. Kosina's conclusions indicated that an Indo-European homeland could have existed in the North European Iron Age. The idea was developed by the prominent Australian archaeologist Via Gordon Child, whose synthesis, The Dawn of European Civilization, was one of the most influential books of its day. Most recently, the Lithuanian-American archaeologist Maria Gimbutas has confirmed his placement of the Indo-European homeland on the steppe lands of Ukraine, 
by identifying it with the widespread Kurgan culture of barrow burials in that area. Constantly accumulating archaeological discoveries have effectively eliminated the earlier theories of Indo-European homelands. The Kurgan culture seems the only remaining candidate for being proto-Indo-European. There was no other culture in the Neolithic and Chalcolithic periods which would correspond with the hypothetical mother culture of the Indo-Europeans, as reconstructed with the help of common words. And there were no other great expansions and conquests affecting whole territories where the earliest historic sources and a cultural continuum prove the existence of Indo-European speakers. The essential point here is that Gordon Child and his successors were using the term culture in relation to human groups defined both by material and by linguistic criteria. Yet on reflection, there seems no good reason why archaeological cultures should necessarily be correlated with linguistic groups in this way. The Indo-European enigma is not really solved. It is particularly exciting to realize that languages evolve by ceaseless mutation, just as living organisms do. In this case, it may become possible to correlate the chronology of language change in Europe with that of genetic change. By comparing the time trace of linguistic clocks with that of our molecular clocks, the story of the origins of the European peoples and their languages may one day be unravelled. Europe's place names are the product of thousands of years. They form a deep resource for understanding its past. The names of rivers, hills, towns, provinces and countries are often the relics of bygone ages. The science of onomastics can delve beneath the crust of historical records. By common consent, the names of rivers are among the most ancient and persistent. They are frequently the only surviving links with the peoples who preceded the present population. By a process of accretion, they can sometimes preserve a record of the successive waves of settlement on their banks. The River Avon, for example, combines two synonyms, one English, the other the older Welsh. Five Celtic root words connected with water, Avon, Dur, Ushka, Re, and possibly Don, supply the commonest elements in river names right across Europe. Scholars endlessly disagree, of course. But among the best-known candidates would be the Inn and the Yon, Avignon on the Rodanus, Watertown on the Swift River, the Esk, the Etch, or Ardija, the Usk, and the Danube. Celtic names abound from Portugal to Poland. The modern Welsh Dur, water, for example, has its cognates in D, Douro, Dordogne, Derwent, clear water, Durance, and Oder Odre. Pen, meaning head, and hence mountain, appears in Pennine, Apennine, Pianini, and Pindus. Ard, high, in Arden, Arden, Lizard, high cape, and Auvergne, Er Farren, high country. Dun, fort, in Dunkeld, fort of the Celts, Dungannon, London, Verdun, Augusto Dunum, fort Augustus, Autun, Lugdunum, Lyon, Lugodinum, Leiden, Thun in Switzerland, and Tignetz near Krakow, all attest to the far-flung presence of the Celts. Similar exercises can be undertaken with Norse roots, Germanic roots, Slavonic roots, even Phoenician and Arabic roots. Etna is a very suitable Phoenician name, meaning the furnace. Elsewhere in Sicily, Marsala has a simple Arabic name, meaning port of God. Trajan's bridge across the upper Tagus in Spain is now known as La Puente de Alcantara, Alcantara being the exact Arabic equivalent of the Latin Pons. Slavonic place names spread much further west than the present-day Slavonic population. In northern Germany, for example, they are common in the region of Hanover. In Austria, names such as Zwetl, Zwietli, Bright Spot, Dobling, Dub, Little Oak, or Feistritz, Bistritze, Swift Stream, can be encountered from the environs of Vienna to Tyrol. In Italy, they overlap with Italian in the province of Friuli. The names of towns and villages frequently incorporate a record of their origins. Edinburgh was once Edwin's Fort, Paris, the city of the Parisii tribe, Turin, Torino, the city of the Taurini, 
Göttingen, the family home of the Godings, Krakow, Krakow, the seat of good King Krak. Elsewhere, they record the attributes or function of the place. Lisboa, Lisbon, means good spot. Trondheim means home of the throne. Munich, München, place of the monks. Red Ruth, place of the Druids. Novgorod, new city. Sometimes they recall distant disasters. Osaya in Tuscany, meaning place of bones, lies on the site of Hannibal's victory at Trasimeno in 217 BC. Pourrière in Provence, originally Campi Putridi, Putrid Fields, marks the slaughter of the Teutons by Marius in 102 BC. Leschfeld in Bavaria, the Field of Corpses, the scene of the Magyars' defeat in AD 955. The names of nations frequently reflect the way they saw themselves or were seen by others. The West Celtic neighbours of the Anglo-Saxons called themselves Cymri, or compatriots, but were dubbed Welsh, or foreigners, by the Germanic intruders. Similarly, French-speaking Walloons are known to the Flemings as Walsh. The Germanic peoples often called themselves Deutsch or Dutch, meaning Germain or alike, but are called Niemca, the dumb, by their Slavonic neighbours. The Slavs think of each other as the people of the Slova, or common word, or as Serb, kinsmen. They often call the Latins Vlaki, Valux, or Vwaha, which is another variation on the Welsh theme. The assorted Vlach and Wallachians of the Balkans tend to call themselves Romani, Rumeni, or Aromani, Romans. The names of countries and provinces frequently record the people who once ruled them. The Celtic root of Gal, indicating land of the Gales or Gauls, occurs in Portugal, Galicia in Spain, Gallia, Gaul, Pays de Gal, Wales, Cornwall, Donegal, Caledonia, later Scotland, Galloway, Calais, Galicia in southern Poland, even in distant Galatia in Asia Minor. Place names, however, are infinitely mobile. They change over time, and they vary according to the language and the perspective of the people who use them. They are the intellectual property of their users, and as such have caused endless conflicts. They can be the object of propaganda, of tendentious wrangling, of rigid censorship, even of wars. In reality, where several variants exist, one cannot speak of correct or incorrect forms. One can only indicate the variant which is appropriate to a particular time, place, or usage. Equally, when referring to events over large areas of time and space, the historian is often forced to make a choice between equally inappropriate alternatives. Yet historians must always be sensitive to the implications. One easily forgets that Spain, France, England, Germany, Poland, or Russia are relatively recent labels which can easily be used anachronistically. It is clearly wrong to talk of France instead of Gaul in the Roman period, as it is dubious to speak of Russia prior to the state in Muscovy. Writing in English, one automatically writes of the English Channel, ignoring that La Manche is at least half French. Writing in Polish, one automatically writes Lipsk for Leipzig, without laying claim to the Polishness of Saxony, just as in German one says Danzig for Gdansk or Breslau for Wrocław, without necessarily implying the exclusive Germanity of Pomerania or Silesia. One forgets that official language, which presents place names in forms preferred by the bureaucracy of the ruling state, does not always concur with the practice of the inhabitants. Above all, one forgets that different people have every reason to think of place names in different ways, and that no one has the right to dictate exclusive forms. One man's Derry is another man's London Derry. This person's Antwerpen is the other person's Anvers. For them, it was East Galicia or Eastern Little Poland. For others, it is Western Ukraine. For the ancients, it was the Voristhenis. For the moderns, it is the Dnieper, the Dnieper, or the Dnieper. For them it is Oxford, or even New Gin, for us forever Ridachen. European history has always been an ambiguous concept. Indeed, both Europe and history are ambiguous. 
Europe may just refer to that peninsula whose landward boundary for long stayed undefined, in which case historians must decide for themselves where the arbitrary bounds of their studies will lie. But European can equally apply to the peoples and cultures which originated on the peninsula, in which case the historian will be struggling with the worldwide problems of European civilization. History may refer to the past in general, or else, in distinction to prehistory, it may be confined to that part of the past for which a full range of sources are extant. With prehistory, one is dealing with the evidence of myth, of language, and above all of archaeology. With history in the narrower sense, one is also dealing with literary records, with documents, and above all with the work of earlier historians. In either case, whether one is beckoned by the ends of prehistory or the beginning of history proper, one is brought to the terminus of Europa's ride to the island of Crete. 1628 BC, Canossus, Crete Standing on the high northern terrace of the palace, the courtiers of Minos looked out to the distant sea over the shimmering groves of olive and cypress. They were the servants of the great priest-king, masters of the Cretan Thalassocratia, the world's first seaborne empire. Supported by the trade of their far-ranging ships, they lived a life of comfort, of ritual, and of administrative order. Their quarters were supplied with running water, with drainage, and with flushed sewers. Their walls were covered with frescoes, griffins, dolphins, and flowers, painted onto luminous settings of deep blue and gold. Their spacious courtyards were regularly turned into arenas for the ceremonial sport of bull-leaping, their underground storehouses were packed with huge stone vats, filled with corn, wine, and oil, for four thousand people. Their domestic accounts were immaculately kept on soft clay tablets, using a method of writing which progressed over the centuries through hieroglyphic, cursive, and linear forms. Their craftsmen were skilled in jewellery, metalwork, ceramics, faience. They were so confident of their power and prosperity that none of their palaces was fortified. Religion played a vital role in the life of the Minoans. The central object of their worship was probably the great earth goddess, later known as Rhea, mother of Zeus. She was revealed in many forms and aspects, and was attended by a host of lesser deities. Her sanctuaries were placed on mountaintops, in caves, or in the temple chambers of the palaces. Surviving seal stones portray naked women embracing the sacred boulders in ecstasy. Sacrifices were surrounded by the cult of the bull, by orgies, and by a mass of ritual paraphernalia such as altar tables, votive containers, blood buckets, and wasp-waisted statuettes of fertility goddesses. The ubiquitous symbols of bull's horns and of the labris or double-headed axe were carried on high poles in procession. In times of danger or disaster, the sacrifice of animals was supplemented by the sacrifice of human children even by cannibalistic feasts. After all, Rhea's husband, Cronus, was remembered as a devourer of children, and, but for a timely ruse, would have eaten the infant Zeus. Minoan ritual, therefore, was intense, but it was an important ingredient in the social cement which held a peaceable society together for centuries. Some observers have remarked on the absence of modern masculinity in representation of Minoan males. These remarks necessarily prompt questions about the island's role in the transition from primitive matriarchy and the onset of patriarchal warfare. Minoan civilization flourished on Crete for the best part of a thousand years. According to Sir Arthur Evans, the excavator of Knossos, it passed through nine distinct phases, each identified with a particular ceramic style, from early Minoan I to late Minoan III. The zenith was reached somewhere in the middle of Minoan II, in the second quarter of the second millennium BC. By that time, unbeknown to the courtiers on the terrace, the first of the great catastrophes was upon them. The ethnic identity of the Minoans is the subject of considerable controversy. The old assumption that they were Hellenes is no longer widely accepted. The Linear A script, which might unlock the language of the earlier periods, has not been deciphered whilst Linear B, which was definitively identified as Greek in 1952, clearly belongs only to the final phase. Arthur Evans was convinced not only of a strong Egyptian influence on Crete, but also of the possibility of Egyptian colonization. 
It may well be asked whether, in the times that marked the triumph of the dynastic element in the Nile Valley, some part of the older population may not have made an actual settlement on the soil of Crete. However, in the course of the second millennium, Crete seems to have been invaded by several waves of migrants. It can reasonably be supposed that the Hellenization of the island began with one of the later waves, some time after the Great Catastrophes. Another possibility is that the Minoans of the Middle Period were Hittites from Asia Minor. The Hittites were Indo-Europeans and spoke a language called Canesian. Their great confederation was centred on what is now Hattushish in Anatolia and mounted a major challenge both to Mesopotamia and to Egypt. In the 14th century BC, their greatest ruler, Sapilaliumus, or Sabilaliuma, extended his sway as far as Jerusalem. In 1269 BC, they entered a treaty of alliance with Egypt. The bilingual text of the tablet recording this event, the oldest diplomatic document in existence, is now displayed in the foyer of the United Nations building in New York. In 1256 BC, the Hittite king, Hattusilis III, travelled to Egypt to attend the wedding of his daughter with the pharaoh Ramesses II. So, if Hittite influence had been spread so widely over the Middle East, there is every likelihood that it could also have been projected from the mainland to Crete. More specifically, the discovery of a ball cult at the Hittite centre of Chital Huyuk in Anatolia suggests a connection of much greater intimacy. But nothing is certain. According to later Greek legend, Crete was the birthplace both of Zeus and of the dreaded Minotaur. Zeus, after abducting Europa, had simply brought her to his island home. A cave on Mount Ida is still shown to tourists as the site of his birth. The Minotaur, on the other hand, was the product of a stranger passion. Persephone, the queen of Minos, was said to have taken a liking to a sacrificial bull presented by the sea god Poseidon, and, with the assistance of Daedalus, the architect of Knossos, had succeeded in having intercourse with it. For this purpose, Daedalus devised a hollow wooden cow, within which the intrepid queen had presumably struck a suitable pose. The resultant offspring was the monstrous minotaur, half man, half beast, l'infamia di Creti, whereupon Daedalus was ordered to devise a labyrinth in which to keep it. At that point the plot thickened with the arrival of Theseus, hero of Athens. Theseus' obsession with killing the Minotaur may well be explained by the fact that he was the child of yet another mother who had dallied with a bull. At all events, having joined the annual transport of seven boys and seven maidens, which Athens paid to Crete as tribute, he managed to reach Knossos, and, mastering the labyrinth by means of a ball of thread provided by Ariadne, Persephone's daughter, he slew the Minotaur and escaped. He then fled with Ariadne to Naxos, where he deserted her. By another lamentable lapse, on approaching Athens he forgot to give the agreed signal of success, which was to change the colour of his sail from black to white. His despairing father, Aegeus, threw himself into the sea, which was henceforth named after him. These stories clearly date from an era when Crete was the great power, and the Greek communities of the mainland were dependent tributaries. Daedalus is also credited by legend with mankind's maiden flight. Barred by Minos from leaving Crete, he fashioned two pairs of wings from wax and feathers and, in the company of his son Icarus, soared from the slopes of Mount Ida. Icarus flew too close to the sun and plunged to his death. But Daedalus flew on to complete his escape to the mainland. Minos may own everything, wrote Ovid, but not the air. Omnia possideat, non possideat aera Minos. Mount Ida stands 8,000 feet, 2,434 meters, above the sea, and one can well imagine how the thermal currents would have carried those human birds to a height where the whole of Aegean civilization was laid out like a map beneath them. Crete itself, a rocky strip some 130 miles in length, faced south to the shore of Africa and north across the Aegean. Its dominion stretched to Sicily in the west and to Cyprus in the east, to the northwest lay the Peloponnese, dominated by the city of Mycenae with its royal beehive tombs and its lion gate. To the northeast, in the angle of Asia Minor, stood the ancient city of Troy. In the centre lay the scattered islands of the Cyclades, 
Crete's first colonies. Nearest of all, set like a jet-black diamond in the deep blue sea, beautiful and ominous, rose the perfect cone of the island of Thera. It is doubtful that the Minoans knew much about the lands and peoples beyond the range of their ships. They knew North Africa, of course, especially Egypt, with which they traded. Cretan envoys are depicted on the temple walls at Thebes. Knossos, at the height of its magnificence in late Minoan II, coincided with the close of the 18th dynasty of Amenhotep III, and hence with the accession of Tutankhamun. The Minoans knew the cities of the Levant, Sidon, Tyre, and Jericho, which were already ancient, and through them the countries of the Near East. In the 17th century BC, the Hebrews were still kept captive in Egypt. The Aryans had recently migrated from Persia to India. The Babylonians ruled over the land of the two rivers, united by Hammurabi the lawgiver. Hammurabi's code, based on the principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, was the civilizational high point of the age. The Assyrians had recently become the vassals of Babylon. The Hittites, having formed the strongest state in Western Asia, were starting to press into Palestine. The Minoans may well have had dealings with the pre-Latin peoples of Italy. There was no obstacle to their ships cruising into the Western Mediterranean. They could also have met the Bel Beaker people and the megalith builders of Malta and southern Spain, and have sailed into the Black Sea, where they could have encountered the Tripolia people. The latter could have acted as middlemen on the last southern leg of the trade routes which led from the dominant Unyakitska and Tumulus peoples of the interior. The prime commodity was copper, its main source the mines of the Dolomites and the Carpathians. Beyond that, the veil of the Minoans' direct knowledge would have been firmly drawn. Whilst they basked in the Bronze Age, the northern lands lingered in the later stages of the Neolithic. The westward march of the Indo-Europeans had undoubtedly begun. It is sometimes associated with the advent of a male-dominated warrior culture, which subdued both its peaceable predecessors and its own women. The advance guard of the Celts was already on station in Central Europe. The Germanic, Baltic, and Slavonic tribes rested somewhere in the rear. The first northern trappers and merchants from beyond the frontier may well have reached the Aegean. Both amber and jade had found their way to Crete. The eruption of Thera, Santorini, was one of the greatest events of European prehistory. In one crack of doom, like that at Krakatoa in modern times, thirty cubic kilometres of rock, fire and sulphuric acid were blown twenty miles into the stratosphere. At a distance of only one hundred miles, the watchers at Knossos could not have failed to see the plume and the flashes, and then the pillar of fiery ash. With nine minutes' delay they would have heard the boom, the rumbles, and the thuds. They would have seen the sea recede as it rushed to fill the gash in the seabed, only to recover with the dispatch of a mighty tidal wave that swamped the Cretan shore under a hundred feet of brine. High above Canossus, on the northern slopes of Mount Euctus, the priests of the mountain shrine busied themselves with the human sacrifice which the disaster demanded. On this occasion, the everyday offerings of fruit, seeds, or wine, or even the slaughter of a prime bull, would not suffice. In the dark central chamber of the temple, one man prepared a blood bucket adorned with the figure of a bull in white relief. At the inner end of the western chamber, a young woman lay face down, legs apart. On a low table, a young man lay with his feet bound. On his chest, a bronze-bladed knife engraved with a boar's head. Beside him stood a powerful man of status, who wore a precious iron ring and an agate sealstone engraved with the figure of a god punting a boat. But the earthquake triggered by the eruption of Thera struck first. The temple roof collapsed. The sacrifice was never completed. The bodies of the participants remained where they lay, to be discovered three and a half millennia later. The dating of Thera's eruption has largely been achieved by dendrochronology. In 1628 BC, the rings of trees as far apart as the bristlecone pines of California and the bog oaks of Ireland entered a period of stunted growth. Temperatures evidently plummeted throughout the northern hemisphere, probably in response to the veil effect of high-floating volcanic dust. 
confirmation of a worldwide disaster in the period 1645 BC, plus or minus 20 years, comes from sulfuric acid deposits in the relevant ice layers in Greenland. Recent carbon dating at Thera itself also suggests an eruption date at least a century earlier than the original estimate of 1500 BC. Scientific doubts remain, of course, but 1628 BC is clearly the best working hypothesis. The palace at Knossos escaped the later fate of Pompey and Herculaneum. A westerly wind happened to be blowing on the day of the eruption, and the heaviest deposits of ash fell on the coast of Asia Minor. Even so, Knossos was rocked by the quake that felled walls and pillars, and one has to assume that damage to the vital Minoan navy was extensive, if not total. In the space of a few hours, the cone of Thera was reduced to a smouldering ring of black basalt cliffs round an eerie, sulphurous lagoon. Like the stump of rock in the centre of that lagoon, Crete must have been left marooned at the centre of a blasted empire. Archaeological layering on eastern Crete shows that a clear interval of time separated the Thera eruption from a subsequent and still unexplained disaster, which left the palace of Knossos in ruins, with the clay tablets baked so hard by fire that they can still be read today. Thera did not destroy Knossos, as was once proposed, but it certainly delivered the first of the blows which spelled the end of Minoan civilization. Material destruction and population loss must have been enormous, the disruption of trade crippling. A weakened Crete was left open to the mercy of Dorian warriors, and in due course was thoroughly Hellenized. The violent end of Europe's first civilization inevitably prompts thoughts about the rise and fall of civilizations in general. One wonders whether the Minoan survivors would have blamed their misfortunes on their own shortcomings. One wonders whether the catastrophe theory that applies to various branches of the physical sciences can equally be applied to the long-term patterns of human affairs. One wonders whether the mathematical theory of chaos can somehow explain why long, tranquil periods of growth and development can be suddenly interrupted by intervals of confusion and disorder. Is it conceivable that the eruption of Thera was provoked by the fluttering wings of some prehistoric butterfly? Archaeologists and prehistorians think in large spans of time. For them, the prehistoric Bronze Age civilization which came to an end with Knossos and Mycenae was but the first of three great cycles of European history. The second cycle coincided with the classical world of Greece and Rome. The third cycle, which began with the system's collapse at the end of the Roman Empire, coincides with the rise of modern Europe. It is still with us. Almost 3,500 years have passed since the destruction of Knossos. In that time, the face of Europe has been transformed many times over. Just as Greece succeeded to the glory that was Crete, so Rome was built on Greek foundations and Europe on the relics of Rome. Vigorous youth, confident maturity and impotent age all seem to be encoded into the history of political and cultural communities as they are in the lives of individuals. Europe has no shortage of successes to the fate of Crete, of states and nations that once were strong and now are weak. Europe itself, which once was strong, is now weaker. The nuclear explosion at Chernobyl in April 1986 alerted people to the possibility of a continental disaster of Theron proportions, whilst in 1989 the explosive liberation of the nations of Eastern Europe inspired hopes of greater peace and unity. The watchers of late European III worry whether their fate will be one of terminal decline, of invasion by some new barbarians, or perhaps of catastrophic destruction. Or perhaps they will live to see the last golden summer of late European IV. Ukraine Ukraine is the land through which the greatest number of European peoples approached their eventual homeland. In ancient times it was variously known as Scythia or Sarmatia, after the peoples who dominated the Pontic steppes long before the arrival of the Slavs. It occupies the largest sector of the southern European plain, between the Volga crossing and the Carpathian narrows, and it carries the principal overland pathway between Asia and Europe. Its modern Slavonic name means on the edge, a close counterpart to the American concept of the frontier. 
its focal point at the rapids of the Dnieper, where the steppe pathway crosses the river trade route, was fiercely contested by all comers, for it provided the point of transition between the settled lands to the west and the open steppes to the east. Ukraine is rich in mineral resources, such as the coal of the Donbass and the iron of Krivoy Ro. The loess of its famous black earth underlies Europe's richest agricultural lands, which in the years prior to 1914 were to become the continent's leading exporter of grain. Yet apart from the peninsula of Crimea and the main river valleys, the Dnistro, the Dnipro and the Din, which had served as the focus both for Khazaria and for the first East Slav state, much of Ukraine was only systematically settled in modern times. Until then, the wide open spaces of the wild plains were ruled by the raids of pagans and nomads and by the wars of Cossacks and Tatars. Ottoman rule in the 15th to 18th centuries drew it closer to the Black Sea and the Muslim world. Polish rule after 1569 brought in many Polish landowners and Polish Jews. Russian rule, which was steadily extended in stages between 1654 and 1945, brought in Russians and Russification. The Sikh of the Zaporozhian Cossacks, on an island in the Dnieper, was destroyed by the Russian army in 1775, the Tatar Khanate of Crimea in 1783. Under the Tsars, the whole country was officially named Little Russia. The southern provinces designated for new colonization were called New Russia. Not surprisingly, after so many twists and turns of fortune, Ukraine's modern inhabitants are fiercely attached to their land. It features prominently in their plaintive poetry. Zapovit, jak umriu, to pachavajcie mnie na magili, sered stiepu širokova, na vkrajni mili, Shoblani Shirakapoli i Dnipra, i kruci vula vidna, bula chuti, jak revie revuci, jak paniesie z Ukrainy, usinie morie, krov varožu, a tadi ja i lani i gori, vse pakinu i palinu, da samova boga malica, a da tavo ja ni znaju boga. Pakavajtje ta vstavajtje, kaj dani parvitje i vražova zloju krovju, volju akrapitje. I mnie vsimi veliki, vsimi volni novi, ne zabutje pamjenuti ni zlim tihim slovom. Testament When I die, make me a grave high on an ancient mound in my own beloved Ukraine, in the stepland without bound, whence one sees the endless expanse of the wheat fields and the steep banks of Dnipro's shore, whence one hears the stentorian roar of the surging river as it bears away to the far blue sea our oppressor's blood. Then I will leave hills and fields for eternity to stand before God Almighty and to make my peace in my prayer. Till that time it's my destiny to know nothing of God. First make my grave." Then arise to sunder your chains and bless your freedom in the flux of evil foemen's veins. At last, in that great family young and free, do not forget, but with good intent, speak quietly of me. However, since the plain has always been the playground of power politics, the Ukrainians have rarely been allowed to control their destiny. In the twentieth century they were repeatedly suppressed. Their short-lived republic, which in 1918-20 served as one of the main battlegrounds for Russia's Reds and Whites, was crushed by the victorious Red Army. They were victims of some of the continent's most terrible man-made disasters and of wholesale genocide. Their casualties during the wars of 1918-20, the collectivization campaign of the 1930s, the terror famine of 1932-3, and the devastations of the Second World War must have approached twenty million. Some among them, frustrated by their impotence in face of Russians, Poles and Germans, and unable to reach the source of their oppression, struck out in desperate violence against their neighbours. Their population is similar in size to that of England or France, and contains important minorities. But the Ukrainians find very little place in the history books. 
For many years, they were usually presented to the outside world as Russians or Soviets whenever they were to be praised, and as Ukrainians only when they did evil. They did not recover a free voice until the 1990s. The Republic of Ukraine eventually reclaimed its independence in December 1991, facing an uncertain future. Alpi Contrary to first appearances, the high alpine valleys provided an excellent environment for early colonization and primitive agriculture. They possessed an abundance of sunshine, fresh water, fuel, building materials, pasture, and, most importantly, security. Their remoteness was one of their assets. They were inhabited from the earliest times, and, as Hannibal discovered in the 4th century BC, fiercely defended. Traces of hearths found in the Drachenloch cave at 2,445 metres in Switzerland's Tamina Valley date from the Riss Verm interglacial. Evidence of transhumance goes back 12,000 years. Roman building works and settlements were well established, especially in Val d'Aosta and the mining district of Nordicum. Villages perched on impregnable rocks, such as those in the Alpes Maritime and Haute Provence, were immune from bandits, invaders, and tax collectors. In medieval times, many Alpine communities established a distinct political independence. The Swiss cantons are not the only example. The 52 communes of Briançon obtained a Charter of Liberties in 1343, six years before the Dauphin of Vienne sold the rest of his patrimony and his title to the King of France. They maintained their self-government until the Revolution. Other districts avoided close control by the lack of communications. Barcelonete, founded by the Counts of Provence and Barcelona, was ceded to France with the Pays du Bay by the Treaty of Utrecht. But it could only be approached by a 15-hour mule trek until the permanent road was built in 1883. The villages of the Gorge du Verdon were not linked to the outside world until 1947. The lowest part in the Western Alps, the Col de l'Echelle, still does not possess an all-weather road on both sides. Many roads were built for strategic reasons. An obelisk atop the Mont Genevre, 1,054 metres, announces in French, Latin, Italian and Spanish that the route was opened for carriages in 1807, while the Emperor Napoleon was triumphing over his enemies on the Oder and Vistula. The highest road in Europe, over the Col du Galibier, 3,242 metres, was built in the 1930s as part of France's frontier defences. The Alpen Raum was exploited most intensively in the second half of the 19th century, when mixed farming was pushed to high altitudes and the rural population rose dramatically. Yet the advent of modern communications provoked a mass exodus, reflected in the old Savoyard complaint, Toujours ma chèvre monte et ma femme descend. My goat is always going up and my wife going down. The trend was reaching crisis proportions in many localities until the growth of hydroelectricity and mass tourism, especially winter skiing, after 1945. The antiquity and peculiarities of Alpine life have inspired a wealth of specialized museums. The Doyen is the Museo della Montagna, founded in 1874 in Turin. The Ethnographic Museum at Geneva, like many smaller ones, specializes in the tools, buildings, ceramic stoves, and folk art of alpine communities. Gotthard The St. Gotthard Pass commands the shortest passage across the Central Alps. It can fairly claim to be Europe's most vital artery. By joining the valley of the Reuss, which flows northward into the Rhine, and the valley of the Ticino, which flows southwards into the Po, it provides the most direct link between southern Germany and northern Italy. At 2,108 metres, it is significantly lower than its main rivals, which stay closed for longer periods during winter and bad weather. It is interesting that the St. Gotthard route did not become a major thoroughfare until relatively late. It was not developed by the Romans, who preferred the more westerly passes, especially the great St. Bernard, the Mons Jovis nor was it used during the centuries after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, despite the constant migrations from north to south. The problem lay with a short section of the upper Reuss Valley, which, for some three miles north of the modern Andermatt, enters a precipitous rocky canyon. 
this Sholenen Gorge, whose upper entrance is lined with sheer cliffs, was sufficient to defy all traffic until extensive engineering works were undertaken. The works began sometime after A.D. 1200. The entrance to the gorge was spanned by the magnificent single arch of the Devil's Bridge, whose lofty construction must have been no less demanding than the vault of a Gothic cathedral. At the steepest passage of the defile, rock steps known as scaliones, or sholen, were cut into the cliff, together with supports for the wooden platforms which were suspended alongside the overhangs. By A.D. 1300, when the hospice at the summit of the pass was dedicated to St. Gotthard, bishop of distant Hildesheim, it is clear that the flow of travellers had become steady and regular. For nearly six hundred summers the St. Gotthard Road served from June to November as Europe's premier north-south trail. The Altdorf at the head of Lake Lucerne to Biasca, at the head of the Levantina, the stream of pilgrims, merchants and soldiers, faced sixty miles of rough climbing over four or five stages. The southern approach, through the Eri Val Tremola, or Valley of Trembling, the source of the translucent mineral called tremolite, was hardly less daunting than the Devil's Bridge. The zigzag path could only be negotiated by pack mules, by litters, and by foot travellers. Before the widening of the track in 1830, the only person to cross the pass in a wheeled vehicle was the Englishman Charles Greville, who won a bet in 1775 by paying a team of Swiss guides to carry his phaeton on their shoulders all the way. The opening of the St. Gotthard had important strategic consequences. It gave a particular stimulus to the Swiss district of Uri, the guardian of the pass, and hence to the Swiss Confederation as a whole. It enabled armies to march swiftly from Germany to Lombardy and back, a facility exploited by numerous emperors, and most notably by General Suvorov's Russians in 1799. The construction of the St. Gotthard Railway in 1882 was no less remarkable than that of the St. Gotthard Road. It required a main tunnel of 15 kilometres under the summit, together with 80 others. At the famous Pfaffensprung, or Parsons Leap, above Goschenen, trains enter the spiral trackway travelling right and emerge several hundred feet higher up travelling left. It cost the lives of many workmen, among them its designer. The railway tunnel has been joined since 1980 by a 16.5-kilometre motorway tunnel, which carries six lanes of vehicles in all weathers and all seasons. Motorcyclists, who hug their machines as they themselves are hugged by leather-suited pillionesses, scream over the pass in minutes. Yet modern travellers who stop by the Devil's Bridge can see a curious monument built into the rock beneath the modern viaduct. The inscription, in Tsarist Cyrillic, may be translated to the valiant companions of Field Marshal Count Suvorov Rimnitsky, Prince of Italy, who lost their lives during the march across the Alps in 1799. Raised on the centenary of that march, it is a suitable reminder both of the unity of Europe and of the grandeur of its mountains. Sund Like its southern counterpart at the Straits of Gibraltar, the Danish sound has been called Europe's jugular vein. Controlling the sole point of entry to a major sea, it possessed immense strategic and commercial value. Its potential was first realised in 1200, when King Canute VI of Denmark imprisoned some Lübeck merchants until they paid for the right of passage into the Baltic herring grounds. From then on, the sound dues were exacted for as long as the Danes could enforce them. They were accepted by other medieval Baltic powers, such as Poland, the Teutonic State and the Hansa, and survived Sweden's challenge in the 17th century. They declined after 1732, but continued in being until the Redemption Treaty of 1857, when British naval power finally persuaded the Danes to commute their ancient interest. Even then, the sound remained important until Prussia acquired Kiel in 1866 and bypassed the sound by building the Kaiser Wilhelm Canal. Once aeroplanes could overfly them, all maritime straits, including the English Channel, lost much of their strategic significance. All that is left is the memory of greatness, a ferry crossing, and the shade of Hamlet's ghost on the battlements at Elsinore. Pharaoh Of all Europe's many islands, none can match the lonely grandeur of the Pharaohs, 
whose high, black, basalt cliffs rise from the stormy North Atlantic, midway between Iceland, Norway, and Scotland. Seventeen inhabited islands, centred on Stremoy and the principal harbour of Toshown, support a modern population of 45,464, mainly from fishing. Descended from Norsemen who settled in the 8th century, the Faroese answered to the Gulating, the assembly of Western Norway, and to their own local Lukting. Their language is a dialect of Norwegian, but they have their own sagas, their own poets and artists, their own culture. Yet from 1814, when Norway was annexed to Denmark, Europe's smallest democracy was subjected to a Danish governor and to Danish interests. As a result, the Faroese national movement came to be directed against Denmark, the one Scandinavian country with which they have least in common. In this, the Faroese followed in the steps of Iceland, aiming above all to preserve their identity. The big moment came in June 1940, when, with Copenhagen under Nazi occupation, a British warship ordered a Toshan skipper to hoist the Faroese flag in place of the Danish one. The referendum of 1946, which opted for unlimited sovereignty, preceded the compromise settlement of the 1st of April 1948. Pharaoh accepted home rule within the Danish realm. In 1970 it was granted independent membership of the Nordic Council. The Norgeslande Husisch, or Nordic House, in Torshaun, was built with Swedish wood, Norwegian slate, Danish glass and Icelandic roofing, and was equipped with Finnish furniture. Danuvius in ancient times, the River Danube represented one of the great dividing lines of the European peninsula. Established as the frontier of the Roman Empire in the first century AD, the Latin Danuvius, or Greek Ister, divided civilization from barbarity. In later times, however, the Danube was to develop into one of Europe's major thoroughfares, an open boulevard linking west and east. In Bernini's famous composition for the Fountain of the Four Rivers in the Piazza Navona in Rome, it is the Danube which is taken to personate Europe alongside Africa's Nile, Asia's Ganges, and America's Plate. In its upper reaches, as the Dunau, the river flows through the heart of the Germanic world. A plaque in the Furstenberg Park at Dunauerschingen in the Black Forest marks its source. Here entspringt die Dunau. Passing the castle of Sigmaringen, home of the Hohenzollerns, the river passes Ulm and Regensburg, chief cities of the Holy Roman Empire, and after Passau enters the eastern realm of Österreich. In Austria, it guided the route of the Nibelung. It passes Linz, where the Emperor Frederick III was buried under his motto of A-E-I-O-U, meaning Austria erit in orbe ultima, Amstetten, where Franz Ferdinand is buried, Kierling, where Kafka died, and Eisenstadt, which is Haydn's last resting place. Himmel habe Dank, ein harmonischer Gesang war mein Lebenslauf. Heaven receive our thanks, my life's course was one harmonious hymn. Vienna, as Metternich remarked, is where Europe meets Asia. In its middle reaches, as the Duna, the broadening stream enters Hungary, the land of the Magyars driven like a wedge through the lands of the Slavs on either side. At Bratislava, Pozhonia, Pressburg, it laps the sometime capital of Upper Hungary, now the capital of the Slovakian Republic. Fertud was the site of the Esterhazy's second Versailles, Estergom, the home of the Hungarian primates, Sentendra, St. Andrew, once a refuge for Serbian exiles, is now a mecca for Bohemian artists. At Buda and Pest, a Turkish castle on one bank faces an English-style parliament on the other. In the lower reaches, beyond the Iron Gates, the river flows from Catholicism into Orthodoxy. Nicopolis is where Wulfila translated the Greek Bible into Gothic, the starting point of German. Romania, on the left side, claims to be a descendant of Trajan's Dacia. Serbia and Bulgaria, on the right bank, long occupied by the Ottomans, who called it the Tuna, were founded on top of Byzantine provinces. Kiliaveke was once a Genoese outpost. The last landing stage is at Sulina, in the delta, 
in Europe's largest bird reserve, in a world not of civilization, but of eternal nature. Rivers to the geographer are the bearers of sediment and trade. To the historian they are the bearers of culture, ideas, and sometimes conflict. They are like life itself. For 2,888 kilometers, from Duno Eschingen to the Delta, the flow never stops. Vendange Historical climatology relies on records preserved in books and on records preserved by nature herself. The former includes diaries, travellers' tales, and weather data kept by estate managers, grain merchants, or wine growers. The latter involves the study of tree rings, fossils, sediments, stalactites, and glaciers. The precision of nature's own records is amazing, even within historical times. The annual deposits of the Great Salt Lake in Crimea have been logged to 2294 BC. Some of the great stalagmites, such as that in the cave of Avin Dornyak in the Jura, are over 7,000 years old. Variations in the density of their calcite deposits faithfully reflect historical rainfall patterns. Phenology is the study of fruit ripening and has been widely exploited in relation to the history of wine harvests. Every year for centuries, many French vineyards issued a public proclamation of the date for commencing the collection of grapes. An early date signified a sunny growing season, a late date signified a cool season. By listing the dates of the premier cuvée in a particular location, historians can produce complete phenological series over very long periods. By collating the phenological series for different locations, they can work out the mean seasonal date for each region. These courbes de vendange, or wine harvest curves, present precise indications of climatic change. The movement of glaciers provides another source of information. Glaciers advance in periods of cold and retreat in periods of relative warmth. What is more, the length of Europe's alpine glaciers in any particular year can often be established from eyewitness accounts, from old prints or from official records. Archives, such as those of the Chambre des Comtes de Savoie, contain inspectors' records on glacial advances which destroyed villages or prevented the inhabitants from paying their tithes and taxes. In 1600, for example, a year of disaster at Chamonix, people on both the French and Italian side of Mont Blanc lived in fear for their future. Detailed studies of the Mer de Glace, of the Rhone Gletscher in the Valais, or the Fernacht in Tyrol, all of whose termini in the late 16th century stood several kilometres below their current position, demonstrate the reality of Europe's little ice age. Periods of glacial maxima peaked in 1599 to 1600, 1640 to 50, 1680, 1716 to 20, and 1770. In 1653, local people defiantly placed a statue of St. Ignatius at the base of the Arlech Glacier, and the glacier stopped. The contemporary glacial retreat has continued since 1850. Climatic data are most convincing when different sources produce the same results. Wildly fluctuating weather in the 1530s, for example, is confirmed both by tree rings from Germany and by the Franco-Swiss Vendange. The coldest year for Europe's vineyards occurred in 1816. Collection of the ruined grapes began in eastern France on All Saints' Day, the 1st of November. Mary Shelley, vacationing in nearby Switzerland, could not even go out for walks. Instead, she stayed indoors and invented Frankenstein. C-14 40,000 years is the length of time within which isotopes of carbon-14 show measurable signs of radioactivity. This means that radiocarbon dating methods can be applied to organic materials from the late Paleolithic to the recent past, 35,000 BC is approximately the date when the Neanderthals died out and when humans lived at Cro-Magnon. The value of C-14, whose exploitation gave rise to a Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1960, derives from the spontaneous and steady rate of its decay. It is the only one of three carbon isotopes to be radioactive, and it accumulates in all living matter through the action of cosmic rays on the atmosphere. It is present in bones, body tissue, shells, meat, hair, rope, cloth, wood, and many other materials which abound on archaeological sites. 
It starts to decay as soon as the organism dies, and continues to do so over a half-life of 5,730 years and a mean life of approximately 8,033 years. A 1% decrease can be measured to approximately 80 years. The calibration of results is fraught with variables, but it has been greatly improved in recent years by the discovery of complementary techniques that provide a basis for comparison. Thermoluminescence, TL, and electron spin resonance, ESR, for example, detect minute changes caused by natural radioactivity in the crystal lattice of materials and are specially effective in dating ceramics. The examination of carbon isotopes by accelerator mass spectrometry, AMS, has extended the chronological range to approximately 100,000 years, throwing doubt on previous age estimates of the oldest humanoid remains. After three decades of development, radiocarbon dating has been used to construct impressive data collections. Archaeologists of the Mesolithic, for instance, can consult catalogues which list the dates of finds from all over Europe. A piece of linear beaded pottery from Eitzum in Lower Saxony is dated 6480 plus or minus 210. Charcoal from a site at Vlasatz in Serbia, 7930 plus or minus 77. A charred pine branch from Tsavovanje near Warsaw, 10,030 plus or minus 120. Every new measurement consolidates the overall picture. The most sensational challenge for C14, however, arose with the dating of the Turin Shroud. Supposedly brought to Europe from the Holy Land in the 14th century, the shroud bears the faint impression of a dead man's face and body, and had been venerated as a relic of the crucifixion. Tests undertaken in 1988-9 showed that the cloth of the shroud had been manufactured between A.D. 1260 and 1390, but they did not explain the dead man's image. Gat Hunter The origins of organized political communities, or states, have really been sought before the Neolithic period. Some theorists, including Marxists, have looked to the tribes and tribal chiefdoms of the Bronze and Iron Ages, Others have looked to the Neolithic revolution in agriculture and to the associated growth of fixed settlement. According to V. Gordon Child, for instance, the preconditions for a state organized on residence, not kinship, required territorial authority, surplus capital, symbolic monuments, long-distance trade, labor specialization, stratified society, scientific knowledge, and the art of writing. Such preconditions were first met in Egypt and Mesopotamia, and in Europe, in the city-states of ancient Greece. Analysis of the complex society of hunter-gatherers, however, projects the topic much further back in time. Hunter-gatherers, or gatherer-hunters, it seems, were not saved by the advent of agriculture from the immemorial threat of extinction. On the contrary, they enjoyed many millennia of unending leisure and affluence, they were not unfamiliar with agriculture when it arose, but rejected it, except as a marginal or supplementary activity. What is more, in the later stages of prehistory, they developed social structures which permitted differentiated specialization. In addition to the far-roaming hunter-warriors and the home-based gatherers, some groups could specialize in the new labor-intensive processes of fishing, seafood collection, harvesting wild grass and nuts, or bird trapping. Others were free to specialize as organizers or as negotiators in the formation of federations and regional alliances. In other words, the hunter-gatherer bands possessed an embryonic representative and political class. The historical problem can be addressed by analogy with the native peoples of North America, Australia, or New Guinea. The big question about the hunter-gatherers, therefore, does not seem to be how did they progress towards the higher level of an agricultural and politicized society, but what persuaded them to abandon the secure, well-provided and psychologically liberating advantages of their primordial lifestyle? Losel The Venus of Losel dates from approximately 19,000 BC. It is a bas-relief sculptured on the inner wall of a cave in the Dordogne and painted with red ochre. It shows a seated female figure with no surviving facial features, but with a large quaff of hair drawn behind the shoulder, long pendulant breasts, and knees opened wide 
to display the vulva. The left hand rests on a pregnant belly. The crooked right arm holds aloft a crescent-shaped bison horn. Like most of the human images of earliest European art, covering over 90% of human history, the manifestly female gender of this artefact is both striking and eloquent. It is widely taken to represent the Paleolithic Godhead, a variant of the Great Cosmic Mother, whose cult dominated the rites of a matriarchal community. According to one interpretation, it would have presided over masked ritual dancing, where women, men and children sought mystical communion with the animal spirits. Less certainly, it formed the pinnacle of cave life imagery, where the cave was the womb, tomb, maze of the great earth mother, and where blood, woman, moon, bison, horn, birth, magic, the cycle of life, are analogized in a continuous resonance or harmony of sacred energies. The matriarchal or matrifocal character of prehistoric society has been accepted by most theorists from Marx and Engels onwards. However, the assumption that matriarchy only operated at the most primitive level is not now regarded as valid. In his work on myths, the poet Robert Graves explored the origins and fate of matrifocal culture in Europe, tracing the decline of woman's status from ancient divinity to classical slavery. Others have considered the female origins of speech, and hence of conscious culture. In humanity's long nursery age, women and children may conceivably have learned to talk whilst the menfolk were away hunting. If so, the gender difference can only have been one of degree, since boy children must surely have learned to verbalize alongside their sisters. More convincing is the strong possibility that matriarchal and patriarchal societies overlapped, creating a wide range of hybrid forms. If the Gimbutas theory is correct, the advance onto the Pontic steppes of the late Neolithic Kurgan peoples marked the arrival not only of the Indo-Europeans, but also of warlike patriarchal traditions. On the other hand, after the subsequent arrival of the Soromatians, the first wave of the Irano-Sarmatian confederation, the matriarchal newcomers began to mingle approximately 3000 BC with their patriarchal predecessors. In this connection, Herodotus retailed a curious story how Amazon warriors fled the southern shores of the Black Sea and, after mating with Scythian braves, set up a new homeland three days' march from the Myotian Lake. The story was rejected as sheer invention until archaeologists began to uncover the skeletons of female warriors in Sauromatian graves. A Sarmatian princess of a still later vintage, whose tomb was found at Kolbyakov on the Don, had been buried with her battle-axe. Like every committed doctrine, the feminist approach to pre-herstory has its extravagances. But it is not entirely implausible. Because we have separated humanity from nature, subject from object, and universities from the universe, it is enormously difficult for anyone but a poet or a mystic to understand the holistic and mythopoeic thought of Ice Age humanity. The very language we use speaks of tools, hunters, and men, when every statue and painting we discover cries out that this Ice Age humanity was a culture of art, the love of animals, and women. Gathering is as important as hunting, but only hunting is discussed. Storytelling is discussed, but the storyteller is a hunter rather than an old priestess of the moon. Initiation is imagined, but the initiate is not the young girl in Menarche about to wed the moon, but a young man about to become a great hunter. Western civilization, however defined, is generally thought to have its roots in the Judeo-Christian tradition and in the classical world. Both those source cultures, whether of Jehovah or of Zeus Jupiter, were dominated by male godheads. Yet one should not forget that through eons of earlier time, the godhead was female. One can only presume that humankind, so long as it was a tiny, vulnerable species, was more moved by the feminine role of generation and birth than by the male role of killing and death. All sorts of people have dreamed of a long-lost paradise in the remote past. Romantics, nationalists, and Marxists have all had their idealized gardens of Eden, their semi-mythical golden ages. Now feminists are doing the same. One thing is certain. The Venus of Locelle and others like her was no sex object of male gratification. 
In fact, she was no Venus at all. Tammuz Tammuz, son of Ishtar or Ashtar, mother of the universe, was the corn god of ancient Babylon. At the end of the harvest, the stalks of the last sheaves were plaited into straw fans or cages, in which the god could take refuge until the next season. These corn idols, or dollies, have continued to be made wherever wheat is cultivated. In the Balkans, a dolly known as the Montenegrin fan is still fashioned in the shape of its predecessors on the Nile. In Germany and Scandinavia, straw stars and straw angels are popular items of Christmas decoration. In England, a vast repertoire of corn dollies was saved by rural conservationists when the art began to die out in the 1950s. Simple designs, such as the neck and the horseshoe, the knot and the cat's paw, the bell and the lantern, can be found in all the wheat-growing counties. Local specialties included the Shropshire Mare, the Derbyshire Crown, and the Cambridge Umbrella. The Kern Babby of Northumberland and the Ivy Girl of Kent are nothing other than modern versions of Mother Earth, distant daughters of Egyptian Ishtar, of Demeter of the Greeks, and of Roman Ceres. The world knows three major staple cereals, rice, maize, and wheat. Of the three, Europe chose wheat. Wheat came to Europe from Mesopotamia, and wherever Europeans have settled in force, they have taken their wheat with them, first to the empty lands of the Neolithic Northwest, more recently to the virgin prairies of America, Australia, and southern Siberia. The process whereby the choice was made involved an endless series of experiments over several millennia. Although the rival cereals of rye, barley, oats, buckwheat, and millet have continued to exist in Europe, the triumphal march of king wheat is uncontestable. Wheat, the genus Triticum of the grain-bearing grass family, is known in more than 1,000 varieties. Its grain is extremely nutritious. It consists on average of 70% carbohydrate, 12% protein, 2% fat, 1.8% minerals. The protein content is markedly higher than that of rice, one pound yielding up to 1,500 calories. Wheat-based nutrition is one of the factors which has given most Europeans a clear advantage in bodily stature over most rice eaters and corn eaters. Wheat is a seasonal crop, which only requires intensive labour at the spring sowing and the autumn harvest. Unlike the rice growers, who had to tend the paddy fields in disciplined brigades throughout the year, the wheat farmer was granted time and freedom to branch out, to grow secondary crops, to reclaim land, to build, to fight, to politicise. This conjunction may well contain the preconditions for many features of Europe's social and political history from feudalism and individualism to warmongering and imperialism. Wheat, however, quickly exhausts the soil. In ancient times, the land could only retain its fertility if the wheat fields were regularly left fallow and manured by domestic animals. From this, there arose the traditional European pattern of mixed arable and livestock farming and the varied diet of cereals, vegetables and meat. In bread-making, Wheat proteins have the unique property of forming gluten when mixed with water to form dough. In turn, the gluten retains carbon dioxide emitted from the fermentation of yeast. The net result is a wheaten loaf that is lighter, finer, and more digestible than any of its competitors. Give us this day our daily bread is a sentiment which European civilization could share with some of its Middle Eastern neighbors, but not with Indians, Chinese, Aztecs or Incas. Vino. Wine is no ordinary beverage. It has always been associated with love and religion. Its name, like that of Venus, is derived from the Sanskrit, Vena, beloved. Coming from the Caucasus, it featured in both the daily diet and the religious ceremonies of the ancient world. First cultivated by Noah, it inspired not only pagan bacchanalia, but also the communion cup of Christianity. Saint Martin of Tours, born at Sabaria, modern Sombate, near the Danube, was the first patron saint of wine drinkers. Saint Urbon and Saint Vincent, whose name offers a play on reeking of wine, became the principal patrons of wine growers and vintners. Commercial wine growing in medieval Europe was pioneered by the Benedictines at Chateau Prieuré in the Bordeaux region, 
and at locations such as the Clos Vougeau on the Côte de Beaune in Burgundy, the Cluniacs on the Côte d'Or near Macon, and the Cistercians at Nuit Saint-Georges extended the tradition. According to Froissart, England's possession of Bordeaux demanded a fleet of three hundred vessels to carry the vintage home. Benedictine, from the Abbey of Fécamp, and Chartreuse, from the Charter House in Dauphiné, pioneered the art of fortified wine. Europe's wine zone cuts the peninsula in two. Its northern reaches pass along a line stretching from the Loire, through Champagne to the Moselle and the Rhineland, and thence eastwards to the slopes of the Danube and on to Moldavia and Crimea. There are very few wine-growing districts which did not once belong to the Roman Empire. Balkan wines in Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria and Greece, inhibited by the anti-alcoholic Ottomans, are every bit as ancient as those of Spain, Italy or France. The consumption of wine has far-reaching social, psychological and medical consequences. It has been invoked as a factor in religious and political groupings, such as the Protestant-Catholic divide in Germany, and even in the fate of battles. It was wine and beer that clashed at Waterloo. The red fury of wine repeatedly washed in vain against the immovable wall of the sons of beer. Nor has Saint-Martin's homeland lost its viticultural excellence. The volcanic soil on the slopes above Tokai, the hot summer air of the Hungarian plain, the moisture of the Bodrag River, and the most nobly rotten of Arsu grapes form a unique combination. The pungent, velvety, peach-like essentia of golden Tokai is not to everyone's taste, and has rarely been well produced in recent decades. But it was once laid down for two hundred years in the most exclusive cellars of Poland, and kept for the deathbed of monarchs. A bottle of imperial Tokai from the days of Francis Joseph is still one of the connoisseur's most prized ambitions. Jugantilla. The islands of Malta present two historic puzzles, their language and their megaliths. The former is Semitic, of medieval Arab provenance. It is the only Semitic tongue to be written in the Latin script. Romantic philologists once linked it with ancient Phoenician. The megaliths are far older. The principal sites at the temple of Jugantilla, on Gozo Island, and at the unique subterranean hypogeum, or collective burial chamber, at Hal Saflieni, dating from approximately 2400 BC. The earliest rock-cut monuments were constructed a millennium before. The procession of civilizations through Malta reads like a shorthand guide to European history. After the Neolithic cave dwellers who built the megaliths and the Bronze Age beaker folk, came the Carthaginians from the 7th century BC and then the Romans from 218 BC. Gozo is often identified as Calypso's Isle, where Odysseus was stranded. St. Paul was shipwrecked in a bay named after him, north of Valletta, in AD 60. Allocated to the eastern Byzantine Empire in 395, Malta was then ruled successively by Arabs from 870, by Normans from 1091, by the Knights Hospitallers from 1530, by the French from 1798, by the British from 1802, and from 1964, belatedly, by the Maltese themselves. Darsa A popular history of mathematics states that the advance of the beaker folk into Neolithic Europe was accompanied by the spread both of the Indo-European languages and of the decimal system. The statement is supported by lists of number words from a selection of Indo-European languages which use the base 10 or decimal method of numeration. The implication is that prehistoric Europe was familiar with base 10 counting three millennia before its introduction in written form. It is intriguing, of course, to think that one might reconstruct modes of counting in a remote and illiterate society, for which no direct evidence is available. Yet there can be no certainty that numbers used today have remained constant since prehistoric times, and one must be careful to test the hypothesis against all the most relevant languages. Celtic, Welsh, 1, in, 2, die, 3, tree. 4. Pedwar, 5. Pimp, 6. Huech, 7. Scythe, 8. Oith, 9. 
now, ten, dig. German, one, eins, two, zwei, three, drei, four, vier, five, fünf, six, sechs, seven, sieben, eight, acht, nine, neun, ten, zehn. Latin, one, unus, two, duo, three, tres, four, quatuor, five, quinque, six, sex, seven, septem, eight, acto, nine, noem, ten, decem. Ancient Greek, one, heis, two, duyo, three, tres, four, tesares, five, pente, six, hex, seven, hepta, eight, octo, nine, enea, ten, deca. Slavonic, Russian. One, adin, two, dva, three, three, four, chitiri, five, piat, six, shest, seven, siem, eight, vosim, nine, divit, ten, disit. Sanskrit. One, eka, two, dvi, three, three, four, chatur, five, panchan, six, shash, seven, septa, eight, ashta, nine, nava, ten, dasa. Sanskrit, meaning perfect speech, is the second oldest of the recorded Indo-European languages. It was the language of ancient India and, in Hindu tradition, of the gods. It was employed approximately 1500 BC for the composition of Vedic literature. Its prime followed shortly after the fall of the Indus civilization, which invented the decimal system. Sanskrit's number words were definitely based on decimal counting. Its units 1 to 10 corresponded with those found in other Indo-European languages. Its teens were simple combinations of units with the word for 10, hence ekadash, 1 plus 10 equals 11, or navadasa, 9 plus 10 equals 19. Its tens were combinations of units with the collective numeral for a decade, dasati, hence vimsati or dvimdesati, 2 times 10 equals 20, or trimsati, 3 times 10 equals 30. Its word for one thousand, dasasata, meaning ten hundreds, stood alongside sahasra, a variation used in the formation of still higher numbers. It had a single word, kror, for ten million, and another, sh, to express percentage. Latin numbers, too, are essentially decimal. But their structure bears no relation to Roman numerals, which are based on conglomerates of units fives and tens. The Celtic languages, of which Welsh is the most active modern survivor, once stretched across much of Europe. They belong to the most ancient Indo-European forms in the West. Yet Celtic numerals have preserved elements of counting in base 5, base 10, and especially base 20. Modern Welsh, like Sanskrit, uses decimal units for 1 to 10. But in the teens, it uses numbers similar in structure to Roman numerals. 16 is Inar Bamtheg, or 1 over 5 and 10, and 19 is Pedvarar Bamtheg, or 4 over 5 and 10. Above 19, base 20 counting takes over. Igain is the base, and Degain, 40, Trigain, 60, and Pedvargain, 80, are all multiples of 20. 30, 70, and 90 are expressed as 10 over a multiple of 20. 50, Hanner Kant, means half of a hundred. Welsh, 11, Inardeg, 20, Egain, 30, Degarhigain, 40, Degain, 50, Hanerkant, 60, Trigain, 70, Degarthrigain, 80, Pedwarhigain, 90, Degarfedwarhigain, 100, Kant, 1000, Mil. Latin, 11, Undekim, twelve, Wiginti, thirteen, Triginta, fourteen, Quadraginta, fifteen, Quinquaginta, sixteen, Sexaginta, seventeen, 
septaginta, 18, octoginta, 19, nonoginta, 100, centum, 1000, mille. Sanskrit, 11, ekadasa, 20, vimsati, 30, trimsati, 40, katvarimsati, 50, pankasati, 60, shashti, 70, septati, 80, ashiti, 90, navati, 100, sata, 1000, dasasata, sahasra. Base 20 counting, which started by using toes as well as fingers, is preserved in the English word score, which derives from the mark cut into counting sticks. It is also reflected in French quatre-vingt, meaning four times twenty, which is probably a relic of Celtic Gaul. In all probability, therefore, Europe's early peoples counted in twos, fives, tens, dozens, or scores as they thought fit. At some point they must also have encountered the Babylonian system of base sixty, which was adopted for counting minutes and seconds. There is little reason to assume that Indo-Europeans in general, or the beaker folk in particular, were decimalized from the start. In fact, Europe had to wait until the 13th century AD before base ten numbers were widely introduced. The key step, the use of naught for zero, had first been taken in India. From there, the decimal system found its way into the Muslim world and through Arabic Spain into Christendom. For several centuries, it operated alongside the much clumsier Roman numerals, which could not even be used for addition or multiplication. When it finally triumphed, many Europeans did not realize that their numbers were not European at all. Samphire Boiled Samphire Pick marsh samphire during July or August at low tide. It should be carefully washed soon after collection and is best eaten very fresh. Tie the washed samphire with its roots still intact in bundles and boil in shallow, unsalted water for eight to ten minutes. Cut the string and serve with melted butter. Eat the samphire by picking each stem up by the root and biting lightly, pulling the fleshy part away from the woody core. Prehistoric food has long since perished and cannot easily be studied. Modern attempts to reconstruct the menus and the gastronomic techniques of the Neolithic period rely on six main sources of information. Prehistoric rubbish tips present the archaeologists with large collections of meat bones, eggshells, and shellfish remains. The kitchen areas of hut sites often reveal seeds and pollen grains which can be identified and analyzed. Implements for fishing and hunting and utensils for preparing, cooking, and eating food have survived in large numbers. Cauldrons for boiling were common, ovens for baking were not. The total food resources of the past can be assessed by subtracting modern items, such as yeast, wine, or onions, from the vast repertoire of edible plants and fauna living in the wild. All sorts of delicacies no longer in the cookbooks are known to have been eaten. Guillemots, sea kale, hedgehogs, beech mast, sloes. Much may also be learned by analogy with the food technology of primitive or pre-industrial societies, whose skills in everything from wild herbs to wind-drying, salting, and preserving are by necessity very considerable. Finally, modern techniques have permitted the analysis of the stomach contents of prehistoric corpses. The Tolland man, for example, had eaten linseed, barley, and wild plants. Whether, in the end, one can ever recreate an authentic Neolithic meal is a matter for debate, preferably pursued whilst chasing the samphire with marrow bones served with virpa. Marrow bones, 8 ounces, 225 grams, marrow bones, flour, salt, dry toast. Scrape and wash the bones and saw in half across the shaft. Make a stiff paste of flour and water and roll it out. Cover the ends of the bones with the paste to seal in the marrow and tie the bones in a floured cloth. Stand upright in a pan of boiling salted water and simmer slowly for about two hours. Untie the cloth and remove the paste from each bone. Fasten a paper napkin round each one and serve with dry toast. Soans or virpa. One pound four hundred fifty grams fine oatmeal, three pounds wheat meal, sixteen pints, nine litres, water. Put both meals into a stone crock. Stir in fourteen pints or eight litres of lukewarm water, 
and let it stand for five to eight days until sour. Pour off the clear liquid. This is the Swats, which makes a refreshing drink. The remainder in the crock will resemble thick starch. Add about two pints or one litre water to give the consistency of cream. Strain through a cheesecloth over a colander. The liquid will contain all the nutritious properties of oatmeal. Gentle rubbing with a wooden spoon and a final squeezing of the cloth will hasten the process. Reconstructing the past is rather like translating poetry. It can be done, but never exactly. Whether one deals in prehistoric recipes, colonial settlements, or medieval music, it needs great imagination and restraint if the twin perils of artless authenticity and clueless empathy are to be avoided. Did Neolithic cooks really serve marrowbones in a paper napkin, or strain their verpa through a cheesecloth? And were there prehistoric augusts when samphire could be picked? Thronos The throne in the palace of Knossos in Crete has been described as Europe's oldest chair. The claim is unlikely to be correct. What is certain is that high-backed chairs with armrests were reserved in ancient times for ceremonial purposes. They enabled rulers and high priests to assume a relaxed, dignified, and elevated position, whilst everyone else stood at their feet. From the royal throne, the concept of the chair as a symbol of authority has passed to the cathedra or see of bishops and to the chairs of professors. Furniture for everyday sitting is a relatively modern European invention. When not standing, primitive peoples sat, squatted, or lay on the floor. Many Asian nations, including the Japanese, still prefer to do so. Ancient Greeks and Romans reclined on couches. The medievals used rough-hewn benches. Individual chairs were first introduced into monastic cells, perhaps to facilitate reading. They did not join the standard household inventory until the 16th century, nor the repertoire of fine design until the 18th. They were not widely used in schools, offices, and workplaces until the end of the 19th. Unfortunately, flat-bottomed chairs do not match the requirements of the human anatomy. Unlike the horse saddle, which transfers much of the rider's body weight onto the stirrup, leaving the natural curvature of the spine intact, chairs lift the thighs at right angles to the trunk and disrupt the equilibrium of the skeleton. In so doing, they put abnormal stress on the immobilized pelvis, hip joints, and lumbar regions. Chronic backache is one of the many self-inflicted scars of modern progress. Tolland Tolland is the name of a marsh near Aarhus in Denmark, where, in 1950, the whole body of a prehistoric man was discovered in a state of remarkable preservation. It is displayed in the Silkeborg Museum. The tannic acid of the peat had mummified him so perfectly that the delicate facial features were quite intact, as were the contents of his stomach. Except for a pointed leather cap and waistband, he was naked, and had been strangled with a braided leather rope, apparently the victim of ritual murder some two thousand years ago. His strange fate can evoke a haunting sense of compassion, even today. Something of his sad freedom as he rode the tumbril should come to me, driving, saying the names Tolland, Graubella, Nabelgard, watching the pointing hands of country people, not knowing their tongue. Out there in Jutland, in the old, man-killing parishes, I will feel lost, unhappy, and home. Yet Tolland man is not alone. Similar discoveries were made thirty years later at Lindo Moss in Cheshire, England, and a particularly interesting corpse came to light in September 1991 in a glacial pocket near the Simi Laun ridge of the Erztaler Alps in South Tyrol. The body appeared to be that of a pre-Bronze Age hunter, fully dressed and equipped. He was five feet, 152 centimetres in height, 120 pounds, 54.4 kilograms, perhaps 20 years old, with blue eyes, a shaven face, and even a complete brain. He was very thoroughly clad in tanned leather tunic and leggings, a cap of chamois fur, birch bark gloves, and hay-lined, thick-soled boots. His skin was tattooed with blue tribal markings in four places, and he was wearing a necklace made from twenty sunray thongs and one stone bead. He was carrying an empty wooden-framed rucksack, a broken thirty-two-inch, 975 centimetres, bow, 
a quiver of fourteen bone-tipped arrows, a stone-bladed axe tipped with pure copper, a short flint knife, and a body belt containing flints and tinder. He apparently froze to death whilst crossing the pass in a blizzard. Rigor mortis fixed his outstretched arm, still trying to shield his eyes. Dated to 2731 BC, plus or minus 125, he finally reached an unintended destination in the deep freeze at Innsbruck University, with some 5,000 years delay. Prehistoric bodies are clearly a valuable source of scientific information. Recent advances in prehistoric pathology have facilitated detailed analysis of the body's tissues, diseases, bacteria, and diet. But no one can entirely forget the case of Piltdown Man, whose bones were unearthed at a quarry in Sussex in 1908. In the same year that Tolland Man was discovered, Piltdown Man was shown to be one of the great master forgeries. 2. Hellas, Ancient Greece There is a quality of excellence about ancient Greece that brooks few comparisons. In the same way that the quality of Greek light enables painters to see form and colour with exceptional precision and intensity, so the conditions for human development in Greece seem to have favoured both the external environment and the inner life of mankind. Indeed, high-intensity sunlight may well have been one of the many ingredients which produced such spectacular results, in which case Homer, Plato and Archimedes may be seen as the product of native genius plus photochemistry. Certainly, in trying to explain the Greek phenomenon, one would have to weigh a very particular combination of factors. One factor would have to be that sun-drenched but seasonal climate which provided optimal encouragement for a vigorous outdoor life. A second factor would be the Aegean, whose islands and straits provided an ideal nursery in the skills of seafaring, commerce and colonisation. A third factor would be the proximity of older, established civilizations, whose achievements were waiting to be imported and developed. There were other parts of the world, such as present-day California or southern Australia, which possessed the same favourable climate. There were other enclosed seas, such as the Baltic or the Great Lakes of North America, which were suited to primitive navigation. There were numerous regions adjacent to the Great River Valley civilizations that were perfectly habitable. But nowhere, with the possible exception of the Sea of Japan, did all three factors coincide as they did in the eastern Mediterranean. The rise of ancient Greece often strikes its many awestruck admirers as miraculous, but it may not have been entirely fortuitous. No doubt a touch of caution should be added to prevailing comment on the most amazing period of human history. Modern opinion has been so saturated by the special pleading both of the Enlightenment and of Romanticism that it is often difficult to see ancient Greece for what it was. Johann Joachim Winkelmann, the discoverer, sometime prefect of antiquities at Rome, invented an aesthetic scheme which has deeply affected European attitudes to Greece ever since. In his Thoughts on the Imitation of Greek Works and his History of Art Among the Ancients, he wrote of the noble simplicity and serene greatness and the perfect law of art which supposedly infused everything Greek. The motto was taken to be nothing in excess or moderation in all things. One can now suspect that many classical scholars have imposed interpretations which owed more than they knew to the rationalism and restraint of Winkelmann's era. It was not the fashion to give emphasis either to the rational element in Greek life or to its sheer joie de vivre. The Philhenic Romantics of the nineteenth century held priorities of their own. First there came John Keats with his Ode on a Grecian Urn. O Attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form, dost tease us out of thought as does eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain, in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. Then there is Shelley enthusing on Hellas. The world's great age begins anew. The golden years return. 
The earth doth like a snake renew her winter weeds outworn. Heaven smiles, and faiths and empires gleam like wrecks of a dissolving dream. Above all there was the young Lord Byron, dreaming about the Isles of Greece. Place me on Sunium's marbled steep, where nothing save the waves and I may hear our mutual murmurs sweep. There, swan-like, let me sing and die. The Romantics wrote on Greece with beguiling genius, and it is not surprising that they can tease us out of thought. Even the most distinguished critics can lose their critical faculties. One of them can be found writing on Greek literature about results so satisfactory in form and so compelling in substance that their work has often been held up as a type of perfection. Another can be found waxing on the joys of digging at any classical or sub-classical site in the Greek world, where practically every object you find will be beautiful. Yet another claimed that the spirit of ancient Greece hath so animated universal nature that the very rocks and woods, the very torrents and wilds, burst forth with it. It may be that moderns are fired by nostalgia for a time when the world was young, or moved by a misplaced desire to prove the uniqueness of ancient Greece, or perhaps in marvelling at the surviving masterpieces they forget the dross which has not survived. It was a liberal education even to walk in the streets of that wonderful city, wrote a popular historian of Athens, to worship in her splendid shrines, to sail the Mediterranean in her fleets. Negative aspects can undoubtedly be found by those who seek them. Those noble Greeks, who are so admired, were nonetheless surrounded by degrading superstitions, unnatural vices, human sacrifice, and slavery. Many commentators compare the high-minded vigour of the early period with the violence and decadence of later centuries. Still, the facts remain. When the civilization of ancient Greece first came into focus, its links to the older worlds of Egypt and Mesopotamia were tenuous. Yet, in the space of three or four hundred years, it had created breathtaking achievements in almost every field of human endeavour. European history knows no such burst of vital energy until the era of the Renaissance. For Greece, apparently, did not develop slowly and methodically. It blazed. The political history of ancient Greece spanned more than a thousand years and passed through several distinct ages. The initial prehistoric age, which looked to the twin centres of Minoan and Mycenaean civilization, came to an end in the 12th century BC. In its later stages it coincided to a large extent with the so-called Heroic Age, which culminated in the Trojan War, and which later Greek literature peopled with the legendary names of Hercules, Ajax, Achilles, and Agamemnon. Troy was built on the Asian side of the Aegean, which, especially in Ionia, supported the major centres of Greek settlement for centuries. The traditional date for Troy's fall is 1184 BC, Excavations have shown that the historical basis of the legends is stronger than was once supposed. After that, an extended Dark Age ensued, where the historical and even the archaeological record is meagre. The Golden Age of the Greek city-states lasted from the 8th to the 4th centuries, and itself passed through several distinct periods. The Archaic Period reached the historical record with the First Olympiad, whose traditional date of 776 BC was to be adopted as the arbitrary starting point of the Greek chronology. The central period of Greece's greatest glory began in the 5th century and ended in 338 BC, when the Greeks were forced to surrender to the Macedonians. Thereafter, in the period of dependence, the Greek cities laboured under foreign rule, first Macedonian, then Roman. The principal conflicts of this golden age were provided by the wars against the Empire of Persia, which, under Cyrus the Great, 558 to 529, absorbed the eastern half of the Greek world, and later by the Peloponnesian War, 431 to 404, where the Greek cities fought in fratricidal strife. The battles where the invading Persians were held and repulsed, at the plain of Marathon, 490 BC, or the Pass of Thermopylae and the Bay of Salamis, 480 BC, have inspired endless panegyrics. In contrast, 
Sparta's inglorious victory over Athens in 404 BC, which was accomplished with Persian support, or the merciless suppression of Sparta by Thebes, have received less attention. The Persian Wars gave a permanent sense of identity to the Greeks who escaped Persian domination. Free Hellas was seen as the glorious West, the land of liberty, the home of beauty and wisdom. The East was the seat of slavery, brutality, ignorance. Aeschylus put these sentiments into the mouth of the Queen of Persia. The scene is the royal palace at Susa, where news has arrived of her son's defeat at Salamis. Queen. My friends, where is this Athens said to be? Chorus. Far toward the dying flames of the sun. Queen. Yet my son lusts to track it down. Chorus. Then all of Hellas would be subject to the king. Queen. So rich in numbers are they? Chorus. So great a host has dealt to the Persians many woes. Queen. Who commands them? Who is shepherd to their host? Chorus. They are slaves to none, neither are they subject. The notion that Greece was all liberty and Persia all tyranny was an extremely subjective one, but it provided the foundation of a tradition which has persistently linked civilization with Europa and the West. The rise of Macedonia, a Hellenized country to the north of Greece, reached its peak in the reigns of Philip of Macedon, reigned 359 to 336 BC, and of Philip's son, Alexander the Great, reigned 336 to 323 BC. In a series of campaigns of unparalleled brilliance, which ended only with Alexander's death from fever in Babylon, the whole of Persia's vast domains were overrun, and the Greek world was extended to the banks of the Indus. According to one admiring opinion, Alexander was the first man to view the whole known world, the Oikumene, as one country. But for the senior English historian of Greece, at the end of his twelfth volume and his ninety-sixth chapter, the passing of free Hellas was to be lamented even more than Alexander was to be praised. The historian feels that the life has departed from his subject, he wrote, and with sadness and humiliation brings his narrative to a close. In the political sense, this Hellenistic age, which began with the Macedonian supremacy, lasted until the systematic elimination of Alexander's successes by the growing power of Rome. The geographical expansion of the Greek world was impressive. The miniature island and city-states which ringed the stony shore of the Aegean often lacked the resources to support a growing population. Arable land was at a premium. Commercial outlets grew, even without a modern sense of enterprise. Friendly trading posts were needed for effective contacts with the continental interior. For all these reasons, the foundation of clone colonies offered many attractions. From the 8th century onwards, therefore, several of the most ancient cities of the Greek mainland and of Asia Minor, Chalcis, Eretria, Corinth, Megara, Phocia, and above all, Miletus, were engaged in active colonization. The most frequent locations were found in Sicily and southern Italy, in Thrace, and on the coasts of the Euxin, or Hospitable Sea, so named, like the Pacific, in the hope that its name might offset its nature. In time, as the early colonies themselves gave birth to further colonies of their own, whole chains or families of cities were established, each with its lasting devotion to the parent foundation. Miletus constructed the largest of such families, with up to 80 members of various generations. In the west, in Sicily, the first Chalcidian colonies, Naxos and Messana, Messina, dated from 735 BC. Emporia, Ampurias, in Iberia, Massilia, Marseille, Neapolis, Naples, Syracusae, Syracuse, Byzantium on the Bosporus, Cyrene in North Africa, and Sinope on the southern Euxin shore all date from the same early centuries. At a later date, following the conquest of Alexander the Great, Greek cities arose in the depths of Asia. Foundations which bore the name of the Macedonian conqueror included Alexandria at World's End, Kogent in Turkestan, Alexandria in Areia, Herat, Alexandria in Eracosia, Kandahar, Alexandria in Syria, and above all, 
Alexandria in Egypt. From Saguntum, Sagunto near Valencia, in the far west, to Bucephala, Jalem, in the Punjab at the eastern extremity, named after Alexander's faithful charger, the interlinked chains of Greek cities stretched for almost 4,500 miles, that is, for almost twice the distance across North America. Sicily and southern Italy, then known as Magna Graecia, or Greater Greece, had a special role to play. They developed the same relationship with the Greek mainland that the Americas would develop with Europe. Until the Persian conquest of Asia Minor in the 6th century, the focus had remained very firmly in the Aegean. Miletus had been an even larger and more prosperous city than Athens, but once Europa came under threat, first from Persia and then from Macedonia and Rome, the cities of Magna Graecia assumed a new importance. Sicily, full of luxury and tyrants, thrived on its special symbiosis with the surrounding Phoenician world. Syracuse was for Athens what New York was to be for London. On Greek Sicily and its internecine wars, Michelet waxed specially eloquent. It grew in gigantic proportions. Its volcano Etna put Vesuvius to shame, and the surrounding towns responded to its grandeur. The Herculean hand of the Dorians can be seen in the remains of Acragus, Agrigentum, in the columns of Posidonia, Pestum, in the white phantom that is Selinunte. Yet the colossal power of these cities, their prodigious riches, their naval forces, did nothing to retard their ruin. In the history of Magna Graecia, one defeat spelt disaster. Thus Sybaris and Agrigentum passed from the world, the Tyre and the Babylon of the West. Magna Graecia commanded a region of great strategic importance, where the Greek world came into direct contact with the rival spheres, first of the Phoenicians and then of Rome. Phoenicia, homeland of Europa, flourished in parallel to Greece and in similar style. Indeed, Phoenicia's city-states were considerably senior to their Greek counterparts, as were the Phoenician colonies. Sidon and Tyre had risen in prominence at the time when Crete was in terminal decline. Kart Hadchat, or New City, Cartagon, Carthago, Carthage, had been founded in North Africa in 810 BC, reputedly by Phoenician colonists led by Pygmalion and his sister Dido. Neighboring Attic, Utica, was still older. When old Phoenicia was overrun, like Asia Minor, by the Persians, Carthage and Utica were left, like the cities of the Greek mainland, to thrive on their own. Carthage built a huge empire through naval power, trade, and colonization. Its daughter colonies stretched from beyond the pillars of Hercules at Gades, Cadiz, and Tingis, Tangier, to Panormus, Palermo, on Sicily. In its heyday, it was probably the most prosperous of all city-states, dominating all the islands and coasts of the western Mediterranean. From the 5th century onwards, it fought and destroyed many of the Greek cities of Sicily, where its ambitions were cut short only by the arrival of Roman power. The Phoenicians and Carthaginians, like Jews and Arabs, were Semites. As the ultimate losers in the struggle for supremacy in the Mediterranean, they did not enjoy the sympathy either of the Greeks or of the Romans. As idolaters of Baal, the ultimate graven image, they have always been singled out for derision by followers of the Judeo-Christian tradition, which the Greco-Roman world eventually adopted. Though Europa's Phoenician kinsfolk held sway for a millennium and more, their civilization is very little known or studied. Their story may have suffered from yet another variant of anti-Semitism. Greek religion progressed from early animism and fetishism to a view of the world seen as one great city of gods and men. The Olympian pantheon was already extant in the late prehistoric age. Zeus, father of the gods, and Hera, his consort, ruled over the headstrong family of Olympians, Apollo, Artemis, Pallas, Athene, Ares, Poseidon, Hermes, Dionysus, Demeter, Pluto, and Persephone. Their home on the summit of Mount Olympus was generally taken to stand on the northern frontier of the Greek homeland. They were joined by a rich gallery of local deities, satyrs, shades, nymphs, furies, sibyls, and muses, to whom the Greeks paid their oblations. The ritual sacrifice of animals remained the normal practice. 
though it was the prerogative of the gods to be capricious, and though some, such as Ares, god of war, or Poseidon, god of the sea, could be vengeful, there was no devil, no power of darkness or sin, to prey on people's deeper fears. Man's supreme fault was hubris, or overweening pride, commonly punished by Nemesis, the wrath of the gods. A thousand myths and a dazzling choice of cults and oracles proliferated. They fostered an outlook where courage and enterprise, tempered by respect, were thought to be rewarded by health and fortune. The cult of Zeus, centred at Olympia, which hosted the Olympic Games, was universal, as was the combination of piety and competitive endeavour. The widespread cult of Apollo, god of light, was centred at his birthplace on the island of Delos and at Delphi. The mysteries of Demeter, goddess of the earth, at Eleusis, and the still more ecstatic mysteries of Dionysus, god of wine, developed from ancient fertility rites. The cult of Orpheus the singer, who had pursued his dead love Eurydice through the underworld, turned on a belief in the existence and purification of souls. Orphism, which lasted from the 7th century until late Roman times, inspired endless poetic comment, from Plato and Virgil onwards. Nur wer die Laia schon hob auch unterschatten, darf das unendliche Lob annen der Staten. Nur wer mit Toten vom Mohn as, von dem Irren wird nicht den leisesten Ton wieder verlieren. Mag auch die Spiegelung im Teich oft uns verschwimmen, wisse das Bild. Erst in dem Doppelbereich werden die Stimmen ewig und mild. Only he who has raised the lyre even among the shades can dispense the infinite praise. Only he who ate of their poppy with the dead will never lose even the softest note. Though the reflection in the pond may often dissolve before us, no, the image, only in the double realm will the voices be lasting and gentle. All these cults, as well as the Hellenistic cults of Mithras and Isis, were still in full circulation when Christianity arrived in the period after the 200th Olympiad. Greek philosophy, or love of wisdom, grew up in opposition to conventional religious attitudes. Socrates, son of a stonemason, was sentenced in Athens to drink hemlock for introducing strange gods and corrupting youth. Yet the Socratic method of asking penetrating questions in order to test the assumptions which underlie knowledge provided the basis of all subsequent rational thought. It was used by Socrates to challenge what he regarded as the specious arguments of the earlier sophists or sages. His motto was, Life unexamined is not worth living. According to his disciple Plato, Socrates said, All I know is that I know nothing. It was the perfect start for epistemology. Plato and Plato's own disciple Aristotle together laid the foundations of most branches of speculative and natural philosophy. Plato's Academy, or Grove, and Aristotle's Lyceum, otherwise known as the Peripatetic School, were the Oxford and Cambridge, or Harvard and Yale, of the ancient world. With them in mind, it has been said, the legacy of the Greeks to Western philosophy was Western philosophy. Of the two, Plato was the idealist, creating the first imaginary utopias, fundamental theories of forms and of immortality, an influential cosmogony, a far-ranging critique of knowledge, and a famous analysis of love. Nothing in intellectual history is more powerful than Plato's metaphor of the cave, which suggests that we can only perceive the world indirectly, seeing reality only by means of its firelit shadows on the wall. Aristotle, in contrast, was the practitioner of inspired common sense, the systematizer. His encyclopedic works range from metaphysics and ethics to politics, literary criticism, logic, physics, biology, and astronomy. Greek literature, initially in the form of epic poetry, was one of those wonders which apparently came into being in a mature state. Homer, who probably lived and wrote in the middle of the 8th century BC, was exploiting a much older oral tradition. He may or may not have been the sole author of the works attributed to him, but the first poet of European literature is widely considered to have been the most influential. The Iliad and the Odyssey have few peers and no superiors. 
Homer's language, which classicists call sublime, proved to be infinitely flexible and expressive. Written literature depends on literacy, whose origins go back to the importation of an alphabet in the 8th century. The art of letters was greatly encouraged by the urban character of Greek life, but the extent of its penetration into the various social strata is a matter of some controversy. Homer's successors, his fellow epicists from Hesiod to the unknown authors of the so-called Homeric hymns, the elegists from Callinus of Ephesus to Xenophanes of Colophon, the lyricists from Sappho to Pindar, from Anacreon to Simonides of Sios, have attracted countless imitators and translators. Theocritus the Syracusan wrote idylls of nymphs and goat herds, which became the model for a pastoral tradition stretching from Virgil's eclogues to As You Like It. But none sang so sweet as the Tenth Muse of Lesbos. Some say that the most beautiful thing on this dark earth is a squadron of cavalry. Others say a troop of infantry, others a fleet of ships. But I say that it is the one you love. Poetry reading was closely allied to music, and the melody of a seven-stringed lyre served as a common accompaniment to the declaimed hexameters. The Greek word musike encompassed all melodious sounds, whether words or notes. Poetry was to be found in the simplest inscriptions, in the widespread art of epigrams. Panda gelo kai panda kon da to methen. Panda gar ex alogo esti ta gignamina. Everything's laughter, everything dust, everything nothing. Out of unreason comes everything that exists. And of epitaphs. Haxain angelon lake daimovion arti theiti. Kemita toi kenon, remasi pethomenoi. Tell them in Lacedaemon, passerby, that we kept the rules, resolved to die. Greek drama evolved out of the ceremonies of religious festivals. The concept of tragodia, literally goat song, was originally connected with ritual sacrifice. The first Athenian dramas were performed at the festival of Dionysus. Like the games, they were staged in the spirit of competition. The stylized dialogue between the players and the chorus provided a vehicle for exploring the most terrible psychological and spiritual conflicts. Between them, the triad of tragedians, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, turned tribal myth and legend into the fountain stones of world literature. Seven against Thebes, the Orestia, and Prometheus Bound, Oedipus the King, Electra, and Antigone, Iphigenia among the Taurians, Medea, and Hippolytus, represent the remnants of a much larger repertoire. Only thirty-two tragedies have survived, but they continue to be performed the world over. They are specially needed by the horror-struck twentieth century. Tragedy enables us to live through the unbearable. The greatest Greek tragedies are a constant education in the nightmare possibility that we will all end in darkness and despair and suicide. Having boldly looked into the terrible destructiveness of so-called world history, as well as the cruelty of nature, the Greek comforts himself. Art saves him, and through art, life. The comedians, led by Aristophanes, felt free to poke fun at everyone from philosophers to politicians. The knights, the birds, the clouds, the wasps, the frogs, whose fantastic plots are laced with lavatorial and sexual humour, still raise roars of laughter from audiences the world over. Aristophanes had a matchless talent for coining unforgettable phrases. He is the inventor of Nephelocochigia, cloud cuckoo land. It is no exaggeration to say that Greek letters form the launchpad of the humanist tradition. Wonders are many, wrote Sophocles, but nothing more wonderful than man. Chorus. Wonders are many on earth, and the greatest of these is man who rides the ocean. He is master of the ageless earth, to his own will bending the immortal mother of gods. He is lord of all living things. The use of language, the wind-swift motion of brain he learnt, found out the laws of living together in cities. There is nothing beyond his power. Greek oratory was an art fostered both by the theatre and by the tradition of open-air law courts and political assemblies. 
rhetoric, first expounded in The Art of Words by Corax of Syracuse, was studied as a formal subject. Of the ten Attic orators, from Antiphon to Dinarchus of Corinth, none matched the skill of Demosthenes. In his youth an orphan and a stammerer, he overcame all difficulties, drove his arch-rival, Eschines, into exile, and became the acknowledged master both of public speaking and of prose style. His series of Philippics argued eloquently and passionately for resistance to Philip of Macedon. His oration, On the Crown, delivered in his defence at a trial in 330 BC, was modestly described by Macaulay as the ne plus ultra of human art. Greek art, too, experienced its great awakening, what one leading scholar has dared to call the greatest and most astonishing revolution in the whole history of art. Modern appreciation is influenced, no doubt, by those forms which have best survived, notably sculpture in stone, architecture, and figure painting on ceramic vases. Even so, the sudden leap from the stiff and gloomy styles of older antiquity, the explosive flowering which took place in the 6th and 5th centuries, is remarkable. Strongly inspired by spiritual and religious motives, Greek artists paid special attention to the human body, seeking, as Socrates urged, to represent the workings of the soul, by observing the effect of people's inner feelings on the body in action. The two most celebrated statues of Phidias are only known from later copies, but the Parthenon friezes, dubiously salvaged by Lord Elgin, speak for themselves. A century later, Praxiteles, a sculptor of almost ethereal ease and grace, was no more fortunate than Phidias in the survival of his masterworks, though the Hermes of Olympia and the Aphrodite of Arles attest to his talent. These, together with figures of the later period, such as the bronze Apollo Belvedere or the Aphrodite of Milos, better known as the Venus de Milo, have often been taken as ideal models for male and female beauty. By the era of Alexander the Great, the Greeks had created the pictorial language of half the world. Greek architecture succeeded in harnessing immense technical skill to exquisite sensibility. The art of building, which in Mesopotamia and in Egypt had largely sought to impress by means of its colossal scale, now aimed to exhibit more spiritual values. The finely proportioned harmonies of the Doric temples, with their subtly tapered colonnades and sculptured plinths and pediments, could convey either heavyweight muscular power, as at the Temple of Poseidon at Posidonia, Pestum, or effortless elegance, as in the white pentelic marble of the Athenian Parthenon. The tone and the mood of the temple could be tuned to the special characteristics of whatever deity inhabited the enclosed cella or sanctuary behind the soaring columns. Of the seven wonders of the world, as listed in the second century BC by Antipater of Sidon, for the first generation of classical tourists, five were masterpieces of Greek architecture. After the pyramids of Egypt and the hanging gardens of Semiramis at Babylon, these were the statue of Zeus at Olympia, the third temple of Artemis at Ephesus, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, the Colossus of Rhodes, and the Pharos or lighthouse of Alexandria. Greek science was simply a branch of general philosophy. Most philosophers were concerned with both the physical and the abstract sciences. Thales of Miletus, who held that everything derived from water, died fittingly by falling down a well. He measured the flood levels of the Nile, the distances between ships and the height of mountains, and he was credited with predicting solar eclipses. Heraclitus of Ephesus, in contrast, considered fire to be the primary form of all matter, which was constantly in flux. Anaxagoras of Clazomene, the teacher of Pericles, argued for the existence of a supreme mind or nous, which animated all living things, and which, by exerting its force on infinitely divisible seeds, enabled them to combine into all forms of matter. He claimed that the planets were stones torn from the earth, and that the sun was red-hot through motion. Empedocles of Acrogas proposed that the earth is made of four elements, fire, earth, air, and water, and that these elements are constantly merging and separating under the contrary stresses of love and strife. He reputedly leapt into the crater of Mount Etna 
in order to test his capacity for reincarnation, but the volcano obliged by returning only one sandal. Democritus of Abdera refined the atomic theory of Leucippus, holding that all physical matter could be explained in terms of the random collisions of tiny particles which he called atoma, or unbreakables. He was popularly known as the laughing philosopher because of his amusement at human folly. Hippocrates of Kos took medicine out of the realm of religion and magic. Numerous treatises on public health, hygiene, patient care, and surgery were attributed to him. The Hippocratic Oath, whereby doctors dedicated their lives to the welfare of their patients, remained the cornerstone of medical practice until quite recently. His book of aphorisms begins with the line, Life is short, art is long. Eudoxus of Nidus taught the motions of the planets around the sun whilst inventing the sundial. Aristotle wrote systematic works in both physics and biology. His classification of animal species forms the basis of all subsequent zoology. His politics begins with the inimitable remark, Man is above all a political animal. Aristotle's pupil, Theophrastus of Lesbos, applied the same methods of classification to botany. His treatise on characters can be seen as the founding text of analytical psychology. From the historian's point of view, Heraclitus was probably the most important of these pioneers. Heraclitus reasoned that everything in the world is subject to perpetual change and decay, also that change is caused by the inevitable clash of opposites, in other words, by dialectics. In so doing, he unwrapped the two basic ideas of the historian's trade, change over time and causation. His favourite aphorism was, you cannot step into the same river twice. Greek mathematics developed under the influence both of speculative thought and of religious mysticism. Thales had supposedly learned the rudiments of arithmetic and geometry in Egypt, but it was Pythagoras of Samos who, in addition to compiling the results of his predecessors, made a number of original advances. He launched the theory of numbers, formulated the theorem about the square of the hypotenuse of the right-angle triangle, and, most interestingly, worked out the mathematical basis of musical harmony. He may be the author of the beautiful but mistaken theory of the music of the spheres. Eudoxus discovered the theory of proportions and the method of exhaustion for measuring curvilinear surfaces. His disciple, Menachmus, discovered conic sections. All these researches prepared the way for Euclides of Alexandria, whose elements is said to have reigned supreme for longer than any book save the Bible. Euclid was the great mathematical systematizer who set out to provide lasting proofs for all existing knowledge. When asked by the ruler of Egypt whether geometry could not be made more simple, he replied that there was no royal road. The next generation was dominated by Archimedes and by Eratosthenes of Cyrene, who, in calculating the Earth's diameter at 252,000 stades, or 7,850 miles, erred by less than 1%. Lastly, there was Apollonius of Perga, who wrote a vast eight-volume study of conics and found an approximation for pi that was even closer than that of Archimedes. Greek moral philosophy, divided in the later centuries into several rival schools, greatly modified the teachings of traditional religion. The skeptics, founded by Piero of Elis, whose dates are not known, asserted that it is not possible to attain certain knowledge about anything, and hence that man's sole object should be the pursuit of virtue. He was an anti-speculative speculator, who exerted an important influence on the Athenian academy after Plato's death. The Cynics were founded by Diogenes of Sinope, who held a Tolstoyan sort of belief in the value of freeing oneself from desire. Their name meant literally the dogs. Diogenes was a noted eccentric, who lived in a barrel as a gesture of renouncing the world's comforts, and walked the streets of daytime Athens with a lantern, looking for honest men. In a meeting with Alexander the Great in Corinth, he is said to have told the king to stop blocking my sunshine. The Epicureans, named after Epicurus of Samos, taught that people should devote themselves to the pursuit of happiness, fearing neither death nor the gods. 
It is a thought which found its way into the Constitution of the USA. They gained an undeserved reputation for mere pleasure-seeking. In reality, they held that the road to happiness lay through self-control, calm, and self-denial. The Stoics, founded by Zenon of Cyprus, took their name from the Athenian Stoa Poikile, or Painted Porch, where the group first gathered. They followed the conviction that human passions should be governed by reason, and, like the skeptics, that the pursuit of virtue was all. Their vision of a universal brotherhood of mankind, their sense of duty, and their disciplined training, designed to ensure them against pain and suffering, proved specially attractive to the Romans. Greek sexuality is a subject for which fashionable scholarship would prefer monographs to paragraphs. What, for scholars of an older vintage, was unnatural vice, has now been upgraded to personal orientation or preference, and homosexuality is widely considered to occupy a central position in an ancient code of social manners which, as now presented, has very modern overtones. The Greek vice did not generate guilt. For a man to pursue young boys was no more reprehensible than to pursue young girls. Young Greek males, like English public schoolboys, had presumably to take sodomy in their stride. Parents ought to protect their sons in the same ways that they protected their daughters. Female homosexuality was in evidence alongside its male counterpart, though the island of Lesbos, home of the poetess Sappho and her circle, did not lend its name to the phenomenon in ancient times. Incest, too, was clearly an issue. The tragic fate of the legendary Oedipus, who killed his father and married his mother by mistake, was proof of divine wrath. Generally speaking, the Greeks do not appear either licentious or puritanical, so much as practical and open-minded. Their world was full of explicit erotica, about which they were sublimely unembarrassed. One must not imagine, however, that Greek assumptions about sexuality resembled those of contemporary California. A slave-owning society, for example, assumed that the bodies of the unfree were available for the uses and abuses of the free. Sexual activity thus became a function of social status. Mutuality in sexual relations did not have to be taken into account, still less shared feelings. Satisfaction was mainly associated with the phallic pleasure of the active male who imposed himself and his organ on its passive recipients. Despite legal constraints, men of superior status often took it for granted that they could penetrate their inferiors at will, and inferiors included women, boys, servants, and foreigners. This assumption, if correctly identified, would render the modern distinction between homo and heterosexuality largely irrelevant. Similarly, the distinction between pederast and filarast was less dependent on personal proclivities than on the age at which the growing male could assert himself. The classic text for the study of such matters, Aristophanes' myth in Plato's Symposium, mentions a number of sexual practices that appear to foreshadow familiar modern categories. Yet, closer inspection suggests that the Greeks may have followed a system of values that are very alien to our own. According to the myth, human beings were originally eight-limbed, two-faced creatures, each with two sets of genitals, front and back. They came in three varieties, male, female, and androgynous. Zeus later cut them in half and invented sexual intercourse for the benefit of the separated halves. People possessed assorted sexual desires in line with the type of ancestor from whom they were descended. Hence, the binary opposition of male and female would seem to have been lacking, and pluralist sexuality, present to different degrees in all individuals, may have been considered the basic condition. Unfortunately, modern scholarly opinion presents no less pluralism than the subject in hand. Greek social structures do not present a simple picture. There were fundamental differences between the societies of the city-states and those of the remoter mountain areas, such as Arcadia and the Peloponnese, where pastoral pre-Greek tribes survived into Roman times. Slavery was a general feature, though it did not necessarily form the foundation of all social and economic institutions, as some historians would like to believe. In the five-stage scheme of Marxism-Leninism, classic slaveholding is taken as the necessary starting point of all social history. In Athens, 
the population was divided between slaves, metics, or resident foreigners, and citizens. The slaves, who were called andropoda, literally human feet, were treated as chattels and could be killed with impunity. They were not allowed to serve in the army. Freed slaves automatically rose to the status of metics, who could be both taxed and conscripted. The citizens, who alone could call themselves Athenians, had the right to landed property and the duty of military service. They were divided into ten phylae, or tribes, and the tribes into smaller groupings called trities, thirds, and deems, or parishes. Each of these bodies had its own corporate life, with a role in both civil and military organization. Greek political organization was characterized by variety and experimentation. Since every polis or city-state governed itself, at least in theory, a wide range of political traditions developed, each with its variants, derivatives, and imitations. There were monarchies, like Samos under the pirate king Polycrates. There were despotisms, especially among the cities of Asia Minor influenced by the Persian example. There were oligarchies of various types like Corinth, Sparta, or Massilia. There were democracies, like Athens in its prime. Yet incessant wars, leagues, and confederations caused constant interaction, and each of the different polities was subject to drastic evolutions. The Athenian system itself underwent many changes, from its earliest known manifestations in the 7th century under Draco, author of the first Draconian law code, and the 6th century reforms of Solon, and the benevolent despotism of Pisistratus. Two hundred years after Draco, Athens' defeat in the Peloponnesian War ushered in the episode of the Thirty Tyrants and the rule of the radical Cleon, Pericles' chief critic. Even in the central decades of Athenian democracy in the 5th century, modern scholarship is far from unanimous about the true extent of participation by the citizens. Elaborate controversies take place over the size of the slave population, the role of the city mob, the degree of landholding among the citizens, the place of the citizen peasant, and above all, the operations of various city assemblies, the boule, or Council of Five Hundred, the Ecclesia, which was the main legislative assembly, and the jury courts. It turns out that the demos, or people, which is thought to have consisted of up to 50,000 exclusively male freemen, is no easier to define than the democracy. Nor is it easy to reconcile the fact that Pericles or Demosthenes, the great Athenian democrats, were, like Washington and Jefferson, slave owners, or that the democratic Athens exercised a tyrannical hold over the city's lesser dependencies. Not surprisingly, the extreme complications of Greek political practice offered fertile ground for the growth of political theory. Plato's Republic, which advocates the rule of the guardians, a somewhat totalitarian breed of so-called philosopher kings, and Aristotle's politics, with its categoric statement about man being zoon politikon, offer two opposing approaches to the subject. The basic political vocabulary of the modern world, from anarchy to politics itself, is largely a Greek invention. Greek history writing, like the theatre, had its triad of giants. Herodotus of Halicarnassus is commonly known as the father of history, but his keen interest in foreign lands earned from his more chauvinistic compatriots the label of father of lies. He wrote from eyewitness reports and from personal observation on his far-flung travels. He saw the past in terms of the titanic contest between Europe and Asia, and his nine books culminate in the Greco-Persian Wars. Thucydides, the Athenian, in the opinion of Thomas Hobbes and many others, was quite simply the most politic historiographer that ever writ. He introduced the systematic analyses of causation and consequence, he quoted documents and treatises at length, and in the set-piece orations of his principal protagonists, he found a marvellous method for injecting his strictly impartial narrative with subjective opinion. His eight books on the Peloponnesian War were not designed, he wrote, to meet the taste of an immediate public, but to last forever. Xenophon, another Athenian, was author of the Hellenica and of Anabasis, the Hellenica continues the narrative of Greek history from the point where Thucydides had broken off in 411, 
just as Thucydides had to some extent carried on from Herodotus. The Anabasis, translated as the Persian Expedition, describes the long march of 10,000 Greek mercenaries, including Xenophon himself, who went to Mesopotamia and back in the service of a Persian pretender. The shout of Thalassa, Thalassa, the sea, the sea, when, after months of marching, Xenophon's companions caught sight of the coast from the hills behind Trebizond, provides one of the most enthusiastic moments of military chronicles. By common assent, the zenith of Greek civilization was reached during the age of Pericles in Athens. In the interval between the city's salvation from the Persian invasion in 480 BC and the onset of the ruinous war with Sparta in 431, the political, intellectual, and cultural energies of Athens peaked. Pericles, general and statesman, was leader of the moderate democratic faction. He had organized the reconstruction of the pillaged Acropolis and was the friend of artists and philosophers. His funeral oration for the dead of the first year of the Peloponnesian War pulses with pride at the freedom and high culture of his native city. Our love of what is beautiful does not lead to extravagance. Our love of the things of the mind does not make us soft. We regard wealth as something to be properly used, rather than as something to boast about. Here each individual is interested not only in his own affairs, but in the affairs of the state as well. We do not say that a man who takes no interest in politics is a man who minds his own business. We say that he has no business here at all. Others are brave out of ignorance, and when they begin to think, they begin to fear. But the man who can most truly be accounted brave is he who best knows the meaning of what is sweet in life and what is terrible, and then goes out undeterred to meet what is to come. The Athenian contemporaries of Pericles gave him good reason to be proud. Anaxagoras and Socrates, Euripides and Aeschylus, Pindar and Phidias, Antiphon and Aristophanes, Democritus and Hippocrates, Herodotus and Thucydides, all walked the same streets, all watched the Parthenon taking shape for its inauguration in 438. Athens, the eye of Greece, mother of arts and eloquence, had fulfilled the prediction of the oracle, you will become an eagle among the clouds for all time. Most appropriate, perhaps, are the words from a fragment of Pindar. I te vi parai, kai io stephanoi, kai ahoidimoi, elados e resma, klenai artanai, gaimonium palietran, shining and violet crowned and celebrated in song, bulwark of Greece, famous Athens, divine city. Sparta, otherwise known as Lacedaemon, was Athens's foil and rival. To modern sensibilities it was as ugly as Athens is attractive. Exceptionally, it was a landlocked city, built on the plain of Laconia in the middle of the Peloponnese. It possessed no native navy, and was entirely devoted to the militarism which had enabled it to confront all its immediate neighbours, the Messenians, the Argives, and the Arcadians. Its system of government, bestowed in remote times by the divine Lycurgus, was variously described as a despotic form of oligarchy or an oligarchic form of despotism. A council of ephors, or magistrates, wielded dictatorial powers. They gave orders to the two hereditary kings of Sparta, who acted as high priests and military commanders. Sparta had few colonies, and solved its problems of overpopulation by culling its male infants. Weaklings were ceremonially left to die in the open. All surviving boys were taken by the state at the age of seven to be trained in physical prowess and military discipline. At twenty, they started their forty-year service as citizen soldiers. They were forbidden to undertake trade or crafts, and were supported by the toil of an underclass of helots or slaves. The result was a culture which had little time for the arts and graces, and little sense of solidarity with the rest of Hellas. According to Aristotle, it was also a society in which the number of men began to fall alarmingly, and a large part of the land was held by women. To be laconic was to spurn fine words. When Philip of Macedon sent a threatening letter to Sparta, If I enter Lacedaemon, I shall raise it. The ephors sent him a one-word reply, an if. The era of Hellenism 
that is, the era when the world of the Greek city-states was merged into the wider but essentially non-Greek world created by Alexander and his successors, is frequently despised for its decadence. Certainly in the political sphere, the internecine strife of the dynasties that latched on to Alexander's dismembered empire does not make an edifying story. On the other hand, Greek culture had stamina, and the beneficial effects of a common tradition through several centuries and in diverse lands should not be casually dismissed. Greek rulers in the Indus Valley, where the veneer of Hellenism was thinnest, held on into the middle of the first century BC. In Macedonia, the Antigonid dynasty, founded by Alexander's one-eyed general, Antigonus, reigned until their defeat by the Romans in 168. In Syria, and for a time in Persia and in Asia Minor, the Seleucid dynasty, founded by Seleucus I Nicator, controlled vast if ever diminishing Asiatic territories. They were active Hellenizers, consciously executing Alexander's plans for a network of new Greek colonies in Asia. They surrendered to Rome in 69. The eastern half of the Seleucid realm was seized in 250 BC by Arsaces, the Parthian, whose Arsacid dynasty ruled in Persia for nearly 500 years, until the rebirth of a native Persian empire in AD 226. In Egypt, the Ptolemaic dynasty, launched by Alexander's bastard half-brother, Ptolemaeus Sota, the preserver, reigned until 31 BC. The Ptolemies were noted for their love and patronage of the arts and learning, even when occasionally, as with Ptolemy VIII, Fiscon, the paunch, they were also noted for the most disgusting perversions. Through a series of matrimonial contortions, Fiscon contrived to marry his sister, who was also his brother's widow, and who therefore became simultaneously sister, wife, and sister-in-law. To divorce her in favour of her daughter by a previous marriage, who thereby became simultaneously his second wife, niece, and stepdaughter, and to murder his son, who was also a nephew. Incest, to protect the purity of royal blood, was a tradition of the pharaohs which other cultures have called decadence. Yet Thermae, Thessalonica, Antioch, Pergamum, Palmyra, and above all Alexandria of Egypt, became major cultural, economic, and political centres. The blending of Greek and Oriental influences which fermented alongside the decadent dynasties, created that inimitable Hellenistic culture which eventually triumphed over its Western Latin masters. After all, the Romans of Byzantium, who upheld the Roman Empire for a thousand years beyond the fall of Rome, were heirs to the Hellenistic Greeks, and in a very real sense the last successors of Alexander. In the words of Horace, Graecia captha ferum victoriam capit, captured Greece, captured its fierce conqueror. Hellenistic culture, therefore, acquired a much broader base than did its Hellenic progenitor. According to Isocrates, the last of the Attic orators, Athens has brought it to pass that the name of Greek should no longer be thought of as a matter of race, but a matter of intelligence. As a result, the quantity of Greek writers actually increased. There was a gang of geographers, from Strabo to Pausanias, there was a profusion of poets, Apollonius, Aratus, and Bion, author of The Lament for Adonis, Hermesaniax, Moschus, Meliager, and Musius, Oppian, Timon, and Theocritus. There was a host of historians, Manetho of Egypt, inventor of the chronological system of kingdoms and dynasties, and Barossus, Bar Osea, of Babylon, Polybius of Megalopolis, the Greek apologist for Rome, and Josephus, the governor of Judea and author of The Jewish War, Appian, Arian, Herodian, Eusebius. Galenus wrote a shelf of medical textbooks, Hermogenes, the standard treatise on rhetoric. Among philosophers, the Neo-Stoics, such as Epictetus of Hierapolis, vied with the Neoplatonists, Plotinus, Porphyry, Proclus. The Enchiridion, or Manual of Stoicism, written by Epictetus, has been called the guidebook to the morality of the later classical world. Plutarch, the biographer and essayist, Lucian of Samosata, the satirist and the novelists Longus and Heliodorus exemplify the continuing diversity of the Greek prose tradition under Roman rule. 
Among the writers of the Hellenistic period, many wrote Greek as their second language. Josephus, Lucian, and Marcus Aurelius fit into this category, as do the Christian evangelists Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and above all, St. Paul. Within the Hellenistic world, Alexandria in Egypt soon gained the preeminence that Athens had enjoyed in Greece. Under the rule of the Ptolemies, it grew into the largest and most cultured city of the East, second only to Rome in wealth and splendor. Its multinational and multilingual population consisted of Macedonians, Jews, and Egyptians. The decree inscribed on the Rosetta Stone, now in the British Museum, provided the trilingual text which permitted Champollion to decipher its hieroglyphics. The fabulous Museum, or College of the Muses, with its library of 700,000 volumes, was dedicated to the collection, preservation, and study of ancient Greek culture. It was a beacon of learning, illuminating the intellectual life of the later classical world, as surely as the great pharaohs illuminated the sea lanes of the harbour. Aristophanes of Byzantium, one of the early librarians at Alexandria, was responsible both for the first annotated editions of Greek literature and for the first systematic analysis of Greek grammar and orthography. Aristarchus of Samothrace established the text of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Philon, or Philo Judeus, a leader of Alexandria's thriving Jewish community, attempted to reconcile Greek philosophy with traditional Judaic theology. Hieron, an Alexandrian engineer of uncertain date, is reputed to have invented, among other things, the steam engine, the siphon, and a drachma in the slot machine. Specially important in the history of cultural transmission were the so-called hermetic writings. Long attributed to an otherwise unknown author, Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice greatest Hermes, scribe of the gods, this huge collection of Greek texts from Alexandria purports in effect to be an encyclopedia of ancient Egypt. Forty-two sacred books summarize the laws of the pharaohs, their deities, rituals, beliefs, cosmography, astrology, medicine. Other books dating from the third century contain a strange mixture of Neoplatonic and Kabbalistic texts, apparently directed against the rise of Christianity. In the long run, however, it is not surprising that Greece's shoreline civilization proved unequal to the massed battalions of the neighboring land-based powers. Aristotle's simile of mankind living like ants milling on the shore underlines the strategic problem of concentrating Greek manpower and resources. The thin, extended lines of communication were effective for purposes of economic and cultural expansion, but vulnerable to military attack. In the 5th century BC, the Persian challenge had been repulsed with the greatest difficulty. In the 4th century, the Macedonians overran the whole of Greece and Persia in the space of 30 years. From the 3rd century onwards, the advance of the Roman legions was unstoppable. At no time could the Greeks ever put more than 50,000 hoplites into the field. Yet, once the Roman Republic was able to conscript the manpower of the populous Italian peninsula, it had more than half a million soldiers at its disposal. The military contest between Greece and Rome was heavily weighted from the start. The Roman conquest of Magna Graecia was completed at the end of the Pyrrhic Wars in 266 BC. Sicily was annexed following the spirited defence of Syracuse in 212. Macedonia was defeated at the Battle of Pydna in 168. Mainland Greece, which under the Achaean League had reasserted its independence from Macedonian rule, was subdued by the consul L. Mummius in 146 and turned into the Roman province of Achaia. Thereafter, Rome successively reduced all the Greek successor states of the former Macedonian Empire. The dramatic end occurred in 30 BC, when Cleopatra, daughter of Ptolemy XII Oletes and the last queen of Egypt, terminated both a political tradition and her own life by pressing the asp to her snow-white breast. As the lover of both Caesar and Antony, she had done her utmost to control the relentless advance and advances of the Romans. But Pascal's bon mot that the face of the earth would have been different if Cleopatra's nose had been a little shorter was hardly to the point. The political and military strength of the Greek world was exhausted. The absolute supremacy of Rome was already an established fact. 
The resultant fusion of the Hellenistic and the Roman world and the emergence of the hybrid Greco-Roman civilization makes it impossible to put a precise date on the death of ancient Greece. But Hellenic and Hellenistic traditions persisted much longer than is usually supposed. The Delphic Oracle continued to operate until destroyed by marauding barbarians in AD 267. The Olympic Games continued to be held every four years until the 292nd Olympiad in AD 392. The Academy continued to teach its pupils in Athens until closed by the Christian Emperor Justinian in AD 529. The Library of Alexandria, though badly burned during Caesar's siege, was not finally closed until the arrival of the Muslim Caliphate in AD 641. By then, twenty centuries, or two whole millennia, had passed since the twilight of Crete and the dawn at Mycenae. Much of Greek civilization was lost. Much was absorbed by the Romans, to be passed by them into the Christian and the Byzantine traditions. Much had to await rediscovery during the Renaissance and after. Yet, one way or another, enough has survived for that one small East European country to be regularly acclaimed as the mother of Europe, the source of the West, a vital ingredient, if not the sole fountainhead of Europe. Syracuse, Sicily, year one of the 141st Olympiad. In the late summer of the sixth year of the Second Punic War, the epic struggle between the Italian city of Rome and the African city of Carthage was balanced on the knife edge of fate. Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, having annihilated a number of Roman armies sent to halt him, had marched the length of Italy and was campaigning strongly in the south. He had just seized the port and fortress of Tarentum. The Romans, unable to tame him directly, were straining to hold off his allies, the Celts of northern Italy, Philip V of Macedon, who had invaded Illyria, and the Greek city of Syracuse. They were specially eager to subdue Syracuse, since Syracuse held the key both to Hannibal's supply lines from Africa and to their own intentions of reconquering Sicily. As a result, Syracuse was enduring the second season of a determined siege from a Roman force under M. Claudius Marcellus. Syracusae, Queen of Greater Greece, was the largest, the most prosperous, and reputedly the most beautiful of all the Greek colonies in the West. Proudly independent in a Hellenic age which had seen the subjugation of most city-states, it had asserted its supremacy over Athens long since, and had escaped the attentions of Alexander the Great. It had overhauled its sometime rival, the glorious Acragus, raised by the Carthaginians and never fully restored. In this third century BC, it had upheld its profitable role astride the overlapping spheres of Rome and Carthage. It was the last major representative of unconquered Greek civilization. Situated on the east coast of Sicily, halfway between the snowy slopes of Mount Etna and the island's most southerly point at Cape Perkinum, Syracuse commanded a site of unequalled splendor, security, and convenience. It was the natural entrepot for trade between the eastern and the western parts of the Mediterranean, and the most usual staging post between Italy and Africa. Originally founded on a rocky offshore islet, the Ortigia, it had spread upwards onto the neighboring seaside plateau, which was protected by an almost unbroken ring of cliffs and crags. The Grand Harbour, which curved southwards for almost five miles in a perfect bay, was screened by lofty mountains. On the other side of the Ortigia, a second harbour could also accommodate the largest fleet of ships. The island of Ortigia, which served as the city's acropolis, had been joined to the mainland by a fortified causeway in the 6th century. Watered by the marvellous freshwater spring of Arethusa, it was dominated by a huge temple of Apollo, which looked out across the harbour to the matching temple of Zeus, on the opposite headland at Olympium. In the 5th century the entire plateau had been enclosed within a mighty length of stone walls, which ran atop all the natural features. These walls, which stretched for over 15 miles, were anchored to the castle of Euryalus at the foot of the mountains. They surrounded half a million citizens living in five distinct suburbs. The Acradina, or upper city, which possessed its own internal walls, contained the main agora, or forum. Beyond that lay the residential suburbs of Tyche and Epipoli, and above them 
the monumental buildings of Neapolis, the new town, containing a hillside theatre, a nest of temples, and, in Hieron's altar, the largest sacrificial structure of the ancient world. In all this magnificent sight there was only one blemish, an area of marshland astride the river Anapus, which flowed into the Grand Harbour, was a notorious source of summer pestilence. With that one proviso, Syracuse basked in unrivalled favours. According to Cicero, who was to govern there somewhat later, there was never a day when the sun failed to shine. The elevated plateau caught every breeze that blew across the wine-dark waves. Flowers bloomed on the cliffs, and still do, even in winter. Prior to the arrival of the Roman army, Syracuse could boast more than five hundred years of history. Founded by Corinthian colonists in 734 BC, it was only twenty years younger than Rome, and had spread its influence through a network of daughter colonies. In 474, only six years after Salamis, it had been responsible for the destruction of the naval power of the Etruscans, thereby removing one of the early obstacles to Roman fortunes. Like many city-states, it passed through phases of oligarchic, democratic, and monarchical government. It survived its supreme test in the successive sieges of 415 to 413 and 405 to 404, the former laid by the Athenians, the latter by the Carthaginians. For want of better information, the political history of ancient Sicily has to be written in terms of successive Syracusan tyrants, who ruled through a bloody succession of coups and tumults. Dionysius the Elder was cited by Aristotle as an example of the type of tyrant who gains power by demagogic appeals to the poorer classes. His relative, Dion, who had been personally tutored in the ways of a philosopher king by Plato and the Academy, seized control of Syracuse after sailing from Greece in a pre-run of Garibaldi's Thousand. Timoleon, the Corinthian son of liberty, was another who triumphed with the aid of mercenaries, but he seems to have introduced democratic constitutions in many of the cities and succeeded in fixing a boundary on the river Halicus between the Greek and the Carthaginian spheres. The cruel Agathocles was a plebeian potter who rose by marrying a wealthy widow. In 310 BC, he resolved the second Carthaginian siege of Syracuse by carrying the war into Africa. This self-styled King of Sicily was said to have been paralysed by a poisoned toothpick and laid out on his funeral pyre alive. In the next generation, Syracuse was saved from Rome's expanding power by Pyrrhus, the adventurer king of Epirus, who left the field clear for the long reign of his Syracusan supporter, King Hieron II. Hieron II, patron of Archimedes, preserved the peace through an unbroken treaty with Rome and gave Syracuse its last spell of independent affluence. Hieron's death, however, at a crucial moment in the Punic Wars, precipitated a struggle between pro-Roman and pro-Carthaginian factions. His grandson and successor, Hieronymus, abandoned the Roman alliance, only to be overthrown by a popular revolt that overwhelmed first the royal family and then the Roman party. In 215, the election of two Carthaginians as ruling magistrates in Syracuse greatly aroused Roman anxieties. Shortly afterwards, four Roman legions were transported to Sicily, and a Cassus Belli was found in a border skirmish. Marcellus laid siege to Syracuse, by land and by sea, late in 214 or possibly in early 213. For the besiegers, the year was 538 AUC. Their rivalry with Carthage was the central political feature of the era. It was a natural extension of Rome's earlier conquest of southern Italy. Carthage was the established power, Rome the challenger. The First Punic War, 267 to 241, had been provoked by Roman intervention in a local quarrel between Hieron of Syracuse and the city of Messana, and it had ended with Rome's annexation of all Carthaginian possessions in Sicily. Carthage made up for its loss by the creation of a new colony in eastern Iberia, where in 227, Carthaginova, Cartagena, was founded. Rome watched these developments with intense suspicion, and the Second Punic War was provoked by Roman intervention at Saguntum in Iberia, despite a treaty recognizing Carthaginian rule up to the Ebro. 
Hannibal had then carried the war to the gates of Rome, causing a general conflagration in which the strategic control of the central Mediterranean was at stake. Syracuse was the pivot. M. Claudius Marcellus, five times consul, was a pious hero-warrior of the old Roman school. In his first consulship in 222, he had slain the king of the Insubrian Gauls in single combat on the plain near Milan, and had dedicated the whole of his Gallic spoils to the temple of Jupiter Feretrius. He was due to die in battle, ambushed by Hannibal. He earned himself a life by Plutarch. By all accounts, which included those of Livy and Polybius as well as Plutarch, the Roman siege of Syracuse was laid with high hopes of quick success. Marcellus was opposed by the unbreached walls and by confident defenders. Yet, in addition to three legions of perhaps 25,000 men, he was armed with 100 warships, a huge train of siege engines, and by the knowledge that Syracusan councils were divided. He had reckoned on everything, writes Livy, except on one man. That man was Archimedes, unicus spectator caeli siderumque, that unrivalled observer of the heaven and the stars, even more remarkable as the inventor and engineer of artillery and engines of war. Throughout the reign of Hieron II, Archimedes had been building an arsenal of ingenious anti-siege machines of every range and calibre. Livy's account of the scene when the Roman troops approached the sea walls makes good reading. The wall of Acredina, which is washed by the sea, was attacked by Marcellus with sixty-five quinquiremes. From most of the ships, archers and slingers allowed hardly anyone to stand on the wall without being wounded. Other five bankers, paired and lashed together, and propelled by the outer banks of oars like a single ship, brought up siege towers several stories high, together with engines for battering the wall. Against this naval equipment, Archimedes had lined the walls with artillery of various sizes. Ships lying offshore were bombarded with a regular discharge of stones of great weight. The nearer vessels were attacked with lighter but much more frequent missiles. Finally, to let his men discharge their bolts without exposure to wounds, he opened up the wall from top to bottom with numerous loopholes about a cubit wide. Through these, without being seen, some shot at the enemy with arrows, others from small protected scorpions. Polybius relates that the floating siege towers were called sambuci, since their shape resembled that of a musical instrument of that name, no doubt an ancestor of the modern Greek bouzouki. Most disconcerting were Archimedes' devices for lifting the attackers clean out of the water. Huge beams were suddenly projected from the walls right over the ships, which could then be sunk by great weights released from on high. Other ships were grabbed at the prow by iron claws or beaks, like those of cranes, winched up into the air, then dropped stern-first into the depths. Others again were spun round and round by means of machinery inside the city and dashed on the steep cliffs, with great destruction of the fighting men on board. Frequently a ship would be lifted into mid-air and whirled hither and thither until its crew had been thrown out in all directions. Marcellus recognised a superior adversary. Let us stop fighting this geometrical giant, he exclaimed who uses our ships to ladle water from the sea. Or again, our Sambuca band has been whipped out of the banquet. Plutarch commented, The Romans seemed to be fighting against the gods. With the assault abandoned, the siege turned into a blockade that lasted for two years. The Syracusans remained buoyant for many months. A Carthaginian relief force set up camp in the valley of the Anapus, requiring Marcellus to bring a fourth legion from Panormus. A naval sortie left the harbour successfully and returned with a fleet of reinforcements. In the interior of the island, a Roman massacre of the citizens of Henna, a city sacred to Proserpina, turned the Sicilians against them. In the spring of 212, Marcellus mounted a night raid on the Galeagra Tower during the festival of Artemis and broke through the Hexapyloi Gate into the suburb of Epipoli but the main fortresses held firm. In the summer, the Carthaginian admiral, Bomilca, gathered a vast fleet of 700 transports, protected by 130 warships. With clear superiority, he lay in wait for the Roman fleet off Cape Pacinum. At the last moment, for reasons unknown, he declined Marcellus' offer of battle, stood out to sea, 
and sailed on to Tarentum. In the end, the outcome of the siege was decided by plague and by treachery. The Carthaginians, who had been struck by the plague when attacking Syracuse two centuries earlier, were now decimated by the same disease when trying to defend it. Then, with parleys in progress, an Iberian captain called Moriscus, one of three prefects of Acradina, decided to save his skin by letting the Romans in near the fountain of Arethusa. On the agreed signal, during a diversionary attack, he opened the gate. After setting guards on the houses of the pro-Roman faction, Marcellus gave Syracuse to plunder. Archimedes was counted among the many victims. Later tradition held that he was killed by a Roman soldier whilst working on a mathematical problem traced in the sand. Plutarch reviewed the various versions in circulation. As it happened, Archimedes was on his own, working out some problem with the aid of a diagram. Having fixed his mind on his study, he was not aware of the Romans' incursion. Suddenly, a soldier came upon him with drawn sword and ordered him to Marcellus. Archimedes refused until he had finished his problem, whereupon the soldier flew into a rage and dispatched him. Others say that the Roman had threatened to kill him at once, and that Archimedes, when he saw him, had earnestly begged him to wait so that the result would not be left without demonstration. But the soldier paid no attention and made an end of him there and then. There is a third story, that some soldiers fell in with Archimedes as he was taking some of his scientific instruments to Marcellus, such as sundials, spheres, and quadrants. They slew him, thinking that he was carrying gold. It is generally agreed, however, that Marcellus was greatly troubled by the death and shunned the killer, seeking out the relatives of Archimedes and paying them his respects. Such was the impact when Greek civilization met Roman power. At his own expressed wish, Archimedes was buried in a tomb designed as a sphere inside a cylinder. He once said that the ratio of two to three, as expressed in a sphere and cylinder of similar length and diameter, offered the most pleasing of proportions. The fall of Syracuse had immediate consequences. On the cultural front, it underlined Rome's obsession with everything Greek. The artistic loot, wrote Livy, was no less than if Carthage itself had been sacked. It created the fashion for Greek artefacts and Greek ideas, which henceforth became the norm for all educated Romans. It was probably the single most powerful stimulus in the growth of a shared Greco-Roman culture. On the strategic front, it completed the Roman hold on Sicily. It cut off Carthage from a major source of trade and food, and deprived Hannibal of his principal source of logistical support. Before Syracuse, Rome was an equal player in the three-sided Greek-Carthaginian-Roman power game. After Syracuse, Rome held the initiative in all directions. In the longer term, the Romans' success in Sicily encouraged their further embroilment in Greek affairs. During the siege of Syracuse, Rome had just opened an alliance with the Aetolian League in central Greece in order to outflank Carthage's other ally, Macedonia. From then on, Rome had Greek clients to be satisfied and interests to be protected. Three Macedonian wars, 215 to 205, 200 to 197, and 171 to 168, and the struggle against Macedonia's chief associate, Antiochus III of Syria, brought the Romans into Greece with a vengeance. In the end, as in Sicily, Rome decided to terminate the complications by turning the whole of Macedonia and the Peloponnese into Roman provinces. At the time, the fall of Syracuse must have been soon forgotten, even by the Syracusans. They were lucky to escape the fate of other defeated cities, where the whole of the surviving population was habitually sold into slavery. After all, it was just one event in the endless series of campaigns and battles that accompanied the rise of Rome and the demise of Greece. On consideration, however, it may be seen to be symptomatic of shifts and changes that were to affect a much wider constituency than that of central Mediterranean politics. Historians who look back at Rome's triumphant expansion are locked into the knowledge of subsequent developments. They are fully aware that the resultant Greco-Roman culture was destined to dominate the whole of the classical world and to exert a lasting influence as one of the pillars of Western civilization. Their antennae are less sensitive to other trends and prospects which existed alongside it. Equally, fully equipped with a knowledge of Greek and Latin, 
the standard vehicles of higher education in modern Europe, they have sometimes been slow to relate the growth of the Greco-Roman sphere to the full panorama of contemporary events. No one could fairly deny that the fusion of the Greek and Roman worlds, in which the fall of Syracuse was a signal moment, was a process of capital importance. The difficulty is to see what other perspectives were in the offing. No record has survived of Syracusan reflections at the time of the siege, but many of the citizens of a merchant city must have travelled widely. They lived on an island which had long been contested between Greeks and Carthaginians, and only recently invaded by Romans. As a result, whatever side they favoured in the Punic Wars, they must surely have seen the Carthaginians, like themselves, as members of an ancient order challenged by Roman upstarts. Indeed, as a sea-going commercial nation, they would probably have felt a deeper affinity with Carthage than with Rome. Certainly, living more than a century after Alexander put the Greeks into intimate contact with Persia and India, they must surely have felt themselves to be part of that Greco-Oriental world of Hellenism than of a Greco-Roman world which had not yet been delivered. For them, the centre of the world was undoubtedly neither Carthage nor Rome, but Alexandria. Modern perspectives have often placed Syracuse as a Greek and therefore a European city, whose new bond with European Rome was a natural, if not an inevitable, development. They instinctively avoid the suggestion that the Greeks were more Asiatic than European at this juncture, or that they might well have maintained their Oriental connections indefinitely. Few courses on Western civilization which honour Archimedes would point out that the great mathematical genius gave his life opposing the union of his Greek city with Rome. Four years after the Battle of Cannae, Rome's position was still extremely precarious. It would have been entirely reasonable for the Carthaginian party to calculate that Marcellus lacked the strength to take Syracuse by assault, that Roman failure at Syracuse would give heart to Carthage's other allies, that the reassertion of Carthaginian power in Sicily would guarantee proper logistical support for Hannibal, that Hannibal, effectively supplied, would break the stalemate in Italy, that Rome, in other words, had every chance of being defeated. There was no Cato in Syracuse, but the raising of troublesome cities was an established practice. In the long watches on the Syracusan walls, it was entirely possible that some of Archimedes' men, if not Archimedes himself, could have realistically mused Roma delenda est, that is, until the plague struck and Moriscus opened the gate. The Syracusans' knowledge of the world would have been largely confined to the Great Sea and to the countries of the East. The science of geography had made great advances in classical Greece, although the frontiers of the world directly known to the ancients had not radically changed. A contemporary of Archimedes, Eratosthenes of Cyrene, librarian at Alexandria, had concluded that the world was a sphere, and his work was known to Ptolemy and Strabo. But apart from the Phoenician route to the Tin Islands, little progress was made in practical exploration. No known contact was ever made with West Africa, with the Americas, or with the more distant parts of Northern Europe. The rigid division between the civilised world of the Mediterranean shoreline and the barbarian wilderness beyond was not overcome. In the late 3rd century, Mediterranean civilization was still made up of three major spheres of influence, Carthaginian in the west, Romano-Italic in the center, Greek-Hellenic in the east. Thanks to Alexander's conquests, it was more closely tied than previously to the Oriental empires from Egypt to India. Along the fragile tracks of Central Asia, it had some slight link with the empire of China, which, at that very moment, had begun to construct its great wall against nomadic incursions. Over the previous centuries, the barbarian wilderness of northern and central Europe had begun the slow transition from the Bronze to the Iron Age. It had been strongly marked by the dominant influence of the Celts, whose culture had taken hold, whether by migration or osmosis, at most points from the Middle Vistula to Iberia, Gaul, and Britain. The Celts had stormed Rome in 387, and had moved in force into northern Italy. Celtic hill forts had created a permanent network of urban stations, and their commercial activities formed an important intermediary for the Germanic, Slavic, and Baltic tribes further afield. 
In the late third century, one branch of the Celts, the Galatians, who were established in their kingdom of Tyle in Thrace, on the territory of modern Bulgaria, were facing revolt by their Thracian subjects and preparing the move to neighbouring Asia Minor, where they lingered until medieval times. Their sojourn in Thrace has been confirmed by the recent discovery of inscriptions at Suthopolis and Mesembria, Nessabar. In the 3rd century BC, however, many historians would consider that the European peninsula was at least 1,000 years away from anything recognisable as European civilization. In particular, the Europeanness of ancient Greece is being questioned as an anachronistic intellectual construction of latter-day Europeans, which is all very proper. Yet the two most striking processes of that age, the fusion of Greco-Roman civilization in the Mediterranean and the supremacy of the Celts across much of the interior, put two essential building blocks into place for the developments of the future. There was little trace of a common culture or common ideology, though both Greco-Romans and Celts were Indo-Europeans. There was absolutely no inkling of a common identity. Nonetheless, one has to concede that these were the peoples whose descendants and traditions were to find themselves at the core of later European history. It is one thing to correct the excessively Eurocentric interpretations of the ancient world, which have prevailed for too long. It is quite another to go to the other extreme and to maintain that Greeks and Romans hold little or no relevance to the later European story. There are certain events which happened and whose consequences are still with us. One cannot pretend otherwise. If Moriscus had not opened the gate, if Syracuse had resisted the Romans as it once resisted the Athenians, if Hannibal had destroyed Rome as Rome would soon destroy Carthage, if, as a result, the Greek world had eventually fused with Semitic Carthage, then history would have been rather different. The point is, Moriscus did open the gate. Eco Ecological devastation had already caught the attention of Greek rulers in the early 6th century BC. Solon the lawgiver proposed that the cultivation of steep slopes should be banned to prevent soil erosion, and Pisistratus introduced a bounty for farmers who planted olive trees to counteract deforestation and overgrazing. Two hundred years later, Plato noted the damage inflicted on the land in Attica. What now remains compared with what then existed is like the skeleton of a sick man, all the fat and soft earth having wasted away. There are some mountains which now have nothing but food for bees, but they had trees not long ago, and boundless pasturage. Moreover, it was enriched by the yearly rains from Zeus, which were not lost to it, as now, providing abundant supplies of spring waters and streams, whereof the shrines still remain even now, at the spots where the fountains formerly existed. From the ecological point of view, the adoption of agriculture was the most fundamental change in human history. It is known as the first transition, since it created the first form of artificial habitat, the cultivated countryside. Europe, in this process, served as a latter-day appendage to the main developments in Southwest Asia, moving in parallel with China and Mesoamerica. But it shared all the consequences, a permanent food surplus and hence the potential for demographic growth, an ordered hierarchical society, an increase in social coercion, both in labour and in warfare, the emergence of cities, organised trade and literary culture, and ecological disasters. Above all, particular ways of thinking about mankind's relationship to nature were engendered. The Judeo-Christian tradition, which was destined to triumph in Europe, derived from the era of the First Transition. It stressed man's supremacy over the rest of creation. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Genesis chapter 9 for thou hast made him, man, a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honour. Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Psalm 8 The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the sons of man. 
Psalm 115. Dissident thinkers, such as Maimonides or St. Francis, who rejected these exploitative nostrums must be counted a distinct minority. Nor did attitudes change with the emergence of secular thought during the Renaissance and the scientific revolution. Man, if we look to the final causes, wrote Francis Bacon, must be regarded as the centre of the world. Progress, including open-ended material progress, was one of the ideals of the Enlightenment. Mankind was judged perfectible, among other things through the application of the new science of economics. Yet in the eyes of the true ecologist, economics has enthroned some of our most unattractive predispositions. Material acquisitiveness, competition, gluttony, pride, selfishness, short-sightedness, and just plain greed. Of course, by the time of the Enlightenment, the world was moving into the era of the Second Transition. The logic of exploitation was advancing from the rape of nature, that is, of renewable botanical and zoological resources, to the unbridled consumption of non-renewable resources, especially of fossil fuels such as coal and oil. At this stage, Europe definitely took the lead. The Industrial Revolution vastly increased the sheer weight of human numbers, the urban sprawl, the expectation of affluence, and the rate of consumption, pollution, and exhaustion. Above all, it magnified mankind's capacity for causing ecological trauma on a scale which Solon and Plato could never have imagined. It has taken a long time for people to take the effects of a damaged environment seriously. When the ex-emperor Napoleon lay dying at Longwood House on St. Helena in 1821, his terminal illness aroused much disquiet. A post-mortem stated the cause of death to have been abdominal cancer. But tests conducted in 1840, when the body was returned to France for reburial, revealed traces of arsenic in the hair roots. Earlier suspicions of murder seemed confirmed. Various persons in his entourage were named as the poisoner. Over a hundred years later, however, a fresh suspicion emerged. In the early 19th century, Arsenic compounds were sometimes used to fix the colours of fabrics, and close examinations at Longwood House showed that a strong constituent of arsenic was present in the wallpaper of the ex-emperor's specially redecorated rooms. The subject still arouses controversy, but it is not beyond possibility that Napoleon's death was a case not of murder, but of environmental pollution. No misma. No misma, meaning coin was used by both Greeks and Romans. Our own word, money, derives via the French monnaie from the Latin moneta, meaning the mint, where coins are struck. In early Rome, the mint was situated on the Capitoline Hill in the temple of Uno Moneta. Money, in the sense of coinage, began to circulate in the Aegean in the early 7th century BC. According to Herodotus, it was the kingdom of Lydia which minted the first coins. A stater, or two drachma piece of electrum, an alloy of gold and silver, struck either in Lydia or in Ionia, is often described as the world's oldest coin. Certainly, the kings of Phrygia, from the legendary Midas, whose touch turned everything to gold, to Croesus, whose name was synonymous with fabulous wealth, were closely connected with the origins of money. They owned the golden sands of the river Pactolus, near the Lydian capital, Sardis. The island of Aegina also participated in the early days of coinage. Aegina's silver coins, introduced in 670 BC, were certainly the first in Europe. Stamped with the emblem of a sea tortoise, they marked the beginning both of the widespread Aeginetic system of weights and measures and of numismatic art. Each of the subsequent mints adopted a similar emblem, the owl or the olive branch for Athens, the Pegasus for Corinth, the Arethusan nymph for Syracuse. From an early date, heads of divinities and inscriptions identifying the mint or the ruling authority were also common. Coins bearing the head of the ruler did not come into fashion until Hellenistic times, but were the norm under the Roman Empire. Numismatics, the study of coins, is one of history's auxiliary sciences. It deals with some of the most durable evidence of ancient times, and is particularly valuable for dating the layers of archaeological sites. Coins struck in hard metal speak with great precision about time and space. 
they bear witness not only to material conditions, but also to the ramifications of international trade and cultural contact. From the 7th century, Aegean coins have spread throughout the world. They form the basis of most monetary systems and of most commercial exchange. The right to mint coins has become one of the hallmarks of political sovereignty. 1,500 mints are known from ancient Greece alone. The Lydian stater has its descendants in the coinage of Rome, of Christian Europe, and now of all countries. Like the silver drachma of Aegina, some coins have gained currency far beyond the times and the territories for which they were intended. Indeed, the charisma of nomisma became so powerful that many came to fear it. The love of money, wrote St. Paul from Macedonia in A.D. 65, is the root of all evil. Barbaros Every textbook stresses the formative influence of the Persian Wars in uniting the people of free Hellas and in fixing their sense of Greek identity. Less obvious is the fact that those same wars set in motion a process whereby the Greeks would define their view of the outside, barbarian world. Yet inventing the Hellene went hand in hand with inventing the barbarian, and Athenian drama of the 5th century provided the medium through which the effect was achieved. Prior to Marathon and Salamis, the Greeks do not appear to have harboured strong feelings about their neighbours as enemies. Archaic poetry had often made heroes out of supernatural outsiders, including Titans and Amazons. Homer treated Greeks and Trojans as equals. Greek colonies on the Black Sea coast lived from fruitful cooperation and interchange with the Scythians of the steppe. In the 5th century, however, the Greeks became much more self-congratulatory and xenophobic. One finds the ethnic factor raised by Herodotus, who, whilst appreciating the older civilizations, especially Egypt, laid great store by the shared blood and common language of the Hellenes. But the most effective catalysts of changing attitudes were the tragedians, especially Aeschylus, who had himself fought at Marathon. In his Persae, Aeschylus creates a lasting stereotype, whereby the civilized Persians are reduced to cringing, ostentatious, arrogant, cruel, effeminate, and lawless aliens. Henceforth, all outsiders stood to be denigrated as barbarous. No one could compare to the wise, courageous, judicious, and freedom-loving Greeks. The Thracians were boorish and mendacious. The Macedonians were not echte Hellenish. By Plato's time, a permanent barrier had been raised between Greeks and all foreigners. It is assumed that the Greeks alone had the right and the natural disposition to rule. In Athens, it was simply not done to liken the conduct of foreign tyrants to the ways that Athenians could themselves behave towards subject peoples. The superiority complex of the ancient Greeks inevitably raises questions about similar ethnocentric and xenophobic ideas which surface in Europe at later dates. It was certainly adopted by the Romans, and must be held in the reckoning when one considers the various purveyors of Western civilization, who, like the Romans, have felt such an affinity for ancient Greece. Nor can it be irrelevant to the resentments which combine attacks on Western civilization with a particular brand of classical revisionism. Some commentators hold that the conclusions which the ancient Greeks drew from their encounter with the otherness of neighbouring peoples have passed into the body of European tradition. In this particular encounter began the idea of Europe with all its arrogance, all its implications of superiority, all its assumptions of priority and antiquity, all its pretensions to a natural right to dominate. Kersonesos. Kersonesos, peninsula city, was founded in 422 to 421 BC by Dorian colonists from Heraclean Pontica. It stood on a headland on the western coast of the peninsula of Torica, three kilometres beyond modern Sevastopol. It was one of a score of Greek cities on the northern shore of the Euxine Sea, most of them colonies of Miletus Olbia, Prosperity, Panticarpaium on the Cimmerian Bosphorus, the Straits of Kerch, Tanais on the Don, Phanagoria, and others. Its foundation coincided very closely with the visit to neighbouring Olbia of the historian Herodotus, 
who recorded the first description of the Scythian and Tauric peoples inhabiting the Pontic steppes. Like its neighbours, it lived from commerce with the inland tribes, and from the resulting seaborne trade in wheat, wine, hides, and salted fish. Its population of perhaps 20,000 inhabited a typical grid of straight stone streets, replete with the usual agora, acropolis, theatre, and port. Exceptionally, Chersonesus survived all the turbulence of the next 1700 years, passing through successive Greek, Sarmatian, Roman, and Byzantine phases. After its initial period as a solitary Greek outpost, it was absorbed in the 2nd century BC by the growing Kingdom of the Bosphorus, based at nearby Panticarpeum. The kingdom, whose huge wealth grew from the grain trade, especially with Athens, was dominated by the latest wave of immigrants from the steppe, the Iranic Sarmatians, whose ability to assimilate into preceding Greek civilization created a brilliant new synthesis. Its goldsmiths, who worked to order for the Scythian chiefs of the interior, produced some of the most magnificent artistic jewellery of the ancient world. Its Spartacid dynasty, which was not Greek, eventually sought the protection of Mithridates VI Eupitor, king of Pontus, the subject of Mozart's early opera, Mithridate, re di Ponto, who died in Panticarpeum in 63 BC. The Acropolis at Kerch is still called Mount Mithridates. The Roman garrison, installed at that time, did not impose full imperial rule for nearly two centuries. Despite repeated invasions, particularly by the Goths, Huns, and Khazars, the late Roman early Byzantine period saw some fifty Christian churches built at Chersonesus. In one of them, in 988 or 991, the latest barbarian visitor, Prince Volodymyr or Vladimir of Kiev, stepped into the marble pool of the baptistery to be christened before his marriage to the Byzantine emperor's sister. By that time, Khazar overlordship had waned, and the Byzantines were able to re-establish Chersonesus as capital of the theme of Klimata. The final destruction of the peninsula city came in 1299 at the hands of the Mongol Tatars, who were busy turning Crimea into their homeland. It lived to see neither the arrival of the Ottomans in the 15th century nor the Russian conquest of 1783. Excavations at Chersonesus began in 1829. They were intensified before the First World War and resumed in the 1920s by a Soviet archaeological commission. The Tsarists were mainly looking for evidence of St. Vladimir's baptism. In 1891 they erected a vast domed basilica, now shattered, on the wrong spot. The Soviets were looking for remains of the material culture of a slave-owning society. Possession of the classical Black Sea sites gave their modern owners a strong sense of historical pride. The naval port of Sevastopol was founded beside the ruins of Chersonesus, with an appropriate Greek name meaning City of Glory. The Tauride Palace in St. Petersburg, built for the conqueror of Crimea, Prince Potemkin, started Russia's native classical style. After the attack of the British and French in 1854-6, and the heroic Russian defence, the Crimean coast became a favourite resort for the summer palaces of Tsarist courtiers and Soviet party bosses. They all justified their presence through the dubious Russian version of history that starts with St. Vladimir. In 1941-2, after a second heroic siege of Sevastopol, the Crimea was briefly occupied by the Nazis, whose Gotland project would have returned the peninsula into the hands of German colonists. In 1954, on the tercentenary of another dubious event, the Soviet government in Moscow presented Crimea to Ukraine. The gift was intended to symbolize the indissoluble links of Crimea and Ukraine with Russia. Instead, on the collapse of the USSR, it had the opposite effect. In August 1991, the last Soviet general secretary was caught holidaying in his villa at Foros, along the coast from Sevastopol, when the abortive coup in Moscow brought the Soviet era to an end. In recent times, the great variety of Crimea's native population has all but disappeared. The ancient Tauri and Toro Scythians were long since overrun. The Crimean Goths defended their inland stronghold of Mangup until 1475. 
The Tatars were deported en masse by Stalin in 1942. The Pontic Greeks survived until their deportation in 1949. A handful of Jews, who had escaped the Nazis, left for Israel in the 1980s. Russians and Ukrainians were left in an absolute majority. In 1992, as families of the ex-Soviet military from Sevastopol shared the pebbly beach with the tourists, seeking their suntans beneath the ruined clifftop columns of Kersonesus, they looked on anxiously at the returning Tatars, at Ukrainian claims to the Black Sea fleet, and at Russian demands for an autonomous Crimean Republic. No location could have reminded them more of the impermanence of glory. Massilia Massilia, Marseille, was founded approximately 600 BC by Greeks from Phocian Asia Minor. According to legend, Photis, their leader, sailed his galley into the harbour just as the chieftain of the local Ligurian tribe was holding a betrothal ceremony for his favourite daughter. When the girl was invited to hand the cup of betrothal to one of the assembled warriors, she handed it instead to the handsome Greek. Thus began one of the richest and most dynamic of all Greek colonies. Surrounded by high white stone crags and guarded by an offshore island, the magnificent harbour of ancient Massilia has served as a major centre of commercial and cultural life for more than 2,500 years. The government was a merchant oligarchy, a great council of 600 citizens, elected for life, appointed a smaller council of 15, which formed the executive. The trade and exploration of the Massiliotes spread far and wide. They dominated the sea from Luna in Tuscany to the south of Iberia, and they set up trading posts at Nicaea, Nice, Antipolis, Antibes, Rhoda, Arles, and distant Emporia, all dedicated to their own patron goddess, the Ephesian Artemis. Their sailors did not fear the ocean beyond the Pillars of Hercules, and were reputed to have reached Iceland in the north, and what is now Senegal in the south. One daring fourth-century Massiliote, Pythias, navigated the northern coasts of Europe, including the Tin Islands, as Herodotus called Britain. His lost survey of the earth was known to Strabo and Polybius. Faced with the jealous rivalry of the Phoenicians and Carthaginians, Massilia had often appealed to Rome for support, but they did so once too often. In 125 BC, when they called for military aid against the Gauls, the Roman legions overran the entire country, thereby creating the province of Transalpine Gaul, Provence. From this a trilingual community grew up, speaking Greek, Latin, and Celtic. Thereafter, the city's life mirrored all the changes of Mediterranean politics, Arabs, Byzantines, Genoans, and, from 1481, the French. The greatest days of Marseille's prosperity started in the 19th century, with the opening of French interests in the Levant. Napoleon's expedition to Egypt and the building of the Suez Canal by de Lesseps were key episodes. Modern Marseille, like ancient Massilia, is still ruled by the sea. Le Vieux Port, immortalized by the dramatic trilogy of Marcel Pagnol, has been superseded by the vast Port Autonome beyond the Digue. But the turbulent emotions of Fanny, Marius, and César, hopelessly torn by the tearful departures and arrivals of the ships, are constantly repeated. Fanny, et toi, Marius, tu ne m'aimes pas? Il se tait. Marius, je te l'ai déjà dit, Fanny. Je ne peux pas me marier. Fanny, alors, c'est quelque vilaine femme des vieux quartiers. Dis-le-moi. Marius, Marius, j'ai confiance en toi. Je vais te le dire. Je veux partir. Marius, don't you love me? I've told you already, Fanny, I can't marry you. Oh, I see. It's one of those nasty women from the old town. Go on, say it. No, I trust no one but you, Fanny. I'm about to tell you. I want to leave. From the terrace of Notre-Dame de la Garde, perched high on the site of a Greek temple, one can still gaze down on the ships slipping into the harbour, like the galleys of Photis or like the Count of Monte Cristo in the Chateau d'If, or like Marius, one can dream of escape across the sea. Spice Ox Pythagoras gave voice to two well-known maxims, 
everything is numbers, and eating beans is a crime equal to eating the heads of one's parents. Scholars concerned with the origins of modern science study his mathematics. Those concerned with the working of the Greek mind study his ideas on gastronomy. Like the Pilgrim Fathers of a later age, Pythagoras was a religious dissenter and sailed away from his native Samos to found a sectarian colony in Magna Graecia. There he found the freedom to apply his religious theories, among other things, to food and diet. His central contention sprang from the concept of metempsychosis, the transmigration of souls, which could pass after death from person to person or from persons to animals. As a result, he was opposed in principle to the custom of animal sacrifices and held that the perfume of heated herbs and spices was a more fitting offering to the gods than the stench of roasted fat. But if spices formed the link with heaven, beans were the link with Hades. Broad beans, whose nodeless shoots relentlessly pushed their way to the sunlight, were thought to act as ladders for the souls of men migrating from the underworld. Beans propagated in a closed pot produced a seething mess of obscene shapes reminiscent of sexual organs and aborted fetuses. Similar taboos were placed on the consumption of the noble meats, especially of beef. Some creatures, like the pig and the goat, which root around and damage nature, were judged harmful and hence edible. Others, like the sheep, which gives wool, and the working ox, man's most faithful companion, were judged useful and hence inedible. Joints of ignoble meat could be eaten if necessary, but the vital organs, such as the heart or the brain, could not. According to Aristoxenus of Tarentum, the resultant diet consisted of maza, barley meal, wine, fruit, wild mallow and asphodel, artos, wheat bread, raw and cooked vegetables, opsin seasoning, and, on special occasions, suckling pig and kid. Once an ox rescued by Pythagoras from a beanfield was given a lifelong pension of barley meal in the local temple of Hera. More famously, when Pythagoras' disciple, Empedocles of Acragus, won the chariot race at Olympia in 496 BC, he refused to offer up the customary sacrifice of a roasted ox. Instead, he burned the image of an ox made from oil and spices, saluting the gods amidst a billowing cloud of frankincense and myrrh. The Pythagoreans believed that diet was an essential branch of ethics. So long as men slaughter animals, the master said, they won't stop killing each other. Omphalus Delphi, in the view of the Greeks, lay at the exact centre of the world. Its omphalus, or navel stone, marked the meeting place of two of Zeus's eagles, one sent from the east and one from the west. Here, too, in a deep valley ringed by the dark pines and rose-tinted cliffs of Mount Parnassus, Apollo had slain the snake god Python and, in a steam-filled cave above a gaseous chasm, had established the most prestigious of oracles. In historic times, the Temple of Apollo was built alongside a theatre, a stadium for the Pythian Games, and the numerous treasures of patron cities. In 331 BC, Aristotle and his nephew drew up a list of all the victors of the Pythian Games to date. Their findings were inscribed on four stone tablets, which survived to be found by modern archaeologists. The procedures of the oracle followed a timeless ritual. On the seventh day of each month, the high priestess, Pythia, freshly purified in the Castalian spring, would seat herself on the sacred tripod above the chasm and, locked in an ecstatic trance among the vapours, would await her petitioner's inquiries. The petitioners, having watched the customary sacrifice of a goat, would await her notoriously ambiguous responses, delivered in hexameters. Theseus, the legendary slayer of the Minotaur and founder of Athens, was given this comfort. Theseus, son of Aegeus, do not be distressed, for as a leathern bottle you will ride the waves, even in a swelling surge. The citizens of Thera, worried by their failing colony on the African coast, were told to reconsider its location. If you know Libya, the nurse of flocks, better than I do, when you have not been there, I admire your wisdom. Moved to the mainland from its offshore island, Cyrene prospered. King Croesus of Lydia wanted to know whether to make war or to keep the peace. The oracle said, 
go to war and destroy a great empire. He went to war, and his empire was destroyed. Before Salamis in 480 BC, an Athenian delegation implored the aid of Apollo against the Persian invaders. Pallas is not able to appease Zeus, but when all else has been captured, yet Zeus of the broad heaven gives to the Triton born a wooden wall to bless you and your children. Themistocles, the Athenian admiral, rightly deduced that the key to victory lay with his wooden ships. Lysander, the Spartan general, who had entered Athens in triumph at the end of the Peloponnesian War, was warned, I bid you guard against a roaring hoplite and a snake, cunning son of the earth, which attacks behind the back. He was killed by a soldier with the emblem of a snake on his shield. Philip of Macedon, notorious for his bribery, was reputedly told to fight with silver spears. More authentically, on preparing to fight the Persians, he received this prophecy. The bull is garlanded, the end is come, the sacrificer is nigh. Shortly afterwards he was murdered. The Roman Lucius Junius Brutus consulted the oracle with two companions and asked about their future. Young men, he among you who first shall kiss his mother will hold the highest power in Rome. Brutus' companions took the hint literally, whilst Brutus bent down to kiss the earth. In 509 BC, Brutus became Rome's first consul. Four centuries later, Cicero asked the oracle how one achieved the highest fame. He was told, Make your own nature, not the opinion of the multitude, the guide of your life. The emperor Nero, fearing death, was told, Expect evil from seventy-three. Encouraged, he thought that he might live to be seventy-three. In the event, he was overthrown and forced to kill himself at the age of thirty-one. Seventy-three turned out to be the age of his successor, Galba. Most famously, perhaps, when Alexander the Great consulted the oracle, it remained silent. Belief in the omniscience of the Delphic oracle is almost as great among enthusiastic moderns as it was among the superstitious Greeks of old. For scholars, however, the problem lies in distinguishing the oracle's real achievements from its limitless reputation. Skeptics point out that none of the alleged predictions was ever recorded in advance of the events to which they referred. The amazing powers of the oracle could never be tested. A powerful cult, an efficient publicity machine, and a gullible public were all essential elements of the operation. Many of the oracle's most famous sayings were inscribed on the walls of the Temple of Apollo. These included, Nothing in excess, and Know thyself. They became the watchwords of Greek civilization. Epic Homer's Iliad and Odyssey were traditionally regarded in Europe not merely as the oldest examples of European literature, but as the earliest form of high literature anywhere. In 1872, however, following excavations of clay tablets from the palace library of Assurbanipal at Nineveh, the capital of ancient Assyria, the world was introduced to the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was already venerable by the time that Homer's poems were composed. Indeed, it can be traced back through a Mesopotamian literary tradition into the third millennium BC. It begins, Of him who found out all things, I shall tell the land. Of him who experienced everything, I shall teach the whole. He searched lands everywhere. He who experienced the whole gained complete wisdom. He found out what was secret and uncovered what was hidden. He brought back a tale of times before the flood. He had journeyed far and wide, weary and at last resigned. He engraved all his toils on memorial tablets of stone. Initial interest in the Babylonian epic centered on its biblical connections, notably on its narration of the flood and the ark and the story of creation. But it was not long before scholars noticed echoes of Homer, after all, the chronological coincidence was close enough. As Sir Barnipol was building his library at Nineveh in the last quarter of the 7th century BC. Nineveh was destroyed in 612, in much the same era that the Homeric poems must have found their final form. Many textual similarities can be explained by the oral conventions practiced by all pre-literate epic poets. But many things cannot be so easily explained. 
The opening invocation of Gilgamesh resembles the opening lines of the Odyssey both in tone and sentiment. Goddess of song, teach me the story of a hero. This was the man of wide-ranging spirit who had sacked the sacred city of Troy and who had wandered afterwards long and far. Many were those whose cities he viewed and whose minds he came to know, many the trouble that vexed his heart. Goddess, daughter of Zeus, impart to me in turn some knowledge of all these things, beginning where you will. Stronger still is the case that can be made for the influence of Gilgamesh on the Iliad. Both epics turn on a dramatic twist of the plot, which occurs with the death of one of two inseparable friends. Gilgamesh mourns for Enkidu as Achilles mourns for Patroclus. Other episodes, such as that where the gods draw lots for the division of the earth, sea, and sky, are strikingly similar. What was once rated as a possible Greek debt to Assyria must now be upgraded to a probability. If this supposition is correct, the Homeric epics not only supply a link between classical letters and the countless generations of Awidoi, the unlettered bards of the immemorial tradition, they also span the gap between the conventional Western literary canon and the far more ancient writings of non-European literature. Cadmus Cadmus, son of Argenor, king of Phoenicia and brother of Europa, features in numerous Greek myths. He was honoured as founder of Boeotian Thebes and as importer of the alphabet. Wandering the earth in search of his abducted sister, Cadmus consulted the oracle at Delphi. He was told to build a city wherever a cow would rest, so he followed a likely bovine from Phocis into the plain of Boeotia. He marked the spot where it finally lay down beside a hillock and started to build the Cadmia, the oval acropolis of Thebes. The city's inhabitants were born from the teeth of a dragon which Cadmus had slain on the advice of Athena. Athena made him their governor, and Zeus gave him a wife, Harmonia. Birthplace of Dionysus and Hercules, of the seer Tiresias, and of the magical musician Amphion, Thebes was also the scene of the tragedy of Oedipus and of the Seven Against Thebes. It was the neighbour and hereditary rival of Athens, it was the ally and then the destroyer of Sparta, and it was destroyed itself by Alexander. The Phoenician alphabet, which Cadmus reputedly brought to Greece, was phonetic but purely consonantal. It is known in its basic form from before 1200 BC, having, like its partner Hebrew, supplanted the earlier hieroglyphs. A simple system, easily learned by children, it broke the monopoly in arcane writing which had been exercised for millennia by the priestly castes of previous Middle Eastern civilizations. The names of the letters passed almost unchanged into Greek, Aleph, Alpha, equals Ox, Beth, Beta, equals House, Gimel, Gamma, equals Camel, Dalet, Delta, equals Tent Door. The old Greek alphabet was produced by adding five vowels to the original sixteen Phoenician consonants. It also doubled for use as numerals. In due course, it became the ancestor of the main branches of European writing, modern Greek, Etruscan, Latin, Glagolitic, and Cyrillic. The earliest manifestations of the Latin alphabet date from the 6th century BC. It was based on a script found in the Chalcidian colonies, such as Cumae in Magna Graecia. It was subsequently adopted and adapted by all the languages of Western Christendom, from Irish to Finnish, and in recent times for many non-European languages, including Turkish. The Glagolitic and Cyrillic alphabets were developed from the Greek in Byzantine times for the purpose of writing certain Slavonic languages. In Orthodox Serbia, Serbo-Croat is written in Cyrillic. In Croatia, the same language is written in the Latin alphabet. The angular style of Phoenician, Greek, and Roman scripts was dictated by the art of the stone chisel. The gradual evolution of cursive styles was made possible by the use of the stylus on wax and of quill on parchment. Latin minuscules, which are the basis of modern small letters, emerged around AD 600, although the Roman majuscules, or capitals, have also been retained. Letters and literature are one of the glories of European civilization. The story of Cadmus hints that their roots lay in Asia. Musiki 
The Greek term musiki embraced both poetry and the art of contrived sound. Both have a long history. Ancient Greek music was built on modes. A musical mode, like a scale, is a fixed sequence of notes whose intervals provide the basis for melodic invention. The Greeks were familiar with six of them, and Pythagorean mathematicians correctly calculated the frequencies which underlie their component tones, semitones, and quarter-tones. The modal system, however, does not operate in quite the same manner as the later system of keys and scales. A change of mode alters the configuration of the intervals in a melodic line, whilst a change of key only alters the pitch. In the 4th century, St. Ambrose selected four so-called authentic modes for ecclesiastical use, to which Gregory the Great added four more so-called plagal modes, making eight church modes in all. These formed the basis of plain song. In the 16th century, the Swiss monk Henry of Glarus, Glarianus, set out a full table of twelve modes, giving them a confusing series of names which, with one exception, did not coincide with the ancient originals. Number 1. Glarianus Dorian. Greek name Phrygian. Range D to D. Final D. Dominant A. Number 2. Glarianus Hyperdorian. No Greek name. Range A to A. Final D. Dominant F. Number 3. Glarianus Phrygian. Greek name Dorian, range E to E, final E, dominant C. Number 4, Glarianus Hyperphrygian, no Greek name, range B to B, final E, dominant A. Number 5, Glarianus Lydian, Greek name Sentono Lydian, range F to F, final F, dominant C. Number 6, Glarianus, Hypolydian, no Greek name, range C to C, final F, dominant A. Number 7, Glarianus, Mixolydian, Greek name, Ionian, range G to G, final G, dominant D. Number 8, Glarianus, Hypomixolydian, no Greek name, range D to D, final G, dominant C. Number 9, Glarianus, Aeolian, Greek name, Aeolian, range A to A, final A, dominant E. Number 10, Glarianus, Hypoaeolian, no Greek name, range E to E, final A, dominant G. Number 11, Glarianus, Ionian, Greek name, Lydian, range C to C, final C, dominant C. Number 12. Hypoionian. No Greek name. Range G to G. Final C. Dominant E. The development of modern harmony rendered most of the ancient modes redundant, but two of them, 11 and 9, the Lydian and the Aeolian, survived. Known from the 17th century onwards as the major and the minor variants of the twelve key scales, they supply the twin aspects, the joyful and the mournful, of the melodic system on which most European classical music is based. Together with time and harmony, they constitute one of three basic grammatical elements in the musical language which marks Europe and African neighbours. Given that Europe has never acquired a universal spoken language, that is, a common verbal musiki, Europe's musical idiom, its non-verbal musiki, must be reckoned the longest and strongest thread of its common culture. Indeed, since it extends from Spain to Russia, but not to India or to the Islamic world, one is tempted to suggest that it is the only universal medium of pan-European communication. Oedipus Oedipus, the swollen foot, king of Thebes, is one of the most ubiquitous characters of ancient Greek myth and literature. He also furnishes a prime illustration of the classical tradition which derives from them. The story of Oedipus is that of a Theban outcast who, being rejected by his royal parents, is doomed to take the most terrible, though involuntary, revenge. Exposed to die as an infant because his father, King Laius, feared a bad omen about him, 
He is saved by a shepherd and is fostered in nearby Corinth by people unaware of his origins. Consulting the oracle at Delphi, he is told that he will kill his father and marry his mother, for which reason he flees Corinth and comes again to Thebes. He kills Laios during a chance meeting, solves the riddle of the Sphinx, rids the city of its terror, and, as a reward, is given the king's widow, Jocasta, his own mother, to wife. After fathering four children through this unwittingly incestuous union, he discovers the truth and sees Jocasta hang herself in despair. Thereon he blinds himself and is led into exile by his daughter Antigone. His end comes at Colonus, in Attica, where the tragic wanderer disappears into a sacred grove. Homer mentions Oedipus in both Iliad and Odyssey, but it is the last epic, Thebais, which was probably the main source of the later story. It then becomes the centerpiece of the Theban trilogy of Sophocles, and the background to Aeschylus' Seven Against Thebes, and to Euripides' Suppliants and Phoenician Women. Oedipus recurs throughout subsequent European literature. The Roman poet Statius wrote an epic Thebaid, which in turn was the model for Racine's first play, La Thebed. The Roman tragedian Seneca composed a variation on Sophocles' Oedipus, inspiring further versions by Corneille and by André Gide, and a loose adaptation by the contemporary poet Ted Hughes. Sophocles' Oedipus at Colonus provides the basis both for T.S. Eliot's verse drama The Elder Statesman and Jean Cocteau's Infernal Machine. His Antigone has been followed by dramas of the same name and subject by Cocteau, Jean Anouy, and Brecht. Anthony Burgess wrote an Oedipus novel entitled M.F. There are two paintings of Oedipus and the Sphinx by Engris. There is an opera oratorio, Oedipus Rex, by Stravinsky, set to Cocteau's Latin libretto, and a film, Oedipus Rex, by Pasolini. By far the best-known use of the legend, however, was made by Sigmund Freud, who gave the label of Oedipus Complex to the repressed hostility of boys to their fathers. Deriving from the rivalry of father and son for the mother's affection, the syndrome can lead in later life to a pathological mother fixation. The classical tradition, which may be defined as the creative reworking of ancient themes for contemporary purposes, draws on thousands of such examples. Nourished since the Renaissance by five centuries of education in Greek and Latin, it has supplied a body of knowledge with which all educated Europeans have been familiar. Together with Christianity, it has provided a stream within the bloodstream of European culture and a code of instant recognition. Its decline in the 20th century has been precipitated by changing social and educational priorities. Its advocates argue that its survival is essential if European civilization is not to wither from alienation. Scholasticos The Philogelus, or Love of Laughter, once attributed to Philagrius of Alexandria and the 5th century AD, is a collection of much older Greek witticisms. It features the original Scholasticos, or absent-minded professor, together with the men of Abdera and Cumae, butts of early forms of the Irish or Polish joke. A Scholasticos, who wanted to see what he looked like when asleep, stood in front of a mirror with his eyes shut. A Scholasticos met a friend and said, I heard you'd died, but you see I'm alive. Yes, but the man who told me was much more reliable than you. A Cumean went to the embalmers to collect the body of his dead father. The embalmer, looking for the right corpse, asked if it had any distinctive features. A bad cough. A Cumean was selling honey. A passerby tasted it and found it excellent. Yes, said the Cumean. I wouldn't be selling it at all if a mouse hadn't fallen into it. A Scottish scholasticos decided to economize by training his donkey not to eat, so he gave it no food. When the animal had starved to death, the owner complained, and just when it was learning to live without eating. Collectors of folk tales have recorded versions of the last story in Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian, Swedish, English, Spanish, Catalan, Walloon, German, Italian, Slovene, Serbo-Croat, Russian, and Greek. Malcolm Bradbury uses it in Rates of Exchange, as part of the heritage of his imaginary East European country, Slaka.
hysteria. According to various Hippocratic treatises on medicine, hysteria was exclusively a woman's disease associated with uterine disorders. Hystera in Greek meant womb, and the state of nervous agitation was caused when menstrual blood was unable to escape. Whenever the menses are suppressed or cannot find a way out, illness results. This happens if the mouth of the womb is closed or if some part of the vagina is prolapsed. Whenever two months' menses are accumulated in the womb, they move off into the lungs where they are prevented from exiting. In another variant, the womb itself was thought to become displaced and to wander round the body cavity. By pressing on the heart or brain, it provoked anxiety and eventually uncontrollable panic. Religious taboos forbade human dissection, and the internal workings of women's and of men's bodies were not understood until modern times. In the view of one analyst, however, ancient attitudes to women survived even when ancient anatomical theories had been discounted. The notion persisted that women's minds could be adversely affected by their reproductive tracts. The history of women's bodies is a complicated subject. Over the ages, their size, weight, shape, muscular development, menstruation, childbearing capacity, maturing, aging, and disease patterns have varied considerably, as have their symbolism, their religious connotation, their aesthetic appreciation, their decoration, clothing, and display. Women's awareness of their physical potential has been particularly constrained, so much so that a standard textbook on the subject can seriously ask, could any woman enjoy sex before 1900? Histories of the male body do not ask such things. As for the wonderful workings of the womb, modern research suggests that the interdependence of the female nervous and reproductive systems is extremely sophisticated. A survey of women's health conducted during the prolonged siege of Budapest in 1944-5, for example, revealed unusually high levels of amenorrhea. Menstruation was suspended through well-grounded anxieties, not through hysteria. The womb does not need to be told that a minimal birth rate makes very good sense in times of maximum danger. Electron Electron, bright stone, was the ancient Greek name for amber. The Greeks knew that when rubbed, it generated a force which attracted other objects, such as feathers. Thales of Miletus said it had psyche, Electra, the bright one, was the name given to two women prominent in Greek myth. One, the daughter of Atlas, was a favourite paramour of Zeus. The other, daughter of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, and sister to Orestes, figures in the tragedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. The invisible physical force which repels and attracts had no name until William Gilbert, the father of magnetism, called it electric in his treatise De Magnete. Earth, he wrote, is nothing but a large magnet. Advances in the study of electricity and magnetism were made by A. M. Ampere, H. C. Ersted, and Michael Faraday, until J. C. Maxwell combined the two into the theory of electromagnetic force. H. R. Hertz demonstrated the existence of electromagnetic waves filling a spectrum of different frequencies. Application of electricity had moved on from the dynamo and the electric motor to radio and x-rays. Finally, in 1891, the British physicist J.D. Stoney needed a label for the negatively charged particles which constitute the smallest component of matter and which, in the company of positively charged protons and non-charged neutrons, orbit round the nucleus of an atom on the scale of a pinhead in St. Peter's Dome. He called them electrons. Archimedes Archimedes of Syracuse, 287 to 212 BC, was the mathematician's mathematician. He possessed a childlike delight in solving problems for their own sake. Not that he was averse to practical matters. After studying in Alexandria, he returned to Sicily as advisor to King Hiero II. There he invented the screw for raising water. He built a planetarium, later carried off to Rome, and he designed the catapults and grapnels which held off the final Roman siege of Syracuse. He launched the science of hydrostatics, and is best known for running naked into the street, shouting, Eureka! Eureka! I've found it, after supposedly working out the Archimedes principle in his bath. 
The principle states that an object immersed in water apparently loses weight equal to the weight of the water displaced. The volume of the object can then be easily calculated. On the subject of levers, he said, give me a place to stand and I will move the earth. His greatest enthusiasm, however, was reserved for purely speculative problems. 1. The Sand Reckoner Archimedes set himself the task of calculating how many grains of sand would be needed to fill the universe. To deal with the vast numbers involved, and since decimals were not yet in existence, he came up with the original concept of a myriad myriad, that is, 10,000 times 10,000, or 10,000 squared. Given that he assumed the universe to be equivalent to the galaxy of the sun, his answer of 10,000 to the power of 37 was entirely respectable. 2. Measuring the circle Archimedes worked out the ratio of the circumference to the diameter by starting from the upper and lower limits of the perimeter of a 96-sided polygon. He took certain known approximations and went on to find approximations for the square roots of the necessary seven-digit numbers. He had to work, of course, in the clumsy alphabetic system of numeration. But his answer for what is now called pi lay between the limits of 3 and 1 seventh equals 3.1428571 and 3 and 10 71sts, 3.140845. The accepted modern value is 3.1415926. 3. Problema bovinum. Archimedes thought up a seemingly straightforward teaser about the god Apollo having a herd of cattle, bulls and cows together some black, some brown, some white, some spotted. Among the bulls, the number of white ones was half plus one-third of the number of the black ones, greater than the brown, etc., etc. Among the cows, the number of white ones was one-third plus one-quarter the number of the total black cattle, etc., etc. What was the composition of the herd? The answer comes to a total of more than 79 billion, which is far in excess of the number of beasts that could possibly find standing room on the island of Sicily. Sicily's 25,000 square kilometres can only accommodate 12.75 billion cattle at two square metres per head, not accepting those which would have to stand in the boiling crater of Mount Etna. Athletes Athletic games were an essential part of Greek life. Every self-respecting city had its stadium. The Pan-Hellenic Games at Olympia were but the most prestigious of more than a hundred such festivals. The common devotion to athletics and to the gods, whose patronage the games celebrated, gave a strong sense of cultural unity to a politically divided country. The athletes, all male, competed in ten well-established disciplines. From the seventh century onwards, when one competitor accidentally lost his shorts, they customarily performed naked. They were not amateurs, being accustomed to arduous training and expecting handsome rewards. The tariff of prizes in Denarii, awarded at a minor festival at Aphrodisias in the first century, indicates the status of particular events. Long-distance race, 750. Pentathlon, 500. Race in armour, 500. Sprint, 1 stade, 1,250. Pangration, 3,000. Wrestling, 2,000. Foot race, two stardes, 1,000. Boxing, 2,000. The standard stade, or stadium length, was about 212 metres. Runners turned round a post at the end opposite the start. The pentathlon consisted of five events, long jump, discus, javelin, foot race, wrestling. In the pangration, a form of all-in combat, one aimed, as in judo, to force one's opponent into submission. Quite throwing and chariot racing were also important. Athletes and their home cities gained great renown from their triumphs at the Olympiads. Sparta was prominent. Athens, during its golden age, gained only four victories out of a possible 183. But the most successful district was Elis in the Peloponnese, home of the first recorded victor, Coribus in 776 BC, and site of Olympia itself. The all-time champion athlete was Milo of Croton, who won the prize for wrestling in five successive Olympiads between 536 and 520 BC. On the last occasion, he carried the sacrificial ox round the stadium on his shoulders, 
before sitting down to eat it. Most of Pinder's surviving odes are devoted to the games. Single is the race, single of men and of gods. From a single mother we both draw breath, but a difference of power in everything keeps us apart. For the one thing is nothing, but the brazen sky stays a fixed habitation forever. Yet we can, in greatness of mind or of body, be like the immortals, though we know not to what goal by day or in the nights fate has written that we shall run. The ethos of the games lasted well into Christian times. St. Paul was surely a fan, if not a competitor. I have fought a good fight, he wrote. I have run the course, I have kept the faith. The sentiment was quintessentially Greek. The last ancient games at Olympia took place either in A.D. 389 or 393. The last known, Victor Ludorum, in 385, was an Armenian. There is no evidence that the Emperor Theodosius I formally banned the festival. More probably, since Christian opinion had turned against pagan cults of all sorts, it was impossible to revive it after the Visigoths' invasion of Greece in 395. Substitute games continued at Antioch in Asia until 530. The Olympics were revived at Athens on the 6th to the 12th of April 1896, after an interval of more than 1,500 years. The initiator and founding president of the International Olympic Committee was the French sportsman Baron Pierre de Coubertin. With the exception of wartime, the games have been held at four-year intervals and at various venues throughout the 20th century. Women were permitted to compete from 1912. The Winter Olympics were organized as from the 1924 meeting in Chamonix. Appropriately enough, the winner of the first marathon race of the modern series in 1896, Louis Spiridon, was a Greek. Demos Some people believe that in 507 BC, a lasting tradition of popular sovereignty was launched by Cleisthenes the Alcmeonid. In A.D. 1993, they were moved to celebrate the 2,500th anniversary of the birth of democracy. To this end, a lavish banquet in London's Guildhall was addressed by the president of the Classical Society. In fact, the seeds of Athenian democracy had been sown some time before Cleisthenes. The Assembly of Citizens, the Ecclesia, which met in the meeting ground of the Penix alongside the Acropolis, was established by Solon but it was easily manipulated by aristocratic leaders such as Pisistratus and his sons, who used it to bolster their fifty-year tyranny from 560 to 510 BC. Cleisthenes belonged to a rich family, which tried to share power with Pisistratus, then chose exile. He was probably responsible for refacing the temple of Zeus at Delphi with Parian marble to atone for a massacre committed by his kin. He led an abortive invasion of Attica in 513, possibly seeking Persian aid. But it was the Spartans, not Cleisthenes, who drove out the last of the Pisistratids three years later. Cleisthenes is said to have invoked the power of the people in order to undermine the old tribal organizations on which his predecessors had relied. By proposing sovereign power for the Ecclesia, he gained the authority to instigate still wider reforms. He replaced the four old tribes with ten new ones, each with its own shrine and hero cult. He greatly strengthened the demes, or parishes, into which the tribes were divided, and extended the franchise to all freemen resident on Athenian territory. Above all, he instituted the bull, which functioned as a steering committee for the assembly's agenda. He also initiated legal ostracism. He has been called the founder of the art of organizing public opinion. Athenian democracy, which lasted for 185 years, was far from perfect. The sovereignty of the people was limited by the machinations of the bull, by the waywardness of the deme, and by the continuing influence of wealthy patrons and demagogues. To ensure a quorum of 6,000 at meetings of the ecclesia, the citizens were literally roped in from the streets, with a rope dipped in red paint. The extent of participation, both in the central and the district bodies, is a matter of intense scholarly debate. And yet the citizens really did rule. They enjoyed equality before the law. They elected the ten top officials, including the strategos, or military commander. 
They drew lots for distributing hundreds of annual administrative posts among themselves. Most importantly, they held public servants to account. Dishonest or bungling officials could be dismissed or even executed. Not everyone was impressed. Plato thought that democracy meant the rule of the incompetent. Aristophanes made fun of that angry, waspish, intractable old man, Demos of Panix. At one point he asked, So what's the solution? and replied, Women. Unfortunately, the link between the democracy of ancient Athens and that of contemporary Europe is tenuous. Democracy did not prevail in its birthplace. It was not admired by Roman thinkers, and it was all but forgotten for more than a millennium. The democratic practices of today's Europe trace their origins as much to popular assemblies of the Viking type, to the diets convened by feudal monarchs, and to medieval city republics. The Athenian notion of a sovereign assembly consisting of all qualified citizens found its counterparts in medieval Novgorod, Hungary, and Poland, in political systems which spawned no heirs. The theorists of the Enlightenment blended classical knowledge with an interest in constitutional reform, and a romanticized vision of ancient Athens played a part in this among classically educated liberals. But liberals could themselves be critical. De Tocqueville invade against the tyranny of the majority. Edmund Burke called democracy on the French model the most shameless thing in the world. Democracy has rarely been the norm. Nowadays there is little consensus about the essence of democracy. In theory, it promotes all the virtues, from freedom, justice and equality, to the rule of law, the respect for human rights, and the promotion of political pluralism and of civil society. In practice, rule by the people is impossible. There is much to divide the continental brand of popular sovereignty from the British brand of parliamentary sovereignty. And all brands have their faults. Winston Churchill once said that democracy is the worst of political systems, except for all the others. What does exist, as always, is almost universal abhorrence of tyranny. And this is what propels all newly liberated nations in the direction of democracy, irrespective of previous realities. Our whole history inclines us towards the democratic powers, declared the president of newborn Czechoslovakia in 1918. In 1989-91, similar sentiments were echoed by leaders of all the countries of the ex-Soviet bloc. This is not to deny that democracy, like any other movement, needs its founding myth. It needs an ancient pedigree and worthy heroes. And who could be more ancient or more worthy than Cleisthenes the Alcmeonid? Macedon To ask whether Macedonia is Greek is rather like asking whether Prussia was German. If one talks of distant origins, the answer in both cases must be no. Ancient Macedonia started its career in the orbit of Illyrian or Thracian civilization, but, as shown by excavation of the royal tombs, it was subject to a high degree of Hellenization before Philip of Macedon conquered Greece. The Roman province of Macedonia stretched to the Adriatic, and from the 6th century onwards, was heavily settled by migrant Slavs. According to one theory, the Slavs mingled with the residue of the pre-Greek population to form a new non-Greek Macedonian nation. The Byzantine Empire was sometimes dubbed Macedonia because of its Greek connections. But the former provinces of Macedonia, and much of the Peloponnese, was submerged in Sclavonia. In medieval times, Macedonia was incorporated for a time into the Bulgarian Empire, and remained permanently within the exarchate of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church. This strengthened later Bulgarian claims. In the 14th century it passed under Serbian rule. In 1346, Stefan Dushan was crowned in Skopje, Tsar of the Serbs, Greeks, Bulgars and Albanians. This was to strengthen Serbian claims. Then came the Ottomans. In the late 19th century, Ottoman Macedonia was a typical Balkan province of mixed religious and ethnic composition. Orthodox Christians lived alongside Muslims, and Greeks and Slavs alongside Albanians and Turks. By custom, all Orthodox Christians were counted as Greeks, because of their allegiance to the Patriarch of Constantinople. Throughout the Balkan Wars, 
Macedonia was fought over by Greece, Bulgaria, and Serbia. It was divided into three parts. Southern Macedonia, centered on Thessaloniki, was taken over by Greece. After the Greco-Turkish population exchange of 1922 and the Slav exodus due to the civil war in 1949, it came to be dominated by a strong majority of highly patriotic Greeks, Alexander's successors, many of them immigrants from Turkey. Eastern Macedonia found itself in Bulgaria, which treated it as synonymous with Western Bulgaria. Northern Macedonia, centered on Skopje and the upper Vardar Valley, possessed a mixed Albanian and Slav population living within Serbia. When this northern section was reconstituted in 1945 as the Autonomous Republic of Macedonia within Yugoslavia, a determined campaign was launched to simplify history and to transmute the identity of the entire population. The Yugoslav leadership was intent on reversing the effects of wartime Bulgarian occupation and on resisting the cultural charms of ancient Greece. The Slav dialect of the political elite was declared to be a separate language. Old Church Slavonic was equated with Old Macedonian, and a whole generation was educated according to the great idea of a Slav Macedonia stretching back for centuries. Not surprisingly, when the government of Skopje declared independence in 1992, no one could agree what their republic should be called. A Greek scholar was reported to have received death threats for revealing the existence of a Slavic-speaking minority on the Greek side of Greece's closed northern frontier. Neutral commentators abroad adopted the evocative acronym of FIRAM, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Equally useful was the curious mnemonic of F-O-P-I-T-G-R-O-B-B-S-O-S-Y, former province of Illyria, Thrace, Greece, Rome, Byzantium, Bulgaria, Serbia, the Ottoman Empire, Serbia, and Yugoslavia. Papyrus In 1963, a carbonized papyrus from the 4th century BC was unearthed at Derveni near Thessaloniki in Macedonia. It had either been burned as part of a funeral rite or had possibly been used as a firelighter. But it was still readable. Deciphered by Dr. Farkelman of Vienna, who separated the layers of the reheated roll with static electricity, it was shown to carry a commentary on the Orphic poems. It replaced the papyrus of Timotheus Persai, unearthed at Abusir in Egypt, as the oldest Greek papyrological discovery. In 1964, a similar papyrus roll was found in the hand of a man buried in the 4th century BC at Carlatis on the Black Sea coast of Romania, but it crumbled to dust on discovery. The Cyprus papyrus plant had been used for writing in Egypt since 3000 BC. It was laid out in horizontal and vertical strips, which were then pressed flat to form a long volumen or scroll. A thick black ink made from soot was applied either by the tip of a sliced reed or by a quill. Papyrus continued to be used in Greek and Roman times, especially in lands close to the source of supply in the Nile Delta. The largest find of classical papyri, some 800 in number, was extracted from the lava-sealed ruins of Herculaneum. Papyrology, the science of papyri, has made an immense contribution to classical studies. Since very few other forms of writing have survived over two millennia, it has greatly advanced knowledge of ancient paleography, and it has helped bridge the philological chasm between ancient and medieval Greek. It has supplied many texts from the lost repertoire of classical literature, including Aristotle's Constitution of Athens, Sophocles' Trackers, and Menander's The Discontented Man. It has also played a key role in biblical studies, some 7,000 early Greek MSS of various fragments of the Bible are now extant. The Dead Sea Scrolls contained a few Christian as well as Jewish texts. There are two pre-Christian papyrus rolls containing segments of Deuteronomy. A papyrus from AD 125, carrying the Gospel of St. John, is significantly older than any version on parchment. Some of the oldest papal bulls to survive have done so on papyrus. As papyrus gave way to parchment, to vellum, and eventually to paper, so too did the roll give way to the folded pages of the codex. The passing of papyrus and the advent of the codex 
combined to launch the birth of the book. Black Athena No thesis has divided the world of classics more profoundly than that associated with the title of Black Athena. The traditionalists regard it as freakish. Others maintain that it deserves close attention. The thesis has two separate aspects, one critical, the other propositional. The critical part argues with some force that classical studies were moulded by the self-centred assumptions of 18th and 19th century Europeans, and that the cultural debt of Greece and Rome to the older civilizations of the Near East was systematically ignored. The critic's purpose to lessen European cultural arrogance would seem to be fruitful, though talk of the Aryan model of Greek civilization is provocative. The main propositions of the thesis centre on the twin notions of Greek civilization being specifically rooted in Egypt and of ancient Egyptian civilization being fundamentally African and created by blacks. This line stands on shakier ground. The Coptic contribution to Greek vocabulary is at best marginal. The skin colour of the pharaohs, as portrayed on tomb paintings, is usually much fairer than that of their frequently negroid servants. Egyptian men were tanned, the women pale. A Nubian dynasty of the 7th century BC is the only one out of 31 that can realistically be categorised as black. Skeptics might suspect that scholarship has been hijacked by the racial politics of the USA, in which case it is perhaps necessary to restate the obvious. If one cares to go back far enough, there is no doubt that the origins both of Europeans and of European civilization lie far beyond Europe. The point is, how far back and to what starting point do prehistorians have to go? 3. Roma. Ancient Rome, 753 BC to AD 337. There is a quality of cohesiveness about the Roman world which applied neither to Greece nor perhaps to any other civilization, ancient or modern. Like the stones of a Roman wall, which were held together both by the regularity of the design and by that peculiarly powerful Roman cement, so the various parts of the Roman realm were bonded into a massive, monolithic entity by physical, organisational and psychological controls. The physical bonds included the network of military garrisons, which were stationed in every province, and the network of stone-built roads, which linked the provinces with Rome. The organisational bonds were based on the common principles of law and administration and on the universal army of officials who enforced common standards of conduct. The psychological controls were built on fear and punishment, on the absolute certainty that any one or any thing that threatened the authority of Rome would be utterly destroyed. The source of the Roman obsession with unity and cohesion may well have lain in the pattern of Rome's early development. Whereas Greece had grown from scores of scattered cities, Rome grew from one single organism. Whilst the Greek world had expanded along the Mediterranean sea lanes, the Roman world was assembled by territorial conquest. Of course, the contrast is not quite so stark. In Alexander the Great, the Greeks had found the greatest territorial conqueror of all time, and the Romans, once they moved outside Italy, did not fail to learn the lessons of sea power. Yet the essential difference is undeniable. The key to the Greek world lay in its high-proud ships. The key to Roman power lay in its marching legions. The Greeks were wedded to the sea the Romans to the land. The Greek was a sailor at heart, the Roman a landsman. Certainly in trying to explain the Roman phenomenon, one would have to place great emphasis on this almost animal instinct for the territorial imperative. Roman priorities lay in the organisation, exploitation and defence of their territory. In all probability it was the fertile plain of Latium that created the habits and skills of landed settlement, landed property, landed economy, landed administration, and a land-based society. From this arose the Roman genius for military organization and orderly government. In turn, a deep attachment to the land and to the stability which rural life engenders fostered the Roman virtues, gravitas, a sense of responsibility, pietas, a sense of devotion to family and country, and justitia, a sense of the natural order. 
tillers of the soil make the strongest men and the bravest soldiers, wrote the elder Cato. Modern attitudes to Roman civilization range from the infinitely impressed to the thoroughly disgusted. As always, there are the power worshippers, especially among historians, who are predisposed to admire whatever is strong, who feel more attracted to the might of Rome than to the subtlety of Greece. They admire the size and strength of the Colosseum, with never a thought for the purpose to which it was put. The Colosseum, in fact, became the symbol of Roman civilization. It became a commonplace. When falls the Colosseum, Rome shall fall, and when Rome falls, the world. At the same time, there is a solid body of opinion which dislikes Rome. For many, Rome is at best the imitator and the continuator of Greece on a larger scale. Greek civilization had quality, Rome mere quantity. Greece was original, Rome derivative. Greece had style, Rome had money. Greece was the inventor, Rome the research and development division. Such indeed was the opinion of some of the more intellectual Romans. Had the Greeks held novelty in such disdain as we, asked Horace in his epistles, what work of ancient date would now exist? What is more, the Romans vulgarized many of the things which they copied. In architecture, for example, they borrowed the heavy and luxurious late Corinthian order, but not the Doric or the Ionian. The whole fabric of Greek art goes to pieces, writes one critic, when it is brought into contact with a purely utilitarian nation like Rome. Rome's debt to Greece, however, was enormous. In religion, Romans adopted the Olympians wholesale, turning Zeus into Jupiter, Hera into Juno, Ares into Mars, Aphrodite into Venus. They adopted Greek moral philosophy to the point where Stoicism was more typical of Rome than of Athens. In literature, Greek writers were consciously used as models by their Latin successors. It was absolutely accepted that an educated Roman should be fluent in Greek. In speculative philosophy and the sciences, the Romans made virtually no advance on earlier achievements. Yet it would be wrong to suggest that Rome was somehow a junior partner in Greco-Roman civilization. The Roman genius was projected into new spheres, especially into those of law, military organization, administration, and engineering. Moreover, the tensions which arose within the Roman state produced literary and artistic sensibilities of the highest order. It was no accident that many leading Roman soldiers and statesmen were writers of high calibre. Equally, the long list of Roman vices cannot be forgotten. Critics have pointed to a specially repulsive brand of slavery, to cruelty beyond measure, and, in time, to a degree of decadence that made Hellenism look puritanical. In its widest definition, from the founding of the Eternal City in 753 BC, to the final destruction of the Roman Empire in A.D. 1453, the political history of ancient Rome lasted for 2,206 years. In its more usual definition, from the founding of the city to the collapse of that western segment of the Roman Empire, of which Rome was the capital, it lasted for barely half that time. It is customarily divided into three distinct periods, the Kingdom, the Republic, and the Empire. The semi-legendary Roman kingdom corresponds in many ways to the earlier heroic age of Greece. It begins with the tale of Romulus and Remus, the orphaned twins, reputedly descendants of Aeneas, who were suckled by a she-wolf, and it ends with the expulsion of the last of the seven kings, Tarquin the Proud, in 510 BC. Those two and a half centuries lie long before the era of recorded history. Romulus, the founder of Rome, supposedly organized the rape of the Sabine women, who helped to populate the new city. Numa Pompilius, a Sabine, introduced the calendar and the official religious practices. He founded the Temple of Janus in the Forum, whose doors were opened in time of war and closed in times of peace. Tullius Hostilius, the third king, a Latin, raised the neighboring city of Alba Longa and deported its population. Ancus Marcius, created the order of plebs, or common people, from imported captives. Servius Tullius, the sixth king, granted Rome its first constitution, giving the plebs independence from the patricians or elders, and created the Latin League. The fifth and seventh kings, Tarquinius Priscus and Tarquinius Superbus, 
were of Etruscan descent. The former undertook the first public works in Rome, including the vast sewer named after him. The latter was expelled following the rape of Lucretia, organized by his son. Rome, with its seven hills commanding the strategic crossing point of the river Tiber, was but one of several cities of Latium that spoke the Latin tongue. In those early years it was dominated by more powerful neighbours, especially by the Etruscans to the north, whose fortified city of Veii lay only sixteen kilometres from the Forum. The remains of the Etruscan places at Vulci, Tarquinia and Perugia attest to an advanced but mysterious civilization. Rome borrowed much from them. According to Livy, the city only survived the Etruscan attempt to storm it and to reinstate the Tarquins after the one-eyed Horatius Cocles had held the Sublician Bridge. Then out spake brave Horatius, the captain of the gate, To every man upon this earth death cometh soon or late, and how can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? Hew down the bridge, Sir Consul, with all the speed ye may. I, with two more to help me, will hold a foe in play. In yon straight path a thousand may well be stopped by three. Now who will stand on either hand and keep the bridge with me? Horatius, quoth the Consul, as thou sayest, so let it be and straight against that great array forth went the dauntless three. For Romans in Rome's quarrel spared neither land nor gold, nor son nor wife, nor limb nor life, in the brave days of old. The Roman Republic presided over the city's growth from provincial obscurity to mastery of the whole Mediterranean. The process began in 509 BC with the first election of the ruling consuls, and ended 478 years later, when Octavian established the first imperial dynasty. It was an epoch of incessant conquest. In the 5th century, Rome gained a hold over its immediate neighbours and a territory of 822 square kilometres, 314 square miles. In one famous episode, in 491 BC, the Roman exile G. Marcius Coriolanus, who had led an all-conquering Volscian army to the gates of Rome, was persuaded to desist by the tearful entreaties of his mother. In the 4th century, Rome recovered from its sack by the Gauls in 390 BC, and in the three fierce Samnite wars established its supremacy over central Italy. In the 3rd century, Rome undertook the conquest of the Greek south, first in the war against Pyrrhus, king of Epirus, who came to the aid of his compatriots, and later in successive campaigns ending with the annexation of Sicily. These campaigns provoked extended conflict with Carthage and the three Punic Wars. Of all Rome's wars, it was the Hundred Years' Conflict with Carthage that best demonstrated that famous Roman combination of stamina and ruthlessness. Older than Rome, African Carthage had been founded by migrants from Phoenicia, in Latin Punica. Relations between them had traditionally been Pacific, protected by a treaty contained in the oldest known document of Roman history. Dated in the first year of Republic, the treaty enjoined each side to respect the other's sphere of influence. The peace was kept for nearly three centuries, before Roman forces crossed the Straits of Messina. In the First Punic War, 264-241, to Carthage itself remained relatively immune from Roman land power, although its hold on Sicily was lost. Rome learned the arts of naval warfare. In the Second Punic War, 218 to 201, which followed Hannibal's spectacular expedition across the Alps from Spain to Italy, Rome recovered by sheer persistence from the brink of annihilation. The Celts of northern Italy were in revolt, as was much of Sicily, and the road to Rome was left almost undefended. The two battles of Lake Trasimeno, 217, and Cannae, 216, belong to Rome's most crushing defeats. Only the tactics of Q. Fabius Maximus Cunctator, the Delea, the dogged nursing of resources, and the capture of Syracuse enabled Rome to survive. Hannibal's brother Hasdrubal was thwarted in a second attempt to invade Italy from Spain, and in 203 Hannibal himself was forced to withdraw. He was followed to Africa by the young Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus, survivor of Cannae, conqueror of Cartagena. At Zama, in 202, Hannibal met his match. 
Taking refuge with the enemies of Rome in Greece, he was eventually harried to suicide. Carthage, deprived of its fleet and paying heavy tribute, survived for sixty years more. But in the Third Punic War, 149 to 146 BC, the elder Cato raised the call for the enemy's complete destruction. Carthago delenda est. The deed was carried out in 146. The city was razed, the population sold into slavery, the site ploughed, and salt poured into the furrow. In Tacitus' words on another occasion, the Romans created a desert and called it peace. Scipio Emilianus, watching the scene in the company of the historian Polybius, was moved to quote the words of Hector in the Iliad, The day shall come when sacred Troy shall fall. When asked what he meant, he replied, This is a glorious moment, Polybius, yet I am seized with foreboding that some day the same fate will befall my own country. As the challenge of Carthage was neutralized and then removed, the triumphant legions of the Republic began to pick off the remaining countries of the Mediterranean. Cisalpine Gaul was conquered between 241 and 190. Iberia and much of northern Africa came as a prize in 201. Illyria was conquered between 229 and 168. Macedonia, together with mainland Greece, was taken over by 146. Transalpine Gaul was invaded in 125 BC and finally subdued by Caesar in 58 to 50 BC. The independent kingdoms of Asia Minor were annexed in 67 to 61 BC, Syria and Palestine by 64 BC. In the last hundred years of the Republic's existence, the foreign campaigns became entangled in a series of civil wars. Successful generals sought to control the central government in Rome, whilst would-be reformers sought to satisfy the demands of the lower orders. The resultant strife led to intermittent periods of chaos and of dictatorial rule. In 133 to 121 BC, the popular tribunes Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus and his brother G. Sempronius Gracchus attempted to allocate public lands to displaced peasants who had served in the Republic's conquest. Both were opposed by the ruling oligarchy and both were slain. In 82 to 79, El Sulla Felix declared himself dictator after defeating the partisans of G. Marius, the greatest soldier of his age. In 60 BC, three rival soldier politicians, M. Licinius Crassus, Pompeius Magnus, and C. Julius Caesar, formed the first ruling triumvirate. But in 48 BC, Caesar claimed the title of Imperator after crushing the faction of the remaining triumvir, Pompey. Finally, in 31 BC, after the fall of the Second Triumvirate, Octavian brought the civil wars to a close. His victory at Actium brought about the surrender of Egypt, the death of Antony and Cleopatra, the end of opposition, and his assumption of the title of Augustus. In this way, the last gasp of the Roman Republic coincided with the capture of the last piece of the Mediterranean coast, which had remained at least nominally independent. In almost five hundred years, the gates of the Temple of Janus had been closed on only three occasions. The civil strife was the outward expression, above all, of a shift in political attitudes, which is well illustrated from the careers of the two Catos, both of whom supported the losing side. Marcus Porcius Cato, the censor, 234-149 to BC, became a byword for the old Roman virtues of austerity and Puritanism. After twenty-seven years of soldiering, he retired to his farm to write books on history and agriculture. He railed against the wave of Hellenistic luxury and sophistication, and in particular against the unprincipled careerism, as he saw it, of the Scipios. In his last years, he called unrelentingly for the annihilation of Carthage. His great-grandson, M. Porcius Cato Uticensis, 95-46 B.C., showed the same rectitude and obstinacy of character. A Stoic by training, he joined Pompey in the campaign to check the dictatorial ambitions of Caesar. When Pompey's cause was lost, he killed himself rather than submit, after a heroic journey across the Libyan desert, which led only to encirclement in the town of Utica. He had spent his last night reading Plato's Phaedo on the immortality of the soul. 
In this way, he became a symbol of republican opposition to tyranny, of principled opposition. Cicero praised him. Caesar, in his Anticato, tried meanly to discredit him. The poet Lucan, who also committed suicide rather than submit to a despot, makes him the champion of political freedom. Dante, after Lucan, makes him the guardian of Mount Purgatory and hence of the path to spiritual liberty. See Julius Caesar, 100 to 44 BC, led the decisive attack on the established procedures of the Republic. A successful general and administrator, he shared the first triumvirate from 60 BC with Pompey and Crassus, served as consul and, from 59, proconsul of the two Gauls. Caesar's enemies were disgusted by his shameless bribing of the Roman populace, by his manipulation of politicians, by the smash-and-grab policy of his military campaigns. Cicero's protest, O tempora, O mores, is still with us. On the 10th of January, 49 BC, when Caesar crossed the frontier of the province of Italia on the river Rubicon, he declared war on Rome. He shunned the outward trappings of monarchy, but his dictatorship was a reality. His name became synonymous with absolute power. He even succeeded in changing the calendar. He was assassinated on the Ides of March, 44 BC, by a group of Republican conspirators headed by M. Brutus and C. Cassius Longinus, whom admirers have called the Liberators. Brutus was a descendant of Rome's first consul, who overthrew the Tarquins. Shakespeare called him the noblest Roman of them all. Dante put him in the lowest circle of hell for his betrayal of Caesar's friendship. After Caesar's death, the leadership of the Caesarian party was assumed by his nephew Octavian. See Octavius, born 63 BC, whose name had been changed to C. Julius Caesar Octavianus when he was adopted as Caesar's official heir, was to change it again when all the battles were won. He served for twelve years in a second shaky triumvirate with M. Emilius Lepidus and M. Antonius, who, together at Philippi, suppressed the republican faction of Brutus and Cassius. But then he turned on his partners and attacked the dominant Mark Antony. Octavian was master of the West, Mark Antony of the East, and the naval battle of Actium was a rather tame conclusion to a confrontation in which the combined forces of almost all the Roman world were ranged. But Actium was decisive. It ended the civil wars, finished off the Republic, and gave Octavian the supreme title of Augustus. The Empire, whose early years are widely referred to as the Principate, begins with the triumph of Augustus in 31 BC. It saw the marvellous Pax Romana, the Roman peace, established from the Atlantic to the Persian Gulf. Although turbulent politics and murderous intrigues continued, especially in Rome, the provinces were firmly controlled, and wars were largely confined to the distant frontiers. A few new territories were acquired, Britannia in AD 43, Armenia in 63, Dacia in 105. But in the main, the empire was content to protect itself in Europe behind the Limes, or frontier line, from Hadrian's Wall to the Danube Delta, and to fight in Asia against Rome's most formidable enemies, the Parthians and Persians. Eventually, the imperial retreat had to begin, and retreat led to crumbling at the edges and demoralization at the center. Already in the third century AD, a rash of short-lived emperors signaled the weakening of the monolith. A partial recovery was staged by ordering the division of the empire into east and west. But in the fourth century, a marked shift of resources in favor of the east was accompanied by the decision to transfer the capital from Rome to Byzantium. That was in AD 330. Rome had reached its term as a political center. The eternity of its rule over kingdom, republic, and empire lasted exactly 1,083 years. The motor of Roman expansion was far more powerful than that which had fueled the growth of the Greek city-states or of Macedonia. Although the overall dimensions of Alexander's empire may briefly have exceeded those of the later Roman world, the area of land which Rome systematically settled and mobilized was undoubtedly the larger. From the outset, Rome applied a variety of legal, demographic, and agrarian instruments which ensured that an incorporated territory contribute to the overall resources of the Roman war machine. 
According to circumstance, the inhabitants of conquered districts would be granted the status either of full Roman citizenship or of half-citizenship, civitas sine suffragio, or of Roman allies. In each case, their duty to contribute money and soldiers was carefully assessed. Loyal soldiers were rewarded with generous grants of land, which would be surveyed and divided into regular plots. The result was a growing territory that needed ever more troops to defend it, and a growing army that needed ever more land to support it. A militarized society, where citizenship was synonymous with military service, developed an insatiable agrarian appetite. A fund of state land, the Ager Publicus, was held back to reward the state's most devoted servants, especially senators. Within this overall strategy, political arrangements could be extremely flexible. The introduction of uniform administration was not an immediate priority. Peninsular Italy, which was united under Roman rule at the end of the 3rd century BC, had to wait 200 years for its reorganization into regular provinces. Local rulers were frequently left in place. Those who resisted or rebelled risked annihilation. In Greece, for example, resistance was undermined when in 146 BC the Roman general appeared at the Isthmian Games and announced that the city-states would be allowed to retain their autonomy. Corinth, which declined the offer, suffered the same fate as Carthage, and in the same year. Roman religious life was amazingly eclectic. Over the centuries, the Romans came into contact with virtually all the gods of the Mediterranean, each of whose cults they added to their collection. In the early days, the devotion of a Roman family was centered on the household deities of hearth and barn. Civic life centered on a series of guardian cults, such as that of the Vestal Virgins, who tended the eternal flame, and on a complicated calendar of festivals presided over by the Pontifex Maximus. Later, the proximity of Magna Graecia led to the wholesale adoption of the Olympian pantheon. The first temple of Apollo was consecrated in Rome in 431 BC. The Epicureans, and especially the Stoics, also found many adherents. In late Republican times, Oriental mystery cults were popularized, among them that of Atargetis from Syria, of Sibylle, the Magna Mater of Asia Minor, and of Egyptian Isis. In imperial times, official religion shifted to the obligatory cult of recent or reigning emperors. Christianity took hold at a time when the Persian sun god Mithras was increasingly cultivated, especially in the army. The gospel of love had to contend with the dualist doctrine of light and darkness, whose initiates bathed in bull's blood and celebrated the birth of their god on the 25th of December. Their subterranean oblations are imagined in the Hymn of the Thirtieth Legion. Mithras, god of the morning, our trumpets waken the wall. Rome is above the nations, but thou art over all. Now, as the names are answered and the guards are marched away, Mithras, also a soldier, Give us strength for this day. Mithras, god of the sunset, low on the western main, thou descending immortal, immortal to rise again. Now when the watch is ended, now when the wine is drawn, Mithras, also a soldier, keep us pure till the dawn. Mithras, god of the midnight, here where the great bull dies, look on thy children in darkness, O oh, take our sacrifice. Many roads thou hast fashioned, all of them lead to the light. Mithras, also a soldier, teach us to die aright. The Roman economy combined a large measure of self-sufficiency in the inland areas with extensive trade and commerce in the Mediterranean. Overland transport costs were high despite the main roads, so provincial cities did not look beyond the surrounding districts for most commodities. But the seaborne traffic, first developed by Greeks and Phoenicians, was increased still further. Wine, oil, furs, pottery, metals, slaves, and corn were the standard cargoes. The growing population of Rome was fed on state-supplied corn, the frumentum publicum, which was imported initially from Latium and later from Sicily and North Africa. But the Romans were also wedded to luxuries and were able to pay for them. The silk route was open to China and the spice lanes to India. Roman traders, the notorious negotiatores, moved freely round the empire after the armies, taking valuables, styles, and expectations with them. 
A common currency was introduced in Italy in 269 BC and in Roman territories as a whole in 49 BC. In the imperial period, there were gold, silver, brass, and copper coins. The brass sestertius became the basic unit of currency. The gold aureus was worth 100 sesterius, the silver denarius four, the copper as one quarter. Local currencies continued alongside, however, and the right to mint was an important mark of status. Roman society was built on fundamental legal distinctions between the citizen and the non-citizen, and, among the non-citizens, between the free and the unfree. It was a strict system of hereditary social orders or estates. Practices which began in ancient Latium were modified over the centuries until they encompassed the vast and variegated populations of all the empire's provinces. In early Republican Rome, the patres, or city fathers, were set apart from the plebs, or common people, with whom they were forbidden to intermarry. The patrician clans dominated both the political life of the city in the Senate and economic life through their hold on the distribution of land, and they fought a long rearguard action against the plebeian challenge. But eventually their privileges were undermined. In 296 BC, by the Lex Ogulnia, the plebs were to be admitted to the sacred colleges of pontifices and augurs. In 287 BC, by the Lex Hortensia, the laws of the plebeian assembly became binding on all citizens. The plebs had become part of the establishment. In the so-called Social War of 90-89 BC, Rome's Italian allies successfully claimed the rights of full citizenship. But it was not until AD 212 that the Constitutio Antoniniana gave citizenship to all free-born male subjects of the empire. Important distinctions developed within the patrician oligarchy of the later republic. A handful of the most ancient and senior clans, the gentes maiores, formed an aristocracy among the patricians, the Valeri, Fabi, Cornelii, Claudi, and others. The nobiles were a wider but still senatorial group, consisting of all who could claim descent from a consul. They possessed the highly valued right of displaying in public the waxen portraits of their ancestors. The equites, or knights, formed a sub-senatorial propertied class which possessed the means to belong to the cavalry. They had the right to wear a toga edged with two thin purple stripes, the angusticlavia, as opposed to the senator's toga with broad purple stripes, the laticlavia. In the theatre, they sat in the first fourteen rows, immediately behind the orchestra, reserved for senators. They were the chief beneficiaries of promotions under Augustus when they largely displaced the nobiles as the backbone of the ruling class. The strong contrast between city and countryside persisted. Like Rome itself, the provincial cities developed into major urban centres, characterised by imposing public works, paved streets, aqueducts, baths, theatres, temples, monuments, and by the growth of merchant, artisan and proletarian classes. The city mob, constantly pacified in Juvenal's words, through bread and circuses, panem et circenses, became a vital social factor. In the countryside, the villas of local dignitaries stood out above the toiling mass of slaves who worked the great latifundia. An intermediate and, in the nature of things, enterprising group of libertini, or freed slaves, grew in importance as the import of fresh slave populations tailed off with the end of the Republic's conquests. Despite the extreme contrasts of Roman society between the vast power and wealth of the patricians and the lot of their slaves, between the opulence of many city dwellers and the backwardness of the desert tribes and barbarian settlers on the periphery, it is a tribute to the flexible paternalism of the Roman social tradition that the outbreaks of class conflict were relatively few and far between. Blood relations carried great weight in Rome, where elaborate kinship groups proliferated. The patriciate presided over society at large, just as the pater familias presided over every extended family. The patricians were originally divided into three tribes, the tribes into thirty curiae or parishes, and the parishes into kentes or clans and families. In later times, the gens was composed of persons boasting the same remote male ancestor, 
whilst the familia was narrowed to mean household group. The absolute rights of fathers over all members of their family, the patria potestas, was one of the cornerstones of family law. There was a profusion of popular assemblies in Rome, which had both social and political functions. The patricians met on their own in the Comitia Curiata, their parish meetings, where, among other things, they ratified the appointment of the consuls. The plebeians, too, met regularly in the Comitia Tributa, or tribal meetings, where they discussed their communal affairs and elected their officials, the tribunes, or spokesmen of the tribes, the questores, and the aediles, the plebeian magistrates. After 449 BC, they could be summoned by the consuls as well as by the tribunes. They met in the forum, and in the plebiscita, or voting of the plebs, they gave their opinion on any matter put to them. For military purposes, patricians and plebeians met together in the Comitia Centuriata, or the Meetings of the Centuries. They assembled outside the city, on the vast Campus Martius, the Field of Mars, where they were drawn up in their thirty-five tribes. Each tribe was divided according to wealth into five classes, with the Equites, or Knights of the Cavalry, at the top, and the poorest of the Pedites, or Infantry, at the bottom. In time, there was also an unproperted class of proletarii, or proles. Each of the classes was organized in turn into centuriae, or centuries, and each century into seniors, men aged between forty-five to sixty on the reserve list, and juniors, men aged between seventeen to forty-five, liable for active service. The census of 241 BC showed a total of 260,000 citizens in 373 centuries, which works out at almost 700 men per century. Here was the whole of Roman male society in full view. These comitia centuriata gradually assumed the functions once reserved for the patricians, including the elections of the chief magistrates, the conferment of the imperium or right of command on military leaders, the ratification of laws, and decisions of war and peace. They voted by dropping clay tablets into one of two baskets as they filed out of their century enclosures. Their proceedings were required to be completed within one day. Within these assemblies, patronage groups played a vital role. In a hierarchical and highly compartmentalized society, it was natural, indeed essential, for wealthy patricians to manipulate the activities of the lower orders and thereby to influence the decisions of popular institutions. To this end, each patronus retained a following of dependent clientes. The patron expected his followers to support his policies and his preferred candidates. The clients expected a reward of money, office, or property. Serving a wealthy patron was the best road to social advancement. It was patronage that gave Roman government its characteristic blend of democratic forms and oligarchic control. The network of assemblies, the rotation of offices, and the need for frequent meetings created a strong sense of belonging. Every Roman citizen knew exactly where he stood with regard to his tribe, his clan, his family, his century, and his patron. Participation and service were part of the accepted ethos. In formal terms, it was the popular assemblies which appointed the chief officials and the officials who appointed the Senate. In reality, it was the senators who made all other institutions function to their advantage. Whoever dominated the Senate ruled the Republic. The Senate, which held center stage under both Republic and Empire, had a membership which fluctuated between 300 and 600 men. Its members were appointed by the consuls, whom it was called on to advise. But since the consuls were required to give preference to experienced men, and since senatorial patrons controlled all the major offices of state, the Senate could blithely perpetuate its hold on government. It was the core of a self-perpetuating elite. The dominant element within the Senate at any particular moment depended on the delicate balance of power between competing individuals, clans, and clientelae, or client groups but the same patrician names are repeated over and over through the centuries until a tidal wave of upstarts finally swept them away. With time, the efficiency of senatorial control declined in proportion to the growth of factionalism. When the Senate was paralyzed through civil strife, the only ways to keep the system running 
were either for a dictator to be installed by common consent or for one faction to impose its will through force of arms. This was the source of the string of dictators in the first century BC. In the end, the faction led by Octavian Caesar, the future Augustus, imposed its will on all the others. Octavian became the patron of patrons, holding the fate of all the senators in his hands. The two consuls, the joint chief executives of Rome, held office for one year from the 1st of January. In its origins, their office was essentially a military one. They were proposed by the Senate and appointed by the Comitia Centuriata, which gave them the Imperium or Army Command for specific tasks. But they gradually assumed additional functions. They presided over the Senate and, in conjunction with the Senate, held responsibility for foreign affairs. They supervised the management of the city's internal affairs under the praetores, the chief judges who ran the judicial system, the censores, who controlled taxation and the registration of citizens, the questores, who ran public finance, the ediles, who policed the city and ran the games, and the pontifex, the high priest. In conjunction with the tribunes, they were expected to keep the peace between the senate and the people. It is a measure of the consul's importance that Romans kept the historical record of the city not in terms of numbered years, but in terms of the consulships. Thanks to the reforms of Marius and Sulla, the profile of the consulship changed. The practice of administering the provinces through proconsules, or consular deputies, extended its range of powers. On the other hand, direct control of the army was lost. Roman government seems to be the subject of many misconceptions. It was in constant flux over a very long period of time and did not attain any great measure of homogeneity except, perhaps, briefly in the age of the Antonines. Its undoubted success was due to the limited but clearly defined goals that were set. It provided magistrates to settle disputes and to exact tribute. It provided an army for external defence, law enforcement and internal security. And it supported the authority of approved local or regional elites, often through their participation in religious rites and civic ceremonies. The magic combination involved both great circumspection in the degree of the state's encroachment on established rights and privileges and utter mercilessness in defending lawful authority. In Virgil's words, Tu regere imperio populus romane memento ai tibi erunt artes, pacisque imponere morem parcere subjectis et debellare superbos. Make it your task, Roman, to rule the peoples by your command, and these are your skills, to impose the habit of peace, to spare those who submit, and to conquer the proud. Yet Roman institutions seen through modern concepts can be deceptive. Under the Roman kingdom, the monarchy was not hereditary, and it was limited by the senate of the patricians which eventually overthrew it. Under the early republic, the two consuls, elected annually by the patrician senate, received the full power to command. But they were closely constrained both by the dual nature of the office and by the right of veto established in 494 by the tribunes of the plebs. Hence the famous formula of SPQR, Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and People of Rome, in whose name all authority was exercised. Under the late Republic and early Empire, most of the traditional magistracies and legislative bodies survived, but they were subordinated to the increasingly dictatorial pretensions of the executive. Roman political culture determined how changing institutions actually worked. Political and religious life were always closely interwoven. The reading of the auguries accompanied all decision-making. Strong emphasis was placed on family or local authority. As a result, civic responsibility, the demands of military service and respect for the law, were deeply ingrained. Rotating offices demanded a high degree of lobbying and initiative. Under the Republic, consensus was always sought through the taking of concilium, advice. Under the Principate, or early empire, it was obedience that counted. Roman law has been described as the Romans' most enduring contribution to world history. Its career began with the Twelve Tables of 451 to 50 BC, 
which were thenceforth regarded as the fount of equal law, the ideas that were equally binding on all citizens. It distinguished two main components, the ius civile, state law, regulating the relations between citizens, and the ius gentium, international law. It developed through the agglomeration of accepted custom and practice, as determined by prudentia, or legal method. Over the years, every point of law was tested, amended, or expanded. The praetors were the main source of this type of lawmaking until the perpetual edict of the Emperor Hadrian put a stop to further amendments. Laws initiated by magistrates, the leges rogatae, were differentiated from the plebiscita, or popular judgments, initiated by one or other of the assemblies. The complexity and antiquity of legal practice inevitably gave rise to the science of jurisprudence and to the long line of Roman jurists from Q. Mucius Scaevola, consul in 95 BC, onwards. It was a sign of deteriorating times that two of the greatest jurists, Emilianus Papinianus Papinian, a Greek, and Domitius Ulpianus Ulpian, were both put to death. The Roman army was the product of a society nurtured in perpetual warfare. Its logistical support system was as remarkable as its technical skills and its corporate ethos. For half a millennium, from the Second Punic War to the disasters of the third century, it was virtually invincible. Its victories were endless, each marked by the pomp of a triumph and by a vast collection of monuments on the model of Titus' arch or Trajan's column. Its defeats were all the more shocking for being exceptional. The annihilation of three Roman legions in the German backwoods in AD 9 was a sensation unparalleled until the death of the Emperor Decius in battle against the Goths in 251, or the capture of the Emperor Valerian by the Persians in 260. The Latin proverb, Siuis pacem para bellum, if you want peace, prepare for war, summarized a way of life. During the Pax Romana, the empire's fortresses and frontiers were maintained by a standing force of some thirty legions. Many legions became closely associated with the provinces in which they were permanently stationed for generations, or even for centuries. The two Augusta and the twenty Valeria Vitrix in Britain, the fifteen Apollinaris in Pannonia, or the five Macedonica in Moesia. Each legion counted approximately five to six thousand men and was commanded by a senator. It consisted of three lines of infantry, the Hastati, Principes, and Triarii, each made up of ten maniples commanded by a prior and a posterior centurion, a body of velites, or skirmishers, the Iustus Equitatus, or complement of cavalry, consisting of ten turmai, or squadrons, and a train of engineers. In addition, there were a large number of auxiliary regiments made up of allies and mercenaries, each organized in a separate cohort under its own prefect. With time, the percentage of citizen soldiers declined disastrously, but the backbone of the system continued to rest on the middle-ranking Roman officer caste, who served as centurions. Distinguished service was rewarded with medals or with crowns for the generals, and loyal veterans could expect a grant of land in one of the military colonies. Discipline was maintained by fierce punishments, including flogging and, for turncoats, crucifixion. In later times, the decline of civilian institutions gave the military their chance to dominate imperial politics. The gladius, or thrusting sword, first adopted from the Iberians during the Second Punic War, became, in the hands of the gladiators, the symbol of Rome's pleasures as well as her invincibility. Roman architecture had a strong proclivity for the utilitarian. Its achievements belong more to the realm of engineering than to design. Although the Greek tradition of temple building was continued, the most innovative features were concerned with roads and bridges, with urban planning and with secular, functional buildings. The Romans, unlike the Greeks, mastered the problem of the arch and the vault, using them as the basis for bridges and for roofs. The triumphal arch, therefore, which adorned almost all Roman cities, combined both the technical mastery and the ethos of Roman building. The Pantheon, first built by Agrippa in 27 BC in honour of all the gods and the Battle of Actium,
carries a vaulted dome that is four foot six inches, 1.5 meters, wider than St. Peter's. It is now the Church of Santa Maria Rotunda ad Martires. The Colosseum, more correctly the Flavian Amphitheatre, is a marvellous amalgam of Greek and Roman features, and has four tiers of arches interspersed with columns. It seated 87,000 spectators. The vast brick-built baths of Caracalla, or Thermae Antoninianae, where Shelley composed his Prometheus Unbound, are a monument to Roman lifestyle, 360 yards, 330 metres square. They contained the usual sections, graded by temperature, the Frigidarium, Tepidarium and Caldarium, a piscina, or pool, for 1,600 bathers, a stadium, Greek and Latin libraries, a picture gallery, and assembly rooms. The baths of Diocletian were even more sumptuous. The grandiose Circus Maximus was devoted to chariot racing. It was enlarged so that it could accommodate 385,000 spectators. Roman literature is all the more attractive for challenging the prevailing ethos of a military and, to a large extent, a Philistine society. The Roman literati obviously had their clientele, especially among the leisured aristocracy of late Republican and early Imperial Rome, but somehow they did not blend into the landscape so naturally as their Greek counterparts. There was always tension between the sophisticated world of letters and the stern Roman world at large. This tension may well explain why Latin literature developed so late, and why it received such a hostile reception from those who, like Cato, saw it as a mere aping of decadent Greek habits. It may also explain why dramatic comedy was the first genre to be imported, and why satire was the only medium which the Romans could honestly call their own. Of the thirty or so masters of the Latin repertoire, Virgil, Horace, Ovid, and Cicero have gained universal recognition. But anyone who recoils from the luxury, gluttony, and cruelty of Roman living must surely feel an affinity for the sensitive souls who reacted most strongly against their milieu, for the exquisite lyrics of Catullus, the biting wit of Juvenal, the epigrams of Martial. The first Roman writers wrote in Greek. Livius Andronicus, who translated Homer into Latin verse, was an educated Greek slave brought to Rome after the sack of Tarentum in 272 BC. Serious Latin literature appeared in the second half of the 3rd century BC with the plays of Gnaeus Naevius, T. Marcius Plotus, and P. Terentius Afer, Terence. All three made brilliant adaptations of the Greek comedies. With them, the theatre became a central institution of Roman culture. Native Latin poetry begins with Q. Ennius, a prime literary innovator. He introduced tragedy, launched the art of satire, and fashioned the Latin hexameter, which provided the basic metre of many later poets. Oratory held a prominent place in Roman life, as it did in Greece. Its greatest practitioner, M. Tullius Cicero, spoke and wrote in a polished style which has been taken ever since as the model for Latin prose. A new man, Cicero rose to the highest office of consul in 63, only to be banished and, after a second spell of political activity, to be proscribed and beheaded. His writings, which include moral philosophy and political theory, as well as the orations, had an immense influence both on Christian and on rationalist thinking. He was a champion of the rule of law and of republican government. His successor, the elder Seneca, a rhetorician from Cordoba, compiled a great anthology of oratory. History writing had much to feed on. Titus Livius, Livy, wrote a history of Rome in 142 books, 35 of which are extant. He idealized the Roman Republic and impresses more by style than by analysis. I shall find satisfaction, not, I trust, ignobly, Livy began, by laboring to record the story of the greatest nation in the world. See Julius Caesar, was both the supreme maker and recorder of Roman history. His accounts of the Gallic War and of the Civil War against Pompey are masterpieces of simplicity, once known to every European schoolboy. C. Salustius Crispus, or Sallust, followed Caesar both in his political and his literary interests. Cornelius Tacitus continued the annals of Livy through the first century of the empire, and not with any great enthusiasm for the emperors. 
His inimitably astringent style can also be seen in monographs such as the Germania. The revolution of the ages may bring round the same calamities, wrote Gibbon in a footnote, but the ages may revolve without a Tacitus to describe them. The art of biography also flourished. The supreme exponent was C. Suetonius Tranquillus, sometimes secretary of the Emperor Hadrian. His racy Lives of the Twelve Caesars is a mine of information and entertainment, outshone only by Tacitus' study of his father-in-law Agricola, governor of Britain. Latin literature undoubtedly reached its heights with the poets of the Augustan age, Virgil, Horace, and Ovid, the lyricist C. Valerius Catullus, the elegiac poet Albius Tibullus, and the aptly named Sextus Propertius, whose love poems to the exasperating Cynthia match those of Catullus to his Lesbia. Cupid is naked, wrote Propertius, and does not like artifice contrived by beauty. P. Virgilius Maro, Virgil, created language that rarely palls, even with the most mundane of subject matter. His ecloges, or selections, are pastoral poems. His Georgics eulogize farming. The Aeneid, or Voyage of Aeneas, is an extended allegorical epic which celebrates the Roman debt to Homer and to Greece. Recounting the adventures of Aeneas, a survivor of Troy and ancestor both of Romulus and of the Gensi Iulia, Virgil provided the mythical pedigree with which educated Romans wished to identify. His infinitely precise hexameters are not really translatable. They were written at the rate of one line a day for ten years, and sing in inimitable tone, serene, sustained, subtle, sad. Felix qui potuit rerum cognoscere causus. Happy is he who could learn the causes of things. Sed fugit in teria, fugit irreparabile tempus. But meanwhile time is flying, flying beyond recall. Omnia vincit amor, et nos quedamos amori. Love conquers all, so let us yield to love. Et penitus toto divisos orbe Britannus, and Britons wholly separated from all the world. Sunt lacrimae rerum et mentem mortalia tangunt. There are tears shed for things, and mortality touches the mind. For Dante, Virgil was il maestro di lor che sanno, the master of those who know, and the fount which spilt such a broad river of words. For the early Christians, he was the pagan poet who, in the fourth eclogue, was thought to have forecast the birth of Christ. For the moderns, he was lord of language, poet of the poet satyr, wielder of the stateliest measure ever moulded by the lips of man. He probably composed his own epitaph, seen at Pozzuoli by Petrarch, Mantua me genuit, calabri rapuere, tenet nunc partenope, cecini pasqua, rura duces. Mantua bore me, calabria carried me away, Naples now holds me. I sang of pastures, fields, and lords. Q. Horatius Flaccus, Horace, Virgil's friend and contemporary, was the author of odes and satires, epodes and epistles. He had studied in Athens, commanded a legion, and fought at Philippi, before retiring to his Sabine farm under the protection of his patron, Mycenus. He was a gentle, tolerant soul. His epistle to the Pisos, otherwise the Ars Poetica, was much admired by later poets. His satires were directed at human folly, not evil. His odes shine with translucent clarity, and with curioso felicitas, a marvellous felicity of expression. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Parturient montes, nascetur ridiculus mus. The mountains will give birth, and a silly mouse will be born. Atque inter silvas academi quarerere verum, and seek for truth even in the groves of academe, exegi monumentum aere perennius, non omnis moriar. I have created a monument more lasting than bronze. I shall not die completely. 
Horace is the most imitated and the most translated of poets. P. Ovidius Naso, Ovid, was a leading figure of Roman society until banished to the Black Sea coast by the Emperor Augustus. The causes of his exile, he says, were a poem and an error. The poem was undoubtedly his Ars Amortaria, the art of love. The error probably involved the emperor's daughter Julia, who was also banished. Ovid's Metamorphoses, or Transformations, which rework over two hundred Greek and Roman myths and legends, has been rated the most influential book of the ancient world. It has provided the favourite reading not only of the Romans, but of people as different as Chaucer, Montaigne, and Goethe. It has inspired a torrent of creative works from Petrarch to Picasso. Siwi Samari, wrote of it, Amma. If you wish to be loved, you too must love. The Silver Age of Latin literature, which lasted from the death of Augustus to perhaps the middle of the second century, contained fewer giants. Apart from Tacitus and Suetonius, there gleamed the talent of the Stoic philosopher Seneca II, of the two Plinys, of the poet Lucan, the rhetorician Quintilian, the novelist Petronius, and above all, of the satirist D. Junius Juvenalis, Juvenal. Difficile est satorum non scribere, wrote Juvenal. It is difficult not to write satire. The calculated violence of Roman life was proverbial. The butcheries of the foreign wars were repeated in the civil strife of the city. Livy's catchphrase, Why victis, woe to the vanquished, was no empty slogan. In 88 BC, when the so-called Vespers of Ephesus saw perhaps 100,000 Romans massacred in one day on the orders of King Mithridates, Sulla, leader of the aristocratic Optimates, marched on Rome and proscribed the rival followers of Marius. The head of the tribune, P. Sulpicius Rufus, was exhibited in the forum. The urban praetor, preparing to conduct a sacrifice before the Temple of Concord, was sacrificed himself. In 87 BC, when Rome opened its gates to Marius, it was the turn of the Optimates to be slaughtered. Marius' legions of slaves and his Dalmatian guard struck down every senator whom the general did not salute. Among his victims were names of later importance, Gnaeus Octavius, the reigning consul, M. Crassus, M. Antonius, L. Caesar, all ex-consuls. In 86, after the sudden death of Marius, the general's associate, Q. Sertorius, summoned the executioners on the pretext of distributing their pay, then cut them down en masse to the number of some four thousand. In 82, when the Optimates finally triumphed, they too massacred their prisoners. The clatter of arms and the groans of the dying were distinctly heard in the temple of Bellona, where Sulla was just holding a meeting of the Senate. Thereafter, to avoid such scenes, the procedure of proscription was formalized. Victorious factions would post a list of names in the forum to summon the leaders of the defeated faction to stand trial or risk confiscation. Men on the list who killed themselves in time, usually by opening their veins in a warm bath, could save their families from ruin. Those who failed to do so found their names on a new list carved in marble, declaring their lives and the property of their kin to be forfeit. In 43, for example, the proscription of the second triumvirate caused the deaths of at least three hundred senators and two thousand knights. Among them was Cicero, whose head and hands, severed from the corpse, were exhibited on the rostra of the forum. Where the ruling class of Rome set an example, the populace followed. The Roman Revolution is not a term that was used in ancient times, but it has been widely accepted by historians who see the transition from republic to principate as the product of profound social transformations. In other words, it is not an established historical event so much as the subject of modern sociological theorizing. The period witnessed the violent transfer of power and property, wrote its chief interpreter, and the principate of Augustus should be regarded as the consolidation of the revolutionary process. In this scenario, the chief victim was the old Roman aristocracy. The chief revolutionary was Caesar's heir, the young Octavius, a chill and mature terrorist, a gangster, a chameleon, who presented himself in turns as bloodthirsty avenger or moderate peacemaker. The resultant changes included the ruin of the established governing class, 
the promotion of new social elements, the domination of Rome by ambitious Italian outsiders, and, with their support, the emergence of a de facto monarchy. The key to Roman politics lay in the patronage of the rival dynasts, especially Caesar, Pompey, Mark Antony, and Octavius. The key to understanding the essential mechanisms lies in the art of prosopography, which analyzes the detailed careers of a class in order to uncover the inducements which animate them. Syme, relying heavily on the work of Munzer, did for Roman history what Louis Namia did for Georgian England. Political life, he wrote, was stamped and swayed not by the parties and programmes of a modern parliamentary character, not by the ostensible opposition of Senate and people, but by the struggle for power, wealth and glory. Particularly important in an age of civil war was a politician's ability to control the army and to satisfy the soldiers with lands, money and respect. Fighting, it would seem, was only a secondary preoccupation for successful generals. Overall, it is a cynical picture. Shifting alliances of convenience predominate over parties of principle. Political concepts, Cicero's Libertas Populi, Auctoritas Senatus, Concordia Ordinum, Consensus Italiae, are presented as mere slogans and catchwords. The Roman constitution was a screen and a sham, a mere facade for men's baser instincts. The old aristocracy could be bought. The new men were driven by greed and vanity. They were the trousered senators, the ghastly and disgusting rabble of Caesar's provincial dependents, the thousand creatures installed in the Senate by the Second Triumvirate, the servile apologists and propagandists whom Octavius hired to win public opinion and to distort history. Behind the scenes lurked the bankers, the millionaire paymasters, the adventurers, C. Maecenas, L. Cornelius Balbus from Gades, C. Rabirius Postumus, treasurer of Alexandria. In this scenario, therefore, the turning point occurred already in 43 BC, during the proscriptions of the Second Triumvirate which followed Caesar's death and in which, to his discredit, Octavian took the lead. The Republic had been abolished, despotism ruled, supported by violence and confiscation. The best men were dead or proscribed. The Senate was packed with ruffians. The consulate, once the reward of civic virtue, now became the recompense of craft or crime. Non mos, non ius. The Caesareans claimed the right and duty of avenging Caesar. Out of the blood of Caesar the monarchy was born. The rest was an epilogue. All cried liberty and all longed for peace. When peace came, it was the peace of despotism. Nonetheless, it is not possible to dismiss all the works of Augustus, reigned 31 BC to AD 14, as the fruits of propaganda. He undoubtedly had a Semir side, but importantly for the Romans, the omens were with him. Suetonius tells the story how the future emperor's mother had been entered by a serpent during a midnight service in the temple of Apollo, nine months before his birth. But then a comet had appeared in the sky when he first celebrated the Ludi Victoriae Caesaris. And on the eve of Actium, where he left the battle to subordinates like Agrippa, he met a Greek peasant driving an ass along the shore. I am Eutyches, prosper, said the peasant, and this is my ass, Nikon, victory. The nature of the early empire, or principate, is particularly deceptive. The emperor Augustus achieved lasting power for himself and his successors, not by the abolition of republican institutions, but by collecting all the offices that controlled them. He made himself imperator, or supreme commander, consul, tribune, censor, pontifex maximus, and proconsul of Spain, Gaul, Syria, and Cilicia, etc. As a result, he possessed powers as extensive as many an autocrat, but he did not exercise them through centralized autocratic channels. He replaced the pseudo-republic of the senatorial oligarchy with a quasi-empire, whose old institutions were obliged to work in a new way. As princeps senatus, a new office, he acted as chairman of the Senate, whose membership was drawn either from ex-magistrates, whom he would have appointed, or from imperial nominees. He left the Senate in charge of roughly half the provinces, into which all the empire was now divided, 
but he subjected their deliberations to an imperial veto. Dictatorial powers were delegated to former municipal offices, such as those of the Praefectus Urbi, in charge of criminal jurisdiction, or of the Praefectus Anonai, in charge of trade, markets, and the corn dole. Similarly, numerous boards of curatores, or commissioners, overseeing everything from roads and rivers to the repair of public buildings, now answered solely to the emperor. The growth of a more formal autocracy was a development of Christian times, especially in the Eastern Empire, where Persian influences were strong. The main law-making procedures of the Republic were gradually abandoned. But many of its statutes remained. The Comitia Tributa was occasionally summoned to confirm laws passed by other bodies, and the Senatus Consulta, or Decisions of the Senate, were still issued. From the 2nd century AD, however, the emperor became the sole source of new law, through his edicts or ordinances, his rescripts or written judgments on petitions, his decreta or rulings on judicial appeals, and his mandates or administrative instructions. By that time, the Senate had been replaced as the Supreme Court of Appeal by the emperor's praetorian prefect. With the passage of time, the vast corpus of Roman law had to be repeatedly codified, there were three such partial attempts in the Codex Gregorianus, A.D. approximately 295, the Codex Hermogenianus, approximately 324, and the Codex Theodicianus, 438. Similarly, in the Edict of Theodoric, before 515, the so-called Breviary of Alaric, 506, and the Burgundian Code, 516, Barbarian rulers attempted to summarize the law which they found in provinces captured from Rome. Yet the main work of systematization was undertaken under the Emperor Justinian. Between them, the fifty decisions, the institutes, the digest of the jurists, the revised code, and the novels covered every aspect of public and private, criminal and civil, secular and ecclesiastical law. It was through the Justinian law books that this huge heritage was transmitted to the modern world. The term provincia, sphere of action, originally referred to the jurisdiction of magistrates sent to govern conquered lands. Under the empire, it came to refer to the lands themselves. Each province was given a charter, the Lex Provincialis, which determined its limits, its subdivisions, and its privileges. Each was entrusted to a governor, either a proconsul or a propraetor, who raised troops, collected tribute, and through edicts spoke with the force of law. Each governor was accompanied by a staff of legates appointed by the Senate, by a military guard, and by an army of clerks. A distinction was made between imperial provinces, which the emperor retained under his direct control, and senatorial provinces, which were left to the Senate. The creation of provinces had far-reaching consequences both for Rome and for the fate of the empire. In the short run, Rome thrived mightily from the vast influx of tribute and from the constant traffic in people and goods. In the long run, through the steady internal consolidation of the provinces, the capital was squeezed from the sources of wealth and power. Over four centuries, Mother Rome was gradually rendered redundant by her own children. As Rome waned, the provinces waxed. In the first stage, provincial elites supplied the droves of newcomer knights and senators who swamped the traditional oligarchy and ran the empire. In the second stage, when the military forces were concentrated on an increasingly self-sufficient periphery, provincial cities such as Lugdunum, Lyon, or Mediolanum, Milan, flourished in competition with Rome. Political life was plagued by the rivalries of provincial generals, many of whom became emperors. In the third stage, the links between the periphery and Rome were weakened to the point where the provinces began to claim autonomous status. Especially in the west, the fruit was ready to fall from the tree. The centrifugal shift of power and resources was one of the underlying causes of the empire's later distress. The empire's finances, like its provinces, were split into two sectors. The Aerarium of the Senate was the successor to the Republican treasury in the Temple of Saturn and Ops. The Imperial Fiscus was an innovation of Augustus. 
In theory, it was separate from the emperor's private property, the Patrimonium Caesaris. In practice, the boundaries were not respected. The main items of income included rent from the state lands in Italy, tribute from the provinces, portaria or gate dues, the state monopoly in salt, the mint, direct taxes on slaves, manumissions and inheritance, and extraordinary loans. Apart from the army, the main items of expenditure included religious ceremonies, public works, administration, poor relief and the corn dole, and the imperial court. In time, imperial agents took over all tax collecting outside Rome. The army was gradually increased in size and strength, reaching a maximum in 31 BC of almost 60 legions. After Actium, the empire's permanent defence force consisted of 28 legions of approximately 6,000 professionals apiece. The navy maintained squadrons on the Rhine and the Danube, as well as in the Mediterranean. From 2 BC, Augustus initiated the nine cohorts of the elite Praetorian lifeguard, based in Rome. The soldiers were paid 720 denarii per annum for a Praetorian, 300 denarii for a cavalryman, 225 denarii for a legionary, and they served for 20 years. The legions were known by number and by name. Augustus retained the sequential numbering used both by his own and by Mark Antony's army, awarding distinctive names to legions with the same number. Hence there was Legio III Augusta and a Legio III Serenaica, a Legio VI Victris and a Legio VI Ferrata. Several legions possessed the number one, since emperors liked to give seniority to units raised by themselves. Legions which were destroyed in battle, such as the 17th, 18th, and 19th lost in Germany, or the Legio IX Hispana, wiped out in Britain in AD 120, were never restored. The Limes, the frontier line, was a vital feature of the empire's defence. It was not, as is sometimes supposed, an impenetrable barrier. From the military point of view, it was more of a cordon, or series of parallel cordons, which, whilst deterring casual incursions, would trigger active countermeasures as soon as it was seriously breached. It was a line which normally could only be crossed by paying portaria, and by accepting the Empire's authority. It was, above all, a marker which left no one in doubt as to which lands were subject to Roman jurisdiction and which were not. Its most important characteristic was its continuity. It ran uphill and down dale without a break, and along all frontier rivers and coasts. In places, as in Britain, it took the form of a great wall on the Chinese model. Elsewhere it might carry a wooden stockade atop earthworks, or a string of linked coastal forts, or, as in Africa, blocks of fortified farmhouses facing the desert interior. Its guarded crossing points were clearly marked with gates and roadways. They naturally became the focus for towns and cities which grew round the military camps and markets which the upkeep of the frontier required. Thanks to the Limes, Rome could manage its relations with the barbarians in an orderly fashion. Throughout the empire, barbarian officers and auxiliaries served with the Roman army, and barbarian tribes were settled by agreement in the imperial provinces. The Romanization of barbarians and the barbarization of Romans were processes that had been operating since the earliest conquests of the Republic in Italy. After all, Caesar's trousered senators were Romans of Celtic origin who still liked to wear their native leggings under their togas. Societies, it has been said, rot from the head down like dead fish. Certainly, the list of early emperors contains more than its share of degenerates. The emperor Tiberius, reigned AD 14 to 37, adopted son of Augustus, left Rome for Capri to practice his cruelties and perversions. Under him, mass proscriptions returned to fashion, fueled by the deadly work of the delatores or informers. Caligula, reigned 37 to 41, ordered himself deified in his lifetime and appointed his horse to a consulship. It was his habit to commit incest with each of his three sisters in turn, Suetonius wrote, and at large banquets when his wife reclined above him, he placed them all in turn below him. 
Because of his baldness and hairiness, he announced that it was a capital offence for anyone to mention goats in any context. He succumbed to an assassin who struck, appropriately, at his genitals. Claudius, reigned forty-one to fifty-four, who married two murderous wives, Messalina and Agrippina, was poisoned by a toadstool sauce mixed with his mushrooms. The Emperor Nero, reigned fifty-four to sixty-eight, an obsessive aesthete and sybarite, disposed of his mother by having her stabbed after an attempted drowning miscarried. He murdered his aunt by administering a laxative of fatal strength, executed his first wife on a false charge of adultery, and kicked his pregnant second wife to death. Not satisfied with seducing free-born boys and married women, wrote Suetonius, he raped the Vestal Virgin Rubria. Then, having tried to turn the boy Sporus into a girl by castration, he went through a wedding ceremony with him, dowry, bridal veil, and all, which the whole court attended, then brought him home and treated him as a wife. The world would have been a happier place had Nero's father, Domitius, married the same sort of a wife. In the end, he committed suicide, with the words, Qualis artifex pereo, what an artist perishes in me. The Emperor Galba, reigned sixty-eight to nine, a military man, was killed by the mutinous military in the year of the four emperors, as were his successors Otho and Vitellius. Vespasian, reigned sixty-nine to seventy-nine, son of a provincial tax-gatherer, succeeded in his main aim, to die on his feet. His last words were, Dear me, I must be turning into a god. Titus, reigned seventy-nine to eighty-one, was supposedly poisoned by his brother, after a reign of unusual felicity marred only by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. The supposed poisoner, the Emperor Domitian, reigned eighty-one to ninety-six, was stabbed to death by his wife and her accomplices. Eight of the ten immediate successors of Augustus had died a nasty death. Yet Rome's Indian summer still lay ahead. If a man were called to fix the period in the history of the world during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, wrote Gibbon, he would, without hesitation, name that which elapsed from the death of Domitian to the accession of Commodus. Under the emperors Nerva, reigned ninety-six to eight, Trajan, reigned ninety-eight to one hundred seventeen, Hadrian, reigned one hundred seventeen to thirty-eight, Antoninus Pius, reigned 138 to 61, and Marcus Aurelius, reigned 161 to 80, the empire not only reached its greatest geographical extent, but enjoyed an unrivaled era of calm and stability. Nerva initiated the tradition of poor relief. Trajan was an honest, indefatigable soldier, Hadrian a builder and patron of the arts. Of Antoninus Pius, Gibbon wrote, his reign is marked by the rare advantage of furnishing very few materials for history, which is, indeed, little more than the register of the crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. The minutiae of imperial administration during its heyday have survived in the voluminous correspondence of the Emperor Trajan with Pliny the Younger, administrator of Bithynia Pontus. Pliny Nicaea has expended ten million cestuses on a theatre that was tottering, and great sums on a gymnasium that was burned. At Clodiopolis they are excavating a bathhouse at the foot of the mountain. What am I to do? Trajan. You are on the spot. Decide for yourself. As for architects, we at Rome send to Greece for them. You should find some where you are. Pliny. The money due to the towns of the province has been called in, and no borrowers at twelve per cent are to be found. Ought I to reduce the rate of interest, or compel the decurions to borrow the money in equal shares? Trajan. Put the interest low enough to attract borrowers, but do not force anyone to borrow. Such a course would be inconsistent with the temper of our century. Pliny. Byzantium has a legionary centurion sent by the legatus of Lower Moesia to watch over its privileges. Juliopolis requests the same favour. Trajan. Byzantium is a great city, but if I give such help to Juliopolis, all small towns will want the same thing. Pliny. A great fire has devastated Nicomedia. Would it be in order to establish a society of 150 firemen? Trajan. No. 
Corporations, whatever they're called, are sure to become political associations. Pliny. I have never been present at the resolutions concerning the Christians, therefore I know not for what causes they may be objects of punishment. Are those who retract to be pardoned? Must they be punished for their profession alone? Trajan. The Christians need not be sought out. If they are brought into your presence and convicted, they must be punished. But anonymous information against them should not carry any weight in the charges. With Marcus Aurelius, reigned 161-80, Rome received a true philosopher king. A disciple of Epictetus, he trained himself to withstand the rigours of constant campaigning, the burdens of office, and the demands of a profligate family. His notes to myself, known as his meditations, exude all the higher sentiments. What peculiar distinction remains for a wise and good man, but to be easy and contented under every event of human life, not to offend the divine principle that resides in his soul, nor to disturb the tranquillity of his mind by a variety of fantastical pursuits, to observe a strict regard to truth in his words and justice in his actions, and though all mankind should conspire to question his integrity and modesty, he is not offended at their incredulity, nor yet deviates from the path which leads him to the true end of life, at which every one should endeavour to arrive with a clear conscience, undaunted and prepared for his dissolution, resigned to his fate without murmuring or reluctance. Marcus Aurelius had a marvellous sense of who and where he was. As the Emperor Antoninus, Rome is my city and my country, but as a man I am a citizen of the world. Asia and Europe are mere corners of the globe, the great ocean a mere drop of water. Mount Athos is a grain of sand in the universe. The present instant of time is only a point compared to eternity. All things here are diminutive, subject to change and decay. Yet all things proceed from the one intelligent cause. By the mid-third century, the Roman Empire was showing all the outward symptoms of an inner wasting disease. Political decadence was apparent in the lack of resolve at the centre, and in disorder on the periphery. In the ninety years from A.D. 180, no fewer than eighty short-lived emperors claimed the purple, by right or by usurpation. The reign of Gallienus, wrote Gibbon, produced only nineteen pretenders to the throne. The rapid and perpetual transitions from the cottage to the throne, and from the throne to the grave, might have amused an indifferent philosopher. The army dictated to its civilian masters with impunity. The barbarians flooded over the limes, often unchecked. The raids of the Goths turned into permanent occupations. In 268, they sacked Athens. One breakaway empire, under a certain Postumus, appeared in central Gaul and another in Palmyra. The difficulty of enforcing the cult of worthless or transient emperors led to recurrent persecution of the growing Christian sect. From 250 to 265, plague raged in many regions. For a time, five thousand people a day were dying in Rome alone. Famine followed the plague. Severe price inflation set in, accompanied by a seriously debased coinage. Marcus Aurelius had issued an imperial silver coin of 75% purity. Under Gallienus, reigned 260-8, a century later, it was 95% impure. Tax revenues slumped. The imperial authorities concentrated resources in the frontier provinces. Elsewhere, many provincial centres declined. Amphitheatres were demolished to provide stone for defensive walls. Even under Diocletian, reigned 284 to 305, whose twenty-one years have been seen as the founding of a new empire, all was far from well. The Tetrarchy, or Rule of Four, which divided the empire into two halves, each with its own Augustus and its own deputy Caesar, facilitated administration and frontier defence. The army was greatly increased, but so was the bureaucracy. The rise in prices was controlled, but not the fall in population. The Christian persecutions continued. In 304, a great triumph was organised in Rome, but it was the last. One year later, Diocletian abdicated, retiring to his native Dalmatia. Flavius Valerius Constantinus, reigned 306-37, later called Constantine the Great, 
was born at Nysus in Moesia Superior, that is, Nice in modern Serbia, not, as Gibbon says, in Dacia. His father, Constantius Chlorus, Diocletian's western Caesar, died at Eboracum, York, soon after succeeding to the purple. His mother, Helena, was a British Christian, revered in legend as the discoverer of the true cross. Constantine reunited the two parts of the divided empire, and, in the Edict of Milan, proclaimed general religious toleration. At two crucial moments of his career, he claimed to have had a vision. Initially, the vision was said to have been of Apollo, later of a cross, together with the words, By this you will conquer. He quarrelled with the citizens of Rome, and determined to move his capital to the shores of the Bosphorus. On his deathbed, he was formally baptised into Christianity. In this way, at the moment of its emperor's Christian conversion, Rome ceased to be the centre of the empire which it had created. Christianity In its origins, Christianity was not a European religion. Like Judaism and Islam, to which it is related, it came from Western Asia, and Europe did not become its main area of concentration for several centuries. Jesus of Nazareth, approximately 5 BC to 33 AD, Jewish nonconformist and itinerant preacher, was born in the Roman province of Judea in the middle of the reign of Augustus. He was executed in Jerusalem by crucifixion during the reign of Tiberius, 14 to 37 AD, and the procuratorship of Pontius Pilatus, praenomen unknown, a Roman knight who may later have served at Vienna, Vienne in Gaul. Reportedly, Though no fault was found in him, the procurator acquiesced in the demands of the Jewish Sanhedrin to put him to death. Apart from four short Gospels, whose evidence is partly repetitive and partly contradictory, few facts are known about the life of Jesus. There is no historical document which mentions him, and there is no trace of him in Roman literary sources. He did not even attract major notice from the Jewish writers of the period, such as Josephus or Philo. His personal teaching is known only from a score of parables, from his sayings during the various incidents and miracles of his ministry, from his talks with the apostles, and from a handful of key pronouncements, his Sermon on the Mount, his answers in the temple and at his trial, his discourse at the Last Supper, his words on the cross. He claimed to be the Messiah, the long-foretold saviour of the Jewish scriptures, but he reduced the vast corpus of those scriptures to two simple commandments. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. Jesus did not challenge the secular authorities, stressing on several occasions, My kingdom is not of this world. When he died, he left no organization, no church or priesthood, no political testament, no gospel. Indeed, just the enigmatic instruction to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. That Christianity should have become the official religion of the Roman Empire could hardly have been foreseen. For generations of Christian believers in later times, the triumph of Christianity was simply the will of God. It was not seriously questioned or analyzed. But for many Romans in the early centuries, it must have presented a real puzzle. Jesus was long regarded as an obscure local phenomenon. His followers, whose beliefs were confused by outsiders with Judaism, were unlikely candidates to found a religion of universal appeal. The faith of slaves and simple fishermen offered no advantage for class or sectional interest. Their gospel, which made such a clear distinction between the spiritual kingdom of God and the rule of Caesar, seemed to have resigned in advance from all secular ambitions. Even when they became more numerous and were repressed for refusing to participate in the imperial cult, Christians could hardly be seen as a general menace. Of course, one may see with hindsight that Christianity's emphasis on the inner life 
was filling a spiritual void to which the Roman lifestyle gave no relief. Also that the Christian doctrine of redemption and the triumph over death must have exerted great attractions. But one can also understand the bafflement of imperial officials, like Pliny the Younger in Bithynia. It is one thing to decide that the ancient world was ripe for a new salvationist religion. It is quite another to explain why the void should have been filled by Christianity than by half a dozen other candidates. Of all the sceptics writing about the rise of the Christian church, none was more sceptical than Edward Gibbon. Gibbon's Decline and Fall contains on the one hand the most magnificent historical prose in the English language, and on the other hand the most sustained polemic against the church's departure from Christian principles. He conducted what he called a candid but rational inquiry into the progress and establishment of a pure and humble religion, which finally erected the triumphant banner of the cross on the ruins of the capital. The spread of Christianity was greatly facilitated by the Pax Romana. Within three decades of Christ's crucifixion, Christian communities were established in most of the great cities of the eastern Mediterranean. St. Paul, whose writings constitute the greater part of the New Testament, and whose journeys were the first pastoral visit of a Christian leader, was largely concerned with the Greek-speaking cities of the East. St. Peter, Christ's closest disciple, is said to have sailed to Rome and to have been martyred there approximately A.D. 68. From Rome, the gospel travelled to every province of the empire, from Iberia to Armenia. The key figure was, without doubt, Saul of Tarsus, died approximately 65, known as St. Paul. Born a Jew and educated as a Pharisee, he took part in early Jewish persecutions of Christ's followers. He was present at the stoning of the first Christian martyr, Stephen, in Jerusalem, approximately thirty-five. But then, after his sudden conversion on the road to Damascus, he received baptism and became the most energetic proselyte of the New Way. His three missionary journeys were the single most important stimulus to its growth. He met with varying success. In Athens, in 53, where he found an altar to the unknown God, he was received with hostility by the Jews and with suspicion by the Greeks. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is? For the Athenians spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Acts chapter 17 verses 18 through 21. He sojourned twice in more congenial company at Corinth, where he probably wrote the epistle to the Romans. On returning to Jerusalem, he was accused of transgressing the Jewish law, but as Roman citizen, appealed for trial in Rome. He is generally thought to have perished in Rome during the persecutions of Nero. St. Paul's contribution was crucial on two separate counts. On the one hand, as the apostle of the Gentiles, he established the principle that the new way was not the tribal preserve of Jews, that it was open to all comers. There shall be neither Jew nor Gentile, neither bond nor free. On the other hand, he laid the foundations of all subsequent Christian theology. Sinful humanity is redeemed by divine grace through Christ, whose resurrection abrogated the old law and ushered in the new era of the Spirit. Christ is more than the Messiah, he is the Son of God, identified with the Church in his mystical body, which is shared by the faithful through repentance and the sacraments until the second coming. Jesus was uniquely the source of its inspiration, but it was St. Paul who founded Christianity as a coherent religion. The Jewish origins of Christianity have had lasting consequences, especially on relations between Christians and Jews. Following the Jewish revolt of A.D. 70, the Jewish diaspora began to spread far and wide through the empire. Judaism ceased to be concentrated in Judea, and the people of the book became a religious minority in many parts of Europe and Asia. For them, Jesus Christ was a false messiah, a usurper, a renegade. For them, the Christians were a threat and a menace, dangerous rivals who had hijacked the scriptures and who broke the sacred taboos dividing Jew from Gentile. 
For the Christians, the Jews were also a threat and a challenge. They were Christ's own people, who had nonetheless denied his divinity, and whose leaders had handed him over for execution. In popular legend, and eventually for a time in official theology, they became the Christ killers. The schism within the Judeo-Christian tradition has been generated on both sides by intense feelings of betrayal. It was inevitably more bitter than the conflicts of Christians with other religions. It is an unresolved and unresolvable quarrel within the family. From the hardline Jewish perspective, Christianity is by nature anti-Semitic, and anti-Semitism is seen as a Christian phenomenon par excellence. From the hardline Christian perspective, Judaism is by nature the seat of the Antichrist, a bad loser, the perpetual source of smears, blasphemy, and insults. Notwithstanding the doctrine of forgiveness, it is the hardest thing in the world for Christians and Jews to see themselves as partners in the same tradition. Only the most Christian of Christians can contemplate calling the Jews our elder brethren. Christianity, however, did not draw on Judaism alone. It was influenced by various Oriental religions current in the empire, and especially by Greek philosophy. The Gospel of St. John, which begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, stands in marked contrast to the other three Gospels, where this manifestly Greek doctrine of the Logos is not present. Modern scholars stress the Hellenistic as well as the Judaic context. Philo of Alexandria, a Hellenized Jew who sought to reconcile the Jewish scriptures with Platonism, holds a prominent place in this regard. The most recent research tends to suggest that Christianity and Judaism did not completely part company for perhaps two centuries. For many decades, the two overlapping communities may have shared the same messianic hopes. Judaic texts from the period 200 BC to AD 50, located in newly released sections of the Dead Sea Scrolls, bear a striking resemblance to the Christian Gospels. One assessment maintains that the final break between Christians and Jews occurred in AD 131, when the leader of the Second Jewish Revolt against Rome, Shimon Bar Kokhba, proclaimed himself the Messiah thereby severing the bond. Whatever the date of the final split, the Jewish presence alongside Christianity has never been extinguished. Every week for two millennia, the celebration of the Jewish Sabbath on Friday evening has always preceded the Christian Sabbath on Sundays. After the lighting of the candles and the prayers for peace, the service culminates in the opening of the Ark of the Covenant and a reading from the Book of the Law, the Torah. The Torah is a tree of life to those who hold it fast and those who cling to it are blessed. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Eitz haim hi, la ma hazikim ba, vetom heha meusha, dera heha darke noam, vekol netivo teha shalom. Early Christianity had many rivals. In the first two centuries of the empire, the mystery cults of Isis, Sibylle, and the Persian sun god Mithras were thriving. They shared several important traits with early Christianity, including the ecstatic union with the divinity, the concept of a personal saviour or lord, and initiation rites akin to baptism. The anthropological approach to religion would stress these similarities. Gnosticism, too, had much in common with Christianity. In origin, the Gnostics were philosophers, seekers after knowledge, but they attracted a following of a more religious character. They borrowed heavily from both Judaism and increasingly from Christianity, to the point where they were sometimes regarded as a Christian sect. They held to a distinction between the Creator, or Demiurge, who was responsible for an evil world, and the Supreme Being, also in the nature of man, to a distinction between his vile physical existence and the spark of divine essence which gives people the capacity to reach for the heavenly spheres. Simon Magus is mentioned in the New Testament. Valentinus was active in Rome, approximately 136 to 65. Basilides in Alexandria. Martian founded a Gnostic sect that lasted until the 5th century. He taught that Christ's body was not real, and hence that the resurrection could not have taken place in any physical sense, and he rejected the Old Testament, 
holding that the Jewish Jehovah was incomplete without the God of love as revealed by Jesus. This docetism launched the long-running Christological debate about the true nature of Christ. The disputes between Christians and Gnostics revealed the need for a recognized canon of Scripture, which of the holy writings were God-given and which were merely man-made. This question preoccupied Christians at the turn of the second and third centuries, though the definitive statement was not made until the Festal Letter of Athanasius in 367. The core of the New Testament, the four Gospels and the thirteen letters of St. Paul, was accepted approximately 130, and the Old Testament, that is, the Hebrew canon less the Apocrypha, approximately 220. Other books, especially the Apocalypse or Revelation, were disputed much longer. Theological disputes foreshadowed the need for some form of ecclesiastical authority to resolve them. One solution was provided by Clement of Rome, who furthered the doctrine of the apostolic succession. Christian leaders had authority if they could trace their appointment to one of the twelve apostles, or to the apostles' recognized successors. Clement himself, who was probably third in line to St. Peter as bishop at Rome, based his own claim on the text, Thou art Peter, and on this rock I shall build my church. The same point was made with greater force by Bishop Irenaeus of Lyon in his writings against the Gnostics. The greatest and most ancient of churches known to all is that established at Rome by the apostles Peter and Paul. Every other church, that is, the faithful from all other parts, ought to be harmonized with Rome by virtue of the authority of its origins, and it is there that tradition derived from the apostles has been preserved. Here already was the essence of the Roman Catholic tradition. For the time being, several competing authorities prevailed, and the apostolic succession, as interpreted in Rome, never gained universal acceptance. Direct contact with Christ's apostles, however, obviously carried kudos. Apart from St. Clement, the apostolic fathers included Ignatius of Antioch, Papias of Hierapolis, and St. Polycarp of Smyrna, who was burned at the stake. The persecution of early Christians is a matter of some controversy, and its true extent cannot be disentangled from the martyrology of the most interested party. The ecclesiastical writers of the 4th and 5th centuries, wrote Gibbon, ascribed to the magistrates of Rome the same degree of implacable and unrelenting zeal which filled their own breasts. Still, fitful repressions did occur. Nero made Christians into scapegoats for the great fire of Rome in 64. This was contrary to the general toleration extended to national cults, such as Judaism, to which Christianity was judged to belong. Domitian, who demanded that he be worshipped as Dominus et Deus, executed Christian recalcitrants for atheism. Marcus Aurelius sanctioned a severe repression at Lyon in 177. But it was not until 250 that the Emperor Decius ordered that all his subjects sacrifice to the state gods on pain of death. After another interval, Diocletian ordered in 303 that all Christian churches be destroyed and all Bibles burnt. This great persecution lasted thirteen years, and was the prelude to the general toleration proclaimed in the following reign. Excessive repression had proved counterproductive. The Roman Empire's surrender to Christianity was irrigated by the blood of martyrs. The growth of clergy as a separate estate from the laity seems to have been a gradual matter. The offices of episcopus, or bishop, as communal leader, and of diaconus, or deacon, preceded that of the presbyter, or priest, with exclusive sacerdotal functions. The title of patriarch, the father of the bishops in any particular province or country, was long used very inconsistently. No special status was accorded to the Bishop of Rome. The prestige which accrued from leading the Christian community in the capital of the empire was diminished when the imperial government ceased to reside there, and it exposed the Christians of Rome to greater persecution. Throughout the early centuries there was a line of bishops on the throne of St. Peter, but they did not emerge as a leading force in the church until the fifth or some might reckon the seventh century. The fathers of the church, 
is a collective label which was used from the 4th century onwards for the Christian leaders of the preceding period. The apologists, from Aristides of Athens to Tertullian, clarified what ultimately became orthodox beliefs. Others, including Hippolytus, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and Cyprian of Carthage, were revered for their defense of the faith against pagans and heretics. The body of patristics, or writings of the fathers, is not judged to end before those of St. John Chrysostom. Heresy, of course, is a tendentious concept. It is an accusation leveled by one group of believers against another, and it can only exist if the accusers believe in their own dogmatic monopoly of the truth. In Christian history, it only emerges in the second and third centuries as the general consensus solidified. Most of the church's fathers were heretical in varying degrees. The chief heresies, as defined by later orthodoxy, included Docetism, Montanism, Novatianism, Apollinarianism, Nestorianism, Eutychianism, Arianism, Pelagianism, Donatism, Monophysitism, and Monothelitism. Of these, Arianism was specially important because it won the adherence of many communities both inside and outside the empire. Founded by Arius, a priest of Alexandria, it held that Christ, as Son of God, could not share the full divinity of God the Father. It provoked the first ecumenical council of the church, where it was condemned. But it re-emerged through the support of the Emperor Constantius II and its acceptance by several barbarian peoples, notably the Goths. It even split into three main sub-heresies, the Ammonians, the Homoians, and the Semi-Arians. It did not die out until the 6th century. Christian monasticism was entirely oriental in its beginnings. Saint Anthony of the Desert, an opponent of Arius and founder of the first Anchorite community, was yet another Alexandrian. The Christian concept and practices, therefore, which in due course were pronounced Catholic, universal, and Orthodox, correct, were the fruit of many years of debate and dispute. Their final definition awaited the work of four doctors of the Church, who were active in the late 4th century, Saints Martin, Jerome, Ambrose, and Augustine. Apart from the debate on the Logos, which soon gave precedence to the Christological issue, they centered on the doctrines of grace, atonement, and the Church, on the sacraments, baptism and Eucharist, and above all, on the Trinity. In 325, when the Emperor Constantine convened the first general council of the Church at Nicaea in Asia Minor, the 300 delegates were asked to summarize the articles of basic Christian belief. They were dominated by the party from Alexandria, especially by the anti-Arian or Trinitarian group led by Athanasius. There were only a handful of bishops from the West, including Cordoba and Lyon. The absent bishop of Rome, Sylvester I, was represented by two legates. What they produced was a combination of a baptismal formula used in Jerusalem with the famous idea of homoousius, or consubstantiality. The Nicene Creed has been binding on all Christians ever since. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things both visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, only begotten, that is, of one substance with the Father, by whom all things both in heaven and earth were made, who for us men and our salvation came down and was incarnate, became man, suffered, and rose again the third day, ascended into the heavens, cometh to judge the quick and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit. It was three hundred years since Christ had walked in Galilee. The Bosporus, 4th of November, 1079 AUC Shortly after ordering the execution of his heir apparent, the Emperor Constantine conducted a ceremony to mark the foundation of his new capital city. He laid the first stone of the western wall at the point where it meets the sea. He was attended by the Neoplatonist philosopher Sopater, who was acting as Telestes, or magician, and who cast the spells to secure the city's good fortune. Also present was Praetestatus, a pontifex from Rome, who was said to have brought the most sacred of Roman talismans, the Palladium, to be buried at the base of the founder's statue in the new forum. The sun was in the sign of Sagittarius, but the crab ruled the hour. 
Four years later, on the 11th of May, 1083, A.D. 330, fresh ceremonies inaugurated the life of the new foundation. Shortly after the execution of Sopater and of another pagan philosopher, Canonaris, who had shouted out, Do not raise yourself against our ancestors! Constantine presided at a grand inaugural festival. The city was officially named Constantinopolis and Roma Nova. Prayers to the goddess Tyche, or Fortune, the city's tutelary genius, mingled with the Christian chant of Kyrie Eleison. In the circus, by the Temple of Castor and Pollux, sumptuous games were held, but no gladiatorial contests. In the forum, the oversized statue of the emperor was unveiled. It had been made by mounting Constantine's head on an ancient colossus of Apollo, and it stood on a huge porphyry column. In all probability, a smaller gilded statue of Constantine, carrying a tiny tyche on its outstretched hand, was paraded in torchlight procession. Certainly a procession of that sort soon became an annual tradition in Constantinople on Founders' Day. The tyche carried a cross welded to her forehead. All subsequent emperors were expected to rise and to prostrate themselves before it. New coins and medals were struck. They carried the bust of Constantine, and the inscription Totius Orbis Imperator. The choice of the city's site had not been easily decided. The emperor needed a capital that would benefit from the sea routes through the Bosporus and Hellespont. He had first looked at ancient Chalcedon on the Asian shore. Then he went for ancient Ilium, Troy, whose legendary connections with the founding of Rome offered important symbolic advantages. He visited the Trojan fields, and marked out the outlines of a future city at a place revered as Hector's grave. The gates had already been erected, they can still be seen, before he changed his mind once again, crossing the water to the small town of Byzantium on the European shore, where he had recently conducted a victorious siege. At last, both the practicalities and the auguries were right. Later, legend held that Constantine traced the line of the walls in person, Striding out in front of the surveyors, spear in hand, he left his companions far behind. When one of them called out, How much further, sire? He is said to have replied mysteriously, Until he who walks before me stops walking. The transformation of little Byzantium into Constantinople the Great required works of immense size and speed. Constantine's wall ran across the peninsula from the Golden Horn to the Sea of Marmara, some two miles to the west of the ancient Acropolis. Constantine's Forum was built immediately outside Byzantium's older wall. The separate suburbs of Sikai, Galata, and of Blachanai, on opposing sides of the Golden Horn, received separate fortifications, whilst much of the old city was stripped or demolished. The graceful granite column of Claudius Gothicus, erected in AD 269 after a famous victory, was left on the point of the promontory, looking out over the sea to Asia. Constantinople, like Rome, contained seven hills, which were soon to be covered with public and private buildings. Eighty years later, a description mentions a capital or school of learning, a circus, two theatres, eight public and 153 private baths, 52 porticos, five granaries, eight aqueducts, four meeting halls, 14 churches, 14 palaces, and 4,388 listed residences of outstanding architectural merit. To adorn this megalopolis, vast numbers of art treasures were brought from Greece, the Pythian Apollo, the Samian Hera, the Olympian, the Pallas of Rhodian Lindos. 427 statues were assembled to stand in front of St. Sophia alone. Colonists were forcibly imported from all the neighbouring settlements. In order to feed them, and to supply the annual dole, the grain fleets of Egypt, Syria, and Asia Minor were redirected. Constantinople had to be launched in record time. Its neighbours were vandalised, emptied, and starved. The character of Constantine has attracted much speculation. As the first Christian emperor, he became the subject of shameless hagiography. Speech and reason stand mute, wrote Eusebius of Caesarea, the first biographer. When I gaze in spirit upon this thrice-blessed soul, united with God, free of all mortal dross, in robes gleaming like lightning, and in ever-radiant diadem. 
Yet to his detractors he was an odious hypocrite, a tyrant and murderer, whose reputation was only burnished by a deathbed conversion and by the forgeries of the subsequent era. Gibbon, who was allergic to Christian legends, nonetheless preferred a generous interpretation, stressing talents marred only by the extravagances of his old age. Constantine was tall and majestic, dexterous, intrepid in war, affable in peace, and tempered by habitual prudence. He deserved the appellation of the first emperor who publicly professed the Christian religion. Despite his mother's example, it is a moot point how far Constantine was a practicing Christian. He publicly confessed his debt to the one God, but most of his actions, including the Edict of Toleration, could equally be explained by the policy of a tolerant pagan. During the festivities at Constantinople, he was most interested in promoting the worship of himself. At the same time, he was a devoted patron of church building, not least in Rome, where both St. Peter's and the Basilica Constantiniana, St. John Lateran, were his foundations. In 321, he enforced the general observance of Sunday as a day of rest. As was common, he long deferred his formal baptism, being christened by Bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia, an Arian, on his deathbed. He gave no special favours to the Bishop of Rome. Constantine basked in the deepening theatricality of the late imperial cult. As the Sol Invictus, the unconquered son, he inherited Diocletian's practice of the Adoratio Purpurae, the adoration of the purple, and he surrounded himself with the obsequious language of Oriental despotism. Public art, as illustrated on the friezes of the Arch of Constantine in Rome, was growing more stiff and formal. Intellectual life at Constantine's court was dominated by the drive to reconcile the rising tide of Christianity with traditional culture. Constantine relied on the convert rhetorician Lactantius, whom he had known at Trier, both to teach his son Crispus and, in the Divinia Institutiones, to set out a systematic account of the Christian worldview. The state of the Christian religion in Constantine's reign must be nicely gauged. After the Edict of Milan, 313, the Church benefited from official toleration and a stable revenue, and, with the Nicene Creed, from a coherent doctrine. Yet it was still little more than a minority sect in the early stages of institutional growth. There was no supreme ecclesiastical authority. The scriptural canon was not fully agreed. None of the greatest of the Church Fathers, from John Chrysostom to Augustine, had yet been born. The greatest of the heresiarchs, Arius, enjoyed considerable influence at the imperial court, being recalled from exile in 334. Indeed, Arianism was destined to become dominant in the succeeding reign. The Donatists in Africa had recently been suppressed. The only countries where Christianity was growing beyond the empire were Armenia and Abyssinia. The age of sporadic persecutions was past, but the divisions of Christendom suspended the ruin of paganism. In 330, the empire was in healthier shape than for many decades. East and West had been reunited. The general peace held. Constantine's reforms have been dismissed as a timid policy of dividing whatever is united, of reducing whatever is eminent, of dreading every active power, of expecting that the most feeble will prove the most obedient. At least they gave the empire a breathing space. The army was brought under control by dividing the jurisdiction of the Praetorian prefects into rival masterships of cavalry and infantry, by distinguishing the elite Palatine troops from the second-rate forces on the frontier, and by the widespread introduction of barbarian officers and auxiliaries. The emperor's lavish building projects and his repair of the road and postal system was paid for by an oppressive land tax. A far-flung network of imperial messengers who acted as official spies kept potential opponents in fear. Constantine had no plan for avoiding the perennial problems of succession. He had killed his eldest son, Crispus, on rumours of a Roman plot. But this still left him with three more sons, Constantine, Constantius and Constance, a favoured nephew and three brothers. Two years before his death, he divided the empire between them, raising his sons to the rank of Caesar. They ill repaid his generosity. Constantine II was killed whilst invading the territory of Constance. 
Constance was killed by the usurper Maxentius. Constantius II, having initiated a massacre of his remaining relatives, was left to win the empire from Maxentius. Following the chaos of the previous century, the economy of the empire was restored to a modicum of prosperity and stability. Civil munificence was diminished from earlier levels, but provincial cities, especially on the frontier zones of Central Europe, retained a solid measure of pride in their public works. Diocletian's tax reforms, based on assessments of agricultural labour, had provided the basis for regular budgetary planning. They also swelled the imperial bureaucracy. Complaints were heard about tax collectors outnumbering taxpayers. The gold coinage, struck at the rate of 60 coins per pound of bullion, offset the debasement of copper coins and laid the foundations of Byzantium's stable currency. The empire's frontiers were holding firm. In fact, for a time they were slightly expanded. The valuable province of Armenia had been wrested from Persia in 297, and through Romanization and Christianization was laying the basis of a permanent and distinctive culture. To facilitate administration, the empire was divided into the four prefectures of Oriens, Constantinople, Illyricum, Sirmium, Italia et Africa, Milan, and Gaul, Trier. In the west, in Britain, the depredations of the Picts and Scots had been held at bay by the expedition of Constantine's father. The separatist emperors of Britain, Corosius and Alectus, had been brought to heel. In the east, Sassanid Persia threatened, but did not overrun. In the south, Moorish tribes were pressing on Roman Africa. The most important changes to Europe's political and ethnic map were proceeding beyond the empire's limits and beyond the reach of documentary history. The huge region of Celtic supremacy was dwindling fast. The Celts' western strongholds in Britain and Gaul were heavily Romanized. Their homelands in the centre were being overrun, absorbed or destroyed by the movement of Germanic and Slavonic tribes. The Franks were already settled on either side of the Rhine frontier. The Goths had completed their long march from the Vistula to the Dnieper. The Slavs were drifting westwards towards the centre, where Celtic Bohemia was heading for Slavicization. The Balts already lived on the Baltic. The Finno-Ugrians, long since divided, were well on their way to their future territories. The Finns were on station on the Volga-Baltic bridge. The Magyars were settled at one of their many halts along the southern steppes. The nomads and the sea raiders remained, for the time being, along the outer periphery. The Scythians were no more than a distant memory. The Huns were still in Central Asia. The Norsemen were already in Norway, as shown by the oldest of their runic inscriptions. Constantine's view of the outside world would have been governed by the state of Roman communications. China, which was still disunited by the chaos of the recent Three Kingdom period, was known through the fragile contacts of the Silk Route. It had been visited in AD 284 by the ambassadors of Diocletian. It was nominally subject to the Qin dynasty, whose influence was slowly spreading from north to south. It had largely abandoned the philosophy of Confucius and, through the flowering of Buddhism, was building strong cultural ties with India. India, whose northern region had just come under the rule of the Gupta emperors, the greatest patrons of Hindu art and culture, was much closer to Rome and was much better known. News of the crowning of Chandragupta I at Magadha in 320 would almost certainly have reached Constantinople via Egypt. Egypt was also the source of news from Abyssinia, which was the target of Christian missions from Syria and Alexandria. The Sassanid Empire of Persia, which shared a long and fragile frontier with Rome, was the object of intense interest. It had rejected the Hellenism of the previous era and passed into a phase of militant Zoroastrianism. Mani, the prophet of dualist Manichaeanism, who had sought to marry Zoroaster's principles with those of Christianity, had been executed some sixty years before. The boy king, Shapur II, 310 to 79, was still in the power of his priests and magnatial guardians, who, apart from completing the compilation of the Holy Scriptures, the Avesta, were conducting a thorough persecution of all dissenters. The Roman Persian peace, which had not been broken for thirty-three years, was due to hold until Constantine's death. The founding of Constantinople in 330,
which was a clear-cut event, seems to support the widespread practice of taking the reign of Constantine as the dividing line between the ancient and the medieval periods. In this, it has to vie with a number of competing dates, with 392 and the accession of Theodosius I, the first emperor whose empire was exclusively Christian, with 476 and the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West, with 622 and the rise of Islam, which divided the former Roman world into Muslim and Christian spheres, and with 800 and Charlemagne's restoration of a Christian empire in the West. If this sort of dividing line were to be taken seriously, there is a danger that the young Constantine might be judged an ancient and the older Constantine a medieval. Much more important is the overall balance at any given time between the legacy of the past and the sum total of innovations, what professional historians sometimes call the continuities and the discontinuities. On this basis, one can state with some confidence that no such tipping of an important balance occurred in Constantinople in AD 330. The city of Rome was inevitably diminished, not least when Constantine abolished the Praetorian Guard and raised their Roman headquarters. But Rome's practical importance had declined long since. In the long run it actually benefited. By losing control of an empire which was set to crumble, it ensured that it would not be linked to the empire's fate. It was to find a new and lasting role as the home of Christianity's most powerful hierarch. The current Bishop of Rome, however, was far from assertive. Sylvester I attended neither the Council of Arles, which Constantine convened in 314 to end the Donatist quarrel, nor the General Council of Nicaea. Most historians would agree that the core of Greco-Roman civilization, as solidified in the later phases of the ancient world, lay first and foremost in the empire, and secondly in the complex cultural pluralism which it patronized and tolerated. The core of medieval civilization, in contrast, lay in the community of Christendom and its exclusively Christian culture. It developed through the mingling of ex-Roman and non-Roman peoples on a territorial base that coincided with that of the former empire only in part. In 330, very few of the processes which led from the one to the other had even begun. Constantine himself was no European. One must not forget the sequence of events. The span of time which separated Constantine from Charlemagne was greater than that which separated Constantine from Caesar and Augustus. It was equal to the span which encompasses the whole of modern history, from the Renaissance and Reformation to the present. Yet Constantine did plant the seed of one historic notion, that the Christian religion was compatible with politics. Christ himself had categorically rejected political involvement, and prior to Constantine, Christians had not sought to assume power as a means of furthering their cause. After Constantine, Christianity and high politics went hand in hand. This, in the eyes of the purists, was the moment of corruption. Appropriately enough, therefore, Constantinople soon became the founding seat of Christian power. It was made the official capital of the Roman Empire in 331, on the first anniversary of its inauguration, and it retained the distinction for more than a thousand years. Within one or two generations it assumed a predominantly Christian character, with the churches outnumbering the temples, until the temples were eventually banned. It was the source, and later the heart, of the Byzantine state, the senior branch of medieval Christendom, and despite the devotees of Western civilization, an essential constituent of European history. Auk Roman chronology was based on the conventional date for the founding of the city. Zero year was long taken to be equivalent to 750 BC. All subsequent dates were calculated auc, ab urbe condita, from the founding of the city. A modified scheme came into being in the first century BC, when the computations of M. Terentius Varro, the most learned of the Romans, made the city's foundation equivalent to 753 BC. By Awaro's time, however, most Romans had also become accustomed to an alternative system, which referred not to the date of the year, but to the names of the annual consuls. Both in official records and in everyday conversations, they talked of the year of C. Terentius Waro and L. Emilius Paulus, 216 BC, or of 
the seven consulships of C. Marius, 107, 104, 103, 102, 101, 100, and 86 BC. One needed a detailed grasp of Roman history to follow the references. Few educated people would not have known that the elder Waro and Aemilius Paulus had commanded the Roman army at the disaster of Cannae. Fortunately, the two systems were compatible. Each of them could be invoked to support the other. For example, the rise and fall of G. Julius Caesar could be calculated with reference to the following. AUC, 695. Consulship, M. Calpurnius Bibulus and C. Julius Caesar I, B.C. 59. AUC, 705. C. Claudius Marcellus and L. Cornelius Lentulus Crus, B.C. 49. AUC, 706. C. Julius Caesar II and P. Servilius Watia Isoricus, B.C. 48. AUC, 707. Q. Rufius Calenus and P. Watinius, B.C. 47. AUC, 708. C. Julius Caesar III and M. Aemilius Lepidus, B.C. 46. AUC, 709. C. Julius Caesar IV, sole consul, B.C. 45. AUC, 710. C. Julius Caesar V, and M. Antonius, B.C. 44. AUC 711. C. Vibius Panza and A. Hirtius, both killed, replaced by the triumvirate of M. Antonius, G. Octavianus, and M. Aemilius Lepidus, B.C. 43. It was Caesar who realized that the existing calendar was becoming inoperable, the old Roman year contained only 304 days divided into 10 months, beginning on 9 Cal Maius or the 21st of April. The extra months of Ianorius and Februarius had been invented as stopgaps. In 708 AUC, therefore, during Caesar's third consulship, drastic reforms were introduced. The current year was prolonged by 151 days so that the new year could begin on the 1st of January 707 AUC, 45 BC, and run over 12 months of 365 days until the 31st of December. Further adjustments were made under Augustus in 737 AUC, AD 4, when the old 5th and 6th months, Quintilus and Sextilus, were renamed Julius, after Caesar, and Augustus and the four yearly bisextile, or leap day, was introduced. The resultant Julian year of 365 and a quarter days was misaligned with the earth only by the tiny margin of 11 minutes 12 seconds, and remained in universal use until A.D. 1582. Nonetheless, consuls continued to be appointed throughout the Principate, and the custom of counting years by consulships was preserved with them. The renal years of the emperors were not usually invoked. In the later empire, when consulships were abolished, the AUC system was supported by references to the 15-year tax cycle of indictions. When the Christian era finally came into use in the mid-6th century AD, the Roman era had been in operation for 13 centuries. Etruscaria At Santa Severa, ancient Pyrgi, near Rome, Archaeologists have uncovered two Etruscan temples overlooking the sea. The find, made in 1957-64, to was exceptional. It was the first Etruscan site that offered something other than tombs. Dated approximately 500 BC, it yielded three wafer-thin gold tablets, with inscriptions in Punic and Etruscan. To the Lady Astarte, this is the sacred place made and given by Thefarie Velianus, king of Sisra, in the month of the sacrifice of the sun, in the third year of his reign, in the month of Kir, of the day of the burial of the divinity, and the years of the statue of the goddess are as many as these stars. Pyrgi served as harbour to the nearby town of Sisra, modern Kerveteri, and King Thefarie, or Tiberius, had chosen to worship a Carthaginian goddess. The temples must have been dedicated sometime after the abortive Etruscan raid on Greek Cumae on the Bay of Naples, perhaps within a decade of the revolt of Rome against Etruscan overlordship. 
The Etruscans flourished in Tuscany and Umbria from 700 to 100 BC. They claimed to be immigrants from Asia Minor. Their alphabet, derived from the Greek, is easily read, but their language has not been fully deciphered. After the initial era of princes, they passed in the 6th century into the era of mercantile city-states on the Greek model. Their grave chambers are covered in fine, stylized pictorial murals, often depicting banquets of the dead. The little that is known about them derives either from archaeology or from hostile Roman accounts of a later age, when they are painted as gluttons, lechers, and religious devotees. From the first Etruscan exhibition in London in 1837 to its most recent successor in Paris in 1992, many attempts have been made to interest the European public in Etruscology. The greatest stimulus came in 1828-36, to 36, from the opening of tombs at Vulci, Caere, and Tarquinia, then in the Papal States. But the dominant mode has been one of romantic speculation. I Medici, who organized the first investigations, claimed to be of Etruscan descent. In the 18th century, Josiah Wedgwood named his pottery Etruria, unaware that the fashionable Etruscan style was of Greek, not Etruscan origin. Prosper Merrimay was beguiled by the mystery of the Etruscans, as was the Victorian pioneer George Dennis, and so was D. H. Lawrence. The things the Etruscans did in their easy centuries were as natural as breathing, and that is the true Etruscan quality, ease, naturalness, and an abundance of life, and death was just a natural continuance of the fullness of life. This is not Etruscology, it is Etruscaria, or, as the French would say, Etruscomani. Egnatia. Of all the Roman roads, the Via Egnatia proved to be one of the most vital. Built in the 2nd century BC, it linked Rome with Byzantium, and hence, in a later age, the Western with the Eastern Empire. It took its name from the city of Egnatia in Apulia, the site of a miraculous fiery altar, and a main stage between Rome and the Adriatic port of Brindisium. In Italy, it provided an alternative route to the older Via Appia, which reached the same destination through Beneventum and Tarentum. On the eastern Adriatic shore, its starting point was at Diraccion, Durus, with a feeder road from Apollonia. It crossed the province of Macedonia, passing Lycnidos, Ocrid, and Pella to reach Thessalonica. It skirted the Chalcidice Peninsula at Amphipolis and Philippi, before terminating at Dipsella on the Hebros Maritza in Thrace. The final section, Inter Byzantium, did not originally carry the name of Egnatia, and made a long inland detour to avoid the coastal lagoons. The direct route between Region and Hebdomon was only paved by Justinian I, bringing the traveller to the Golden Gate of Constantinople after twenty days and over five hundred miles. It was proverbial that all roads lead to Rome, but all roads led away from Rome as well. Aquila The eagle's ranking as king of the birds is as ancient as the lion's as king of the beasts. In Roman law, it was Jupiter's stormbird, carrier of the thunderbolt. Eagles figured as emblems of power and majesty in Babylon and Persia, and were adopted by the Roman general Marius after his oriental conquests. The legions of the Roman Empire marched behind eagle ensigns, and Roman consuls carried eagle-tipped scepters. In Slavonic folklore, the three brothers, Lech, Czech, and Rus, set out to find their fortune. Rus went to the east, Czech to the south to Bohemia, whilst Lech crossed the plain to the west. Lech stopped beside a lake under a great tree where a white eagle had built its nest. He was the father of the Poles, and Gniezna, the eagle's nest, was their first home. In Wales, too, the peak of Mount Snowdon, the heart of the national homeland, is called Erari, the place of eagles. In Christian symbolism, the eagle is associated with St. John the Evangelist, alongside the angel and axe of St. Matthew, the bull of St. Luke, and the lion of St. Mark. It appears on the lecterns of churches, upholding the Bible on its outspread wings to repel the serpent of falsehood. According to St. Jerome, it was the emblem of the Ascension. Throughout European history, 
the imperial eagle has been co-opted by rulers who claimed superiority over their fellow princes. Charlemagne wore an eagle-embossed cloak, and Canute the Great was buried in one. Both Napoleon I and Napoleon III used eagle symbolism with relish. Napoleon's heir, the King of Rome, received the sobriquet of Asion, or Eaglet. Only the British, to be different, betrayed no aquiline interests. Eagles recur throughout European heraldry, having been present at an earlier date in Islamic insignia. Both Serbia and Poland boast a white eagle, the Polish one crowned, and temporarily uncrowned by the communist regime. Both Tyrol and Brandenburg, Prussia, sported a red eagle, the Swedish province of Varmland, a blue one. The Federal Republic of Germany took a single stylized black eagle from the city arms of Aachen. Under the dynasty of the Paleologues, the Byzantine Empire took on the emblem of a black, double-headed spread eagle, symbol of the Roman succession in East and West. In due course, this passed to the Tsars of Moscow, the Third Rome, to the Holy Roman Emperors in Germany, and to the Habsburgs of Austria. Ein Adler fängt keine Mücken, runs the German proverb. An eagle catches no midges. Aquincum Like neighbouring Carnuntum, Aquincum started life as a legionary camp on the Danube in the region of Tiberias. It soon attracted a cluster of Canabai, or informal settlements, and in the 2nd century AD was given the formal status of municipium. As a gateway to the empire from the plains of Pannonia, it thrived mightily, both as a legionary base and as a commercial centre. Its prosperity is reflected in its twin amphitheatres, military and civilian, and the mural paintings which adorned its more opulent houses. The ruins of Aquincum lie in the suburbs of modern Budapest. Like the English, the Hungarians had no direct experience of the Roman world, having migrated to their present homeland after the empire's fall, but they cherished their Roman heritage all the more. Arikia A dozen miles to the south of Rome, in a crater amidst the Alban hills, lies Lake Nemi, the Lake of the Grove. In imperial times, the nearby village of Nemi was called Arikia, and throughout the Roman era, the woods beside the lake sheltered the sacred Arician Grove, home of Diana Nemorensis, the Diana of the Grove. The Arician cult is known both from the writings of Strabo and from modern archaeology. In many ways it was unremarkable. It involved the worship of a sacred oak, whose boughs were not to be broken, and a sanctuary of perpetual fire. Apart from Diana, it addressed two minor deities, Egeria, a water nymph, and Virbius, a fugitive from the wrath of Zeus. As shown by the surviving mounds of votive offerings, its main devotees were women who hoped to conceive. On the day of the annual summer festival, the grove was lit up by myriad torches, and women all over Italy burned fires in gratitude. In one respect, however, the cult was exceptional. The chief priest of Arikia, who bore the title of Rex Nemorensis, or King of the Grove, was obliged to win his position by slaying his predecessor. At one and the same time he was priest, murderer, and prospective murder victim. Stalking the grove with drawn sword, even at dead of night, he awaited the hour when the next contestant would appear, break off a twig of the oak, and challenge him to mortal combat. In recent times, the Arician Grove is notable as the starting point of James Fraser's The Golden Bough, 1890, one of the founding works of modern anthropology. Fraser ranks alongside Marx, Freud, and Einstein as a pioneer who changed the thinking of the world. Fraser posed himself two simple questions. Why had the priest to slay his predecessor? And why, before he slew him, had he first to pluck the golden bough? In search of possible answers, he set off on an investigation of supernatural beliefs in every conceivable culture, ancient or modern. He examines rain-making in China, priest kings from the pharaohs to Dalai Lama, tree spirits from New Guinea to the cedar of Gilgit, corn spirits from the Isle of Skye to the gardens of Adonis, May Day festivals, summer fire festivals, and harvest festivals. 
He describes belief in the internal soul among the Hawaiians and in the external soul among the Samoyeds of Siberia, in the transference of evil and the expulsion of spirits. He outlines a great range of sacrificial ceremonies, from sacrifices among the Kondz of Bengal to eating the god in Lithuania and crying the neck by the reapers of Devon. Fraser was making two assumptions, which in his own day were revolutionary. On one hand, he insisted that so-called primitive or savage practices were based on serious ideas, and hence, despite their grotesque appearances, were worthy of respect. At the same time, he showed that the supposedly advanced religions of the civilized world, including Christianity, owed much to their pagan predecessors. The life of the old kings and priests teems with instruction, he wrote. In it was summed up all that passed for wisdom when the world was young. Or again, our resemblances to the savage are still far more numerous than our differences. We are like heirs to a fortune which has been handed down for so many ages that the memory of those who built it up has been lost. Their errors were not willful extravagances or the ravings of insanity. We shall do well to look with leniency upon their errors as inevitable slips made in the search for truth and to give them the benefit for that indulgence which we may one day stand in need of ourselves. Cum exclusione itaque veteres audiendi sunt. Fraser's universal tolerance was one of the principal means whereby the European humanities were able to escape their narrow Christian straitjacket and open themselves up to all times and all peoples. His demonstration that many of the customs of Christian peoples had their roots in pagan practices was particularly shocking. At the approach of Easter, Sicilian women sow wheat, lentils, and canary seed in plates which are kept in the dark and watered. The plants soon shoot up, the stalks are tied together with red ribbons, and the plates containing them are placed on the sepulchres with which effigies of the dead Christ are made up in churches on Good Friday. The whole custom, sepulchres as well as plates of sprouting grain, is probably nothing but a continuation, under another name, of Adonis worship. Returning to the Arician grove, Fraser concluded that the king of the grove personified the tree with the golden bough, and that the rite of his death had parallels among many European peoples from Gaul to Norway. The golden bough, he claimed, was none other than the mistletoe, whose name he derived from the Welsh, meaning tree of pure gold. The king of the wood lived and died as an incarnation of the supreme Aryan god, whose life was in the mistletoe or golden bough. To be safe, he added a final paragraph saying that nowadays the visitor to Nemi's woods can hear the church bells of Rome, which chime out from the distant city, and die lingeringly away across the wide Campanian marshes. Le roi est mort, vive le roi. In other words, the pagan king of the grove has gone. The Christian king of heaven reigns supreme. He didn't care to mention that the Christian king, too, was born to be slain. Cedros The fact that the Greeks and Romans had only one word, either kedros or cedros, to describe the two different species of juniper and cedar, merits a nine-page appendix. On the scale of scholarship demanded by a genuine specialist, a subject such as trees and timber in the ancient Mediterranean world needs a volume as large as the one you are listening to. And it is worth every page. It shows what a dedicated scholar can do by applying a very narrow instrument to a very broad front. In other words, if one is permitted the only appropriate metaphor, to saw a cross-section through the trunk of the classical world. Like other such works, it starts with a meticulous examination of the different sources of evidence archaeology, literary references, inscriptions, temple commissioners' accounts and reports, dendrochronology. It then surveys the subject matter, from the cedar floor beams at Knossos to the ash spear of Achilles, from the 220 Roman ships built in 45 days for the First Punic War to the bridge over the Rhine built in 10 days for Julius Caesar. Greece and Rome were not timber-based civilizations like those of the far north, but their knowledge of timber was renowned and the timber trade well developed. After reading up on the subject, 
One can never see a fir tree without thinking of the Athenian fleet at Salamis, nor part a larch without imagining the one hundred foot mast of a Roman trireme. Every bare hillside is a reminder of the Romans' deforestation of southern Italy and of northern Africa. History demands sympathetic historians. There has never been a finer dovetail than that which joined classical trees and timber to the son of a timber merchant from New York State. Samos Samian ware, the everyday red-gloss pottery of the Roman Empire, probably originated on the island of Samos, but the great mass of it was not manufactured there. From an important factory at Aretium, Arezzo, which was most active AD 30 to 40, its production was moved to a number of large-scale potteries in Gaul. Forty-five main centres are known, but the major ones from the first century were located at sites at La Grofessenc, Aveyron, and Banassac, Lozère, from the second century at Les Martres de Vert and Le Zou, Puy de Dôme, and from the third century at Trier and at Tabernay Renanay, Rheinsaben, in Germany. The full geographical range stretches from Spain and North Africa to Colchester and Upchurch in England and Westendorf on the River Inn in Austria. Ceremology seeks the triumph of ingenuity and pedantry over the remains of millions of archaeologists' pots and shards, and Samian ware has offered the most extensive challenge. Since studies began in 1879, over 160 kilns have been identified, together with over 3,000 individual potter's marks. Hans Dragendorf classified 55 standard forms of vessel. Others have catalogued standard decorative motifs, analyzed technical aspects such as the gloss, the clay, and the texture of the terra sigillata, or established the color spectrum from the characteristic orange-pink of Banasac to the deep orange-brown of Les Martres de Verre. Pioneer collections at the British Museum and the Musée Carnavalet led the way for numerous studies from Toronto to Ljubljana. Potter's marks are especially revealing. One preceded by the letter F equals fekit, made by, M equals manu, by the hand of, or of, officina, by the factory of. They bring to life the craftsmen who fed the most widespread commodity of imperial trade. The working lives of fifty-one central Gaulish potters have been exactly charted. Cocata Sidinalis and Ranto worked throughout the reign of Trajan, 98 to 117. Kinamus of Lazou was active approximately 150 to 90. Banus, Casurius and Divixtus spanned the five reigns from Antoninus Pius, 138 to 61, to Albinus, 193 to 7. The net result is a corpus of information that is so sophisticated that the date and provenance of the smallest fragment of Samian ware can be precisely established. For archaeologists, it is a research aid of inestimable value. A crate of Samian ware from Gaul was found unopened at Pompeii. Similar consignments were sent to every town and settlement of the empire. Spartacus Spartacus, died 71 BC, was a gladiator and the leader of the ancient world's most extensive slave uprising. A Thracian by birth, he had served in the Roman army before deserting and being sold into slavery to the gladiatorial school in Capua. In 73 BC, he broke out and, with a band of fellow fugitives, set up camp on Mount Vesuvius. For the next two years, he defied all attempts to catch him. His army swelled to almost 100,000 desperate men who marched the length and breadth of Italy to the Alps and the Straits of Messina. In 72 BC, he defeated each of the reigning consuls in turn in pitched battles. He was finally cornered at Petalia in Lucania, separated from his Gallic and German allies and annihilated by the forces of the praetor M. Licinius Crassus. Spartacus died sword in hand, having first killed his horse to render further flight impossible. Appropriately enough, Crassus was one of the wealthiest slave owners in Rome. He had benefited from the estates sequestered from the faction of Marius and grew vastly rich by training his slaves in lucrative trades and by mining silver. Known as Dives, 
He was consul in 70 with Pompey, and triumvir with Pompey and Caesar in 60. He celebrated his victory over Spartacus by lining 120 miles of the road from Capua to Rome with crucified prisoners, and by treating the Roman populace to a banquet of 10,000 tables. He enriched himself further as governor of Syria, only to be killed in 53 BC by the Parthians. His head was cut off, the mouth stuffed with molten gold. The accompanying notice from the Parthian king read, Gorge yourself in death with the metal you so craved in life. Slavery was omnipresent in Roman society, and in some estimations the key institution of the economy. It provided the manpower for agriculture and industry, and underpinned the luxury of the cities. It involved the total physical, economic, and sexual exploitation of the slaves and their children. It was supported by the wars of the Republic, which brought in millions of captives, and in later centuries by systematic slave raiding and slave trading. Julius Caesar sold off 53,000 Gallic prisoners after one battle alone at Atuatia, Namur. The island of Delos served as the principal entrepot for barbarians brought from the east and from beyond the Danube. Slavery continued to be a feature of European life long after Roman times, as it was in most other cultures. It persisted throughout medieval Christendom, though it was gradually overtaken by the institution of serfdom. It was generally permitted among Christians, so long as the slaves themselves were not Christian. It was still common enough in Renaissance Italy, where Muslim slaves were treated much as in their countries of origin. In more modern times, the European powers only tolerated it in their overseas colonies, where it survived the conversion of the slaves to Christianity. The abolition of slavery was one of the chief social products of the European Enlightenment. It progressed through three main stages. The outlawry of slave-owning in the home countries was followed by the suppression of the international slave trade and then of slave-owning in the overseas colonies. In Britain's case, these stages were reached in 1772, 1807, and 1833. Abolition did not occur, however, through revolts such as that of Spartacus. It occurred, as Emerson remarked, through the repentance of the tyrant. In modern times, Spartacus was adopted as a historical hero by the communist movement. His name was borrowed by the forerunner of the KPD, the Spartacus Bund of 1916-19, and it was used by Arthur Kessler for the protagonist of his novel The Gladiators. Slave revolts, in the Marxist view, were a necessary feature of ancient society and were given suitable prominence in communist textbooks. A partner for Spartacus was found in Sao Marcus, leader of an earlier revolt among the Scythian slaves of Crimea, that is, on Soviet territory. Soviet historians did not care to emphasize the parallels between the world of Spartacus and Crassus and that of the Gulag, forced collectivization, and the nomenclatura. Nomen Clan and family provided the basis for the Roman system of personal names. All patrician males had three names. The praenomen, or forename, was generally chosen from a short list of twelve, usually written in abbreviated form. C, in brackets, G, equals Gaius, GN equals Naius, D equals Decimus, FL equals Flavius, L equals Lucius, M equals Marcus, N equals Numerius, P equals Publius, Q equals Quintus, R equals Rufus, S equals Sextus, T equals Titus. The nomen indicated a man's clan, the cognomen his family. Hence, C. Julius Caesar stood for Gaius, from the gens or clan of the Iulii, and the domus or family of Caesar. All men belonging to the same patrician clan shared the same nomen, whilst all their paternal male kin shared both nomen and cognomen. At any one time, therefore, there were several Julius Caesars in circulation, each distinguished by his praenomen. The famous general's father was L. Iulius Caesar. When several members of the same family had all three names in common, they were differentiated by additional epithets. P. Cornelius Scipio, tribune, 
396 to 395 BC. P. Cornelius Scipio Barbatus, the Beard, dictator, 306. P. Cornelius Scipio Asina, the She-Ass, consul, 221. P. Cornelius Scipio, consul, 218, father of Africanus. P. Cornelius Scipio Africanus Maior, the Elder African, 236 to 184. General Consul 205, 194, Victor over Hannibal. L. Cornelius Scipio Asiaticus, the Asian, brother of Africanus. P. Cornelius Scipio Africanus Minor, the younger African, son of Africanus Maior. P. Cornelius Scipio Emilianus Africanus Minor Numantinus, the Numantian, 184 to 129 B.C., adopted son of Africanus Minor, destroyer of Carthage. P. Cornelius Scipio Nasica, the Nose, consul, 191. P. Cornelius Scipio Corculum, little heart, Pontifex Maximus, 150. Plebeians, like G. Marius or M. Antonius, possessed no nomen. Women, in contrast, were given only one name, either the feminine nomen of the clan for patricians, or the feminine cognomen of the family for plebeians. Hence all the daughters of the Uli were called Julia, or of the Livi, Livia. Sisters were not differentiated. The two daughters of Mark Antony were both called Antonia. One became the mother of Germanicus, the other the grandmother of Nero. All the daughters of Marius were called Maria. It is a sign of Roman women's lowly standing that they were denied a full individual identity. As Roman practice shows, multiple names were only required by citizens with independent legal status. For much of European history, therefore, most people made do with much less. All they had was a forename, or Christian name, together with a patronymic or adjectival description. All the languages of Europe had their counterparts for Little John, son of Big Tom. In addition to a personal name, women often used a term denoting whose wife or daughter they were. In the Slavonic world, this took the form of the suffixes ova or ovna. Maria Stefanova, Polish, stood for Stephen's wife, Mary. Yelena Borisovna, Russian, for Helen, daughter of Boris. Well-known people and foreigners often acquired names indicating their place of origin. In the Middle Ages, the feudal nobility needed to associate themselves with the fief or landed property which justified their rank. As a result, they adopted place-based surnames using either a prefix, such as fon or d, or suffix, such as ski. Hence, the French prince Charles de Lorraine would be known in Germany as Karl von Lotharingen, or in Polish as Karol Lotharinski. Members of guilds adopted names denoting their craft or trade. The ubiquitous bakers, carters, millers, and smiths belonged to the largest group to fix on the custom of family surnames. More recently, state governments have turned custom into a legal requirement, bringing individuals into the net of censuses, tax collecting, and conscription. The Gales of Scotland and the Jews of Poland were two ancient communities who long escaped surnames. Both had enjoyed communal autonomy, surviving for centuries with traditional name forms using either patronymics, such as the Jewish Abraham ben Isaac, that is, Abraham, son of Isaac, or personal epithets. The famous Highland outlaw whom the English-speaking lowlanders called Rob Roy MacGregor was known to his own as Rob Ruag, Red Robert, of Inversnaid. Both the Gaelic and the Jewish nomenclatures fell victim to state bureaucracies in the late 18th century. After the Jacobite defeat, the Scottish Highlanders were registered according to clan names which they had previously rarely used, thereby giving rise to thousands upon thousands of MacGregors, MacDonalds, and MacLeods. After the petitions of Poland, Polish Jews in Russia usually took the names of their hometowns or of their noble employers. In Prussia and Austria, they were allotted German surnames by state officials. From 1795 to 1806, the Jewish community of Warsaw found itself at the mercy of E.T.A. Hoffman, then chief Prussian administrator of the city, 
who handed out surnames according to his fancy. The lucky ones came away with Apfelbaum, Himmelfarb, or Vogelsang, the less fortunate with Fischbein, Hosenduft, or Katzenelenbogen. Lex It is often said that Roman law is one of the pillars of European civilization, and so, indeed, it is. Latin lex means the bond, that which binds. The same idea underlines that other keystone of Roman legality, the pactum, or contract. Once freely agreed by two parties, whether for commercial, matrimonial, or political purposes, the conditions of the contract bind the parties to observe it. As the Romans knew, the rule of law ensures sound government, commercial confidence, and orderly society. Yet it must not be imagined that the legal traditions of Rome were bequeathed to modern Europe by any simple line of direct inheritance. Most of the empire's law codes fell into disuse with the disintegration of the empire and had to be rediscovered in the Middle Ages. They survived longest in Byzantium, but did not, by that route, strongly influence modern lawmaking. Indeed, in terms of direct example, they probably most immediately affected the formulation of Catholic canon law. What is more, even in the secular sphere, the revival of Roman traditions had to compete with other non-Roman and often contradictory legal practices. Rome was only one of several sources of European jurisprudence. Customary law, in all its diversity, was equally important. In some countries, such as France, a balance was achieved between Roman and customary traditions. In most of Germany, the Roman law arrived in the 15th century at a very late date. In England, exceptionally, the common law, modified by the principles of equity, was to gain a virtual monopoly. Even so, the Roman distinction between the public and the private domains was to suit the purposes of Europe's growing polities, and civil law in most European countries was to be based on codified principles in the Roman fashion, as opposed to the Anglo-American concept of legal precedent. In this regard, the single most influential institution came to be the French, Code Napoleon. Whatever their connections, all educated European lawyers acknowledge their debt to Cicero and to Cicero's successors. It was Cicero, in De Legibus, who wrote, Salus Populi Suprema Lex. The safety of the people is the highest law. One could equally say that the rule of law provides the people with the highest degree of safety. Epigraph Epigraphy, the study of inscriptions, is one of the important auxiliary sciences in exploring the classical world. Since so much material and cultural evidence has perished, the inscriptions which have survived on stone or on metal provide an invaluable source of information. The careful study of tombstones, dedicatory tablets, statues, public monuments and the like yields a rich harvest of intimate details about the people whom the inscriptions commemorate, their family life, their names and titles, their writing, their careers, their regiments, their laws, their gods, their morality. The great epigraphic collections, such as the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum and the Corpus Inscriptionum Graecarum, both produced in 19th century Berlin, are as solid and as durable as the monuments which they record. The most famous of Roman epigraphs, the Twelve Tables of the Law, which stood for centuries in the Forum, did not survive, but the variety of the extant material is extraordinary. Roman tombstones frequently bore a poetic description of the dead person's life and career. A stone from Moguntium, Mainz, carried a protest over the manner of the dedicatee's death. Iucundus em terenti, the first, Ibertus, pecuarius praeteriens, quicumque legis consiste viator, et vide quam indigne raptus inane queror. Vivere non potui plures, ex 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 milibus per annos, Nam erupuit servus mihi vitam et ipse, prae cipitem sese de gesi dinamnem, abstulit huic moinus quod domino eripuit, patronus de suo posuit. Iucundus, shepherd, a free slave of Marcus Terentius, traveller, whoever you are, 
stop and peruse these lines. Learn how my life was wrongly taken from me, and listen to my vain lament. I was not able to live for more than thirty years. A slave took my life, then threw himself in the river. The man took his life, of which his master was deprived. My patron has raised this stone at his own expense. Dedications to the gods were a usual feature of public monuments. An inscription discovered in the Circus Maximus, and now placed on an obelisk in the Piazza del Popolo, was originally erected in 10 to 9 BC by the Emperor Augustus in honour of the conquest of Egypt. Imp Caesar Divi F. Augustus Pontifex Maximus Imp XII Cos XI Trib Pot XIV Aegypto in Potestatem Populi Romani Redacta Soli Donum Dedit. The Emperor Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Julius, supreme priest, twelve times commander, eleven times consul, fourteen times tribune, Egypt having passed to the control of the Roman people, has offered this gift to the sun. Objects of a much more humble nature often bear interesting inscriptions. Vases and pottery carried marks of manufacture, metal stamps for imprinting a name or advertisement onto clay were in common use. A whole series of such stamps, from the bottles of an optician, were found at Reims. Di calicest fragis adas pritvidi, decimi gal cestis fragis ad as pritudinem, decimus gallius cestus eyewash for granulous pupils. Ludi The people who have conquered the world wrote Juvenal, now have only two interests, bread and circuses. The art of conversation is dead, exclaimed Seneca. Can no one today talk of anything else than charioteers? The ludi, or games, had become a central feature of Roman life. Originally staged on four set weeks during the year in April, July, September, and November, they grew to the point where the Circus Maximus and the Colosseum were in almost permanent session. At the first recorded games in 264 BC, three pairs of slaves had fought to the death. Four centuries later, the Emperor Trajan laid on a festival where 10,000 persons and 11,000 animals perished. Professional gladiators provided shows of mortal combat. Marching in procession through the Gate of Life, they entered the arena and addressed the imperial podium with the traditional shout, Ave Caesare Morituri! Salutamus, hail Caesar, we who are about to die greet thee. Nimble retiari with net and trident faced heavily armed secutores with sword and shield. Sometimes they would join forces against teams of captives or exotic barbarians. The corpses of the losers were dragged out on meat hooks through the gate of death. If a gladiator fell wounded, the emperor or other president of the games would signal by thumbs up or thumbs down whether he should be reprieved or killed. Promoters exploited the rivalry of gladiatorial schools and advertised the feats of famous performers. One program which has survived listed a fight between T. V. Pugnax Nair III and M. P. Muranus Nair III, that is, two fighters from the Neronian school in Capua, each with three wins, one fighting with Thracian arms, small shield and curved sword, and the other in Gallic, Marmillo style. Pugnax came out victor, whilst Moranus ended up Peritus, dead. The thirst for grand spectacles gradually led to the practice where gladiatorial shows were interspersed with venationes, or wild beast hunts, by full-scale military battles, and even by naval contests in a flooded arena. In time, acts of gross obscenity, bestiality, and mass cruelty were demanded. Popular stories elaborated scenes of spread-eagled girls smeared with the vaginal fluid of cows and raped by wild bulls, of Christian captives roasted alive, crucified, set alight, or thrown to the lions, or of wretches forced to paddle in sinking boats across water filled with crocodiles. These were only passing variations in an endless variety of victims and torments. 
They continued until the Christian Emperor Honorius overruled the Senate and put an end to the games in A.D. 404. Nothing, however, roused such passions as chariot racing, which began in Rome and continued in Byzantium. Traditionally, six teams of four horses careered seven times round the spine of the circus, competing for vast prizes. Sensational spills and fatal crashes were routine. Huge bets were placed. Successful charioteers became idols of the mob and as wealthy as senators. Successful horses were commemorated by stone statues. Tuscus, driven by Fortunatus of the Blues, 386 wins. Racing was in the hands of the four corporations, whites, reds, greens, and blues, who supplied the competing stables, teams, and drivers. The factions of circus supporters were responsible for many a riot. In Byzantine times they were institutionalized and were once thought to have formed the basis for incipient political parties. This theory is now largely abandoned, but faction-like associations were still performing in late Byzantine ceremonies. The Christian church always frowned. Some put their trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Condom in 18 BC and again in AD 9, Emperor Augustus attempted to increase the fertility of the empire's population through decrees curbing abortion and infanticide. From this and other sources, it is clear that the Romans were familiar with many methods of contraception, including herbs, spermicidal douches containing cedar gum, vinegar or olive oil, vaginal pessaries soaked in honey, and condoms fashioned from goat's bladders. One Roman writer advised, Wear the liver of a cat in a tube on the left foot, or part of the womb of a lioness in a tube of ivory. Research into medieval practices once suggested that the necessary mentality for diverting nature was simply not present. But this view has been revised. Examination of church penitentials shows that the subject was much discussed, especially since the sins of Onan can reasonably be taken to include coitus interruptus. Dante's hints in Paradiso 15 about Florence's empty family houses and about what was possible in the bedchamber leave little to the modern imagination. The increase of urban prostitution increased an interest in avoiding pregnancy. The Cathars, too, were notoriously non-pro-life. In the 1320s, the Inquisitors succeeded in persuading a Cathar priest's lover to reveal their techniques. When the priest wanted to know me carnally, he used to wear this herb wrapped up in a piece of linen about the size of the first joint of my little finger, and he had a long cord which he used to put round my neck when we made love, and this thing or herb at the end of the cord used to hang down as far as the opening of my stomach. It might happen that he might want to know me carnally twice or more in a single night. In that case, the priest might ask me before uniting his body with mine, where is the herb? I would put the herb in his hand, and then he himself would place it at the opening of my stomach, still with the cord between my breasts. The only detail missing was the name of the herb. Historical demographers studying Italian merchant families and English villages have concluded that births must have been kept artificially low in both the medieval and modern periods. In the 18th century, lechers like James Boswell made no secret of using armour. Their continental counterparts talked of English overcoats or umbrellas. Their hero was the mysterious Captain Condom, said to have been either physician or commander of the guard at the court of Charles II. The first pope to have condemned contraceptive practices was supposedly Clement the Twelfth in 1731. Modern campaigners for birth control did not advocate contraception in the cause of permissiveness. Marie Stopes, though packed with nymphomaniac drive, was also an old-fashioned romantic. In Married Love and Wise Parenthood, she was arguing to give women the chance of relief from childbearing and of enjoyable love-making within marriage. Military authorities who distributed French letters to troops on the Western Front were concerned both for the soldiers' health and for civilian relations. Abortion remained the principal technique in the communist world as in the Roman Empire. 
In the West, contraception was not linked to changing sexual mores until the availability of the pill and of free clinical advice for unmarried adolescents in the 1960s. Yet, as a jingle of the 1920s recalls, success was nowhere guaranteed. Jeannie Jeannie, full of hopes, read a book by Marie Stopes, but to judge from her condition, she must have read the wrong edition. Illyricum The Roman province of Illyricum occupied the eastern shore of the Adriatic between the Italian district of Istria and the Greek province of Epirus. It was bounded to the north by Pannonia beyond the river Dravus and to the east by Moesia and Macedonia. It was known to the Greeks as Illyris Barbara, being the part of ancient Illyria which had remained free from the conquests of Philip of Macedon. In imperial times, it was divided into three prefectures, Liburnia and Dalmatia on the coast, and Lapidia in the interior. Apart from Siscia, modern Zagreb, and Narona, Mostar, its principal cities were all seaports, Tartatica, Ada, Zada, Salonai, Split, Epidaurum. The southernmost fortress city of Lissus had been founded by Syracusan colonists in 385 BC. Illyricum was subdued in stages. It first paid tribute to Rome in 229 BC and was twice overrun during the Macedonian Wars of the second century. It was fully incorporated under Augustus in 23 BC. Having participated in the great Pannonian Revolt of AD 6-9, it remained in the empire until Byzantine times. Little is known of the ancient Illyrians. Their language was Indo-European, and probably supplied an underlying stratum to modern Albanian. Their material culture was renowned for its sophisticated metalwork. From the 6th century, their situla art was distinguished by fine repoussé figures set on bronze wine buckets amidst scenes of feasting, racing, and riding. A silver coinage was minted in the 3rd century. Illyrian warriors fought in chainmail like the Scythians, but not in chariots like the Celts. Illyricum gave birth to two Roman emperors and to St. Jerome. The emperor Diocletian retired to a grandiose palace built on the seafront of his native Salonai. His octagonal mausoleum survived as a Christian church, an ironic fate for the resting place of the Christians' last great persecutor. St. Jerome was born at nearby Strido in AD 347, more than two hundred years before the first appearance of the Slavs, who were to lay the foundations of the future Croatia, Bosnia, and Montenegro. Illyricum, like Britannia, belongs to a group of Roman provinces whose ethnic and cultural connections were totally transformed by the Great Migrations. But the memory of the Illyrians was cherished by their successors. Their legacy is very different from that bequeathed to those parts of Europe which never knew Rome at all. Lugdunum in 43 BC, the proconsul Muniatus Plancus drew the centre line of a new city overlooking the confluence of the Rhone and the Sone. Lugdunum was to be the principal city of Roman Gaul, the meeting point of a star like network of paved roads. Its amphitheatres can still be seen on the hill of Fourvière. It commanded not only the Rhone Rhine corridor, but the route leading northwest from Italy to the Channel. The Rhone, though navigable, was a swift and turbulent river. Downstream, ships risked being wrecked on numerous reefs and islands. Upstream, they could only make headway against the current with the help of horses. In the decades before the arrival of steamboats in 1821, 6,000 horses worked the towpath, hauling cargoes up to Lyon before floating back down on rafts. From 1271 to 1483, the Lower Rhone constituted an international frontier. The left bank, known as L'Empi, lay in the Holy Roman Empire. The right bank, Le Riome, and all the islands belonged to the Kingdom of France. Fifteen stone bridges were built between Geneva and Arles, and several sets of twin towns, such as Valence and Beaucaire, grew up on opposing banks. In that same era, Lyon recovered the economic preeminence which it had once commanded in ancient Gaul. It was annexed to France by Philippe le Bel, who entered the city on the 3rd of March 1311, after which it headed the French Isthmus, linking France's northern and southern possessions. 
From 1420, it hosted four international fairs annually. From 1464, it received privileges aimed at subverting the commerce of Geneva. And from 1494 to 1559, it supplied the logistical base for France's Italian wars. Its merchant elite was distinguished by many Italian families, including the Medici, the Guandagni, Gadagna, and numerous Genoese. This lively, determined, and secretive city, caught up in whirlpools and rhythms of a very particular kind, made itself the leading centre of the European economy. Vieux Lyon, the old quarter nestling beside the Saône, recalls the city's golden decades. A hillside warren of narrow streets connected by tunnel-like traboules or transambulant passageways, it is crowded with highly ornamented Gothic and Renaissance hotels, courtyards, squares, and churches. Its names, from the Monicanterie, or Cathedral Choir School, to the Hôtel de Gadagne on the Rue Juiverie, or Jewry Street, ring with the memory of colourful bygone inhabitants. The Place Bellecour was laid out under Louis XIV on the interfluvial plain. Its statue of the Sun King, which had been shipped from Paris by sea, came to grief in transit and had to be fished from the river. Given Lyons's strategic location and its industrial prowess based on silk, geographers have wondered why it never ousted Paris as France's capital. The prospect has remained an unrealized possibility. From 1311, Lyon has had to be content as France's second city. For geography only determines what is possible. It does not determine which possibility will triumph. A country is a storehouse of dormant energies, wrote the master, whose seeds have been planted by nature, but whose use depends on man. Panta When the city of Colonia Cornelia Veneria Pompeiana was buried under five metres of volcanic ash on the 24th of August, A.D. 79, all forms of human life were extinguished, the elegant, the mundane, and the seamy. Yet, when Pompeii was excavated, mainly from 1869 onwards, one aspect of its former life, its dedication to Venus, was officially concealed. A huge collection of objects which offended against the 19th century's fear of obscenity were kept for decades in the Stanze Prohibiti, or prohibited sections, of the National Museum in Naples. The sexual commerce of Pompeii, in contrast, was plied without shame or hypocrisy. Brothels, or lupinari, were located in all parts of the town and openly advertised their menus and their tariffs. The cheapest girls, such as Successa or Aptata, charged two assi. Speranza charged eight, Attica sixteen. Outside brothels, there were notices to discourage eavesdroppers. One notice read, No place for idlers, clear off. Inside, there were pictures to encourage the customers. Paintings and sculptures of sexual subjects were common, even in private houses. Murals portraying the mysteries of the city's cults had a semi-sacred character. Phalluses of gigantic proportions were on frequent display. They served as the flame-holders of oil lamps, as the centerpiece of comic drawings, even as the spouts of drinking cups. Humorous trinkets showing male gods with divine equipment, or the god Pan plunging an upturned she-goat, were commonplace. Many of the city's whores are known by name, or, like actresses, by their nom de scène. Hence Panta, everything, Culibonia, lovely bum, Calitremia, super crotch, Laxa, spacious, Landicosa, big clit, or Extaliosa, back channel. Their clients are also known by name or nickname. One was Enocleone, valorous toper. Another, Scordo Pordonicus, garlic farter. The chief ponce of Pompey's largest brothel died shortly before the volcano erupted. His servant had scratched an obituary on the gate. For all who grieve, Africanus is dead. Rusticus wrote this. The trade was both bisexual and bilingual. Rent boys were available for both sexes, and the language of the game was either Greek or Latin. The essential vocabulary included futoere, lingere, felare, phallus, mentula, verpa, cunus or connus, and lupa. 
Most expressive are the graffiti, ancient moments of triumph and disaster recorded for all time. Filius Salax, quot mulierum diffutuisti. Ampliate, Icaras te pedicat. Restituta pone tunicam rogo redes pilosa co. Dolete puelae pedi. Cunni superbe vale. Ampliatus totius. Oc quoque fututui. Impelle lente. Messius hic nihil fututit. Crux. Like the square, the circle, the triangle, the arrow, and the notch. The cross is one of the irreducible primary signs that recur throughout human history. Sometimes called the sign of signs, it is used in science to denote ad, plus, and positive. Owing to the crucifixion of Christ, however, it was adopted at an early stage as the prime symbol of Christianity. The cross is omnipresent in the Christian world, in churches, on graves, on public monuments, in heraldry, on national flags. Christians are baptized with the sign of the cross, they are blessed by their priests with the sign of the cross, and they cross themselves, Catholics and Orthodox in opposite directions, when they implore divine assistance or when they listen to the gospel. Medieval crusaders wore the cross on their surcoats. The Christian cross can be found in any number of variants, each with a specific symbol or ornamental connotation. Yet pre-Christian signs have long existed in Europe alongside their Christian counterparts, Best known is the age-old swastika, or crooked cross, whose name derives from a Sanskrit phrase for well-being. In ancient Chinese law, it signified bad luck when the hooks were turned down to the left, and good luck when they were turned up to the right. In its Scandinavian form, it was thought to represent two crossed strokes of lightning giving light, or two crossed sticks making fire. In its rounded Celtic form, common in Ireland, it was made to represent the sun. It had several millennia behind it before the pagan Nazis chose a modern version of the Hakenkreuz as their party emblem. Another example of the transmission of Oriental and non-Christian insignia concerns the tamgas, or pictorial charges, of the ancient Sarmatians. The tamgas, which occasionally resemble some of the more simple Chinese ideographs, reappeared in the tribal signs of the Turkish tribes, who advanced into the Near East in early medieval times. By this route, they are thought to have contributed to the system of Islamic heraldry, which Western Crusaders were to encounter in the Holy Land. At the same time, they bear a striking resemblance to signs which emerged at a somewhat later period in the unique heraldic system of Poland. As a result, scholars have been tempted to speculate that the familiar claim about the Polish nobility being descended from ancient Sarmatian ancestors may not be entirely fanciful. The so-called Sarmatian ideology, their heraldic clans, and their remarkable cavalry tradition have all been linked to the long-lost Oriental horsemen of the steppes. One hypothesis holds that Poland's Sarmatian connection may best be explained as a legacy of the Sarmatian Alans, who disappeared into the backwoods of Eastern Europe in the 4th century AD. Symbols can arouse the deepest emotions, when the International Red Cross was founded in 1863, few Europeans realized that its emblem could be other than a universal symbol of compassion. But in due course it had to be supplemented with the Red Crescent, the Red Lion, and the Red Star. Similarly, when a Christian cross was raised on the site of the former Nazi concentration camp at Auschwitz, it caused bitter controversy, especially among those who were not aware that the victims of the camp included large numbers of Christians as well as Jews. In 1993, nine years of accusations and broken agreements were ended with the creation of an ecumenical memorial centre. Apocalypse Patmos is Europe's last island, hard by the Aegean's Asian shore. In the first century AD, it was used as a penal colony for the nearby Roman city of Ephesus. It was a fitting place to compose the last book of the canon of Christian scripture. The author of the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, was called John. He never claimed what later tradition assumed, that he was St. John the Apostle, and neither his style nor his outlook matches those of the fourth gospel. He had been exiled for religious offences, and was probably writing between A.D. 81 and 96. 
The Apocalypse of St. John the Divine records a series of mystical visions which, like Jewish apocalyptic literature of the same vintage, foretell the end of the existing order. The interpretation of its wondrous symbolism of the Lamb, the seven seals, the four beasts, and the four horsemen, the great whore of Babylon and the red dragon, and many more, has kept Christians puzzled and entranced ever since. The central chapters deal with the struggle with Antichrist, supplying a rich fund of demonology. The concluding section, chapters 21 to 2, presents a view of a new heaven and a new earth. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Revelation chapter 21 verses 4 through 6. Chastity. Chastity, in the sense of the permanent renunciation of sexual activity, was adopted by the early Christians as a central feature of their moral code. It was not unknown among the ancients, although Juvenal hinted that it had not been seen since Saturn filled the throne. It was practiced by pagan priestesses, such as the Vestal Virgins of Rome, on pain of death, and in the Jewish world by some of the all-male sects but it had never been upheld as a universal ideal. Indeed, the wholesale pursuit of the virgin life had serious social implications. It threatened the family, the most respected institution of Roman life, and it undermined marriage. In a world where infant mortality was high and average life expectancy did not exceed twenty-five years, the average household needed five pregnancies from each of its adult women to maintain numbers. Celibacy among adults seriously endangered the reproduction of the species. Yet the Christians cherished chastity with unremitting ardour. From St. Paul onwards, they increasingly condemned the bondage of the flesh. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, wrote St. Paul, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The appeal of these Pauline teachings can only be partly explained in terms of the life of the Spirit demanding freedom from all worldly preoccupations. The belief in the imminence of the Second Coming may also have played a part, since it was thought to have rendered procreation superfluous. Sexual orgasm was condemned because it involved the ultimate loss of free will. Many people believed that the character of a child was determined by the parent's humour during intercourse. This created further inhibitions, since lovers would fear that impure sexual feelings might deform their offspring. Galen reports an erroneous medical notion to the effect that semen was produced from the froth of agitated blood. For men, sex was linked with physical as well as with spiritual disorder. For women, Lifelong virginity was seen as the surest means of liberation from the tyranny of husbands and of traditional domestic duties. In general, therefore, sex was seen to be the mechanism whereby the sins of the fathers were transmitted from generation to generation. In August 386, there occurred in Milan one of the most famous conversions of a self-confessed fornicator. St. Augustine's Confessions provide a vital insight into the considerations involved in his acceptance of chastity. By that time, however, three hundred years had passed since St. Paul. Established Christian communities were feeling the need to multiply. Hence, the secondary ideal of Christian marriage was revived alongside the primary ideal of Christian chastity. In this, marriage officially remained a stopgap measure, a guard against lust and fornication for those too weak to abstain. For it is better to marry, St. Paul had written to the Christians of Corinth, than to burn. This rout of the body continued to hold sway in the Middle Ages. The secular Latin clergy joined the monks in celibacy. The virgin saints were universally revered. The cult of the Virgin Mary, immaculate notwithstanding both conception and childbirth, was given a status similar to that accorded to the creed of the Trinity. 
Christian ascetics practiced every form of mental and physical restraint, self-castration not accepted. The history of chastity is one of those topics in the study of Montelité which best help modern listeners to penetrate the mind of the ancients. It serves as a point of entry to what has been called a long extinct and deeply reticent world. The magisterial study, which traces the debates on chastity among the church fathers of both Greek and Latin traditions, does not comment on present-day sexual attitudes, which the early Christians must surely have seen as a form of tyranny. But it undertakes the task of every good historian to signal the differences between the past and the present, where chastity, to borrow a phrase, is often seen as the most unnatural of sexual perversions. To modern persons, Peter Brown concludes, the early Christian themes of sexual renunciation, continence, celibacy, and the virgin life have come to carry with them icy overtones. Whether they say anything of help or comfort for our own times, the readers must decide for themselves. Pascha Easter is the prime festival of the Christian calendar. It celebrates Christ's resurrection from the dead. It is preceded by the forty days of the Lenten fast and culminates in the eight days of Holy Week, starting on Palm Sunday. It reaches its most somber point during Passion Tide, which begins at the hour of the crucifixion at noon on Good Friday, only to erupt in an outburst of joy on the third day, on Easter morning, when the tomb was found empty. In most European languages, Easter is called by some variant of the late Latin word Pascha, which in turn derives from the Hebrew Pesach, Passover. In Spanish it is Pasqua, in French Pak, in Welsh Pasch, in Swedish Pask, in Russian and Greek Pascha. In German, however, it is Ostern, which derives, like its English equivalent, from the ancient Germanic goddess of springtime Eostro, Ostara. From this it appears that the Christians adapted earlier spring festivals marking the renewal of life after winter. They also appropriated the Jewish symbolism of Passover, with the crucified Christ becoming the Paschal Lamb. The difference in names also recalls ancient controversies over the date of Easter. Those early Christians who followed the practices of the Jewish Passover fixed Easter on the fourteenth day of the moon following the vernal equinox. In 325, the Council of Nicaea decided that Easter Day should fall on the first Sunday after the full moon following the vernal equinox. But the matter could not rest there, since several rival astronomical cycles were in existence for calculating solar years and lunations. Originally the great observatory at Alexandria was charged with the mathematics, but soon important discrepancies crept in between the Greek and Latin churches and between different provinces within the Latin church. In 387, Easter was held in Gaul on the 21st of March, in Italy on the 18th of April, and in Egypt on the 25th of April. Subsequent attempts at standardization succeeded only partially, though the 21st of March and the 25th of April have remained the extreme limits. The Orthodox and Catholic Easters were never harmonized. Since Easter is a movable feast, all other festivals in the annual Christian calendar which depend on it, from Whitsun, Pentecost, to Ascension Day, must move with it. Easter finds no mention in the Bible, except for an isolated mistranslation in the English authorized version of 1613, where, in Acts 12, chapter 4, Easter appears in place of Passover. For nearly two millennia, Christendom has resounded at Easter time to triumphal hymns about Christ's victory over death. For non-Christians, these hymns can sound threatening. For the faithful, they express the deepest sense of their existence. The ancients sang the fourth century, Aurora lucis rutilat, the day draws on with golden light, finita iam sunt proelia, the strife is o'er, the battle done, or victimae pascali laudes. The best-known Easter hymns, including Salve festa dies, Welcome, happy, including Salve festa dies, Welcome, happy morning, Vexilla regis, the royal banners forward go, and Pange lingua gloriosi praelium certaminis, Sing, my tongue, the glorious battle, were composed by Venantius Fortunatus, sometime Bishop of Poitiers. 
the best Greek counterparts, such as Anastasio Simera, the Day of Resurrection, sometimes sung to the melody of Lancashire, were composed by St. John of Damascus. Germans sing the Jesus lebt of Christian Fuch de Gott Gellert, the French à toi la gloire, ô ressuscité, the Poles Christus smart fixtan jest, the Greeks Christos anesti. The English-speaking world sings Christ the Lord is risen today, to words by Charles Wesley. Vain the stone, the watch, the seal, Christ has burst the gates of hell. Death in vain forbids his rise, Christ has opened paradise. Lives again our glorious King, where, O oh, death, is now thy sting? Once he died, our souls to save, where thy victory, O oh, grave? Hallelujah. Diabolos All the main traditions from which European civilization was fused were strongly conscious of the evil one. In prehistoric religion, as in pagan folklore, he often took the form of a horned animal, the dragon, the serpent, the goat-man of the witch's sabbath, the seductive gentleman who could not quite conceal his horns, his tail, and his hooves. In classical mythology he was a lord of the underworld, with a pedigree that can be traced to the encounter of Gilgamesh with Huwawa. In the Manichaean tradition he was the prince of darkness. To Aristotle he may have been no more than the absence of the good, but to the Platonists he was already the Diabolos, the opponent, the old enemy. In the Old Testament, especially in the book of Job, he was the agent of sin and inexplicable suffering. In Christian law, the tempter of Christ in the wilderness becomes the Satan and the Lucifer of the fall. He finds a central place in medieval demonology and in St. Augustine's discussion of free will and of God's license for evil, as in the masterworks of Milton and Goethe. In recent times, Europeans have dropped their guard, but a history of Europe without the devil would be as odd as an account of Christendom without Christ. Catacombi Belief in the resurrection of the dead gave burial a special role in the early Christian community, and two miles beyond Rome's Aurelian walls, in the vicinity of the Appian Way, lay a district, Ad Catacumbas, where for safety early Christians buried their dead in underground galleries. Forty-two such catacombs have been identified since their rediscovery in the sixteenth century, each of them a warren of tunnels on five or six levels, linking the maze of chambers and family loculi, or notches. The earliest tombs, such as that of Flavia Domitila, wife of the consul for AD 95, date from the end of the first century, but the greatest number date from the era of persecutions in the third century. The catacombs were never lived in, but later, under Christian rule, they became a favourite meeting ground, where festivals were held and chapels built in honour of the popes and martyrs. Most of the inscriptions were cut at that time. For example, in the catacomb of Praetextus, there is an inscription to one of Pope Sixtus' martyred deacons, St. Ianorius, arrested with him on the 6th of August, 258. Beatissimo martiri Ianuario Damasus Episcop Fecit. Bishop Damasus made this monument dedicated to the blessed martyr Ianorius. The largest complex, the Catacomb of St. Callistus, was built by the ex-slave who became Pope in 217-22. It includes the papal chamber, containing burials up to Pope Militiades, the crypt of St. Cecilia, and in the crypt of the sacraments, an extraordinary collection of mural paintings. Catacomb art was highly symbolic of the spiritual life and the world to come. Its favourite motifs included the dove, the anchor, the dolphin, the fisherman, the good shepherd, and Jonah, precursor of the resurrection. Pillaging by Goths and Vandals in the 5th century caused many relics to be withdrawn to churches within the city, and the postponement of the Second Coming caused the gradual abandonment of underground burial. St. Sebastian's crypt was one of the few sites to remain frequented. It was sought out by medieval pilgrims seeking protection from the plague. Beside the catacomb of Basileo stands a church which marks Rome's most famous Christian legend. Fleeing from persecution along the Appian Way, St. Peter met Christ on the road and asked him, 
Domine, quo vadis? Lord, where are you going? Christ answered, To Rome, for a second crucifixion. Peter turned back and was martyred. Three of the forty-two catacombs, at Villa Torlonia, at Vigna Randatini, and at Monteverde, are Jewish.